Mr Speaker. I call the member for Kwana. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. So as I was saying about this state budget, no money in the state budget for the Camcos Heavy Rail Corridor on the Sunshine Coast. No money for the Meriden Way Connector Road to reduce congestion around Parklands, around Meriden uh, Parklands Boulevard and the Meriden State College. No money for additional police at the Kiwana Waters Police Station or the Caloundra Police Station, despite the fact we've got huge crime issues happening in Kiwana and Caloundra. No issue. No, no, the police minister doesn't talk about that this morning. Despite the population growth of Kiwana and Caloundra over the last five years, the police resources has not kept pace. Now, Minister Grace talked about the live music industry. How dare she talk about the live music industry and the piddly $7 million that the government have committed in this budget, considering three days ago they closed down night quarter in my electorate. A small business community overnight closed them down. Police and Queensland Health stormed the gates of night quarter, closed them down. Oh, I take the interjection because guess what? Queensland Health have just reneged on the revocation order. So now they can open back up, despite the fact businesses have suffered a financial loss over the last few days. So don't give me this, that this government is supporting the live music industry. I've already had, I've already had, I've seen the reports of San Cisco, who was the band that was due to play, that couldn't play because of the shutdown by Queensland Health, have been asking for $60,000 compensation from the state government. And you know what? I agree. The state government should compensate them. The state government should also compensate the charity U-turn event that was due to happen this weekend that can't now happen because of the closure. The state government should refund and help that charity and the Aiken family that were going to put on that music festival for young people dealing with mental health, youth suicide, youth homelessness. But because Queensland Health's overhanded, heavy-handed approach to this restriction issue and closed night quarter down, that charity can't now run their charity festival this weekend, Madam Deputy Speaker. So there is no support for the live music industry. And there is a double standard when you can have an overcapacity state of origin at Townsville Stadium with 40,000 people singing and dancing in their chairs, and yet at night quarter on the Sunshine Coast, in an open air environment, the breeze comes in, the sun comes comes in, occasionally a bit of water comes in with the rain, and the health, of, uh, the health minister says it's an indoor event. It's not. So if they want to show real leadership, real money, put it into the live music industry, industry properly. And can I conclude on this, the housing crisis. The government are funding, they say, you know, $2 billion worth of houses. But again, the money's not in the budget. We've got people sleeping in their cars on the Sunshine Coast, people that can afford rent, that can't get into an accommodation or a rental facility. They're applying for over 50 applications per house on the Sunshine Coast, Mr Deputy Speaker. We need to look out of the box. We need to look at things like, I met a young couple recently, they've built the um, portable uh, emergency accommodation. We could put those on blocks of vacant land across the Sunshine Coast to house people immediately, get them out of their cars. We need to think out of the box with the homelessness issue on the Sunshine Coast because we have a, a very terrible issue. And can I just conclude, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in saying this, I thank the government, the Karamundi State School, $283,000 to refurbish classrooms, Kiwana Water State College, $6.5 million, Talara Primary College, $150,000 tuck shop extension, and the Karamundi State School uh, needs a tuck shop upgrade. Now, call on the government to immediately provide funding to the Karamundi State School for their tuck shop upgrade. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Logan. Mr Speaker, I um, listened with interest to the speech of the member for Kwana, both before and um, after, and I, I had that picture of, you know, back in the 80s, um, uh, they used to have on game shows often a big spinning wheel, and they'd have it sort of in gold and uh, silver sequence, and there was always a character, a bit like the member for Kwana, who uh, would be dressed up and would spin the wheel. But in this case, the wheel, instead of having those prizes in the 80s that we used to have, like a washing machine or a, a, a TV that was almost 24 inches wide, Toyota Celica, it, Toyota Celica sometimes, um, instead there was, on, on this particular game show wheel, between its gold sequins and its silver sequins, each thing as it spun round, all the answers were always, look at me, look at me, look at me. <laughs> Because, frankly, that's all the member for Kiwana has with his stunts about this budget. And it's disappointing that we cannot take seriously that this, after a once-in-a-generation social, health and economic event, that we cannot uh, take these concerns seriously and instead have to play silly politics and, of course, silly games like that. We are incredibly encouraged that we have a 5.4 per cent unemployment rate. We're incredibly encouraged that since May last year, the state has created 86,000 jobs. Now, I pose to those around the parliament 
What was the most important? Uh, what was the most important date for this budget? Through the chair, Madam Deputy Speaker. I guess I'm doing rhetorically, um, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, so, uh, some people would say that it was when the, pres the, um, the treasurer got up to do his speech. Others would say in the months of preparation and hard work. Like some on the opposition might even say that it was this morning when, when the uh, opposition um, uh, leader gave his speech. But I want to argue that the most important date for this budget was actually, and I asked members to cart their minds back to the 31st of January 2020. It's a date I know well because that was the date we were to hold the Labor caucus to consider what we were doing for our future. But instead on that day, we had heard as we were driving up that the whole ministerial team I was not going to come to our annual retreat. Instead, uh, they were going to have a series of special meetings to activate emergency, health, police and other services. This is in January. As well as pursuing the processes in, for the pandemic, you're right, January 2020. We didn't, wait, we didn't wait like the federal government to see. We weren't going to the football that weekend uh, like the federal government uh, minister was doing. We didn't wait a week until ministerial diaries cleared. This government acted early, decisively and firmly because this is a government that protects Queenslanders and protects their economy. This government was probably alone in taking, in taking this action, the, uh, a whole of government action on the 31st of January, perhaps alone in the whole world. I want to recognise this government continued to make the best decisions to protect, uh, uh, protect Queenslanders through the pandemic. Of course, we protected the lives of senior Queenslanders and the health of all Queenslanders. But in doing so, we also knew that these actions were vital to protecting the industry, jobs and economies of Queensland. Some, Mr Deputy Speaker, mistakenly through the pandemic said we had a simple choice, uh, a healthy population or a growing healthy economy. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, was a false choice. Instead, you could either have, uh, you could only have both options. You could have a pandemic that was killing senior Queenslanders and having a weakened Queensland economy, or you could have a healthy population uh, that would lead to confident Queenslanders working productively and a stronger economy. It was one or the other, and you need a healthy population for a healthy economy. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, nothing at this stage of my speech would give me greater pleasure to inform you of this, the history of this event that on these actions we had bipartisan support from those across the aisle. Sorry, on this side of the aisle. Now, I'm not... Um, uh, now, I'm not talking, of course, about the anti-vaccine conspiracy theorists of Pauline Hanson's One Nation, but of course their fellow travellers in the M LNP, um, in which uh, in some ways were more dangerous than Pauline Hanson. Um, we should note uh, uh, more dangerous than Pauline Hanson because at this stage we should have noted that they would have damaged the economy by pre pre uh, pre prematurely opening up the economy to the infected southern states, and that was actually the policy of the LNP. They called for it 64 times. All of their members supported it. We know that instead of having shadow cabinet meetings to support the government's health response, they were having under meetings to undermine it. We also know that they secretly talked with both the Premier of New South Wales and the Prime Minister to attack the health responses of Queenslanders. When I last spoke in this place, when I last spoke in this place, I do. If I take the interjection, I'm just getting to it. I, I, through the you know, chair, comments will come through the chair. The question was, do I know of whether it was secret, Mr Deputy Speaker? And I do know about it. And the, let me just give you the reasons. We uh, found out about this because at that point, it was beginning to become obvious that the policy of the LNP was a failure. So Carl Stefanovic, in an interview with Gladys Berejika, said, the state election this Saturday, have you spoken with the opposition leader in Queensland, the member for Nanango, who has her full name, about the possibility of her becoming Premier and those borders coming down? And Gladys Berejiklian then said at this time, oh, look, Deb and I have a wonderful working relationship. Sorry, uh, the member for Nanango and I have a wonderful working relationship. We're in touch with each other all the time. It was rather cute. It was rather affectionate. And she goes on, she goes, so I know if she was elected Premier, and this point is talking about uh, the member for Nanango, she would definitely open up the border. And this is the important part, she would have done it months ago. Because that's the way the Deb and the LNP are up there. That's the way Deb and the LNP are up there. So we know, we know now because the Premier of New South Wales outed it.
We saw constantly the weakness of the former leader of the opposition going on Sky and saying one thing up there and then trying to say another thing for the for people of Queensland. Well, it seems, Madam Deputy, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this, continued, this has been continued by the Leader of the Opposition, the member for Broadwater. Recently, when he was asked, are you ruling out cuts? He said, I'm ruling out being savage. Well, there's a long way to go before you go to the member's definition of savage cuts. And I, I, I looked this up, I looked up a thesaurus and I thought, there's a lot of words around the definition of savage. I, and I found out there's barbaric, barbaric cuts. They are not ruled out, and he could have in his speech ruled out barbaric cuts by the member for Broadwater. Brutal cuts, that's also in the thesaurus, they're not ruled out. Harsh cuts, well, those are loved by the member for Broadcourt. Vicious cuts, well, that's what he's all about. So in trying to impress his mates on Sky, he's really let the cat out of the bag. He won't tell Queenslanders, but he will tell Sky News. There will be cuts, they will be barbaric, they will be brutal, crude, fierce, harsh and vicious. Queenslanders know now cuts are what define the LNP because the member for Broadwater has told us so. Now, one of the things that unfortunately they've spoken about is, of course, our securing the future of the Queensland Titles Office and taking it out of their hands, their privatising hands, by putting it into the, uh, the, the debt reduction fund. And we need to know uh, that they've now entered into a QAnon styles conspiracy about the valuation. Of course, this was completely transparent. We know that, and we know that. Order, members. Order. Order, member for Budrum. We know, of course, that members of the committee will not engage in this QAnon style uh, conspiracy because they know they were told at the committee hearing by the Under Treasurer that in relation to the valuations, there would be developed by independent valuers on due diligence based on Treasury and QIC. The final and values will be informed by the independent advisers of the Queensland Treasury in the QIC. They will include, obviously, the earnings duration, the calculation undertaken. There are a number of valuations that will go into the final valuation. So those of us Water on the members. And I had hoped the shadow treasurer who should be following the committee should have absolutely known about that discussion. But of course, they're going into their little conspiracy theories. And who would be involved in this conspiracy theory? Well, the allegation from those on the committee, if they, if they do deem to say this, but certainly the member, uh, the shadow treasurer, the member for Toowoomba South, uh, he seems to say that there's a conspiracy between PwC, uh, EY, that's uh, Ernst & Young, they used to be called, I think, and um, uh, BIS Oxford Economics, Deloitte's, Allen's, Lineker's, Link, Laters, PwC, and, and again EY. So um, the Deputy Treasurer, of course, challenged it to go out and say that Tom Seymour, the, CW, the CEO of PwC Queensland, was involved in this little conspiracy that they allege. But of course, they will not say that because this is simple, simply and silly politics. Now, we also need to note that. We talked, a lot, we talked a lot about individual Queenslander stories and names. We need to recognise, though, that one of the great and heartening things is, and the Premier says this, there is nothing that gives Queenslanders greater dignity than having a job. And we have reduced our unemployment down to 5.4 per cent, and in the last month the greatest uh, fall in unemployment of any of the states in Queensland. Um, it's the biggest monthly drop across the country. Now, what's behind that, though, is all of those names. Um, names of individual people who are in the 86,400 people, all of those families, all of those households, they're all genuine Queenslanders who were nervous during the uh, pandemic and they wanted the support of government to go on and do things. We also know that uh, at this point, usually there's, and they know what I'm gonna say here, so there's normally a call out about Scott Morrison for this. Is no one's gonna venture into that? Well, well, they shouldn't because we know, of course, that Scott Morrison has failed his own home state in New South Wales because New South Wales has 33,000 less jobs before the pandemic. So unless you're alleging that somehow, not just PwC and Ernst and & Young and uh, Allens, the other conspirators are the very Prime Minister who is conspiring for Queensland against New South Wales. Madam Deputy, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have serious challenges ahead of us serious challenges to do with the health of Queenslanders, serious challenges about continuing to grow unemployment as thousands of Southerners flock to our states. We will continue to fight for these challenges. We have strong uh, records. We have a strong budget that backs Queenslanders. 
Um, but we won't do it with all of these silly theories that do not actually face the reality of the situation we face. I, um, I, uh, at budget time, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's usually a, there's a voice we won't hear this budget. Um, And, uh, and we'll miss that voice, and I endorse the bill to the House. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Madriba. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise today to offer a response to the government's 2021-2022 budget. Those on the benches opposite have exclaimed that this budget is a typical Labor budget. And right they are, Mr Deputy Speaker. This is a typical Labor budget. And I say that because it is a budget which has more holes than you can poke a stick at. A budget which on the surface might sound all right, but once you look beyond the glossy brochure, Mr Deputy Speaker, you begin to wonder where is the money. A typical Labor budget indeed. Mr Deputy Speaker, there are line items in this budget which have no allocations against them. It beggars belief. In his budget speech, the Treasurer was quick to make a billion-dollar promise here, a $2 billion promise there. But when you look in the budget paper, there's nothing. Not a cent allocated to some of the funds he mentioned. The Opposition has highlighted this yesterday, and we will continue to do so. Those on this side of the House will back sensible and honest measures, and that is a fact. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, what we will not do is stand idly by and let those opposite get away with sneaky accounting and empty words. Mr Deputy Speaker, members in this chamber understand my passion and desire to improve health care here in Queensland. Every last Queenslander to a man, woman and child deserves quality health care. Our incredible doctors, nurses and paramedics and all our other amazing clinicians strive every day to make that a reality. Their tireless and selfless work is truly remarkable, and I commend them all for it. It's a tough but rewarding job. And as a registered nurse myself, I know what it's like on the front line. What we are in this place cannot and should not do is make their job, already tough job, any tougher. That should not happen, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I fear that it is. With no vision to end the crisis which has beset Queensland Health, this budget leaves Queenslanders wanting. When it comes to empty words and empty promises, there is no more obvious example in this budget than a $2 billion hospital building fund. Mr Deputy Speaker, so flimsy is the hospital building fund that it's not even given a line item. That's right, the $2 billion hospital building fund, the centrepiece of the Labor Party's health policy, is not even given a line in the government's own budget documents. How can that be, Mr Deputy Speaker? How is that right? It is an empty promise, an empty line item, and it should leave every Queenslander feeling empty. This government's plan to improve our health crisis is truly an empty one. It is little wonder, then, that this government is losing control of our health system. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Opposition welcomes any effort made to increase capacity within our health care system. It is desperately needed. We know this, and it's what the experts tell us. But by the government's own admission under the non-existent hospital building fund, we won't see further commitments until 2024-2025. Mr Deputy Speaker, we need a solution to this problem now. It's not a problem for tomorrow, next month, next year or in four years' time. This is a problem right now. Queensland Health is in crisis right now. The government is losing control of the public health system right now. We need a solution to this problem and, sadly, with this budget, I don't believe we have it. Mr Deputy Speaker, where is the vision? Where is the genuine plan to fix the crisis? I said this yesterday, and it's incumbent on those governing a state jurisdiction to effectively resource and manage a health care system. Because, after all, one of the core functions of a state government is to run our public hospitals. Those opposite are the only ones in this chamber who hold the position to fix the mess. The budget offered a perfect opportunity to do so. But instead of getting on with the job, they are only interested in blaming others. They blamed the Commonwealth, they blamed elderly patients, and they blamed honest Queenslanders for showing up to emergency departments, and it's now time to hold a mirror up because this is what it would reflect. It would show that ambulance ramping across the state is the highest in a generation. It's at 40 per cent. Even in the darkest days of the Bligh government, the number never climbed that high. In fact, it is now 10 per cent more. 
The reflection would also show we have an elective surgery waiting list of 55,000 people. That number has increased by nearly 25,000 Queenslanders in six years. And of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, let us not forget the waiting list for the waiting list. There are 220,000 people languishing there. Mr Deputy Speaker, that is what those opposite would see if they were brave enough to own up to their own problems. Sadly, it's not a record to be proud of, and it's a record that I fear will only worsen in the months and years ahead. Mr Deputy Speaker, Queenslanders ought to be able to see these numbers. They should know how long it takes to be seen when they arrive by ambulance at a hospital. They should know how many people are waiting to have surgery. They should know how our emergency departments are performing. And it's important that this information be open and transparent. After all, these figures effectively take the temperature of how our public health system is performing. But those opposite are now refusing to release that information. Most of the data available on the government's own website is from 2020. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've already referenced the statewide ambulance ramping figures today, the figure of 40 per cent. The people behind that number have spoken up. These Queenslanders depend on our paramedics to arrive promptly to an emergency in their hour of need. But at the moment, through no fault of their own, our paramedics are stuck on the hospital ramps waiting to offload patients. It's happening because our system is being mismanaged. Compared to data from around the country from February, which was the last time Queensland's ramping figures were released, we sit last. 40 per cent is as bad as it gets. Mr Deputy Speaker, remember that number is higher at some of our hospitals, which are most under the pump. These are from, there are now six hospitals across our state which have ramping numbers of 50 per cent or higher. That means at some of these facilities, Queenslanders are more likely to wait on an ambulance stretcher for longer than clinically recommended than they aren't, and that is a frightening realisation. Whilst it might be lost on those opposite, it isn't lost by the clinical fraternity. We know today that the AMAQ called a secret crisis meeting last night to address the ramping issue. Mr Deputy Speaker, I will not speak for them, but to me that sounds like some of our most trusted doctors across the state are not confident that those opposite can fix the ramping crisis. In fact, the AMAQ called this ramping conundrum a vicious cycle of crisis upon crisis. I could not think of a more apt description. Mr Deputy Speaker, some hospital and health services across Queensland are budgeted to receive less funding this coming financial year than, than what they spent on this one. Take the Gold Coast HHS, for instance. Speaker, this financial year, the HHS spent $1.82 billion in providing health services for Gold Coasters. This coming financial year, Labor has budgeted $1.77 billion. We're expecting them to do more with less. Earlier this year, the Auditor General identified that 11 of the state's 16 HHSs recorded an operating loss last year. When the state is handing out less to some HHSs than they spent last year, how could the minister possibly expect that these local health services to improve their financial positions? My concern is that this government is setting up some of our HHSs to fail, but right now, more than ever, we need these organisations to work. Together with this, Mr Deputy Speaker, some of our HHSs are also budgeted for a reduction in staff. Central Queensland HHS, Children's Health Queensland HHS, Metro South HHS and Torres and Cape HHS are all staring down the barrel of less staff. That means less hands on deck for those who deliver care. Metro South HHS and Central Queensland HHS can ill afford that. Some of their ramping figures are the worst in the state at the likes of Logan and Ipswich hospitals. And of course, Rockhampton Base Hospital is ground zero for regional ramping. 49 per cent of patients are ramped there. Mr Deputy Speaker, the LNP does, have, does and has made some responsible and meaningful suggestions to improve our public hospital system. Our plan to make emergency room data available to the public in real time, improve and better resource triaging practices in our ED departments and to be honest and open about bed resourcing in our hospitals are sensible suggestions. Mr Deputy Speaker, access to good health care shouldn't just be about those in our major centres. Regardless of your postcard Queens, postcode, Queensland deserves quality care. We want to ensure that where it's practicable, practicable and safe, our doctors and nurses in the bush should be better equipped to treat people locally. They should be better equipped so that they're able to care for the patients in their local communities and ease pressure on our larger hospitals in major centres. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, we know what a record health budget means to Queenslanders under Labor. Those opposite can't hide behind those three words, record health budget, any longer. Those words are meaningless. They are meaningless to Queenslanders whose grandmothers had a fall, or whose fathers had a stroke, or whose daughter is having an asthma attack. Queenslanders are realising that their health outcomes are being compromised by a mismanaged system, and Queenslanders won't stand for it. Labor is losing control of our public health system, and this budget does nothing to stop the crisis from further unfolding. Mr Deputy Speaker, when it comes to the government's election commitments, we will hold the government to account for each and every promise and on behalf of every community which they impact. And that includes mine, the best electorate in Queensland. But once again, the residents of Mudjabar have been left behind by Labor, and I'm furious. As a community, we've been working together as we recover from the worst of the pandemic. Our residents have put in an incredible effort doing the right thing so our lives can return to normal. But it's still been a tough year for many in my electorate, with many businesses impacted by the on-again, off-again lockdowns throughout the country. Families remain separated, including my own, with inconsistencies over travel and quarantine exemptions continuing for many who are facing difficult times with their loved ones. We support following the health advice, but we also support transparency and openness about the decisions. But Labor continues the spin and trickery. This year's budget again was re-announcements and rebadging. There's really nothing new for Mudjabar. Mr Deputy Speaker, let me take take the House through some of the projects much of our locals fought for but missed out on again in Labor's budget. We missed out on vital funding to keep My Community Legal afloat in Rabina. My Community Legal provides free legal advice to those who cannot afford a lawyer, including some of our most vulnerable residents, women and children fleeing domestic violence, families at risk of becoming homeless. My Community Legal does so much for our community, but they don't receive funding from the state government to deliver these important services. Mr Deputy Speaker, we also missed out on more female changing facilities for grassroots sports clubs. They've tried to pull the wool over our eyes with a re-announcement of the Rabina Raptors Rugby League Club female change rooms. But let me tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, not one nail has been hammered. As we know, the sports rort scandal exposed the heinous truth about Labor's funding for sports clubs in Queensland. If you're not in a Labor electorate, you're not worth it. Don't worry, I will keep fighting for the sporting clubs of Mudjabar to get their fair share. It's 2021. Female players deserve the same facilities as the blokes. For all their words, there's not much action from those opposite when it comes to equity and participation. Mr Deputy Speaker, luckily we aren't holding our breath waiting for the train at Merrimack. Yes, there's a station promise, which was promised two elections ago, but no timeline or details about the process. We need better public transport to take pressure off our roads. And speaking of which, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've missed out again on so many vital road infrastructure projects in this budget of smoke and mirrors. I'm fighting for road improvements for safety's sake in my electorate. We need vital intersection upgrades at Mudjabar and Tallow Roads. We need signals at the Gooding Drive roundabout to stop the accidents and keep people safe. We need $1.5 million to raise the Austinville Causeway so more drivers aren't swept off the roads in floods and communities remain connected in times of natural disasters. And we need proper upgrades to Wurrungaree Road and other main thoroughfares, not just the patchwork of potholes repairs that locals struggle with. While I'm talking about safety, let's talk about combating the scourge of hooning. I can't tell you how often I've written to the minister and his department pleading for CCTV cameras in hooning hotspots um, in Wurrungaree, Gilston and Talli. If we have this investment in infrastructure, our hard-working police officers will have a chance of catching and locking up these offenders. It also, I'll also keep fighting for the future of our community, our children. I'm thrilled that the Numabar Valley State School and the Mudjabar Special School, which does such wonderful work with our very special cohort of students, will get $6 million for new classrooms, but we need so much more. Our community desperately needs a new state high school west of the M1. Enrolments at our local schools are booming. Local high schools are reaching capacity and there's no scope for any future development. Local families want to stay in the area from prep to um, to finishing for their final exams. Labor likes to talk big about tourism and the environment. There's nothing to boost those things in Mudjabar in this budget. We desperately need better signage for tourists at Springbrook. We need better facilities and parking so that more people can explore our fabulous hinterland. But we need the funds to protect the World Heritage listed wilderness and the green spaces closer to the communities. Years ago, the Mudjabar Creek was a thriving ecosystem and where it was possible to spot platypus. We need the government to fund the reinvigoration of Mudjabar Creek so that locals and wildlife can enjoy the area once again. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to put on record my determination to keep fighting for Mudjabar so the residents can have the roads, schools and education they deserve. Deputy Speaker. I call the uh, member for Townsville. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I rise today to support the Palaszczuk Government's 2021-22 state budget. This budget will help us to continue to del deliver our plan for economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, and the resource sector will continue to play a key component of this moving forward. Already in the past 12 months, we've seen how important this traditional industry is to Queensland, and it's been able to continue operating and keep thousands of people in jobs through the global pandemic. The resource sector is incredibly important for all of Queensland, but particularly so in regional places like Townsville, and I'm proud of which I'm proud to represent. Mr Deputy Speaker, as our government has said since the beginning of this pandemic, we will continue to invest in Queensland's traditional strengths, such as resource sector, to help us come back stronger from this pandemic. In this budget, more than $42 million will be invested into Queensland resource sector and lands programs as part of the 2021-22 state budget. Deputy Speaker, this latest budget will allow Queensland to continue its resource-led recovery through exploration grants, initiatives and mine rehab programs. These initiatives are critical to making sure our exploration and resource sector remains strong and we continue to drive new discoveries as we transition to a low carbon economy. The resource sector has continued operating during the COVID-19 pandemic, supporting, supporting 71,000 jobs. And Deputy Speaker, I'd like to take this time to again thank everyone in that resource sector, not one single case of COVID-19 in 71,000 jobs. As part of this strategy, the Palaszczuk government will continue to help explorers discover new economy minerals, which are crucial for renewable technologies such as electric vehicles and batteries. We do this with the $2.5 million towards collaborative exploration initiative grants and a further $2.2 million to facilitate the development and expansion of the new economy minerals industry. Exploration investment is critical to find those new deposits and developing potential new projects, which means more royalties, more exports and more jobs for Queenslanders. The latest statistics from ABS show that exploration in Queensland is up 22.5 per cent to $705 million in 12 months. Investment in exploration today is what will lead the next generation of projects, which is why this budget is backing the sector. Deputy Speaker, there's even more opportunities for the resource sector to grow with the announcement of the $2 billion Queensland Renewable Energy and Hydrogen Jobs Fund as part of this budget. You can't have a renewables industry without a strong resource industry, and Queensland has a real opportunity to take advantage of this moving forward, thanks to the world-class Northwest Minerals Province. There is a world-class minerals um, deposit at our doorstep, which the world will increasingly look towards in the future. Minerals like vanadium, cobalt, copper and rare earth elements will be in demand, and, and that's why we're investing $13.8 million in our New Economy of Minerals initiative to help explorers discover the new economy of minerals and future jobs across North Queensland. In this budget, we'll invest $15.5 million to address rehab of abandoned mines across Queensland. This package will include continued management of the Link Energy site. On this site, 50 wells have been identified as high priority for decommissioning due to the associated contamination risks. I'm pleased to report to the House that this work is already underway, and in the coming year, this funding will be focusing on those wells. Another priority site is the abandoned Collingwood tin mine, which is disclaimed in 2015. Given its location in the wet tropics World Heritage Area and the Great Barrier Reef catchment, my department will be focusing on decommissioning the tailing stand. Additional works include site works in the abandoned Wolfram Creek mine and make safe works associated with historic mine shafts in the Atherton Tablelands. The state budget also delivered for our gas industry. The state budget delivered $222 million investment in the publicly owned clean energy operator Cleanco. This included $24.6 million to develop the Kogan North gas field in a joint venture with Arrow Energy. Gas will play an increasingly critical role in our energy mix as we move towards this government's commitment to net zero emissions by 2050. With Cleanco investing in additional gas supply, this will also assist Queensland's push to deliver our commitment of 50 per cent renewable energy target by 2030. 
This commitment builds on our already announced $5 million Bowen Basin gas pipeline feasibility study. Deputy Speaker, I'm also proud that this government is leading the development of the Queensland Resource Industry Development Plan. Work is already underway on the plan, and having attended multiple workshops across regional Queensland, this is going to be a great success. As I said earlier, the resource sector will continue to be a key part of Queensland's economic recovery plan from COVID-19, which is why the Palaszczuk government will continue to back it with real investment. Deputy Speaker, in this budget, another $1 million will be invested to continue strategic programs that improve and restore rangelands, soil and vegetation catchments throughout the Queensland Natural Resource Investment Program. Also, as part of the Natural Resource Investment Program, a further $500,000 will explore ways to improve partnerships and innovative ways to deliver grants program. Additionally, my department will be investing $7.7 million to continue protection of the Great Barrier Reef as part of the $270 million uh, uh, reef water quality program being led by Minister Scanlon. This investment is in, in addition to the $400 million already invested into the reef by the Palaszczuk Government. And Deputy Speaker, we must not forget that 65 per cent of Queensland is still affected by drought and we'll need to do all we can to have our drought affected farmers wherever we can. That's why we'll be delivering $3.2 million in land rent rebates for landholders in drought declared areas. In addition to the rebate, drought declared landholders will be granted a hardship deferral for required rent payments. Deputy Speaker, through this budget, the Palaszczuk Government is doing what it can to help keep businesses working, people employed and their resources going strong. Deputy Speaker, through this budget, the Palaszczuk Government is doing what it can to help keep businesses operating and thriving, people employed and our resource sector going strong, particularly in Townsville. But it's not just the resource sector that will benefit from this budget. In Townsville, we're continuing to back job creating projects with millions of dollars being invested into the city. Essential infrastructure in North Queensland, like the $193 million channel upgrade at the Port of Townsville, is incredibly important. This will position our city well into the future and will also support our growing resource sector, which Townsville is a key part of. Deputy Speaker, yourself has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Mr Deputy Speaker, call the member for Mermaid Beach. Mr Deputy Speaker, debt, 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 borrow, 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 promises, promises, promises. These are the hallmarks of another Labor debt-driven budget, another failed attempt by the Treasurer to look after Queenslanders' long-term interests and another cop-out from proper job-creating infrastructure spending by a government so addicted on sugar-hit sugar spending that it uses the COVID excuse to mask its profligate, voracious debt appetite condemning Queenslanders to a future of higher taxes and lower services. When borrowings are used to fund recurrent expenditure rather than long-term investments, you know the institution is in diabolical fiscal meltdown. This government has copped an estimated $4,000 million wage rise for the public service alone through the 7.5 per cent wage rise, and that is just the tip of the iceberg of their financial mismanagement of Queensland's finances. And the Treasurer is aware of his government's precarious financial position, and the last thing he wants is another ratings agency downgrade, as his predecessor, Andrew Fraser, infamously achieved. For the political damage, obviously, it would do to his leadership ambitions. And I am sure after his conversations with the rating agencies, who would have nominated a figure that would avoid a ratings agency downgrade in relation to the government's debt position, that is how he came up with the fairy tale valuation of the titles registry at firstly four point two billion three weeks ago and now seven point eight billion shifted in a pea and thimble trick off the government's debt ledger to enhance this deceitful Labor government's debt position. The Economics and Governance Committee was advised that the debt reduction bill passed three weeks ago would save 9 per cent of the government's balance sheet. So I assume that $7.8 billion will save 16.65 per cent of the government's debt ratio, which conveniently will dodge a ratings agency downgrade. 
No one of any financial capacities believes the Treasurer's assurances to the House of Statements made by different financial observers because the Treasurer is hiding the valuation of the titles registry from public scrutiny. If the Treasurer won't release the valuation under spurious protection reasoning, then it is obvious he has something to hide. This phony, dodgy, hidden valuation is proof this government will say anything, do anything and dream up any trickery to hide the real financial position of Queensland's taxpayers to the great detriment of our children and our children's children's future. I do not know how this Treasurer sleeps at night knowing he is deliberately deceiving the people of Queensland and with the grinning straight face with which he delivered this false reality budget gives testament to the character of the man who aspires to be Premier of Queensland. Either his incompetency leads him to actually believe this fairy tale valuation of an asset that can never be sold to prove its real worth, or he is deliberately deluding himself to save at all costs his private political ambition. No one wants a Premier who oversaw a fiscal downgrade for Queensland while he was in the position of Treasurer. And if this dodgy accounting pra practice was not the highlight of this underwhelming Queensland budget, the sad admission that there will be a $4 billion decrease over forward estimates of the government infrastructure spend tells you that this government is comfortable spending debt borrowings on recurrent expenditure and it probably won't be long before they'll have to borrow to pay the interest bill. Borrowing for infrastructure spend is a reasonable strategy for governments to follow, given that good infrastructure will be shared by future generations who will share in the repayment of the cost of that infrastructure. However, increasing borrowings and decreasing infrastructure spend is a flashing red light warning that the entity is engaging in this fiscally irresponsible activity and is actually under heavy financial pressure and but for the side shuffle titles registry fairy tale trick, I'm certain the rating agencies would have forced to lower the government's credit rating, which would have meant an added interest cost to the Queensland taxpayer because of this Treasurer's mismanagement. And moving on to local issues, in the extremely important part of the state that is the fabulous Gold Coast City, I note there is nothing, diddly squat, zero in the budget for the upgrade and expansion of the Gold Coast Convention Centre. Obviously, the state-owned facility is an icon of Gold Coast tourism, and Blind Freddy could tell you that conventions and conferences are an integral part of any tourism recovery package. This was a golden opportunity to put a, uh, a tourism recovery on the Gold Coast front and centre, but not even one dollar for a study, a talk fest, a business case or whatever the Labor Party is famous for to ensure this much needed facility is very much on the agenda for the Gold Coast tourism recovery. And uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, when one reflects on the lost opportunity by the Palaszczuk Labor government while pursuing the so-called global tourism hub of collecting $100 million from the Star Casino for an upgrade of the Gold Coast Convention Centre, which they manage in return, for a 20-year moratorium on any further casinos on the Gold Coast, it makes a laughing stock of their decision makers over this lost opportunity when the global tourism hub was only ever a pie-in-the-sky Labor thought bubble. There is no need now for Star to require an exclusivity deal as there is no new, new casino operator threat on the horizon and probably will not be one for the next 20 years anyway. And speaking of Star Casino, they are forging ahead very successfully with their real estate development on the tiny island. Eventually, when all five high-rises uh, are completed, you'll get that real Hong Kong feeling uh, by just visiting Star on the Gold Coast, as well as saving on an airfare to Hong Kong. Instead of a ferry ride to Macau, you can just walk downstairs to the Star Casino to get a bet on. Again, the Goldie has it all. And I tried to find the three million the state government, I am told by the Gold Coast City Council, has committed 
for its half share of the Gold Coast Oceanway project for the first stage from surface paradise to broad beach with no luck. This is a sacrificial infrastructure project through the sand dunes and much heralded sand grasses of Gold Coast City beaches, and one would question the logic of concreting a four metre path over our magnificent Gold Coast beaches, knowing that perhaps this Christmas or the next, it will be washed away in a big storm. I hear the cries of many that would like this infrastructure to ride their bike on, push their pram on, or generally not get their Nike shoes dirty on the beach sand. However, it is, a respon it is responsible governments who should resist these Christmas wish calls to Santa in the name of responsible spending of ratepayers and taxpayers' money. The beach is a beautiful place to walk, and other pathways that aren't sacrificial infrastructure are better placed to provide mobility access. I understand many folk are rallying against this project through legal avenues, and I wish them well in their endeavours. For the umpteenth time, I'm calling on the government to fast track the alternative M1 connector, as daily I see congestion growing on the M1 to the point of gridlock, and I fear that before too long, any minor accident occurring on the M1 will shut down the main arterial between Australia's third largest city, Brisbane, and Australia's sixth largest city, the Gold Coast. The Gold Coast is bigger than Tasmania already, and that could be shut down for hours and days in the years ahead. The prevarication over the start of the alternative M1 reminds me greatly of the 1994 recognition by the Goss Labor government of the need to upgrade the then four-lane highway by the provision of an alternative route. As the then boss of the AWU, Big Billy Ludwig, told me that instead of the Labor government doing a $2 million study on whether it was needed or not, you could have asked any mum with a child in the back seat of a car stuck in the gridlock traffic and you would have got the correct answer. Bring back Big Bill Ludwig, I say, for some common sense to apply to this out-of-touch, left-wing, loony Labor government. On another note, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order, members. I see, there, Order. I see there is $113 million allocated this financial year for the start of light rail stage three, which is 85 per cent in my patch of Mermaid Beach. Already the cries of despair are reverberating Nobby Beach. Over two 12-storey high-rises proposed to accommodate more passengers for the light rail. As I have said on numerous occasions before, the light rail is predominantly a development enabler, with increased densities already being utilised along earlier stages. The Department of Transport facts are that a maximum 7.7 per cent of commuters will use public transport, which means 92.3 per cent of commuters around the light rail will use a car. With the increased high-rise density associated with beachside living, it means an enormous increase in traffic and parking problems in the suburbs around the light rail, while there is only one north-south highway, being the Gold Coast Highway, in what is a totally linear city. The light rail as, a public, as public transport would be a great addition if it was only used for improving public transport accessibility but is being used as a Trojan horse for high-rise development along the light rail beachfront route, and it will only lead to further gridlock on the Gold Coast Highway as the 15,000 people a year moving into high-rises on the Gold Coast along the light rail passageway. Parking will be a nightmare around those beachside suburbs, with two and three cars owned by tenants in the high-rise units rented out for investment. And again, I say the light rail is a good public transport acquisition if it is used for the current densities. However, it is fool's gold if it is used as is previously used by state and local government as a development enabler. On the subject of the light rail three, I cannot believe the federal Morrison government stumped up another $126 million for the project 
to address outrageous union-backed labour payment claims that the project's private operators weren't prepared to pay. When will the federal government learn they get no credit for bankrolling this out-of-funds Labor state government projects and the kudos will remain fairly and squarely with the Palaszczuk Labor government? If they want proof of my assertions, just take a look at the Townsville football stadium where they bailed out the state Labor government, half the cost of the stadium, and see how popular that has made Premier Palaszczuk as opposed to the business whiz kid and fail politician Malcolm Turnbull. There you'll find the real political benefit in bailing out a Labor state government with federal cash and the lesson to be learned is stay out of state responsibilities. Another issue I'd like to raise, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the commitment by the government, which I congratulate them on, and the $41 million to the upgrade of the uh, annex in the parliamentary precinct. Uh, this is a matter that uh, was raised in statements last year, and the, matter of, uh, the manager of opposition uh, uh, highlighted the fact the building was actually falling apart. And uh, to the government's credit, even though the Treasurer of the day uh, was adamant that it wasn't money well spent, has actually agreed to put $41 million into uh, the uh, upgrading of the parliamentary precinct before it actually falls down. So I congratulate the government on taking that decision and, uh, uh, and I look forward to that uh, taking effect for the betterment of the parliamentary services and staff living in this uh, dinosaur of the, uh, I think, the 70s era uh, and uh, upgrade here to today's facilities. And, Mr Speaker, with your indulgence, uh, and on, an, on a concluding note, uh, may I also add my deepest sympathy to the family of uh, Duncan Pegg today, as I know there will be many speakers to the House's recognition of Duncan's service at a later date. I serve with Duncan on the portfolio committees and he was what could be best described by the ultimate compliment, a good bloke. Perhaps, Mr Deputy Speaker, a legacy parliamentary program named after Duncan Pegg might be fitting recognition of a life well lived and a parliamentary career well served. Speaker. Thank you for that. I call the member for Bancroft. Speaker, I rise to, um, to speak in favour of the appropriation bills and in, and, uh, and, uh, in favour of the budget we have before us. When I sat here earlier today, I listened to the opposition leader's contribution. I didn't hear him mention COVID-19 once. Not once. He mentioned vaccines 31 minutes in. I may have missed it, but not once did he talk about COVID-19. Now, over 20 minutes in, he mentioned the Olympics uh, very briefly regarding transport. So my question there is, how can you talk for nearly an hour on a budget and not mention the two biggest impacts on future budgets in Queensland, COVID-19 and the Olympics? Beggars belief. And if you want to talk about how we grow the economy through growing productivity, you've got to talk about these two things that are affecting how we cast our budget. It's absolutely crucial. I'm a bit staggered by those oversights there, but perhaps I shouldn't be so surprised. What didn't surprise me is when they used the words trickery and confusion, um, which was for code for me for saying, we don't understand this budget stuff. So we'd say, um, that, is a sh that is a shame, but once again, but once again, Oh, if I explained it to you, I'd have to speak very Order, slowly. members, and you put your comments through the chair, please, member. Okay. A little words, thank you, uh, member. Uh, speaker, the question is, what is their policy? Um, and what we're seeing at the moment is their policy that they're bringing forward to the people is telling them they are victims. They're not giving people hope. They're appealing to their fear. And that is how the LNP harvests votes time after time, and that's harvesting votes through fears, amplifying fears. Now, to all these people whose stories they have harvested, can I say to you, with greatest respect, the LNP will not help you. They will use you and they will drop you. And I've seen that in my area when child safety stories came up. If they ever get into power, I would say to them, things will drastically get worse. Your problems will certainly not improve. 
Now, Speaker, what we've heard in the budget reply speech from the opposition leader is any problem that they mentioned, I found it very hard not to interject and say, we're on to it, we're already solving it, there is already a solution on the way. Like, for example, that one policy that they did mention, that they did come up with, they, they do have a policy now, which let's give them kudos to that, that is good, uh, the Social Entrepreneur Loan Scheme. But uh, problem, we've already got a so Social on Enterprise Jobs Fund. We've already got one. The applications are already open for it. Uh, I'm worried that they didn't do their homework on this. Not only that, we've got skilling Queenslanders for work. $431 million has been spent on Queensland, uh, in Queensland since 2015 on this program. And that money can go to social enterprises to train people and to get people into work and to training. That money can go to social enterprises. And I know in my area as well that the um, that a, uh, a Deception Bay Community Youth Programs has used some of that funding to support and create a social enterprise that trains people as well. Really, this is our only policy, uh, and it really is a clangor. Oh, uh, hang on, no, there is another one, of course, I nearly forgot, the Parliamentary Budget Office. And I tell you what, I've got a job for them there. Let's analyse their Bradfield scheme. How about that for a first job for the Parliamentary <laughs> Office there? Oh, that would keep them busy for at least a day or two. And after that, we can go the Bruce Highway one. Wow, that's, 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 a great, that's a great job for the Parliamentary Budget Office. And, and um, I'll also, um, if we, the, the member for Jordan who talked yesterday about the LNP promised to build a Springfield hospital. But when they got down to it, when we saw the letter, it was a promise to get a briefing on possibly doing a hospital. I would love to see that go to the Parliamentary Budget Office as well. Um, so what I, I spent an hour of my life um, listening to this today, as we all did there, and I'm not illuminated too much more about what is going on in Queensland. But what is very clear is that the ALP has taken the mantle as the better economic managers in Queensland. It is absolutely true. Our growth predicted to reach 3.25%, 337,000 jobs since we came to office, 32,000 jobs uh, since, uh, in the last month, and an unemployment rate that will be down to about 5.4 per cent. Speaker, I've said all I need to uh, say. I commend this bill and the budget to the House. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Coomera. Mr. Speaker, I rise to, uh, for the budget in reply speech, but firstly um, to the sad loss of the member for Stretton, Duncan Pegg, Peggy, as he was uh, known by uh, all and sundry. My condolences to his family and his community. He will be missed, uh, but he will live on in the hearts uh, of those who knew him and indeed loved him. Mr Deputy Speaker, we've had some successes with all of the lobbying that's been going on over the last uh, several years, 12 years indeed, that I've been the member. We've uh, constantly pushed hard to get the services for the Northern Gold Coast, Exit 54, was one that we managed to get over the line funding-wise and planning-wise uh, whilst we were in government, and then, of course, uh, it was uh, delivered uh, to the Northern Gold Coast, which then saw the uh, Coomera Town Centre built and a massive amount of additional growth uh, in and around that area. Uh, but those other positives that we've had, education is one of those. Um, uh, I mean, and and. Uh, as I have always said many times in this House and right around my community, um, Education Queensland is doing and has always done in all of the time that I have been in this role an excellent job when it comes to delivering for the education needs of the Northern Gold Coast. They recognise that we have um, a, the fastest growing region in Queensland and indeed uh, one of the uh, uh, very up-to-date measures for uh, establishing that as the cornerstone, fastest growing region, is the enrolment figures that are updated on a very regular basis, indeed monthly. Um, the Coomera electorate, uh, as at the 28th of the 5th, 2021, just uh, uh, three weeks ago, uh, 47,240 voters in the state seat of Coomera, 28.55 per cent above the average uh, number, and indeed it is the fastest growing. Um, uh, number of voters in any electorate in, in the state, uh, and all of those 
all of those electorates that surround it are in fact around the average or slightly below the average. So uh, I'll table that for the uh, benefit of uh, members um, so they can have a bit of a look through just to see how fast things are going. Uh, but on the education front, I do have to say, uh, although we've been doing a fantastic job, we have missed one small school out of the equation, uh, one lovely little small school, as a matter of fact, and I would have hoped that the member for Logan, who shares, uh, whose, whose uh, electorate shares the, um, uh, the, the students uh, for the school, Cedar Creek, uh, and so too, I, I note, the, uh, the member for Scenic Rim also has uh, students going to Cedar Creek. And what a lovely little school it is. 270, Order, member for Logan. 270, 275 students there. Uh, it's a great place, of part of the world. Uh, but with some of the work that has been done by Education Queensland in covering in undercrofts and what have you, we now no longer have a waterproof area for the students uh, to meet, for the families to meet. Uh, so what I would ask, and I did ask this at the last, in, in the last budget, um, if we could see some funding for Albert Hall to enclose Albert Hall, probably run in at around 300,000, 350,000, certainly far less than it costs to build a new, uh, a new school hall um, in some of the other faster growing or bigger, bigger schools around the area. And I, I note um, the minister mentioned uh, she can't believe she's still building school halls. Well, Little Cedar Creek uh, State School uh, has missed out and it deserves to be uh, given some serious consideration to having Albert Hall uh, built in. Uh, now, police and emergency services, once again, we've had a win there. We've got the fire and emergency services station now at uh, Pimpama. Uh, we've got a full crew there, 19. Uh, 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 19 crew, uh, and that gives us a full 24-hour, seven-day-a-week um, service to the, uh, 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 to the area. And of course, the big win for us uh, is the Pimpama Police Station, which is now being fast-tracked and will be completed sometime late this year, weather permitting. And uh, the biggest win of all, 36 additional police uh, to, uh, for the Northern Gold Coast, without any impact on any of the stations around it, 36 additional police for the Northern Gold Coast. It's been hard fought for, uh, and I thank Katarina Carroll for her foresight in delivering that station within six weeks of, of coming into the role, uh, and, uh, and then just recently announcing those additional police for us. Uh, transport and main roads, on the other hand, unfortunately, uh, well, we've got, some, we've got some issues. The government is, is fast and loose with the truth, in, uh, is, is a term I've often heard used by others um, and, uh, about the Labor government, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, in a case in point is the second M1, which is years away, uh, colleagues, years away. Uh, my question to the Premier the other, the other morning, uh, on Tuesday morning, was fobbed off. I asked the Premier uh, when we would be driving on the second M1. Uh, her response, oh, we've, we're going to start building it this year. That wasn't the question. We want to know when it, it will be available for us to, to drive. But here are the figures from QTRIP. Construction timelines for the Coomera to Narang stretch is about eight years. And where do I get that from? $115 million being spent in 2021-22, $250 million 22-23. Then in the next two years after that, $507 million. This is all 50-50 with the federal government, by the way, Mr Speaker. 507 million by 2025, we'll have spent that, and then the balance of the money uh, from 2026 onwards, 628 million. It's about an eight-year timeline as a minimum just to build that 16 kilometres. That doesn't go anywhere near the northern uh, part of the second M1, uh, and, and you know the point being there that it, it does get worse. The stretch from Logan home in the north to Coomera to connect up with the stretch that's about to start, which is stage one of stage one. There's three stages in stage one. I can't quite work out how they get to that, but there's three stages in stage one. But to build that by the Olympic Games, we're going to have to get moving. What have we got committed over the next four years for the stretch between Coomera and Logan home? $11 million. 
$11 million, nothing. and nothing out past the forward estimates. So unless something magical happens uh, in the not too distant future, we are not going to see the second M1 built by 2032. So um, we've got plenty to do in that space. Uh, the rest of the transport and main roads uh, area, uh, we've got uh, the fast tracking of Pimpama railway station is desperately needed. Um, I met with the, um, with the people from uh, uh, the uh, Cross River Rail uh, just uh, last week, in fact, uh, to have a talk to them about that. They gave me a bit of a rundown. I pointed out all of those stats that I spoke, to, spoke about earlier. The Pimpama Railway Station needs to be built faster than the delivery of the Cross River Rail. That's not being delivered until 2025. Fastest growing region in Queensland, centred on Pimpama, needs to have that train station uh, built faster. We could start construction early uh, next year, I would suggest, after the planning has been completed and deliver it by the end of 2022. We need to fast track the upgrade to exit 49 as well. Once again, we're not seeing anything uh, as far as delivery is concerned for that particular project until 2024 at the early, earliest. Uh, funding for the upgrade for exit 38. Now, there's been a business case in place since 2018. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the, the, even the figures were indicated uh, as something in the order of $81 million or $87 million. Don't hold me to that. But certainly not a cracker. Not a cracker. Been, business case has been in place for Exit 38 since 2018, and there's not one dollar in this budget for the upgrade of Exit 38. Uh, funding for the full upgrade of Exit 45. We've got $10 million from the government to upgrade uh, Exit 45. Somehow they, they convinced um, uh, the federal government to give them $10 million for a slip lane. Uh, don't know, ask me what you're going to spend $20 million on for a slip lane coming off the M1 heading south, because that just sounds over the top. But we need full funding in the order of $130 million to duplicate Exit 45. Uh, more buses between Beanley and Ormo. I was hoping to see that. The, State, uh, sorry, the uh, Gold Coast City Council have committed $11 million over the next four years for 50 per cent of the cost to run more buses between Beanley and Ormo Station, more buses between Ormo and Coomera Station uh, with more repetition and also more bus routes, but also uh, more buses or a, or a new bus service out to Jacobs Well. But unfortunately, I can't find anything in the budget papers to uh, provide support uh, for that 50 per cent funding from the Gold Coast City Council. There's $11 million needs to be put on the table uh, by, the, uh, by the state to make that a reality. Uh, another one here is the Police Citizens Youth Club. We've been trying now for up to seven years to try and get some funding happening for the Police Citizens Youth Club in Pimpama. Um, we have full support um, from the local community. We've got uh, a coalition of the willing, if you like, in that regard. The only people that aren't on board is the uh, state government. I've put petitions in. I've been knocked back on two occasions in relation to providing funding. I'm going to write to the minister and, please, and ask for please give consideration. Fastest growing region, highest number of youth, uh, youngest, youngest population in the state, 30.2 uh, uh, years is the average age. Uh, in the electorate, uh, 42 per cent of our population is under 25 years of age, which just happens to fit in with the P PCYC target age group, uh, and indeed uh, something like 27.5-28 per cent of our population is under 15 years of age, desperately needed uh, in that regard. Uh, education, uh, the commitment to Albert Hall I have mentioned a, a moment ago. Uh, health, $10 million is what we need for a master plan. Uh, promised by this government $3 million. Well, this, we're $7 million short there, but the thing I can't understand is it's not in the budget papers. We can't find it anywhere in the budget papers. We need $10 million for the master plan. But then we need a commitment. When are we going to build it? It's not a matter of just saying, OK, well, let's put $10 million in, let's do some planning. We're talking about a significant funding uh, requirement here. I hear that uh, we've, we've see, we see a, uh, 174 beds, 177 million, or is it the other way around, uh, beds for Springfield, and good on you in that regard. But we don't ha even have a private hospital in the northern Gold Coast. Fastest growing region in Queensland doesn't even have a private hospital, let alone um, 
any consideration in the shorter term or short to medium term for a, uh, for a hospital. So let's get one of those PPPs going, public-private partnership. Let's get something happening more quickly for the Northern Gold Coast as far as the education needs of the Northern Gold Coast are concerned. So I've got a wish list here that I'm going to actually table for, once again for the benefit uh, of, uh, of all members, uh, that construction of the northern section of, um, of the M1 needs to be seriously considered. $11 million just doesn't cut it. And by the way, that $11 million isn't just this year. That's over the next, that's over the forward estimates. The $11 million is being divided over the, over the forward estimates. So it's not like it's, um, it's there and available um, to review again uh, in six months' time. Uh, the fast tracking and duplication of Exit 49, as I said, uh, the fund, uh, funding the upgrades and duplication of Exit 38, which I'll give in detail on, uh, Exit 45. I mean, it is absolutely mad. It is it's absolute madness that we can't see an upgrade to Exit th uh, th 45, uh, given the massive amount of, of traffic congestion that we have. It goes for kilometres long, in every direction, every morning and every afternoon. Um, I, and may I say, I, one thing that I haven't mentioned in regard to the health uh, area is the ambulance station that's now being, being committed to be built uh, in the wrong place. We need an ambulance station in Ormo. We need an ambulance station in Ormo, no doubt about that, but don't build it in the wrong place. It's being built in the wrong place. It's being built on the corner of an industrial estate, nowhere near the M1. All of those roads that lead from where that ambulance station is finish up congested, heavily congested every morning and every afternoon. So it's the craziest place to build it. The people from uh, the ambulance, the, the people from, um, uh, from the ambulance, when they gave me the brief, briefing on it, explained to me that TMR told them that they had no land available on the uh, M1 corridor to give them any, uh, to give them any um, uh, respite, if you like, in relation to a piece of a piece of land. That's ludicrous. The M1 is owned by the state government and there's land on both sides of it in every which way. So fast tracking of the Pimpama station, uh, 10 million for the, full, uh, for, the, for the master plan for the hospital, commence construction, make some commitment there, the PCYC, the bus services uh, that we need, desperately need, between Beanley and Ormo, partly funded, 50 per cent funded by the local, uh, local council, Gold Coast City Council, uh, Ormo to uh, Pimpama and, of course, out to Jacobs Well, desperately needed once again for the Jacobs Well uh, community. And let's not forget, let's just remind everybody, the Albert Hall at Cedar Creek State School, that needs to be done sooner rather than later. Thank you. Deputy Speaker. I call the Minister for Agriculture, Industry Development. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the appropriations bills in the 2021-22 uh, state budget. Deputy Speaker, 2020 was a year like no other. The COVID-19 global pandemic wreaked havoc on all aspects of our way of life. But the pandemic isn't over, as we all know. That message has been especially clear in the last few weeks with the recent COVID-19 outbreak in Victoria. While the vaccine rollout continues, there is much uncertainty about what lies ahead for Queenslanders. That is why the budget hand down this week by the Treasury is so important. It provides more certainty in uncertain times. Deputy Speaker, the state budget shows the Palaszczuk Labor government's unwavering commitment to regional Queensland. Renewed investment into the Bruce Highway, joint funding on the inland uh, freight route between Charters Towers and New South Wales, 61 per cent, 61 per cent of our 14.7 billion capital program next financial year will be spent in the regions of Queensland. Strategic investments in skills, with more than seven million for agricultural training centres in TAFE, in Toowoomba, Bundaberg, Cannonvale and Bowen. Seventy million for local water suppliers through the Building Our Regions Fund. These investments look well beyond the headlines of today to make a meaningful difference to our future economy and our future capabilities. Speak, Deputy Speaker, compare that to the opposition. They say they're the party of the bush. Their track record speaks for itself, but their time on the government benches saw widespread cuts to the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. More, more than 600 positions, Deputy Speaker, were cut. The people of Queensland Bush were bushwhacked by the LNP, and they are never, ever forgotten. Deputy Speaker, I see the scientists have discovered recently dinosaur bones at Aramanga. 
and they're really the bones that have been left over of the Nationals, the party that used to stand up for the bush, Deputy Speaker. And Deputy Speaker, Deputy Speaker, those dinosaurs, dinos some dinosaurs are still there opposite. Deputy Speaker, the Queensland knows Labor is the true party for the bush. After all, after all, Bark Holden, well, Barky, as most of us on this side know it as, is the birthplace of the Australian Labor Party. It's the birthplace of the Australian Labor Party. Working for and backing the people of the bush is in our DNA. And I'm pleased they've finally woken up, De Deputy Speaker. And the Palaszczuk government is a proud record investment in... Member for Maryborough. Order. Pause the clock. Order for Member for Maryborough. Member for Gregory. CC quarrelling. Thank Minister. you, Deputy Speaker, for the protection. And the Palaszczuk government was, has a proud record of investing in the portfolio of agriculture, industry, development and fisheries and rural communities. A $523 million budget of my portfolio, another half a billion dollars allocated for agriculture and fisheries, the third in a row by this Palaszczuk government, Deputy Speaker. I note that already the Ag Force President, Georgie Somerset, a great advocate and good friend of the Palaszczuk government, has welcomed our commitment to improving, expanding and reforming our drought support program. I also want to acknowledge a very close friend of mine, Will Wilson, Ag Force Cattle Board President. He has also acknowledged how closely this government works with industry to grow our agriculture sector. It's little wonder that when I travel the kilometres and kilometres throughout the regions through this magnificent state, I've called Ferner the farmer's friend, oh, Deputy Speaker. Right. And when it comes to jobs, when it comes to regional jobs in Queensland and for the agriculture industry, this budget delivers in spades. Deputy Speaker, this government will deliver a fourth round of our rural economic development grants. Red grants after, uh, offer uh, co-contribution grants to ag agribusinesses projects to strengthen primary production sectors and bolster our rural communities. In the three rounds so far, we've backed 45 businesses, the length and breadth of this great state, and that's created 1,800 jobs in the, in the regions, meaningful jobs in, the, in our regions. Businesses like Mardo's Mangoes in Bowen created 62 jobs with their expansion that allows them to measure the maturity of each fruit, ensuring each mango set in market is at its peak. Kenilworth Dairies is another Red Grants uh, recipient and agribusiness success. The Palaszczuk government backed them to establish their own bottling plant, and in the process, another 24 jobs has been created, which the member for Nicklin is very supportive of. It's clear that egg businesses want this scheme to continue, and that's why we'll deliver another round to create at least 600 jobs across Queensland. Speaker, the Palaszczuk government is to live in spades on my electorate in Fernie Grove since 2015. From minor works to major transformation infrastructure projects, this government continues to invest in my electorate. I'm pleased to confirm the government's investment in the future of Fernie Grove will continue. $9.76 million will be invested in schools across the electorate for new construction and refurbishment. This investment in our future generation is giving our kids the best chance to grow and learn in quality schools. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, I conclude with uh, recommending that my remaining speech be incorporated, as it has been uh, provided and approved by the Deputy Speaker, but I and I also seek to have it incorporated. Uh, Order, members. Pause the clock, please. Member for Gregory, you're warned. Attorney General, you're not far off it. Um, De Deputy Speaker, I must say I conclude and also uh, concur with the comments already made by other speakers about their comments on Peggy. Peggy's a very close friend of mine. He has missed this budget, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. Thank you, Minister. And uh, in accordance with uh, standing orders, and I note your speech has been reviewed by the Speaker's Office for incorporation, and uh, thank you for indicating it's to be incorporated. I call the member for Mogul. Deputy Speaker, um, I rise to address the appropriation bills for 2021-2022. Uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk uh, State Labor Government's budget for 2021-2022 is a budget that is uh, deep in deception and one that is full of trickery. Deputy Speaker, Labor's budget relies on what can only be described as some very uh, ambitious assumptions, not to mention uh, dubious accounting. Deputy Speaker, important uh, fiscal uh, principles have been abandoned by the current Labor Treasurer, the member for Woodridge. Further, Deputy Speaker, Labor's current Treasurer has exhibited perhaps, perhaps the best example of Labonomics that our state has ever seen after accepting 
the state titles registry could now be valued at nearly $8 billion, which is almost double what it was valued at a year ago, not to mention the fact that the Labor government appeared to indicate that it was worth $4.2 billion just two weeks ago. Deputy Speaker, only Labor could deliver a state budget in which there are building and investment funds without funding. Deputy Speaker, a so-called $2 billion hospitals building fund, a $1 billion housing investment fund, a $300 million parts of treaty fund and a $500 million carbon reduction investment fund. All these announced so-called funds, Deputy Speaker, and yet not a single dollar has been allocated by Labor in this state budget. Deputy Speaker, after more than six years, the Palaszczuk State Labor government has failed to learn any lessons from its own economic mismanagement uh, and incompetence, as the state budget for 2021-2022 uh, has revealed yet again. This year's state budget, Deputy Speaker, continues the long tradition of Labonomics under this state Labor government, that is, using voodoo economics coupled with the blatant attempt of smoke and mirrors as a means of distracting Queenslanders from years of Labor's gross economic failings and trying to pretend that Labor has a sound economic plan. Deputy Speaker, despite the tricks and despite the spin, the Liberal National Party does not forget. And as with every previous Labor state government and the current Labor budget that has been handed down this week, the Liberal National Party will continue to remind all Queenslanders of Labor's track record of failing to deliver, and the Liberal National Party will again show that Labor can't be trusted to manage our finances and our economy. Under Labor, transparency and accountability with Queensland's budgetary processes has been sorely lacking, and that is why the Liberal National Party has announced our plan to introduce a new parliamentary budget office to provide independent budget costings available to all parties, and I join with the Leader of the Opposition and call on the State Labor Government to implement this office before the next election. Deputy Speaker, Labor's track record with Queensland uh, state budgets has seen $3.4 billion raided from the entitlements of Queensland public servants and billions of dollars withheld from public servant superannuation. It is a track record that shamefully now means that Queensland's defined benefits fund for our public servants is, in fact, technically insolvent. Labor's track record is also one which includes the loading of billions of dollars of debt onto our state's government's own corporations and power companies to the point that they have now been placed in financial jeopardy, given the sheer weight of debt that has been loaded onto them by the state Labor government. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk state Labor government's track record can be described as one of constant failure and missed opportunities. And sadly, Deputy Speaker, with Labor's 2021-2022 state budget, the missed opportunities for our state of Queensland will be felt nowhere more harshly than my own electorate of Mogul and across the western suburbs of Brisbane. Clayfield. Deputy Speaker, and I take the interjection from the member for Clayfield, it will also be felt in the, uh, in the state seat of, Clay, of Clayfield. Deputy Speaker, in the lead up uh, to this year's state budget, just as I have continued to do so since I was first elected as the uh, local state member for Mogul, I have made it absolutely clear that the Palaszczuk State Labor government must deliver the critical infrastructure and services uh, that residents uh, of the electorate of Mogul deserve. Despite my voluminous uh, correspondence to Labor state ministers and their departments, uh, various meetings as well as countless speeches and questions in the Queensland Parliament, the Labor state government has failed to act. The many services and key infrastructure requirements for my local community that Labor has failed to deliver include an integrated road and public transport plan with funded solutions to ease traffic congestion and improve public and active transport services. Labor has failed to provide an extension of the 444 bus service to the Mogul District Sports Park, and Labor has failed to increase public transport service timetables and extend public transport routes to service residents of Anstead, Corona Downs and Mount Crosby. Labor has failed again to fund a new school hall at Kenmore State High School, as well as other key capital projects for this important high school. Labor has abandoned families in Corona Downs, Mount Crosby, Carolee and surrounding suburbs by failing to deliver a desperately needed new high school. Labor again has failed to fully fund school infrastructure for every local state school in the electorate of Mogul according to their school uh, strategic infrastructure plans. Mr Speaker, specifically at Chapel Hill State School, four additional classrooms are needed at the beginning of 2022, and the school also has multiple demountable classrooms that need a long-term and permanent solution. Local community organisations have again been let down by this Labor government after Labor failed to provide a new community and neighbourhood centre to support the vital work of local community and not-for-profit organisations, including the Kenmore Bridge Club, Shed West Men's Shed and E-Waste Connection. Residents will have to wait even longer for enhanced footpath and pedestrian infrastructure along Mogul Road and Mount Crosby Road, including key pedestrian travel points through Pullenvale, Pajara Hills, Mount Crosby and a dedicated footpath to the Mogul District Sports Park with no specific funding allocated by the Palaszczuk State Labor Government. 
Similarly, Mr Speaker, despite constant pleas and even petitioning from local residents, Labor will not increase the vegetation uh, maintenance schedule to ensure overgrown weeds and other debris is uh, removed and that these uh, state roads are maintained to a high standard uh, in order to eliminate uh, serious safety and visibility uh, concerns. And sadly, Deputy Speaker, there is no dedicated new funding for local environment and creek catchment groups to support the ongoing and vitally important efforts to preserve, maintain and rehabilitate our local environment and creek catchments, including for the Mogul Creek Catchment Group, Pullen Pullens Catchment Group, the Hutt Environmental Community Association, Cubbola Wind Catchments Network and the Rural Environmental Planning Association. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the electorate of Mogul and the western suburbs of Brisbane have quite literally been uh, left off the map. Deputy Speaker, in both Labor's online map and in Labor's uh, glossy brochures, when local residents look at the Palaszczuk State Labor Government's uh, Regional Action Plan for Brisbane, they see not one a budget highlight or action item for a single suburb in the electorate of Mogul that will improve our roads and uh, public transport, enhance our schools or invest in our important uh, community groups, such as the disdain that the State Labor Government has for our local community. And with the one and only traffic and uh, transport item that is listed for the greater uh, western suburbs of Brisbane, the upgrade of the centenary uh, highway bridge, Labor has now pushed back vital funding into future years, and I note how disappointed the RACQ was with this sleight of hand, Deputy Speaker, uh, not to mention the fact that there is no new funding for the centenary highway and western fee freeway uh, from uh, Dara through to Tawong. And Deputy Speaker, uh, I table uh, a copy of the map uh, for the benefit of the House, which clearly shows uh, this lack of infrastructure spending. Of course, Deputy Speaker, just as the Palaszczuk uh, State Labor Government is content with providing nothing for local residents in the electoral model, they are similarly more than happy to impose a new uh, wheelie bin tax of at least $88 on every single household. Deputy Speaker, local residents simply cannot trust Labor, and local residents simply cannot afford Labor. Deputy Speaker, as the Liberal National Party Shadow Minister for Education, I now wish to turn to the $15.3 billion in funding that has been allocated in the 2021-2022 Queensland State Budget for Education in Queensland. Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk State Labor Government wants Queenslanders to believe that they should be given credit for handing down a record education budget. Well, Deputy Speaker, Labor is seeking accolades for merely doing its job. With an increasing population, coupled with substantial failings by Labor in delivering a world-class education system that all Queenslanders deserve, a significant spend on education is entirely needed to fix Labor's ongoing neglect of our state schools and associated school infrastructure. Even before this week's uh, state budget, Deputy Speaker, the last six months alone has been nothing short of a disgrace when it comes to the service delivery of education and school infrastructure in Queensland by the state Labor government. Deputy Speaker, our hard-working and dedicated principals, teachers and staff at state schools across Queensland are entrusted with ensuring the education of our youngest Queenslanders. Yet under the Palaszczuk State Labor Government, many of our principals and teachers are forced to endure workplaces that are harmful, unsafe and detrimental to their own health and well-being. And this is something I've heard from representatives of the Queensland Teachers Union and the Teachers Professional Association of Queensland. Deputy Speaker, it is simply a fact that when it comes to the provision of education in Queensland, Labor can't get the basics right. Critical and fundamental existing infrastructure has been neglected for far too long under Labor. It is an absolute fundamental human right and basic expectation that students and staff in our state schools can be provided access to clean and functioning bathroom facilities. What's more, Deputy Speaker, it should not have uh, taken the advocacy of important groups like the Isolated Children's Parents Association to highlight the absurd situation of private companies being used to literally truck in clean and usable drinking water for students and staff in our school communities in rural and regional Queensland. Deputy Speaker, I note that the Palaszczuk State Labor Government is desperately trying to convince Queenslanders and Queensland families that they are genuine about early childhood education. But, Deputy Speaker, those on the front line know that this is not the case. Deputy Speaker, I've been in constant contact with our early childhood education sector and they are dis disappointed. They are disappointed because despite the glossy brochures, despite the media releases and despite the spin, what they've seen from this state budget is nothing new by way of additional funding and certainly there is nothing in this budget that is comprehensive or targeted to address critical workforce issues in this sector. Deputy Speaker, this is once again another missed opportunity. It's a missed opportunity because if Labor were serious about early childhood education, they would genuinely work to improve the quality and number of early childhood educators. But Labor just doesn't care, and worse still, they just don't understand this. And Deputy Speaker, more broadly, we've seen the educational outcomes of students directly jeopardised with significant evidence that the Palaszczuk State Labor government has failed to deliver on their own commitments to improve teacher readiness in STEM subjects and provide crucial support to principals and teachers in STEM development. 
Deputy Speaker, it's a hallmark of the Palaszczuk State Labor Government and the current Labor Minister for Education to not be open, transparent and accountable with the parents, teachers and staff of our school communities in Queensland. Again, the last six months alone since the 2020-2021 Labor budget has seen a litany, a litany of failures from the Labor Government. We had 24,000 Year 12 students incorrectly advised that they were not eligible for an ATAR score, with the Minister going into hiding and taking no responsibility. Without warning, Labor scraped the year, scrapped the Year 12 outcomes reports, uh, a crucial resource for schools, parents and staff, and for further policy development and sound educational decision-making in Queensland. Queensland parents and state school communities have continued to grapple with school catchment allocations that are bursting at the seams and applied inconsistently. Similarly, schools in Queensland have had to cope with Labor's botched rollout of its air conditioning program, and with just 12 months to go to complete this rollout, the Liberal National Party will be watching to ensure that every single school receives its air conditioning on time and on budget. There are also significant public health safety matters related to the potential exposure and management of asbestos in our state schools. And in the western suburbs of Brisbane, Labor's consultation and implementation of a proposed new Brisbane Inner West Primary State School has been shambolic at best, with a location seemingly handpicked before any consultation with the local community and a consultation process that has had to be ex extended simply because Labor can't get the basics right. <coughs> Deputy Speaker, I'd also like to uh, take time to address Labor's allocation of funding in the health portfolio. Deputy Speaker, despite boasting of another record health budget, a simple reading of Labor's budget papers reveal that nothing meaningful will be done to fix the state Labor government's health crisis. Deputy Speaker, we continue to see code yellows across our public hospitals. We have 40 per cent of ambulances in Queensland being ramped. 55,000 Queenslanders are sitting on the elective uh, surgery wait list, with a further 220,000 uh, Queenslanders sitting on waiting list to get on the wait list. And I hear those members uh, interjecting opposite there, and I know that they are uh, disappointed with their own track record when it comes to health here in Queensland. Deputy Speaker, local residents continue to share with me their terrible experience of Labor's uh, management of Queensland health. Deputy Speaker, it's not just patients who are regularly calling and contacting me about the perilous state of our public hospital system under Labor. Uh, each and every week I have frontline health professionals contacting me, medical specialists, uh, general practitioners, visiting medical officers, uh, registrars, resident medical officers, nurses, uh, allied health professionals and ambulance officers about the problematic issues they are experiencing. Uh, and in a few weeks' time, Deputy Speaker, there will be the AMA Queensland's past presidents meeting. There's also the upcoming annual uh, Rural Doctors Association of Queensland conference, of which former uh, presidents of, of that particular association will be president. And I can tell you, Deputy Speaker, uh, one of the main topics will be the complete and utter lack of confidence that health and medical specialists have uh, in the ability of the Palaszczuk State Labor Government to manage and provide a well-functioning uh, health uh, and public hospital uh, system. And I hear the member, the member for Thurangau interjecting there, but he knows that his uh, former colleagues in the ambulance service are very unhappy with the performance of the, uh, of the Palaszczuk State Labor Government. Uh, Deputy Speaker, in my remaining time, I'd like to address the, uh, the arts portfolio. Uh, as the Liberal National Party Shadow Minister for the Arts, I note the Palaszczuk State Labor Government's announcement of $90 million in allocating funding for the arts sector. Uh, I note, Deputy Speaker, the inclusion of $7 million in funding to support the uh, sustainability of Queensland's live uh, music venues. And, Deputy Speaker, I must uh, say that on this front, the State Labor Government has been found absolutely wanting when it comes to supporting these venues and operators uh, when they needed it the most over the last 12 months. And Deputy Speaker, uh, we know what a debacle Labor's management of the night quarter on the Sunshine Coast has been, and uh, the Liberal National Party's uh, member for Kiwana, uh, who I acknowledge uh, here in the chamber, he um, certainly outlined all of the relevant circumstances uh, and Labor's complete debacle in managing uh, that circumstance uh, up there and also supporting uh, our live uh, music sector uh, here in Queensland. Uh, Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, Labor has recklessly abandoned local residents of the electorate of Mogul on the western uh, suburbs of Brisbane, uh, and local residents of the electorate of Mogul deserve better uh, than the current uh, Palaszczuk State Labor Government. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Nudgee. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak on the 2021-22 state budget, and I start by acknowledging the Treasurer for this, his second budget, and by thanking him, the Premier and my colleagues for the investments contained in this budget that will improve the lives of people in my electorate and across my portfolio that see some of the mo most vulnerable children, young people and families across Queensland. Deputy Speaker, can I also acknowledge Duncan Pegg, our colleague, like so many others have, 
Budget Week was always his favourite, and I know that we always enjoyed his contribution. He took particular pleasure in, um, in having a spa in the chamber with the member for Clayfield, and I'm sure the member will equally miss him this budget sitting, as we all do. So, Duncan, we think of you and your family at this time. Mm -hmm. Deputy Speaker, it's a budget with record investment in the areas that touch on the lives of nearly every Queenslander. This is a budget that puts Queenslanders first in health, in housing, in education, in small business, in skills, training and employment. This government is investing a record $22.2 billion into health services for extra frontline staff, new health infrastructure, cutting back waiting times for emergency and surgical services, and continuing the wonderful work that has been done in the past 18 months to protect Queensland from COVID-19. Our commitment also means thousands more nurses, hundreds more doctors, and again, hundreds more allied health professionals. Our record $15.3 billion investment in the education budget will deliver not just for our children, but for the tradies who will maintain and improve our schools and other education facilities. Ten new schools will be delivered for Queensland families and more than 4,100 jobs across the state. And it's not the first time that we've cracked the record in education funding, or the second time, or the third time. This is the seventh record investment in education under our government. As the Premier said on Tuesday, this budget is a down payment on Queensland's future. Deputy Speaker, we all know small business is the engine room of our state and a major employer. My electorate of Nudgee has a wealth of small businesses, and I know firsthand that our small business owners have been hit hard by the pandemic. They've told us what they need to continue their economic recovery, and we have listened. On the weekend, we launched the $140 million Big Plans for Small Business Strategy, which includes a business investment fund, $30 million to increase the skills and capacity of our small businesses and making the role of the Queensland Small Business Commissioner permanent. We're also investing more than $31 million to extend the 50 per cent payroll tax rebate for apprentices and trainees to June next year. Our state budget has allocated $460 million for job skills training and a program to help businesses hire the unemployed. That includes funding for our highly successful Skill in Queenslanders for Work program and our Back to Work program. And it was a great pleasure to have the Treasurer and the Minister out to announce those announcements in my electorate at Nudgee at the North Star Football Club. And it's at the grassroots level where I'm always proud to deliver, and that's in my wonderful electorate of Nudgee. For my community, education is the big ticket item, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to announce some great news for our schools. Earnshaw State College will receive $87,000 to upgrade the tuck shop. Boondal State School will receive $388,000 or $500,000 to increase their outside hours school care capacity while Virginia State School will receive ten of $150,000 to complete their new preppy playground. In addition to education, it is wonderful to see the Banyo train station accessibility upgrade I committed to at the election included in this budget with an allocation of $2.4 million. Deputy Speaker, in respect of my portfolio areas of children, youth justice and multicultural affairs, this year's budget recognises two of the most important jobs that our government has protecting the community and keeping vulnerable children safe. This year's budget continues to place a heavy focus on programs and services to keep children safe and to keep the community safe. The $1.86 billion budget for the Department of Children, Youth Justice and Multicultural Affairs represents increased funding across all three of my portfolio responsibilities and includes an extra 154 frontline child safety workers, an additional $282.6 million for out-of-home care, a new 10-bed residential drug and alcohol rehabilitation facility for young people in partnership with the Knopf's Foundation, $5 million to establish a short-term remand centre, $5.7 million for a business case to investigate additional long-term youth detention capacity, and $2 million annually for the Asylum Seeker and Refugee Assistance Program to continue providing the basic necessities of food and housing as well as other support services for asylum seekers and temporary production visa, uh, protection sorry, visa holders. Because, Deputy Speaker, we will always invest in our frontline workers across child safety and youth justice. We will always invest in the programs, services and infrastructure needed to reduce offending and reoffending to keep our community safe. And we will always champion a Queensland that is united, harmonious and inclusive. 
Deputy Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Thank you, Minister. And, uh, having had the review by the Speaker's office and indicating it be incorporated, that will be so. Member for Hill. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I rise to make a contribution to the 2021-22 budget. But before I do, Mr. Speaker, like others before me, I wish to note that there is one person that will be missing from the debate, and I wish to extend my deepest condolences to family and friends of Duncan Pegg. Mr. Speaker, I admired his humility and the way he conducted himself during his times as an MP, and there's no doubt he will be sorely missed. Mr. Speaker, in speaking to the budget, while the budget on surface appears to have all the bells and whistles and promises of big spending and jobs, particularly in regional Queensland, it is lacking in detail. There is also confusion with the statement that 61 per cent of the $14.7 billion capital program will be spent in regional Queensland. Because, Mr Speaker, those living in Mount Isa, Atherton or Ingham certainly wouldn't classify the Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast and Logan as regional regional centres. The true regional Queensland spend is 40 per cent, with 60 per cent uh, being spent in Brisbane and the South East Corner, which won't surprise regional Queenslanders. Mr Speaker, when I was elected in 2004, there was a lot of excitement that the Galilee Basin would be opened up, and I had most of the Galilee Basin in my electorate. Seventeen years later, still nothing. And there was a perception that coal would be exported right across the world. However, I note in the budget that coal royalties will increase to boost the Queensland economy. And just imagine, Mr Speaker, of the massive return if the government owned and built the railway track in the Galilee Basin. But what happened, Mr Speaker? There's still no railway track. And the Bly government sold the coal component of Queensland Rail. So that's $1.7 billion, $8 billion a year that could have been coming back in, you know, as revenue for Queensland. If we build the railway track in the Galilee, Mr Speaker, there's another 2 or $3 billion in royalties, but there's also all the money that we're receiving through transport haul haulages, Mr Speaker. And, and Mr Speaker, that's good budget economy. Mr Speaker, <clears throat> there's also lack of vision when it comes to nation-building projects, whereas um, with the North Johnson transfer, nothing in, in the budget. U10 Road, Mr Speaker, nothing in the budget. Big Rocks Weir, nothing in the budget. Hells Gate, nothing in the budget. Hield an irrigation uh, project, um, nothing, Mr Speaker. And this is what um, raises, builds economy, Mr Speaker, creates jobs. And if we cast our minds back when we remember the construction of the Burdekin Dam, at that time we had the October stock market crash and Australia was struggling, but, Queensland, but North Queensland was thriving because we just finished the construction of the Burdekin Dam. Mr Speaker, also funding to the Utan Road allows access for road trains to open up the cattle industry and improve provisions of supply and reduce costs to the Cape, inlands and Gulf regions. Trucks would also bypass the Athen and Tablelands, reduce wear on tear on the road and also, Mr Speaker, you know, a boost to our local economy. But I want to say, Mr Speaker, there are some bright spot, um, spots that my electorate would um, express appreciation. 11.5 million to the Melander State High School for classroom expansion and infrastructure to the high school. And Mr Speaker, that um, school has been growing the last five years, and it's great to see and now a wrap to know that uh, they're going to um, receive expansion to their classrooms to cater for all the students. 500,000 for the Atherton State High School, 100,000 to the Atherton State School, and Mr Speaker, 524,000 to the Melanda State School to enclose the uh, um, covered basketball port, uh, court. This is good news because they have assemblies in the rain, Mr Speaker. Um, so this will uh, provide the assemb uh, um, assemblies, the parades, the opportunity for sports activities. This is really, really good news for Melanda State Primary School. Yeah. We've got 200,000 for the Innisfail, Innisfail State School. And Mr Speaker, I've been working with this school as well, the Gundy State School. Uh, they've received half a million dollar, dollars uh, in funding to upgrade um, their classrooms. And they're over the moon because $500,000 of damage was imputed upon that school as a result of crime early last year. So they're still getting over that but it's great to see that there's $500,000 that that's going to that school. Um, Mr Speaker, 
The good news is that stage one of the Atherton Hospital upgrade is completed. Stage two is underway with the total investment of $80 million. And Mr Speaker, the other day I ran into electricians that were from Bender uh, up there, um, you know, going through stage two, fixing stage two. Uh, employees from the Atherton Concreting, um, 30 of them, Mr Speaker. They've got jobs as a result of the construction of that stage two part of the, uh, the hospital. Local decorators and plus it will improve health um, care for that region. So that is, is, is good news. I note also there is $40 million has been allocated to the hospital parking project in the state. Um, I do look forward to progress uh, with the upgrade of the Innisfail um, Hospital. This has been going on for years, Mr Speaker. I can't walk down the street without the elderly come up and say that the biggest hassle they have now is not about the hospital, it's trying to get into the hospital. They have to walk uphill, you know, 300 metres. And how can you do that when you're sick and frail, Mr. Speaker? So, we want to continue those discussions with the minister and work with, likewise, council. We've made some uh, progress and even tabled a petition in, in parliament. We really want to get there with this, Mr. Speaker. Also, uh, while we're talking about the parking, uh, I will continue to push for funding for car parking, lighting, and facilities upgrades to the Castor Park um, at uh, Marinian. Uh, near, in, near Innisfail. Castor Park has become a hub for soccer throughout the region. And, Mr Speaker, when you say that hub, if you want to get to a soccer game, Mr Speaker, you can't get a car park. And uh, that is definitely needs to be a priority so that all those parents and kids and all that can get there to be active and play their sports, uh, Mr Speaker. And that's definitely something we'll be uh, pushing for. Mr Speaker, $4.2 million to upgrade the Korea Hydro Power Station. I think this is good news uh, in regards to hydro power. Uh, but good news too, Mr Speaker, is because where the Korea Hydro Power Station is based, uh, only 400 metres from there was where I was brought up as a kid at the Carson Village. And um, so I know that uh, <coughs> that means a lot to uh, the people in that region, but also to myself. And well done for that funding. Um, it has been positive. <laughs> in some way of funding for roads, upgrades and my electorate, uh, with roads that are finishing and starting. And uh, you know, Henrietta Creek hasn't finished, has just finished, Mr Speaker. And the great news about this is that local contractors were given the contract, uh, not, not southerners that wouldn't have a clue about the weather conditions up there that do a cheap job. In that same area, Mr Speaker, Henrietta Creek, three times, it, it, three times it had to be done over the last four years, is because they do come, come there, they do a quick fix, and then you have to come back and do it again. So I fought three times to get the funding for that. And, but it's good news, we've got local contractors, and uh, it's a solid surface. It's held up very, very well. Um, Mr Speaker, also the seven million of funding to con for construction of the East Faluga intersection. That had been lobbied for years, Mr Speaker. And uh, this is good news because there's been a number of young deaths at that intersection and uh, families are, are reduced and it hasn't started. It's just starting, Mr Speaker, just starting. Um, still very little funding has been provided to the Innisfail Japoon Silkwood Road section. And that section, Mr Speaker, and we've got a bit for the Innisfail Wayne Gann section, that is great news. But that road um, is home to Paranella Park. It's the biggest tourist attraction in Queensland. So if you're trying to get to the biggest tourist attraction in Queensland, you're driving on a pathetic, dangerous road, Mr Speaker. And in that same spot, we'll be celebrating on Saturday um, the uh, Mina Creek State School centenary. So hear these words, um, Innisfail Japoon Super Road urgently needs upgraded. Um, and funded, Mr Speaker, and the biggest tourist attraction in Queensland. Mr Speaker, I <coughs> want to say here, building our region program it's, it is a great initiative, initiative, and I welcome the additional $70 million investment, uh, which will take the total investment to $418,000 uh, towards local government infrastructure uh, uh, funds. And uh, I really believe that this is a good thing. And, and my region has had a few wins in regards to this building our region. Uh, so I believe it's going to be a win-win for council, particularly projects uh, that are desperately needed and uh, can be provided and supported from state government, but initiated by local community groups, local sporting groups, state MPs, and um, also working with council and with the state government on this. So this is good news. 
Mr Speaker, before I finish, I would like to talk about social housing, health, waste levy and youth detention. $1.9 billion has been allocated to social housing. Only 14 per cent of this is being delivered this year to build social housing dwelling with the balance spread over a four-year period. Mr Speaker, we are already beyond desperate stages in regional Queensland with long wait lifts and families on the street. We cannot wait four years for the delivery of more accommodation. I urge the Minister to bring forward expenditure to deliver more emergency transitional and long-term housing to our fellow Queenslanders who are struggling. Des Mr Speaker, despite the announcement of big spending on health, the reality is regional Queensland we are losing our medical services. We have experienced long wait lifts, severe lack of um, dialysis treatment, and people have to travel long distance to get either dialysis or even a doctor's grip. Overall, I can't see anything in this budget that will help improve health services in regional Queensland and stop the loss of medical services. Mr Speaker, only $34 million per year over the five years has been budgeted for palliative care. Mr Speaker, this is a disgrace. It is far short of the $275 million yearly required by which Palliative Care Queensland and the AMA Queensland insist is required to meet basic care and protect our most vulnerable in our society. I have to question and wonder why the government is ignoring this advice and is drastically underfunding palliative care over the next five years. Mr Speaker, I also note the Treasurer talked about successful introduction of the state waste levy uh, legislation in 2020. I doubt he would find anyone who agrees with him outside the South East Corner. This might have stopped the interstate trucks using southern Queensland as a dumping ground. However, in the north of the state, which it doesn't affect, it is a ridiculous piece of legislation which has done nothing but increase the cost of struggling businesses and local councils, which is passed on to the ratepayers. I, already, I know of one recycling business in my electorate who are at the point of closing their business because of legislation and others are just holding on. Mr Speaker, I note that the government has again ignored funding towards youth relocation sentencing and continues to pour millions of dollars into youth detention centres. Youth detention is not working as we see everyday juvenile crime reports in the media. And according to the government, youth justice strategies own figures, it costs $1,500 per youth per day in detention. That's 1,500 youth per day in detention. Relocation sentencing could be delivered at a fraction of the cost and will actually reform repeat offenders. Mr Speaker, I wanted to bring this to the attention of the House. Deputy Speaker. Member for Redlands. Deputy Speaker, I rise proudly in this House today to support the 2021-2022 Palaszczuk government budget. It's a budget that Duncan, proud, uh, Duncan Pegg would have been extraordinarily proud of. Um, I know that I will miss hearing his contribution. He'll be deeply missed in this parliament and he'll be deeply missed within his community of Stretton. This is another great budget for Queensland and it's another great budget for Redlanders. In fact, Deputy Speaker, it is a record budget for our rec Redlands coast. Deputy Speaker, I've said it before and I'll say it again, a measure of success in this place is determined by the legacy ultimately left behind for our communities today and for those of the future, and that's what this budget does for my Redlands community. I really hope that our um, Redlands City Council LNP Mayor and the Federal um, LNP Member for Bowman and the Leader of the Opposition are listening and paying attention when I take them through what this means for my Redlands electorate, particularly given some of the disappointing commentary, but not surprising commentary, um, over the past few days um, from, from our Mayor in particular, um, a Facebook post yesterday. As I said, it's disappointing but not surprising um, given her, her recently new membership to the LNP and, and um, her potential to be the candidate for the federal seat of Bowman. What she put out yesterday was the same old LNP rhetoric. So it, if a picture paints a thousand words for her, let me show you um, a picture that paints the millions of dollars of investment um, across our Redlands coast, and I'll table that um, for the benefit, for the bened benefit um, of the mayor and, and for the benefit of the House. Please table a member and stop using it as a prop. 
I'll, put, I'll also put our government's $130 million plus investment this year in Redlands Coast Roads next to the Council's year-on-year -year diminishing annual roads budget any day of the week. Um, I'll, also, I'll also put our capital investment um, into the Redlands region side by side. Um, the federal government and, and, the, and the local council. In Redland Bay alone, our new state primary school and new satellite hospital alone, somewhere in the vicinity of $100 million plus, is a significant contribution. Um, I'll also table for the benefit um, of the House the member for Bowman's um, budget flyer that came out last week. Um, I'll table, for the, I'll table it for the House and, and I'll also table it for my community to just to, to demonstrate how little there was in that federal budget for our Redlands community. In fact, you go pretty close to saying zip, zero, nada and nothing. And qu quite frankly, it's extraordinarily disappointing that the Mayor has said nothing about the fact that the federal government are committing nothing in infrastructure for our Redlands community. It has absolutely been silence. It's been crickets. But again, as I said, no surprises there. Um, so I really do hope that they're listening. Our strong health response to COVID has meant that economically we are bouncing back better than anywhere else in the country, in fact anywhere else better in the, in the world. And, and as we've heard on this side of the House today, there's been little heard from those on the other side of the House about the impact of COVID-19 on, on our state, on our country and what we've seen around the world and what that means in a budgetary sense. Like, it, it's quite astounding that that seems to have been totally overlooked. This budget means a lot for Redlanders and it means a lot for future growth. We're thinking we have a vision and we have a plan for that future growth in our region. As the Premier says, our best days ahead and this budget is positioning us for the, for the needs of today and the needs of tomorrow. Our Chamber of Commerce also says that Redlands Coast has a bright future ahead. So here goes with some of the highlights. Um, in jobs and economic opportunity, great news today with the unemployment at 5.4 per cent, less than before COVID-19. And that speaks to what our Palaszczuk government is delivering for all Queenslanders. It's supported by programs like our Regional Jobs Committee that we've got on our Redlands Coast being um, conducted by our Chamber of Commerce. The Skilling Queenslanders for Work program is absolutely incredible. Um, it's a signature piece of this government. I have spoken about it endlessly in this place. It continues to deliver for my community and will continue to deliver into the future. We're investing in you know, big, business, uh, big plans for small business. We're investing in renewables and hydrogen. $71 million for the film and screen. And that's also looking at how we develop that industry and look at post-production. So fantastic news on jobs and economic opportunity. In roads and infrastructure, we continue to invest in Cleveland Redland Bay Road, a project that was, that was not going to be looked at by the LNP government until 2024. So this is fantastic news for my community in the roads. Beanley Redland Bay Road, the Eastern Transit Way, a new $1.3 million business case to look at the planning work for the Redland sub-arterial um, road from Mount Gravatt, Capalba Road to Tingalpa Creek, an important arterial out heading out of the Redlands. We've also got um, our $37.1 million Southern Morton Bay Island Ferry Terminals in partnership with Redland City Council. Again, another fantastic job that's, uh, project that's creating jobs in my local community, um, like Aluminium Marine, that will be helping deliver that infrastructure. An absolute bonanza in education, record funding um, a, a, across that area, air conditioning and solar, KindyLink Q program for my island communities, um, $1.9 million in shovel-ready projects for Maclay Island, Russell Island, Victoria Point State, Primary, Victoria Point High and Redland Bay State School, Redlands District Special School, $9 million, a new learning precinct for Victoria Point High School, $8.6 million, and a brand new state school for Redland Bay, around about $60 million, so huge. In the hospital space, $50 million in a car park, now seven levels, $83 million for Redlands Hospital Stage 1 expansion, new ICU and beds. You know, our government is about backing in health services and making sure that we deliver for our communities. There is so much more, Deputy Speaker, um, that I could talk about. The list goes on and on. Again, I want to highlight um, for my Redlands community that I will continue to be tenacious and unwavering in delivering for Redlanders. Um, as I said, our Chamber said, a bright future ahead. I know there will always be more to do and I will continue to work hard every day on behalf of my amazing community. Deputy Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation and as such I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the records of proceedings. Thank you, for Member for Redlands for indicating your speech has been reviewed for incorporation and uh, in accordance with standing orders, I'm sure it will be, it shall be. Member for Gregory. Mr Deputy Speaker, in a week of widespread fogs across Queensland, I bet one of the foggiest places to be was the media budget lock-up on Tuesday. And trapped in the fog were those poor journalists trying to make sense of Labor's budget. As In Queensland reported, 
This year's budget papers have changed so much it is difficult to compare years, let alone compare Queensland to other states. You can't see what is new money and what are recycled announcements. You can't see where the money previously allocated has been fully expended. Despite being designed to confuse, the Treasurer's budget certainly finished with a theatrical flourish, a surprise surplus just in time for the next election. Of course, the fog lifts and the Treasurer's fog clears. Journalists have started to see an awful lot of ducks have to line up for that slim surplus to happen. For instance, in a state famous for its extreme weather events, we need to have three consecutive years of good, calm weather. I don't think any grazier or farmer would take that bet. And we can't have any serious COVID-19 outbreaks, lockdowns or border closures. No one controls this as long as there is a single country that hasn't achieved full vaccination. That is a long way off for the foreseeable future. COVID-19 will continue to circulate around the globe, mutating from time to time. We will be living with the coronavirus for some years yet. The surplus miracle we will need is for the Labor government to restrain its spending in a way that doesn't affect growth but achieves the Treasurer's targets. Sadly for us, the Courier-Mail reports this morning that only, the only year the Palaszczuk government has achieved this was last year when everyone was periodically locked down or restricted. The return to surplus is not just a surprise, it's a fairy tale. The surplus wasn't even the most surprising aspect of the budget. That would be the magic beanstalk school of accounting that found the value of the Queensland Titles Office to be a whopping $7.8 billion. When I write my report to my constituents this week, they'll be very surprised because they already know that the last sitting week it was only valued at $4.2 billion. I had pointed uh, out this itself. It was a surprise because New South Wales has a bigger economy and its titles registry is only valued at $2.86 billion. The new valuation of nearly $8 billion will really knock their socks off. If you look at the value of the companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, the humble Queensland Titles Office now ranks safely in the top 50 biggest companies in Australia. Using the figure, the Queensland Government has now sold the Titles Office to itself. But not a real dollar was harmed in that transaction because no real money changed hands. Through this accounting magic, the Treasurer reduced Queensland's debt figure without actually reducing the amount of debt Queenslanders must repay. It's a hoax, plain and simple. It's being played on Queenslanders by this shameless Labor government. The budget magic didn't stop there. The Treasurer had swiped $2 billion of the imaginary money and put it into a fund for social housing and another $2 billion of the imaginary money into a fund for hospital infrastructure. These funds are supposed to be going to deliver all this money, but sometime in the never-never. Today, and in the here and now, there is not a single dollar in the budget against either of these funds. So that's hospital buildings taken care of. What about the money for funding health services? The urgently needed money to fund the actual treatment for care of our sick and injured, our new mums and bubs, and our frail elderly. We came to this budget with Queensland Health in a crisis from the state, from hospital boards to hospital beds. The LNP has brought case after case to Question Time, and the Treasurer described this as bleating. But these are real Queenslanders telling him the truth. As the member for Mudjabra asks, where else in the modern world are people left on stretches for hours crying for help? My constituent in the seat of Gregory, Rob from Dingo, told how he had to drive himself to the Rockhampton Hospital because his GP said he was suffering from a heart attack. A two-hour drive while having a heart attack. Just think of that for a moment. Having got himself there, Rob parked the car, got to the ED, where he was ramped for three hours. Watching the frantic and frazzled staff, he had nothing but praise for them, but he thought to himself, this might not end well for me. Make no mistake, this health crisis is just not in the southeast corner, it's right across the state. In my neck of the woods, when the health minister put an administrator into the Northwest Health and Hospital Service, they know it is not the hospital and health board mismanagement, it's they are chronically underfunded. The Palaszczuk Labor government sets their budgets and budgets aren't sufficient to provide the services expected of them. The crisis is just not in the emergency rooms. It's in every department, 
surgeries, outpatient treatments like renal dialysis, radiology, uh, mental health and palliative care. And talking about renal dialysis, we still don't have renal dialysis for a town the size of Emerald. Emerald has a population of 15,000 people, and if you have to have renal dialysis treatment, you have to travel three hours to Rockhampton to get it. That is simply not good enough for a region which provides so much in coal royalties and so much in agricultural exports that we can't get renal dialysis in a town like Emerald. The Queensland AMA has said 1,500 beds are needed to fix what is a $3 billion problem. But yesterday's budget gave Queensland Health no new money. This morning, the Courier Mail reports that the AMAQ is so devastated by this Labor budget that they are convening secret roundtables of doctors, nurses and hospital administrators to generate a five-year plan that would rescue Queensland Health. This shows how desperate the situation is. It also shows how disenfranchised our medical insiders feel. The Minister for Health, the Treasurer and the Premier should feel mortified by this. These good Queenslanders are having to do your jobs for you. And why do the participants want their names and identities kept secret? Because they fear of government retribution. They fear of personal payback because their participation could be seen as criticism of the Minister for Health, the Treasurer and the Premier. These are good Queenslanders bravely attempting to save our free public hospital system. They deserve our gratitude and our admiration. They deserve our moral and financial support. No doubt the Premier and the Treasurer believe these health workers should be grateful for this budget. After all, they were intending to impose a $550 million in cuts to health. The Treasurer calls these cuts efficiency and productivity dividends, but they are cuts. And remember, Queensland Health still have to find the efficiency dividends imposed in the previous budget last November. Now, we all know the Treasurer is a great showman, and he has tried to, uh, he has tried to, make, uh, to, to quiet this health revolt by saying the budget is a record health budget. The truth is, Queensland's health budget only increased by an extra amount Canberra gave them in this year's federal budget of $400 million. I'm running short of time, but I briefly want to touch on the complete disregard shown in this budget for the Department of Agriculture. The operating budget for the Department of Agriculture has been cut by 10 per cent, and there are fewer staff. There is barely a mention of pests and weeds management or biosecurity preparation and management. As members of this House would know, the electorate of Gregory has suffered nearly a decade of drought and is still being drought declared today. Queensland is a party to an agreement with the federal government to move drought policy from one reactive assistance to one of active drought preparation and resilience. But this budget has no new investment in rural training, education or research to help agriculture rise to the challenge. This budget has completely failed to address the pressing need for Queensland's farmers to have better crop insurance options as a part of dealing with climate change. There's not even any funding for new water infrastructure. In his speech, the Treasurer boasted he had achieved a projected surplus without asset sales. Well, pull the other one. Just over two weeks ago, he just sold part of the Emerald Agricultural College's beef property, Berrigara, for $32.5 million. $32.5 million sold Berrigara. And I assume that money is funding the $10.9 million over five years to finalise so-called long-term decisions on the rest of the assets and their sales. Minister Furner likes to call himself the farmer's friend. Well, here's my challenge to Minister Furner. On the 26th of June, it's a Saturday, it's during when we have agro, I invite the minister to come to agro and walk around with me and see how much friendship he has at agro. I also invite, on the 26th of June, that's the Saturday, the Emerald Agricultural College's past students are having what they a 50-year anniversary of the opening of the Emerald Agricultural College. 1971, they opened the Emerald Agricultural College. I reckon they would love to see Minister Ferner at that event. I reckon he finds so many friends. They would absolutely enjoy his company. Because I can tell you what they'll be telling him. Why did you close down what is essential? agricultural skill training in Queensland. Why did you close down the Longreach Pastoral College, which had been going for well over 52 years, 
Why did the minister close that down? Why did he close down the Emerald Agricultural College? Lock the gates. We are absolutely... They don't care. And he is not the farmer's friends. In fact, I feel that the minister could be misleading this parliament. Yes, uh, there was a uh, agricultural minister who was called the farmer's friends, and that was Henry Palaszczuk. But he, he earned that from agriculture because he understood agriculture. He could not always deliver for agriculture, but he gave his best for agriculture and he was well respected around Queensland. I can tell you now that Mark Ferner, through you, Mr Deputy Speaker, is not the farmer's friend in Queensland. We have seen agriculture close down. We have seen the Department of Agriculture cut by 10 per cent in this budget. We have seen fewer staff in the Department of Agriculture. So he is not the farmer's friend. Mr Speaker, I would also, while we have the Minister for Natural Resources uh, in the uh, chamber, I would also like to note that this budget provides not one extra dollar for Mine Safety Inspectorate, despite the scathing findings regarding the explosion at Grosvenor Mine in central Queensland. I do ask the Minister to have a look at that, but I'd also like to thank the Minister for Natural Resources for his support, uh, along with uh, the resources industry, for the commitment for a new hospital for Blackwater. As many of people would know in this town, Blackwater is the beating heart of the coal industry right throughout Queensland. It was formed back in 1960 by a company called Utah, uh, and the town has grown significantly over that time. But the hospital that it currently has now was built when Utah owned the town and were an important part of the town. Blackwater has a population of 6,000 people, but it actually services a population of around 12,000 people through the fly-in, fly-out drive in, drive out. Uh, it has been a long time coming and I've been working with the Chair of the Central Queensland Health and Hospital Services, Paul Bell, along with the CEO and of course the resources industry, the Queensland resources industry uh, through Ian McFarlane and Kirby uh, and we have managed to uh, collectively all come together to be able to get this hospital uh, uh, for Blackwater. I also thank uh, you know, uh, the people of Blackwater uh, for getting behind uh, this to get a hospital for Blackwater, I think it's, in, I think it's very important. One of the, when it comes to education, one of the disappointing things from this budget is something that was raised at the Isolated Children Parents Association conference in Cunnamulla and something that I've been campaigning for a long time. is about the accommodation facilities at the Long Reach Distance Education and the Capricorn Distance Education in Emerald, uh, where that accommodation was built and funded by the PNCs, by the graziers and farmers in central Queensland to be able to accommodate children coming to those school of distance educations four times a year for what we call mini schools. That has been shut down by this government. That is disgraceful because these children need to get together and have that yearly uh, interaction with parents and children they hear on, uh, obviously on their, on their computers and have that interaction with their uh, with their teachers, but also they have uh, once a year they have their annual play. These children are isolated. They're 500, 600 k's away from each other. They need to come together, and that accommodation facility needs to be corrected. The Minister for Education talked about this morning about the magnificent amount of money they're putting into schools and classrooms. Well, how about putting some of that money into the accommodation facilities that you've shut down to bring them up to standard so we can have those children? Uh, as young as five, come in to Longreach and come in to Emerald to be able to participate. What you're asking them to do now is basically try and find accommodation for five days in Emerald and Longreach, and we know it is high season, and those parents have to spend over $1,500 a week just to come in and participate in their mini schools. It's incredibly important. And finally, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the sad passing of Duncan Pegg. Duncan was a great bloke, uh, and I enjoyed his company. Of course, Duncan and I never—well, we didn't agree on everything, but one, that did not get in the way of our friendship and respect for each other, um, and our love for cricket. That's one thing Duncan and I had. The only difference is that Duncan could actually play cricket. I'm a hopeless cricketer, but I absolutely love the game. So uh, rest in peace, Duncan. You'll be missed, but you'll never be forgotten. And my condolences to the family. Member for Thurngower. Speaker, Speaker, I rise to support this appropriation bill. And I think it's just timely to mention that uh, I used to sit behind Duncan and he loved his budget speech. Uh, he'd always insert a bit of humour. So uh, Peggy, we miss you, mate. This one's for you. 
Uh, from the start, I want to thank the Treasurer for the great big budget. Great big budget for regional Queensland, the City of Townsville and my electorate of Thuringia. What can I say? It's a good budget. It's a good budget. I'm proud to share with the people of Thuringia. If the result had gone to the LNP, God help us, Thuringia would have missed out on $100 billion in infrastructure. That will support local jobs. Now, first, Speaker, I want to address the Leader of the Opposition who gave his budget reply speech today. Yes, the member for Broadwater, David Fasili Chrysofulli. Uh, for silly, for anyone with a knowledge of uh, pasta as a thin, weak, tightly spun pasta, that doesn't hold much flavour. And uh, um, that's what, that's what, that's what the leader really, yeah, this is what happens. This is what happens. He amounts to nothing. He's got nothing. He's, he's running a show about nothing over there. So I've got to say, uh, what a joke. Attacking our record health budget. Our health budget. Housing. Crime. Record infrastructure. Spending and, and creating jobs. Well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to belt that budget right out the back row. No mention of the 5.4 per cent unemployment rate announced today or the 33,000 jobs created last month. Nothing. He's got nothing. No mention of the 900 surgeries cut under Scott Morrison and the Medicare attack to our health system that will leave people waiting for their orthopaedic and heart surgeries. Nothing. Nothing. He talked about nothing. He talked about our ageing population and he should know the federal government is responsible for aged care. But not one word. Not one word about the 100,000 people on the wait list. On the wait list. As we heard, dying, waiting for their home care packages. Nothing. Not one word about the fact that we don't have a GP in Townsville that does, doesn't bulk bill in the residential aged care facility. They require an ambulance, putting more pressure on our public health system. It's all about Medicare. Not one word to address that. And he went on about housing. Not one word about the federal LNP that absolved themselves and walked away from social housing and rural, remote Indigenous housing. Nothing. Under Labor, we have record funding for housing, $2.9 billion of it. And we'll continue to support those people. This continued rubbish of breach of bail. He knows it failed. The breach of bail failed. 90% 90, 90 re-offended. Leave it alone. It failed. Move on. He then wanted to talk about our $30 million funding commitment for, I know, will be delivered in full to build the new police station at Kerwin. Yet his own charge, the LNP candidate in Thuringia in 2020, didn't even have a commitment to rebuild it or replace the Kerwin ambulance station. Nothing. No commitments. Nothing. Nothing for the police station, nothing for Riverway Drive, nothing for the one million dollars in the budget I got for the Weir School. Sorry, Member for Fine River, she's starting to go, I'm starting to yell. Nothing, nothing. Or the one million dollars for the catering hall in Heatley, or the two point four million dollar school uh cool and upgrades, three hundred and fifty thousand for Kelso Primary. It's nothing. You know what? I've got a theory. He is Newman. He is Newman. Under all of that, it's Newman. He's back, Mark II. Speaker, seriously, $913 million in infrastructure for Townsville signals that we have been not forgotten in the regions. We've already spent over a billion dollars in infrastructure, like the Horton Pipeline Stage 1. And on the front page of our paper, budget paper, $195 million for Stage 2. But we know, we know the LNP member for Herbert, member for Townsville knows this well, completely failed the people of North Queensland after promising to fully fund Stage 2 if he got elected. He pulled the wool over the eyes of people of Townsville. I hope they repay him in spades by not forgetting the fact when it comes to a federal election. To the member for Herbert, I hope you're listening, which I doubt because you certainly haven't been listening to the people of Townsville. Please change your logo for not fighting for Townsville because in the federal election there was not one infrastructure project, not one. Nothing. Nothing announced. $195 million. Junior Mintz, isn't it? $195 million. Than the federal member promised and never delivered before it suddenly disappeared. Oh, he never had it. Stark contrast to our budget, it delivers. Delivers in spades for the people of Thuringia. Following our excellent health response, we again back our health team in North Queensland by funding $1.1 billion to our health, hospital and health service. And I love our, 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 uh, um, our doctors, our nurses. 182 more doctors, 249 more nurses. And for my friends in ambulance, and for the smart remark the member for Mogul made, 46 more ambulance officers, a new ambulance station. You see, members, we back our health service, while those on the other side sack the health workers. I thank the health minister for allocating plans for the Kerwin Health Campus expansion, which was a total commitment of $40 million. 
which I know will deliver over this term of government. And I'm very proud of Townsville University Hospital, but I want to shine a light on the Kerwin Health Campus and why it's so important to support and modernise this 37-year-old uh, campus. They have four community health facilities. They have the Parklands Aged Care Facility, the Townsville Community Care and Acquired Brain Injury Unit, Josephine Saylor Adolescent Inpatient Unit. They deserve this funding. And again, the signals local jobs will be created when we move to build the new Kerwin Health Campus. Let's move to schools, all the schools, $37 million for schools in Townsville, $12 million for schools in Thuringia. I'm wrapped. Thank you very much. Of course, my favourite, $65 million. Now you think I'm going to say Riverway Drive. Not quite. $65 million for Townsville Ring Road. Stage five, 400 jobs. We're doing it. We're getting on with it. And of course, Riverway Drive stage two. What can I say? Next year, they start digging. $2 million allocated for it. We have a Treasurer that is backing the people of Townsville with a great Labor budget. Thank you very much, Treasurer. Thanks to the Premier. I'm done. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker. Member for Everton. Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the policies I do agree with the Labor Party is their, their policy to incorporate their speeches. It's just small mercies, but uh, it's something that uh, I really do appreciate, uh, Mr., uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I want to begin where the opposition leader in his uh, very, very good budget reply speech where he finished, and that is that I only agree with one thing that the Treasurer said in his budget reply speech when he said that this is a typical Labor government budget, and he could not have said a truer, a truer word. Because what Labor budgets are all about, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that they're all about spin, they're not about substance, they're all about smoke and mirrors, they're all about repackaging, re-announcing, reneging of promises and commitments, and all delivered by a Treasurer who is totally obsessed with himself and that has an ego that cannot be matched in this place. A treasurer who has a treasurer, Mr Deputy Speaker, a treasurer who has one thing on his mind, and that is to become the next Premier of this state. That's all he's obsessed with. So everything that he does is an audition, an audition to his colleagues to pick me, to pick me to be the next, the next Premier of this state. And Mr Deputy Speaker, if he's not taking credit for recovering the Binnaburra Bell from the bushfires, he's working on the next photo opportunity to satisfy his obsession to be viewed at the same level as past presidents of the United States. It's rumoured that Treasurer Cameron Robert Dick is demanding that his colleagues refer to him as CRD, and I would believe that, Mr Deputy Speaker. What does that stand for? I'll take that interjection from the, uh, the member from Kiwana. I think it stands for Cameron Robert Dick. Oh, like JFK. Exactly right, like JFK. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, and that big cheesy grin, that big cheesy grin won't hide the sham that this budget is. And what a sham it is. This is a Treasurer that, before the election, said that the increased borrowings by the Queensland Government will be $4 billion. After the election, we, were, we learnt that that figure was going to be $28 billion, so he did not have the courage or the integrity to be upfront with Queenslanders before the election took place. And then he comes in here now this week, after increasing the, the deficit by $28 billion after the election, wanting us to pat him on the back because that's now going to be $2 billion less. Thank you so much, Mr Treasurer, for your um, outstanding uh, economic management to be able to bring that $28 billion down to $26 billion. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a budget that is a sham, that it's all about trickery, all about hiding the facts from the Queensland public, and there can be no greater example of that than in the housing portfolio, Mr Deputy Speaker. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, when we left government in 2015, the waiting list for social housing had been brought down to 17,000 households. That number now, Mr Deputy Speaker, and this is September last year, so this figure is now uh, nearly nine months old, that figure now is blown out to 26,000 
households. And the very disturbing thing, which the opposition leader spoke about uh, quite well, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that out of that 26,000, uh, around 16,500 of those people are in very high need. Now, here's the even further disturbing figure, Mr Deputy Speaker, that that 16,000 is an increase of 82 per cent on the 18 months leading up to September last year. Now, I can only imagine what that figure is now nine months later, and we've got some questions on notice there to find, what the, find out what that figure is. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, do not be surprised, do not be surprised if the Labor Party decides no longer to publish what the housing waiting list is. That's what they've done with every other key performance indicator which embarrasses them. They, 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 they don't report them anymore. They don't report it. So don't be surprised. They're already trying to hide it. They, they don't call it the waiting list anymore. They call it the registry of need because they don't want Queenslanders knowing how inefficient they have been in making sure that our most vulnerable people receive housing. Mr Deputy Speaker, the social housing property numbers have increased over the last five years by 0.6 per cent. If they kept up with population growth, if they kept up with population growth, there'd be another 6,000 extra social housing properties. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, these things don't happen over a short period of time, although they have accelerated in the last six years. This is because we have had a Labor government for 27 of the last 30 years. These things build, and these inefficiencies build. These waiting lists build because of that. So this is through a total lack of planning. And Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what we need, what we need is innovative thinking with regards to solving the housing crisis we have in the moment. And wasn't it so ironic yesterday? Wasn't it so ironic yesterday that the member for Logan, the member for Logan would ask a question of the housing minister about social housing? And if the Logan Renewal Initiative had been implemented, we would right now see new homes, additional homes, refurbished homes, better round wraparound services. This is a minister, when she came into government in 2015, that saw the Logan Renewal Initiative and agreed with it. She agreed with it. She thought that was a great idea, and it wasn't until Minister De Brenny took over the portfolio that they scrapped it and tore up contracts which took two years to bring about. What we need is innovative thinking, and that's what the Logan Renewal Initiative was. And what that was about was being serious with partnership with the community housing sector and not for profit uh, development companies, Mr Deputy Speaker. But no, that's too innovative. That's too innovative. That goes against our philosophy. That means that 42 people that worked at the um, Woodridge Housing Service Centre, we might lose their union membership. That, those are the type of things that dictate this government's decisions, and that was a disgraceful decision. Why would you do business in this state when, after two years negotiating with the government and coming up with one of uh, the biggest contracts ever entered into, that they just tore it up, Mr Deputy Speaker? And then they come here with this cruel hoax to talk about a $2.9 billion investment in social housing. That is incorrect. It's not. A billion dollars of that is this Queensland Housing Investment Fund, which, as we know, has been conjured out of the re-evaluation of the titles office, uh, of which there's no figures in the, in the budget papers with regards to the revenue that um, has been forecast about this. This is a cruel hoax. And what we need at the moment is better partnership with the community housing sector to let them be unleashed. Mr Deputy Speaker, there are billions of dollars, and I mean billions of dollars, available at the moment through the uh, National Housing Finance uh, Investment Company, of which every other state in Australia is accessing, but Queensland is missing out. And the reason that Queensland is missing out is that our community housing providers have not been able to grow and to have the leverage to be able to get access to this money. And uh, the, the people from NIFIC, that's what the abbreviation is, is, is dying to give money to Queensland, billions of dollars, so that we can build the community housing, the affordable housing that is so desperately needed, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker. And Mr Deputy Speaker, one of my other shadow portfolios is sport. And I would have thought with an Olympic decision imminent, and it 
is looking pretty good for us, that the government would do a serious investment in sporting infrastructure, particularly for our junior sporting clubs that are preparing our future athletes for the, for the Olympic Games. Now, I don't know, the minister might be able to correct me, but I, I can see, I think, $26 million, which is a bit vague on what that may be. It would seem that the infrastructure grants that sporting clubs have been used to over a whole long period of time from both sides of government seem to have been shrunk. There seems to be shrinkage involved with that funding. And uh, I, I, I can't understand that decision, Mr Deputy Speaker. I can't understand that decision because I know in, in my electorate, for example, uh, the Albany Creek Excelsiors Footy Club, they want a couple of hundred grand to upgrade some of their clubhouse facilities. The Mitchy Footy Club, the Mitchy Footy Club needs uh, around four hundred thousand dollars to have some dressing rooms for our for our lady players. The Everton Wolves AFL Club wants some grand alterations. The One Team of Golf Club wants to improve Order. irrigation. For Capella, the Everton for Park Logan. Bowls Club wants money to put a shade over their artificial turf green. Uh, we've got the Pine Hills Footy Club wants, wants some money to increase and to enhance their lighting. The, these things are important to increase participation in sport for our junior sports people. And what are we getting? We, we seem to be getting nothing on that. And that, that's a real concern. And it's showing a lack of confidence with regards to being preparing ourselves for the, the uh, Olympics and hopefully a successful Olympic bid. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've already just touched on a couple of things in my electorate with regards to sporting clubs, but the number one thing in my electorate that has not been addressed, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the upgrade, the direct upgrade of the intersection of South Pine Road and Stafford Road. So this is an interesting history. I'll give credit to my predecessor, predecessor now Senator Murray Watt, who actually got the plans together for the intersection upgrade that is required. And they have now been sitting, they have been sitting there, sitting there for the last six or seven years, not, not to be funded, Mr Deputy Speaker. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it was only in the 2017 election campaign Order, that members. I made a commitment. I made a commitment to build stage one of the upgrade, which is the Everton Park Link Road. And miraculously, three hours later, the main roads minister made the same announcement. A miracle that he made that uh, made an announcement. But I'm happy that he did that. I'm happy that he did that because that meant the community was going to get that no matter what. Now that's just opened and we're hoping that that will provide some improvement, but it will not bring the improvement that will only, to the level that will only come if we have the direct major upgrade of the intersection, stage two, and I'll take that interjection. Now that will be $120 million that we need, $120 million to bring about that. Now I've, I have, no, no look of that at all in the, in the uh, forward figures. So nothing over the next four years. We're going to still have this congestion uh, outside the office. The only good thing about it, it gives them a chance to look at my big billboard a bit longer, um, which is uh, at the intersection. It's a, very, it's, a, it's a pretty good billboard, it's a, and it's a very good picture, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, it's a little bit dated. It's a little bit dated. It's a little bit dated. Order, Minister. The hair, the hair was a little bit darker. And um, I, I, I just I, I hope that the government doesn't bring truth and advertising laws in. Um, but uh, at the moment we're going to keep it at that. And uh, but but we do we do want we do want the fact we we need this intersection upgrade. It is the biggest issue in my electorate, as we have all this traffic coming from Old Northern Road, coming from those northern suburbs in the south of the Moreton Bay region that uh, have no other alternative. They can go out to Gympie Road or the Bruce Highway, but that just makes that congestion even worse. And so what do they do? They come down right in the middle of my electorate, and uh, we need to do something about it, and we need to spend that money. It's money, going to be money well spent that will help people get home safer and quicker, and it will also enable businesses to get around far quicker as well um, to do their work, Mr Deputy Speaker. Everybody knows to avoid that intersection, and that should not be the case. I also want to mention a couple of community groups in my electorate as well. For the life of me, I, I just do not understand why this group called The Nest, which is a centre for women, does not get funding through that, the neighbourhood centre network. They don't fit the box. because they don't fit the box, they don't get funding. This is an unbelievable group of, of women 
um, that through creativity have intergenerational learning and uh, they have survived over the last uh, five or six years when, I was in, when we were in government. Uh, I was able to provide some funding for a rent of the, the house that they're now in. Um, uh, any money at all that could go to the nest would be greatly appreciated. And I do want to mention ORCA as well. ORCA is a group that is a training group uh, to prepare people with disability for employment. I know they've got a place out at Mansfield, uh, and I know they've got one at Albany Creek as well. That was a promise that we made had we got into government. A couple of hundred grand would go such a long way in helping people with disability get, a work, to get work. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, in summary, the budget is disappointing. Uh, it's trickery. It's all about smoke and mirrors. Uh, it's all about uh, re-announcing, about repackaging, about reneging on promises and commitments. And the people of Queensland, and I know the people of Everton, deserve far better. Thank you, Member. And I wish to assure you that life can be full and meaningful with grey hair as well. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Harvey Bay. Deputy Speaker, as this is my first time on my feet since the passing of our comrade Duncan Pegg, the member for Stretton, I'd wish to add to the comments made by many members and pass on my condolences to his family. Whilst I did not know Duncan for long, I have been moved by the level of love shown in this place and by his, and by his community towards him, Farley Duncan. Speaker, I rise in support of the Appropriation Bill 2021. This budget continues to deliver the economic recovery the people of Queensland and the electorate of Harvey Bay voted for last year. At that election, the electorate said they wanted a strong economic recovery coming off the back of a strong health response delivered by the Palaszczuk Labor government. And on Tuesday, we heard that the Queensland economy has bounced back stronger and faster than the rest of the country and is well on its way with a massive three and a quarter per cent in state growth over this financial year. That's 13 times faster than estimated in the last budget. The unemployment rate in Queensland posted the largest fall in the nation, falling to 5.4 per cent. That's now below its pre-COVID level. Employment has increased by 32,000 alone in the last month. That's more than 1,000 jobs created each and every day. With this budget, the Palaszczuk government has shown that its COVID economic recovery plan is working and is delivering on its strong plan for growth and recovery by ensuring that our local economies rebound whilst the rest of the world must unfortunately still deal with the containment of the COVID virus. As the Honourable Treasurer said in his budget speech, the people of Queensland recognise the important things that matter, like better hospitals, smarter schools, safer roads and creating a pipeline of infrastructure that creates jobs for decades to come. Speaker, the last budget spent big to keep jobs growth growing in Queensland, and this latest budget continues that trend by providing the funding for the many and varied programs and services needed to move us forward as a community. This budget continues delivery on the promises made during the election and delivers for the people of the Harvey Bay electorate to build back better as we unite and recover. Speaker, growth in jobs, health, education, infrastructure, housing is what this Labor budget is all about. Some of the highlights included in this record budget were a record health spend across Queensland. In this, there were further funding towards construction projects to improve facilities at the Harvey Bay Hospital, including the Adult Acute Mental Health Inpatient Unit. This new Acute Mental Health Inpatient Unit is currently underway and will create more than 140 construction and health jobs this is good news for our jobs, for our tradies, our apprentices and our nurses. This is a great outcome for the services needed in Harvey Bay, and I must congratulate the Palaszczuk government for showing the way in growing our, health, our local health services. Sadly, in contrast, the Morrison LMP federal government has slashed the Medicare rebate on over 900 procedures, damaging the health of Harvey Bay residents. Anyone from the LNP and Harvey Bay who supports this ought to hang their heads in shame. The LNP federal budget is going to decimate it, Medicare, putting pressure on our local health system and making personal health care in Harvey Bay less affordable, particularly for the most vulnerable in our community like pensioners, seniors and our mums and dads. And let's not talk about, that, and let's not talk about the, what the LNP have done in creating doctor shortages across the regions. It's just disgraceful. At the last election, I said to the people of the Harvey Bay electorate that I would work to make the Harvey Bay electorate the centre of learning and skills excellence in White Bay. In this budget, schools in the Harvey Bay electorate will receive additional and ongoing funding. 
With education, this passenger provides a further $150,000 to the Harvey Bay Special School to refurbish the second stage of the Trade Training Centre and continue funding for the new halls facilities being built at the Urangan State High School and the Urangan Point State School, plus the ongoing build at the Harvey Bay High and a further $343,000 towards the Urangan State High School canteen upgrade plus a million dollars towards the new security fence, keeping our students and teachers safe and educational outcomes stronger with better facilities. Speaker, on top of the continuation of the highly, highly successful free TAFE for those under 25, which, by the way, has an exceptional uptake in Harvey Bay, the Harvey Bay TAFE will receive upgrades to nursing and allied health infrastructure aligned to health and biomedical training and further training in training investment. This is on the back of the continuation of the highly successful Skilling Queenslands for Work and the Back to Work programs, a funding program that provides Harvey Bay business with the confidence to employ local job seekers who have experienced a period of unemployment and help workers facing disadvantage in the labour market. Programs that are giving the, people, the skills people need to be job ready and further pathways back into work. Again, this is in direct contrast to those op opposite who have, have in the past tried to dismantle and privatise the TAFE system. They just hate a publicly owned run TAFE system. This is never more evident than in the recent Morrison LNP federal government budget's disgraceful announcement, or should I say the non-announcement, because they are saying nothing, that the Morrison LNP federal government is cutting funding to the TAFE sector which is shameful. Reducing the funding to TAFE leaves the heavy lifting back on the state again, and I suppose we're getting used to this from that mob on the other side. Mr Speaker, this, pro this provides that those on the other side don't care less about uplifting people into better jobs. They only, they only care about uplifting their own pockets. And as always, we on this side are giving back, and those on the other side are taking it away. Mr Speaker, Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Mr. Speaker, I call the member for Burnett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, uh, as is arbitrary, we do our budget reply speeches in this place. And I guess, as we always do, we need to encourage a long-term economic growth. Encourage small business with all Queenslanders, and particularly in our part of the world, and we need leadership, but we need a plan. I can't accept that we can celebrate applauding short-term creative economic numbers and statistics because uh, it's not a serious fiscal plan. But I want to uh, put on record my thanks for some of the efforts in the budget. And um, the Minister for Education is in the House, and I want to acknowledge the emails from her office uh, consolidating the education uh, delivery in, in the electorate, and it's welcome, and I thank the minister and her staff for being so forthright. Normally we don't get that support, and I thank you very much. And I think it's great that we can celebrate education in this House uh, a lot more together than we do apart, and I think that we all share that. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge some of those projects that were um, announced. 100000 uh, for Agnes Water State School, Block B, 300000 for Alloway State School, Main Entrance, uh, 350 k for Bagara State School. Uh, 1000 sorry uh, 60000 for goodwood state school uh, 100000 for Kalan state school uh, there's 500000 for maintenance 300000 for minor works and we're delighted the 1.2 million for Miriamvale state school for that amenities block that's been uh, uh, desperately needed we're very much grateful for that announcement oakwood picks up some money as well the state school and rosedale 350000 so again we're very much grateful for the work that's happening uh, in education around the region um, I want to uh, acknowledge in the budget too, uh, the member for Harvey Bay didn't mention uh, the, Harvey, uh, the Fraser Island issue, but I think it's important that we acknowledge the Minister and the Department of uh, Environment for putting that $1.2 million into uh, fire mitigation on Fraser Island. I think we all share somewhere in our hearts a passion for these iconic national parks, and none of us were happy uh, with what happened. Uh, and no one, I'm not portioning blame, I'm just acknowledging the, the fiscal uh, investment into Fraser Island, not in my electorate but somewhere that I visit on a regular basis, and I'm looking forward to going there shortly for another week. But uh, thank you, Minister, for uh, that. I think that's important that we do put that on record. I also want to acknowledge also the money for Lady Elliot Island and their renewables push. It's a truly iconic um, spot, and you all should come and you all should visit. But to be completely off the grid over a number of years now, we all should be really proud of the gashes and, uh, and working with the department. I know they've done some really good work out there. Also be heading off there shortly as well. 
Um, I think it's also important that uh, in our agricultural sector that the money that was put in for the new agricultural and horticultural sector in the Bundaberg electorate I acknowledge, but of course we all share agriculture as a, a key driver for the region. Uh, the five ways down at Childers at Dulby, we want to make sure that that's acknowledged. Um, I think it's important too that um, with all the criticism of Paradise Dam, and I'll talk a bit more about that, the money that is still in the budget for the, the original um, works and more importantly the, uh, the other works, the $32 million that was announced for the, the planning, all that stuff continues. Also the $30 million upgrade power out of Childers I think is important and of course I want to make sure that we do acknowledge and the importance of the seasonal worker program and the money that's come both from federal and state has to be recognised as important. Uh, this is our seventh year of drought, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I think it's really important that the drought assistance reform package continues to be a very important uh, issue. It keeps a lot of our farming families uh, viable and robust. Um, I also think that uh, after the years, so many years of fighting for the Bundaberg port, the, uh, the money that, can, that hasn't been taken out around the uh, port conveyor belt, uh, I want to make sure that we uh, give credit where credit's due. That drought assistance reform package across Queensland is $70 odd million, and of course we just hope that we can get through the litany of paperwork that uh, is needed to fill that out. So uh, some, there is some things in the budget that we certainly want to be um, uh, acknowledgement, uh, and, but there's plenty, there's plenty to talk about in other areas. Uh, just before I, I move into more other areas, one of the issues that does need to be looked at is what uh, the domestic violence sector does need to be looked at. And I want to put a plug in for Hearts of Purple, uh, based on the Gold Coast, but uh, are now uh, right across the state. And they are now in Bundaberg and the Burnett electorate uh, with their purple bins. And those that are coming to the promo night tonight can have, uh, please have a chat to the team from Hearts of Purple. Uh, having to raise money by getting 10 cents a can to keep something like uh, watches and surveillance equipment uh, audits on uh, people fleeing domestic violence. Uh, I think it's a, it's a bit of a, it's a, a success story, but I think it's a bit sad that we can't provide more for them. Uh, Paradise Dam, of course, we know that the uh, options paper will be later in this year, and we know that Building Queensland um, have that before them, and I'm back in the department now. I've spoken about that before. But I did want to express a bit of concern, Mr Deputy Speaker, about an announcement and I just want to make a point. I'm not having a go because it was a Labor Party announcement, but our council has been pushing for an aquatic centre, so I'll take them on so I don't get heckled across the chamber. I can't believe we want to spend $45 million in Bundaberg in the middle of a seven-year drought with Paradise Dam and water security to build a new swimming pool. I did acknowledge that member for Bundaberg. I'll take your interjection. I did try to say I'll take on the council and not make it something that you wanted to interject on, but I do say seriously. We do need to get our priorities right. In the middle of a drought, a $45 million swimming pool, uh, I do need to think we need to rephrase uh, and re reflect what we need to do. Um, I also want to talk about how important the $19, $19 billion worth of agriculture uh, to the Queensland economy is. And of course, our farmers provide everything. It's nutritious, safe in food and fibre, but more importantly, wonderful green and the credentials that come with that. The agriculture sector are the ones that deliver the food security provide protection to the environment and provide so much to the economy, and it's all low risk. So I say we would have liked to see more targeted support for that industry. So why not abolish stamp duty on ag agricultural insurance? We need to establish a discretionary mutual fund for this crop insurance issue that's been kicking around for decades. Let's empower farmers with long-term industry-owned tools for managing risk. And what are the problems with the budget? Well, some of the problems for me is the Bagara Hughes Road intersection. Uh, missed out, Money's Creek Lagoon, uh, the environmental catastrophe that is. We need to get on top of that. Um, of course, I do need to raise a couple of issues, and I'll be very happy, Mr Deputy Speaker, if I'm proved wrong, but one of the things in the budget paper that concerns us, uh, and it is in the Bundaberg electorate, is the Bundaberg flood levy. And I'll table from last year's um, SDS statement where the flood levy had $5.5 million uh, in this budget, $17 million in next year's budget, 23, and 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 17 in the uh, flood. I'll take the interjection from the member for Pine Rivers. Yes, it is about, but our electorates are a bit unique where we do donut around each other. We have a lot of common interests and a lot of common interests in about what flood looks like. So I thank the interjection. I thank the member for Pine Rivers for interjection, but I suggest that those people that live in my electorate don't really care what she has to say anyway. Um, I want to get back to our farmers. Uh, well, I want to make sure that we talk about this crop insurance. Let's empower our farmers with the industry-owned tools for managing risks. And uh, I did mention uh, those issues about 
that uh, believe have been gone. One of the things I do want to raise too is there was a $15 million um, line item to purchase land for the new hospital. Uh, my questions are several, actually. Um, this land that was announced is state land. I don't know why we need to put $15 million into a budget to buy land off ourselves. The other thing is, if you've been to Bundy, $15 million for a parcel of land, some hectares, is something astronomical. I, I could buy a thousand acre macadamia farm for that uh, with, with 15,000 trees. So I'm not sure how we valued this, uh, this thing. Maybe we're going to sell it to ourselves and pay down debt. I'm not sure what it all looks like. But um, I want to make sure that uh, we do need to put on record, and a lot of my colleagues have talked about issues around um, the, the budget for Cross River Rail. Uh, the, we do have members will cease this quarrelling across the chamber. The infrastructure spend. Uh, we also want to talk about this new housing investment. It is so important that whatever government, um, whatever uh, things we do, we have to deal with this housing crisis. And we really hope we can all work a bit more collaboratively about what that looks like. Let's get on with, as being suggested, with the private sector. Let's empower the land bank, and let's make sure that these people living in their cars, and many of them, as has been said here tonight and today. Uh, we have many people in our own electorate that are moving towns just to try and find somewhere to live. And it's not necessarily everyone's fault. The housing boom is something that's crept up on us all. But we haven't planned, we haven't done well, and I think we all need to acknowledge that we can do better. Um, I will never stop talking about the 130 trajectory for debt. I think it's important that we never take our eye off that. And whether I'm just uh, one of those LNP members that always gets fixated with debt, well, maybe that's just me. But for me, it is important. It's serious. And I certainly don't want to leave my green... Uh, I'm not sure what the interjection from the member for Logan was, but it was certainly intended to be disruptive. And I'm sure I don't, didn't want to take it, but I have now. Uh, and I say it also, I think I don't want to let my grandchildren uh, be the ones that has to somehow deal with this issue of the, the repayments of this trajectory of debt. Um, I also want to raise um, the issues around um, an issue in town. Uh, last week, uh, the week before, we had um, Surf Life Saving Queensland come to town and talk to our council about a wonderful announcement, something we've been fighting for for a decade, uh, the funding for a surf club that was wrecked by cyclones in 2010 at Moore Park. And um, one of the things I do need to get on record, though, Mr Speaker, was uh, the council made an announcement on the Wednesday. Uh, it was in the social media pages. The Surf Life Saving Queensland had briefed the council the week before. Uh, we just carried on with what we were doing. We were intending to also just celebrate with the club on the Friday morning. Uh, but then, of course, the intervention from the minister's office. And I want to say my concern is that the minister's office has actually tried to interfere with the public media in Bundaberg, asking them to take down stories about this announcement. The politicisation of this I find incredibly disturbing, and I think there will be more to be said about this. But uh, I heard many times about um, you know, gagging and all the, from the health minister this morning, but I'm deeply disturbed by this new uh, eventuation where we have ministers' offices trying to dictate and influence our local media, and I find that uh, terrible. Um, lack of tourism spending has been raised in this House uh, numerous times today, and working with our leader in the tourism space, and I find that incredibly rewarding, and travelling around. There is a lot of uh, disheartened uh, operators and industry stakeholders out there, and it's an opportunity for me to put back on the public record a real call, call, call uh, to the uh, members of the government that have that influence. Why don't we open up travel, rail, rail travel from the southeast corner into central Queensland? Uh, Harvey Bay, Miraburra, Gladstone, uh, Bundaberg, all, all of us in that part of the world could certainly benefit from getting more of those tourists that don't necessarily drive don't want to or can't afford to fly. Uh, Member for Logan, I'll take you an ejection if you want to repeat your comment. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Member for Logan. Um, I also, and I think if we can just make it encouraging that we can get those people out of South East Corner into our regions, I think from a tourism point of view, what a great opportunity that would be. So again, to the Minister, I've, uh, numerous times I've made contact. I do acknowledge it's not probably something easy to do, but let's think about either free or half price rail travel into our region so we can really capitalise on getting those heads on the pillows, enjoying the wonderful opportunities and um, things we all have to offer. I'm, with the time remaining, I'm not going to uh, go back over the issues of the title office, uh, only to say that we certainly will be keeping an eye on that issue. I am still, um, and I don't mind if people um, admit that I've got some confusion over how all this funding of the housing program, funding of the path to treaty out of this, uh, this so-called budget. 
Uh, I don't know about uh, others, but I think it was important that the Leader of the Opposition's request for transparency and what budgets look like need to be addressed. I've read now nine different budget papers, and of course this year has even been more confusing. There's less information and there's more things being hidden uh, around corners. So that said, um, I'll put the opportunity for others on the other side to explain to me about the FUD levy money, why the $45 million that was promised prior to the election when they hadn't spoken to the federal government and when they hadn't talked to the federal government. Uh, it's not in this year's budget papers, and I think it's a really serious issue for the Queensland government to explain why they made a promise for a $45, $45 million flood levy. I'll take the interjection from the member for Bundaberg and give him an opportunity to explain when his contribution, uh, when he stands up, to explain where the $45 million is, uh, where the state government's promise of $45 million uh, for the flood levy is now. It was in last year's budget papers, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's not in there now. If we have cut the funding, uh, I think it's important. And if, if it is something to do with the federal government, I've backed this, I've backed this Labor government on the flood levy every time. It's, it's needed to be done. But what I won't accept, what I won't accept, what I won't accept is when budgets are manipulated to remove the funding. And if that's the case, I ask those opposite that are responsible for that to at least come clean, at least tell the members of their community that were given a promise during election of $45 million to build a flood levy uh, and then decide to write to the federal government some time later, uh, I think that needs to be just transparent. So I, I put them on notice if they feel comfortable, they feel obligated to at least be truthful about what happened with the flood levy money. If it's gone, cough up, let us know what's going on. Uh, that said, I think what we need to do now is look forward about what issues around the new mental health uh, promises that were made during the election as well. I'd like to see some tangible money in uh, maybe next year's budget, because it's not in this year's budget. Mental health is becoming increasingly more important in our regions because of the issues that confront us, uh, things like the lowering of Paradise Dam, things like reef regs, things that are confronting us. There's a lot of pressure in our communities right across a lot of issues. So I say mental health funding is a really important investment, and I encourage everyone that has capacity to give our region its fair share. Thank you. Deputy Speaker. Call the member for Morrowfield. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk government governs for all Queenslanders, no matter where they live. And we govern for all Queenslanders by providing the services, the frontline staff, the infrastructure and significantly supporting the jobs that all Queenslanders deserve. This budget is proudly a Labor budget. It invests in jobs, infrastructure and services. It provides opportunities for Queenslanders and it builds stronger, better, safer communities. It also provides big investments across police, corrective services and fire and emergency services. And I'll return to those investments in a moment. But first and foremost, this budget makes big investments in the Morayfield State electorate, the great community that I represent in this parliament. In relation to the provision of health and hospital services, the Palaszczuk government is delivering a $400 million redevelopment of the Caboolture Hospital, including the construction of a six-storey, multi-storey car park. In addition, the Palaszczuk government is progressing the delivery of the Caboolture Satellite Hospital and an additional $4 million 24-7 ambulance station for the community, which will be located at Morayfield. All these investments will support the employment of more doctors, nurses, health professionals and paramedics in our community. There is also significant investment in education facilities and resources in the Morayfield State electorate. Across the Moreton Bay region, almost $1.7 million has been committed for minor works at local schools, and over $5.1 million is allocated for local school maintenance. I'm excited to see that this budget will progress over $13 million of new classrooms at Caboolture State High School. We'll finalise the delivery of new classrooms and a joint hall facility at Lee Street Special School and a new hall at Morayfield State High School and build a new safety security fence at Morayfield State School. There's also investments in transport infrastructure, justice services, community safety, employment and training opportunities and, importantly, jobs for local people. The people of the Morayfield State electorate are big winners out of this budget, and I'm very proud of what this budget will deliver for them. Deputy Speaker, now turning to my portfolio responsibilities, as I mentioned earlier, 
This budget supports big investments across the portfolios of police, corrective services and fire and emergency services. And at this point, Deputy Speaker, I'd like to note that the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Gympie. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I rise to speak on the 2021 budget. This budget is an exercise in accounting trickery, spin and grant announcements were not, not backed up with missing budget allocations or lines. In Gympie, it's full of re-announcements and recycling. A month after trying to bask in reflected glory from Beef Week, this budget is glaring proof that the Agriculture Minister is failing to stand up for the industries he is supposed to represent. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government sees the budget as merely a cynical PR exercise in political manipulation. The reality is, if it's not in the budget, it doesn't exist. $4 billion has been cut from the infrastructure spend in whole dollars. Adjusted for inflation, it's closer to $6 billion cut. Minimal new money is being invested, with most of the announced funds either repackaged or closed. The government has reduced, reused and recycled. Queensland's infrastructure spend is way too low at 12 per cent, compared to nearly 25 per cent in New South Wales and Victoria. The ministers have hung, their, hung up their high-vis vests and helmets, ditched the Akubras and Aaron Williams. They have adopted the white shoe brigade look. They have pulled out a rabbit out of the hat using dubious valuations and indulged in showy announcements with no substance. <clears throat> the government sold the title office to itself at an inflated price to wipe debt from the books. No money changed hands, only figures in columns. The debt figure was reduced without actually reducing the level of debt Queensland taxpayers must repay. Three weeks ago, the Treasurer said the title's office was worth $4.2 billion. He now says it's worth $7.8 billion. In only three weeks, it has miraculously risen by 85.7 per cent. An 85.7 per cent increase in less than a month turnaround is taking your cues from the White Shoe Brigade, which shops for evaluation based on whether you are buying or selling. It has been described as like selling your car to yourself at four times its worth, going to the bank asking to borrow more because your asset, the car, is supposed to be, more, uh, is supposed to be worth more. The Treasurer made nearly $6 billion in announcements that can't be delivered in this term of the Parliament. They can't be delivered in the next three and a half years. There is nothing for the promised $2 billion hospitals building fund, $1 billion housing investment fund, $300 million path to treaty fund, or the $500 million carbon reduction investment fund. The $1.5 billion renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund is missing $1 billion. Following media reports two months ago about a proposed pumped hydro scheme at Barumba Dam in the Mary Valley, I requested a briefing from both the Minister for Renewable Energy and the Minister for Water. Despite numerous contacts with both officers, there is only silence. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is not silent in my community. Last week, the Premier, the Treasurer and the Minister for Renewable Energy announced in a release, a press release, $22 million for a detailed design and cost analysis for the project. Constituents contact me asking what is happening. They won't be fobbed off with press releases and little detail. They are concerned it's cloaked in secrecy and lack of transparency. People still recall the last time a Labor government came to the Merry Valley. In a three-year fiasco, it wasted $500 million, half a billion dollars, on the failed Traveston Dam project. The Premier, the Treasurer and the Minister for Tourism should remember they sat around Cabinet tables during those three years. We read about a pumped hydro scheme, but nothing about numerous calls to start investigation works to raise the dam to provide water security for Gympie. The community needs genuine, upfront, honest consultation, transparency, not lip service and secrecy. So, Deputy Speaker, recycling and re-announcements is Gympie's share of the budget. The government has hitched a ride on federal or council projects. It has made an art form from recycling, rebadging and announcing projects primarily funded by the federal government or delivered by the Gympie Regional Council. I welcome the return of the Rainbow Beach Auxiliary Fire and Rescue Station which has perennially bounced in and out of six state budgets. It's been in, out, in, out, and now it's back. It was first promised in 2016, then disappeared the next year. 
The funds were redirected to Bundaberg to prop up the disgraced State Labor member and former Agriculture Minister whose credentials were growing her own fruit and vegetables and owning a fish tank. It was an appalling pork barrelling at the expense of the Rainbow Beach community. The announcement reappeared two years ago in 2019, only to be taken away in last year's budget, which was delayed until after the state election. Six budgets later, it has been dusted off to reappear in the latest glossy brochure. It's a gold medal recycling commitment. I welcome its return and hope it's completed this time. So, Deputy Speaker, I welcome the $500,000 commitment to improve water supply at the Merry Valley State College. The funds to start construction on the Kalula Coast Esplanade Revitalisation will be delivered by the Gympie Regional Council. The state is making a part contribution to a council project. The funding for the Bruce Highway Corroida Carra Section D is part of an ongoing commitment to deliver the project. The Gympie Bypass must be one of the most recycled announcements ever made. They have been constructing it for ages. The federal government funds the bulk of this project, or 80 per cent, of the total $1 billion spent. When existing projects become the highlight, you lack vision. Despite eye-watering borrowings and debt, there is no vision for, the Gimpy, for Gimpy's future. I frequently raise with ministers in the Premier and in the Parliament local projects which need support. The government missed many opportunities like planning to build the new Gympie Fire and Rescue Station, which has outgrown its current site and planning for new high schools. Enrolments are almost at capacity at James Nash and Gympie State High Schools, <coughs> with private schools picking up the slack. The government has thrown a net over business as usual health costs and called it a health building fund. There is no new money. As population grows and with inflation, every budget should be a record. It's about what you deliver. Labor's health record is one of the longest surgery wait lists of 55,000 and highest ambulance ramping numbers in a generation at 40 per cent. It hasn't released the Sunshine Coast HH Services review of Gympie's health needs. It was due in February last year. Phase one of the clinical master plan was due in March last year. We were supposed to see the clinical plan in December. Still nothing. Gympie's paediatric unit no longer takes care of sick, ch sick children. There are no beds for sick kids. Families are forced to drive sick and injured children almost 100 kilometres to the Sunshine Coast. Constituents and the medical profession are constantly contacting me, concerned about the declining services in, services. in some cases, the removal of services altogether. A delegation of doctors came to me concerned about the reduce, uh, reduction in surgeries at the Gympie Hospital and loss of specialist services. No one finds out until they notice a change in what is provided or the loss of services. Whenever you ask questions, you, you meet secrecy, cover-ups or stalling. The government needs to upgrade Gympie Hospital or start planning for a new hospital. It's on a constrained site on top of a steep hill with poor parking. Glenwood needs an ambulance station with more than 6,000 people from Glenwood and the surrounding towns, wait up to 40 minutes for one to come from Gympie or Maryborough. So, Deputy Speaker, the Kalula Coast needs a new police station. The Imble Police Station needs upgrading. We need improved train services from Gympie North to the Sunshine Coast and Brisbane, more public housing, housing and a multi-purpose facility. Road and bridge infrastructure needs upgrading, including overtaking lanes on the Tin Ken Bay and Rainbow Beach roads. Bridges on the Glastonbury Road, including the Eel Creek Bridge, the Merry Valley Highway, improved street lighting at the intersection of Rainbow Beach Road and Queen Elizabeth Drive at Kluwer Cove. Mr Deputy Speaker, despite eye-watering borrowings and record debt, the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, or DAF, is going backwards in funding and staff. DAF's operating budget is cut by more than 10 per cent from $586,733 million to $522 $630 million this year. That's a cut of more than $64 million. DAF staff numbers are cut. DAF is losing staff while more than 30,000 extra Brisbane bureaucrats are on the government's payroll. DAF staff numbers have been falling year on year. This year it will fall by 10 and there will, and there will be one less in biosecurity. Other departments grow, grow. DAF is declining. Front of counter services are cut, DAF offices are closed, extension services have all but disappeared, research and development is being left to others. 
This budget neglects to consider valuable innovation and technology adventures in agriculture. There is no mention of capital funding for ag tech and no mention of investment to incorporate world's best practice, sustainability and technolo technological development. Pest and weed management is barely mentioned. Most shamefully, DAF's as assets are being sold. The Agriculture Minister says he is spending funds to finalise long-term decisions about agricultural education assets. He is working out what he is going to do after he shamefully closed Queensland agricultural colleges. The government has already sold agricultural education assets. They, the spend is spread over five years. It equals about a third of what they have made from the recent fire asset sale of only one property, that being Berrigarra. With 65 per cent of the state in drought, farmers continue to struggle with high power and water costs and an unlevel playing field for water costs. ag for ceo Michael Guerin said, discrimination is alive and when it comes to water used for farmers. The state government has established what is essentially a first and second class system for water use for farmers. DAF has already identified a shortage of between four to 9,000 seasonal workers in horticulture across the state. The budget has no detail on assistance for quarantine costs for foreign workers who are desperately needed on farms. Growcom Chief Executive Stephen Barnard said, this shortage of workers didn't rate a mention by the Treasurer. The upbeat tone taken by both the Premier and Treasurer doesn't match the reality growers are living. The only announcement relevant to the seasonal labour was $2.6 million for implementing the Australian Government's Pacific Labor programs. We expect this will be spent in head office and doubt it will directly result in one additional worker arriving in Queensland. So, Deputy Speaker, the budget has not delivered. The only thing that's been delivered is a press release with little detail. The, Gov the Queensland Farmers Federation called it underwhelming and that it appears to be all style and not enough substance. CEO of the Queensland Farmers Federation, Dr. Dr Georgina Davis, said that the budget's headline numbers could not disguise that it, it was again a missed opportunity to address some critical productivity issues and exciting growth opportunities. She said, without more targeted and deliberate action from government, agriculture will not fully capitalise on the exciting opportunities that are unquestionably available. In today's Queensland Country Life, QFF President Alan Dingle said it lacks substance. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Minister loves tabling the Queensland country life when his picture is on the front page. With 65 per cent of the state in drought for some years, the Queensland country life noted the Treasurer's budget speech only mentioned agriculture and drought once in the 40-minute speech. And it wasn't announcing specific commitments other than a passing mention that drought relief assistance was a concession, the Treasurer said, in industries like agriculture and mining have, have been key to economic recovery, keeping Queensland working and our economy moving. It is a sign of, sen of sensitivity and desperation that the Minister could only compare figures from seven years ago with DAF's, DAF's current budget and to repeat the media spin of his press release. And in today's Dorothy Dixit from the member for Mackay, the Minister even admitted he has cut DAF's budget in the last three years. Meanwhile, other departments have record increases. It is clear agriculture is not on the government's radar. It's clear no one is listening to the Agriculture Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, DAF's budget has provided nothing and no vision. The only extra funding is for red and green tape, for extra regulation which chokes industry. The Minister has lost the confidence of the commercial fishers with the implementation of the onerous fishing reforms. There's no detail in the budget. The Minister ignored the advice of the Queensland Productivity Commission, which said a regulatory impact statement was needed into the fishing reforms. Instead, the Minister supported the abolition of the Queensland Productivity Commission. So, Deputy Speaker, we've waited 19 months for the Minister to appoint the Timber Advisory Panel. There's now little confidence it will provide the answers for the security of the industry's future. The Minister clearly isn't and can't stand up for the, the, the sectors he is supposed to represent around the Cabinet table. So, Deputy Speaker, DAF's budget is clear evidence Labor doesn't care about agriculture, fishing and forestry, other than turning up for a photo opportunity. The Minister talks a big game, but when it's time to deliver, he has failed. Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Rockhampton. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak in support of the Appropriation Bill 2021-22, introduced by the Honourable Cameron Dick 
Treasurer and Minister for Investment. This is another great Labor budget for Queensland, and I'm pleased to be able to respond to another great jobs budget for Central Queensland. Yeah. I feel great pride in the wonderful outcomes that this budget will bring for all Queenslanders, none more so than my constituents in the Rockhampton electorate. It is interesting, there was an article just a few weeks back where the Brisbane Lord Mayor was co complaining about the spend per head on infrastructure in sec central Queensland. In central CQ, we've been above the state average in terms of infrastructure spending for the past few years. A couple of years back, it was about uh, 4,200 per person, and now it's up to 4,700, which is 66% above the state average. We're talking about a whole range of infrastructure projects here. Rookwood Weir, the Gracemere Highway duplication, the Correctional Centre, the Rocky Art Gallery, roads, roads and more roads, and the list goes on. This just highlights the investment the Palaszczuk government is making in central Queensland and regional Queensland. I'm pleased to say 61.2 per cent of infrastructure spending is being budgeted um, is outside the Greater Brisbane area. This uh, budget is, uh, will be providing $973 million for infrastructure spend for Central Queensland, supporting over 3,000 jobs. Again, this health budget, we will uh, see record funding of $691 million, up $30 million. The staff of the Central Queensland uh, Health and Hospitals uh, Services have been working under very challenging times with the impact of COVID, and I thank them for the amazing work they do each and every day. There is uh, 11 million uh, to progress the new uh, drug rehabilitation centre and cardiac hybrid theatre, and the expansion of the mental health ward. I must say again, thank you to the amazing staff of Central Queensland Health and Hospital Services. They do a wonderful job in our community. There will be one million towards the North Rockhampton Ambulance Replacement, 5.5 million for the Rockhampton Ambulance Station and Operations Centres uh, as part of a major refurbishment. And I must thank the staff there too, uh, whether they're the staff taking the calls to those responding in the field, they do an outstanding job. We all know how important education is to securing better life outcomes. It's essential that our schools are maintained and there will be 1.88 million for the schools in the Rockhampton local government area. There will also be $80,000 for the Allenstown School for a shade structured playground. Glenmore State School, 250,000 to refurbish the covered area. Gracemere Primary School, 300,000 to upgrade the amenities and 295,000 to combine the net and tennis courts with um, shade structure and also 400,000 for the perimeter fencing. North Rocky Special School will receive 7.95 million for additional classrooms. And one of my favorite schools, the Hall School, will receive 1.6 uh, million towards their new hall. <laughs> Rockhampton State High School will receive 500,000 of 2.5 million for the new skills development and training facilities and the list goes on. Our 2.9 billion total housing investment is the largest concentrated investment in social housing in Queensland history. We're investing 1.9 million, uh, 1.9 billion over four years and establishing a 1 billion housing investment fund to boost housing supply. We are increasing the supply of social and affordable housing by almost 10,000 homes. Uh, over the life of our housing strategy, and this will include 7,400 new builds over the next four years. In central Queensland, uh, we are committed to commence 113 new social homes uh, by the 1st of July 2025, uh, through a planned investment of 39.9 million over four years. This will support more than 125 jobs, this is in addition to the 48 social housing homes that have been uh, already commenced in central Queensland since 2017. Given my passion for, how, uh, for the provision of housing services, it's also great to see ongoing funding of more than $3 million for specialist homelessness services. 
Across Rockhampton and central Queensland, we will continue to see investment of more than $120 million in roads infrastructure projects like the Bruce Highway between Rockhampton and St Lawrence, completion of the Northern Access Road, Gracemere Highway duplication also nearing completion, Laurie Street duplication, as well as the additional passing lanes on the Bruce and Capricorn Highway. And these projects are supporting approximately 1,300 jobs. And let's not forget the billion dollar Rockhampton Ring Road that will be commencing next year. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation. Um, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech uh, is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Mr Speaker. Call the member for Whitsando. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to contribute to the Appropriations Bill uh, and in particular uh, outline my concerns uh, that have been shared by my colleagues around the budget cuts of infrastructure spending by $4 billion wow. and the need for this government to borrow to pay wages just to keep the lights on, a government that sells itself an asset uh, to itself uh, nothing more than creative accounting is what I think uh, many across our state would be thinking after the handing down of the budget. I'd like to touch on first the portfolios in which the portfolios that I am, Order, members. That I am responsible for, including uh, child safety uh, and in the interest of child protection. Pause the clock. Minister for Education and the member for Nanaga will cease you quarrelling across the chamber. I call the member for Woodsando. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I'd like to first address the budget for child safety that's been allocated, uh, and this budget outlines, and I do share the views uh, of the Leader of the Opposition today that did express uh, our uh, support for the increase in the frontline workforce of child safety workers, uh, an additional 154 frontline workers over the next two years. Uh, and accordingly, I encourage the Minister uh, to engage significantly uh, across the child safety sector to ensure that the culture and the policy position is set to ensure that that funding uh, is utilised in the way that is going to protect children. Uh, I'd also like to encourage though, the minister to consider greater additional funding uh, for foster carers and also uh, frameworks and structures that help support uh, those across our community that want to engage. And when I speak to foster carers and those undertaking applications, Mr Speaker, when it takes over a year, a year and a half, it takes longer, in fact, um, than it does to uh, fall pregnant and deliver a child uh, to become a foster carer in this state, uh, I think there is room for improvement. We have willing and able uh, community members out there that have a lot to give, uh, and we need to do a lot better in that space. I'd also like to touch on the domestic violence portfolio, and it is very pleasing to see that the government releases a statement for women, and it's also pleasing to see that they also adopt the uh, Morrison approach to economic security and safety for women, as we saw them deliver earlier this year uh, a, this, the most significant budget for women uh, allocated. So very pleasing to see the alignment of the Labor state government to that of the federal uh, the Federal Liberal National Party, who, who are Order, investing in women's security and safety. What was disappointing to see in this state Labor budget in the protection for women is only a new commitment of $7.5 million uh, per year over the next four years. Uh, a statement of $30 Order, million dollars, uh, could, be, could be seen as bolstering what is a desperately needed, underfunded segment uh, of, the, of, uh, of service in domestic violence, Mr Speaker. But what was disappointing is when you compare this, this state's contribution to that of Victoria, who have contributed uh, significantly to domestic and family violence as well, uh, it leaves the sector uh, wanting. So on the back of the $25 million that was uh, directed by the Scott Morrison uh, coalition government, in response to COVID-19 and to domestic and family violence, this state government only contributed $7.5 million, which was only 29 per cent of what the federal government contributed. Uh, compared to their Victorian counterparts, who committed $20 million, which was 65 per cent, in fact, uh, was a contribution. 
And I think those working across the sector uh, would be pleased if we had seen uh, a similar uh, percentage contribution by this state government. I'd also like to take the opportunity to advocate on behalf of the sector. I had the great privilege, Mr Speaker, of attending a meeting of the Queensland Domestic Violence Services Network in Mount Isa last month. It is disappointing that the minister was unable uh, to attend uh, a meeting with that, those stakeholders, but I certainly valued very much their time and the opportunity to be able to speak with them uh, about the approach that they see uh, that, that is needed to ensure that their funding is sustainable into the long term. COVID has brought about a number of impacts. Uh, in fact, we hear it from this government every single day in the House. But what there is not a recognition of, Mr Speaker, is that uh, the, the funding that was allocated to domestic violence services, in fact, was only touching the sides. It only filled the, 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 uh, the lack of funding, really, for the need that we already had. COVID has made that worse, and we need to see an increase in funding, in core funding, to support those services each and every year over four years so that they can have certainty about retention, strategies for their staff, workforce development, upskilling, and to deal with the complex issues uh, that we are seeing day in, day out. I'd like to recognise the high-risk teams that take a coordinated approach uh, and are working well across the state, but where we see an increase in funding, we would be able to help more women and children uh, and others that come forward after um, experience trauma or domestic and family violence. Uh, I'd also like to outline in my own electorate that Mackay and the Wit Sundays, uh, my electorate starts in the northern beaches of Mackay, which is the fastest growing part of the Mackay local government area, uh, right through to north of Airlie Beach. And we contribute significantly uh, to this state uh, is economy. What is disappointing is the lack of investment in infrastructure projects across regional Queensland and across the Whitsundays and Mackay. The lack of economic infrastructure that leaves regional Queensland wanting. And I've heard many ministers stand in this house and quote the Bruce Highway. Well, when we see a $4 billion uh, cut to infrastructure funding, and the state government is already behind, $6 billion behind, yeah. in funding, yeah. maintenance for the Bruce Highway. Yeah. I invite the ministers to come and drive my part of the Bruce Highway, Quite like our cycling. shadow minister, yeah. uh, the member for Chatsworth, yeah. has. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. oh, and in fact, if, if the minister Water members. would like to come and cycle uh, the Bruce Highway, I would be happily. I would happily host him in my region. Order, member um, for Logan. Risking his life. You know member for Pine Rivers. To come along. You know uh, we don't have a shortage in my community of projects. We have we have a long list of projects that this government could have chosen to fund, but instead uh, they have the mark has fallen short. We have a skill shortage across the Whit Sundays community. We have a housing shortage, Mr. Speaker. We have a health services shortage, Mr. Speaker. And it is disappointing that the Labor government chose to re-announce projects that have been under construction since Cyclone Debbie, Mr. Speaker. No new projects across the Whit Sunday electorate. In fact, most of them will be almost finished in the last quarter of this year. Uh, to see a re-announcement of the Mackay Ring Road and upgrades to the Bruce Highway that I can drive, the Ring Road is finished. We can proudly announce it's finished. It's actually been opened, but budget. yet it's in the budget. It's in the budget. So the feasi but yet the feasibility study for the Mackay Bacasia Road upgrades, Mr Speaker, have been pushed out in the forward estimates to 2023-24. That is a critical road in and out of the northern beaches of Mackay. It is a critical road to transport children into and out of the schools. It is a critical road for emergency services. It is a critical road for commuters. And this state Labor government has no plan, has no plan for that road, has no, has no allocated funds to build the duplication of that road. Uh, there has not been an exclusive, exclusive investment in social or community housing for the region. And recently, when I had uh, the Shadow Minister for Housing visit the region, uh, the response that we received through the media from the member for Mackay is that there are 10 new social houses being built in Mackay. Well, that's fantastic for the 800 applicants awaiting social housing uh, across Mackay and the Whitsundays. 
While with Sunday and Mackay Regional Councils, and I had the privilege to speak to both of my mayors in the last 24 hours, do welcome the Works for Queensland program, and I too, as a former Deputy Mayor, uh, see the value in that program. That program. What, I'll take that interjection, actually. I'll, I will speak about George Christensen, because George Christensen has delivered more in infrastructure funding uh, for the seat of Mackay and the seat of Whitsunday than this state Labor ha government has in your entire term. So I'll take that interjection. Uh, what's his margin? I'll take that interjection from the member for Bonnie. His what are members? He's sitting about 13.5 per cent, I think, across the safe Labor seat of Mackay. Thank you. So the, the Labor government have continued uh, to ignore the Whitsunday region. They continue to ignore the health demands in a regional community. Order member for Keppel. I recently visited the Proserpine Health, uh, Health and Hospital Service uh, with the newly appointed chair and CEO, and I was very pleased to engage with the local health service and the amazing job that they do there. But what is not pleasing is to see no commitment to the renal dialysis unit that the Labor government committed to during the election, of which a local resident in my community, Navio, has been fighting for a renal dialysis unit for a long time. And I quote, he says, we need facilities closer to the people who require this service. I can't see why the Queensland government keeps talking about how good their health system is, but a centre like Proserpine doesn't have a service. And nothing infuriates me more, Mr Speaker, than I see an announcement for South East Queensland, and I'm all for uh, an increase in services for people all across Queensland. But new satellite hospitals so that people are closer to services when I have people in my community risking their life driving on the goat track that is the Bruce Highway to be able to access renal dialysis. People in their, in their elderly that have to make that trip twice a week. It's, it's, it's appalling, Mr Speaker. I'd also like to touch on the announcement that was made for the Resources Centre of Excellence, Mr Speaker, that's outlined there in the budget. It's a fantastic facility. It too is open. Uh, and the $7 million that's outlined actually in the budget statements uh, and the promotional material in fact is inaccurate, Mr Speaker, because the Mackay Regional Council co-contributed half of that funding on the back of the former leader, uh, the member for Nanango, who made that commitment uh, after the last election. So it's fantastic and I thank and recognise Mackay Regional Council for their contribution. This, this budget also delivered no water infrastructure and I see the Minister over there and I've written to the Minister and I've written to the Deputy Prime Minister because Urana Dam, Mr Speaker, is ready to go. It is ready to go to deliver water security for the Sundays. It is ready to go to deliver uh, renewable energy. It's also ready to go to ensure agriculture uh, across our community is supported and expanded. It's also disappointing to see no new tourism infrastructure, uh, Madam Acting Speaker. But what I would like to recognise is the hard work of my RTO, the way in which they engage partnerships with Tourism Events Queensland and the private sector. And I want to take this opportunity to also acknowledge a very successful event uh, hosted by Kev Collins and Fish Divine recently, uh, which was the White on White, and it was a fantastic event. And I'd also like to take the opportunity as well to recognise the leadership of our Tourism with Sunday CEO, Tash Wheeler, who in fact tendered her resignation yesterday and will be finishing up uh, with the organisation in September. Tash and Pete came to the Whitsundays in 2013. Uh, she has grown brand with Sundays. Her family has grown during that time. She's demonstrated tremendous leadership on the back of COVID-19 and the impacts on the tourism sector. And so I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of everyone in the Whitsundays community and the broader state tourism community to recognise her efforts. Today also, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is the show holiday in Mackay, and I know the member for Mackay also would be, you know, like me, wishing we were there, um, perhaps not sharing um, any fairy floss together, but oh, certainly uh, you know, engaging with our local show community. And tomorrow, it is the local show holiday in Proserpine, uh, which is a very exciting event. Cyclone Debbie caused significant disruption uh, and destruction to the grounds, in particular to the pavilion. During the election, I committed to funding the final stage of the pavilion project upgrade. Unfortunately, the state Labor government 
decided not to fund our rural regional show. It is mean. But the member for Dawson was able to speak, speak to the minister, to Minister Littleproud, and was able to meet that funding shortfall. And they'll be opening that on Friday. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to recognise Brooklyn Laid. Um, India Laid, Georgia Cam, Grace McDonald, Meg Wilson, who raised thirty thousand dollars at the recent Proserpine Show Ball, which is going to go a long way to upgrade those facilities. And the night was a huge success, and those young women uh, made an enormous contribution in fundraising. Uh, and it's something now that will be uh, locked into the annual calendar. With the Proserpine Show opening tomorrow, I'd also like to wish Donna Rogers and her committee uh, all the best as well. So overall, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, this budget was disappointing, to say the least, for the people of Whitsundays, but I will continue to fight for those priority projects that are important and continue to advocate for the fair share that we deserve in regional and rural Queensland. Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Maribyrnong. Deputy, Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the appropriation bill to the budget, the fantastic budget brought down on Tuesday by the Treasurer. Deputy Speaker, this budget is a massive budget for the Mirabra electorate. We'll start off talking trains, and everyone knows I love talking trains. Six, $600 million to start the first uh, batch of trains for the Cross River Rail project. And we hear those across the other side saying, Cross River Rail, Cross River Rail is no good. But when you talk about the Cross River Rail trains, there's a supply chain right throughout regional Queensland. There's jobs being created in regional Queensland. Townsville, Rockhampton, Mirabra and Ipswich. That's what this train is all about. It's a Queensland train manufactured in Mirabra. And unfortunately, unfortunately, they don't get it. They don't get it that, that the trains, this, the Cross River Rail project is very, very good for regional Queensland. $600 million to start it off, and also a train manufacturing facility, uh, Deputy Speaker. So, Mirabra, Mirabra, the Palaszczuk government has made Mirabra again the train building capital of Australia. We build the best trains in Australia, if not the world. Some, a great skill base in Mirabra on the trains. Deputy Speaker, it's, it's like the old Hedgehoppers Anonymous song. It's good news week for Mirabra. Order. We will continue. We'll talk about the new train station, a $12.4 million investment in the new train station yeah, yeah. at Mirabra West. This is a, a brilliant uh, thing for the whole of the Fraser Coast because when you come up on the tilt train made in Mirabra to go on holidays in the Fraser Coast, you'll be able to get off at a brand new rail station, and that's delivered by the Palaszczuk Labor government. That's what we're doing. We're reinvesting in regional Queensland. So the whole, the whole, the whole of this budget is, is about making sure that we're keeping jobs in regional Queensland. It's about jobs in regional Queensland, Deputy Speaker. And the Education Minister, you know, could be the Queen of Mirabra because when we look at, at what's happening in Mirabra in, in, the, in education, Albert School. The Albert School is a very special school. It's one of the oldest schools in Mirabra, and the Governor went to the Albert School. His father was the principal there, and, and the Minister is giving money to upgrade Albert School, Aldridge High School, Bruwina State School, Granville State School, Park State School. These are all small schools that the Minister has listened to me, and that we're investing money in these smaller schools. Tyro State School. St Helens State School and the Tanana State School. We care about education on this side of the House. We care and we make sure that the facilities are up to standard and that's what this Education Minister has done. We're, we're, we're giving the teachers the wherewithal to turn the children out for the next jobs in, the, in this state and that's what we're doing. I'd like to thank the Minister on behalf of the Mirabra uh, community and particularly the PNC associations that I talk to uh, who are very happy with what's happening in education in, in the Mirabra electorate. Then we talk roadworks. And, uh, Deputy Speaker, I might be here for the next hour because we're talking about a lot of roadworks. We're talking about a lot of roadworks in the Mirabra electorate. And, you know, there's no, you know when your government's good when people are pulling you up and saying, hey, tell that minister to stop doing roadworks, please, because we have got a lot of roadworks happening. And I'll talk, I'll talk. I'll take them, I'll take them. I'll, I'll, the, 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 the roadworks in this budget. Order. The roadworks in this budget, Deputy Speaker, is absolutely phenomenal for, for the electorate. So 
we, we, we start with the Tyro bypass. There's money there to start the consultation, the design work. The ministers listen. We had to drag, and I mean physically drag, the federal member. We had to drag the federal member to, the, to, to talk to the deputy prime minister to get the money. We still don't know when the money's coming. We know they've promised it, but we don't know what date or when. But we've put money in this budget to start the planning and start the consultation about the four lanes around Tyro. Road. So that's great. We've also got money for the Burrum Heads Pile Road intersection. Now this intersection is an intersection that's probably the busiest in the, in the wide bay. And, and we start that and we're going to make sure working with the federal government. So the federal member for Hinkler, he said to me, I'm giving you the money. 2024. I said, now come on, mate, we need that money a bit earlier. This intersection now is very, very busy. So, He's thinking about bringing the money earlier for us, but at the moment it's in the 2024 budget for the federal government. Our money's there now to start. So I just asked both federal members, to, to uh, while they're in Canberra, to how about go and knock on some doors and, and getting, some, getting, getting some money and bringing it forward for both the projects. A record health budget, once again. $724 million for the Wide Bay Health and Hospital Service. Thank you very much to the Health Minister. As we've got an ageing population, work with the member for Harvey Bay, work with the member for uh, Bundaberg with, to make sure we've got adequate health services across the WBHHS. And more good news today. Look, more good news, Deputy Speaker. It doesn't stop. And I'll take that interjection from the member for, for Pine Rivers. It doesn't stop for the Mayor of Electorate because this Palaszczuk government is delivering for regional Queensland in spades. The Minister the Brenny today announced energy rebate support regional farmers and employers. Now, I've actually worked well with the Minister and he's done a fantastic job because the biggest foundry on the east coast of Australia is the Mirabur electorate. He, I had meetings with him, he listened, he spoke to the foundry people, he spoke to the other stakeholders, the AMW, who represent the workers there, and the result is it's a good result for Mirabra. 125 jobs will stay in the city. The foundry will stay there. This, this is what this government does. We listen. The minister's door, and I'll say this, the minister's in the house. The minister's door was open all the time for me. Every time I approached the minister, he sat me down and we talked and looked at it, and he understood the value of this foundry to my community. And thank you, minister. I really appreciate what you've done for the workers at the foundry. It can, quite obviously, this budget is a great budget, Deputy Speaker, and it's very good for the Mayor of Electorate. It's very, very good for Queenslanders. And I hear the other side saying no one in Queensland wanted it. Well, I'll tell you what, they should get out of their rooms and start getting on the streets. And I commend the bill to the House. Mr. De uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Burley. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I also to uh, rise to give my budget reply speech. Um, as uh, many members have said tonight, and the, uh, and the Treasurer in fact said himself, this clearly is a Labor budget because it's full of um, miscommunication, false finances uh, and trying to lead the people of Queensland astray. It's full of smoke and mirrors, quite frankly, <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, I had a, I had a wish list um, for my electorate which included more police in the southern Gold Coast. Um, CCTV cameras to deter hooning in my electorate, a bus service for old Burley Town, and I've been harping on about this for a number of years, and I've talked to the Minister for Transport. Funnily enough, the Minister for Transport tells me that buses can't go into old Burley Town. And yet, at the moment, while the M1 is being upgraded, there are um, B doubles going through there. And there is, in fact, a bus that goes through there, privately run, but apparently TransLink buses can't go in there. Maybe if the minister actually came down and had a look, he might figure out that that could in fact happen. I wanted to see some planning and investment for rock. I wanted to see some planning and investment for rock barriers around the Ocean View track uh, to prevent future closures. Now that track closes all the time. Every time there's heavy rain, cold, or a fire, uh, rocks fall down onto the track and destroy it, and it gets closed for a period of time. These, these problems happen in other parts of the world. It's not that hard to fix. We just need a viable solution and a bit of money spent on it. So if the um, Minister for the Environment can think about that for the future, that would be wonderful. Um, more beds, frontline workers and better service delivery um, to um, cut the hospital wait times and less ambulance ramping. We don't need bigger ramps at our hospital. We need less 
ambulances waiting to get patients onto a bed. And um, we've been talking about this now for a long, long time. Labor Party are terrible at managing the health system and it's getting worse by the day. Um, delivery of the promised classrooms and upgrades at Palm Beach State School and the Palm Beach Currumbin High School, and I want to thank uh, the Minister for Education for sending an email today outlining um, the expenditure in my schools. Um, it's very nice to have a minister who actually does talk to opposition members every now and then. Um, so we, we are getting that funding. The Palm Beach State School is $7.9 million out of a $10.6 million, $10 million for new classrooms. And the Palm Beach Currumbin High has uh, $5.1 million of $10 million for a new hall. I welcome those things. I welcome the $500,000 for the Burley State School general upgrades, and I welcome the $600,000 for Canindra Bar's refurbishment of um, Block 5. I also wanted to see uh, fast tracking of the M1 upgrades. Unfortunately, this budget has only $200 million out of a $1 billion project. Uh, that's only 20 per cent, 20 per cent of the upgrades that people in my electorate can look forward to over the next 12 months. The Minister should be Order members. The Federal Government has, has contributed their money. Why is the State spending their money and bringing these things forward? Um, we also see in the, uh, in the uh, glossy brochure about the Gold Coast that uh, the Gold Coast Satellite Hospital is being built somewhere on the Gold Coast, but we have no idea where it is going to be. The last I saw, there was actually a plan, uh, there was a pin on a website at Treasury which showed this satellite hospital in the, in the middle of a brand new biggest church in, in Burley that we have. And I can tell you the Catholic parish was not very happy about the fact that the government were telling them they were going to build a hospital on their brand new $20 million church. Not very happy at all. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, light rail stage three. What a clear debacle. What a debacle. What a debacle. We now see another $113.8 million in this budget, which takes total funding so far for this project to $191 Member for Miller, million. Member for Logan, State government all have contributed to this. The project's blown out to over a over billion, $1.044 billion, because of the grubby deal this government has done with the CFMEU, the ETU and the Plumbers Union. A grubby, grubby deal, Madam Deputy Speaker. In fact, um, the, contract, the contract hasn't been signed with John Holland yet. Wouldn't you think, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that this government might reopen the tenders, given that the project is blown out by 50 per cent, a $300 million blowout because of this best practice industrial uh, conditions that the government have imp imposed on this Member particular project. Member for Miller, they haven't, put, they haven't put the, the tenders back out. They're instead dealing with the one tenderer who is now in a position to say, oh, I'm going to get an extra $330 million on this project. Wow, great. Let's bring it on, bring it on. In fact, a foreign tender as well. A foreign tender as well. Um, unfortunately, the federal government fell for the, for the plan that the state government gave and gave an extra $126 million to this project without considering where their money was going to go. Their money is going to go to the CFMEU, the ETU and the Plumbers Union, quite clearly. So, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I thought I'd try and find out a little bit more about this um, best practices industrial conditions. So I put in a number of RTIs. Um, to the Department of Transport, the Department of Housing, who has uh, procurement, uh, to have a look and see what sort of communication the Transport Minister may have had um, with the Minister for Housing, what sort of communication the uh, Transport and Main Roads might have had with the ETU, the CFMEU and the Plumbers Union. And I'm going to table the responses I got from, uh, from the RTI section of TMR which tell me that I can't see any communication, any emails, any correspondence uh, or any memos between the Department of Transport, the ETU, the CFMEU and the Plumbers Union because it's 
cabinet in confidence. Since when, since when, Madam Deputy Speaker, do emails and correspondence between a Department of Government and the ETU and the CFMEU and the Plumbers Union end up, end up at uh, cabinet in confidence? This is the government that, tell, that told us in 2015, when, during the governor's um, speech, that they would be open, transparent and accountable. Well, they're far from that. They're far from that. You've only got to look at the RTI situation that I, I'm being denied information about. I've asked the minister, I wrote to the Minister for Transport on the 29th of March, and, and I asked him to come down to Palm Beach and talk to the people of my electorate about light rail stage four. 29th of March, uh, member for Theodore, I haven't had the courtesy even of a reply yet, and yet the Minister for Transport has spent all day today trolling my Facebook page to attack me, and uh, it, it, it didn't end up. I got to tell you, I got to tell you, Madam Deputy Speaker, it didn't end up well for him. Order, members. Didn't end up well for him because the people in my electorate absolutely slammed this minister for refusing to come down and talk to them, feigning consultation with the people of, of my electorate. Apparently last year they did 500 phone calls through my electorate to talk about light rail stage four, and I can't find a person in my electorate who actually took the phone call from it. So that just didn't happen. But uh, back to this grubby deal with um, with the um, best practice industrial Member for Miller, please use all interjections. Back to this grubby deal um, with best practice industrial uh, conditions. This has caused a blowout of the Townsville Stadium by $43 million. It's caused a blowout at the Capricorn Correctional Centre, the Cairns Convention Centre, the Gatton Correctional Centre, and I think Cross River Rail is going to get hit pretty severely like by this. So I've written to the... Uh, I, I've written to the Auditor General. I've asked him to have a look at best practice industrial Excuse me, Member for Burley. The word grubby or grubbing is I unparliamentary. Draw. I would draw. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've, I've written to the Auditor General. I've asked him to have a look at all these things and, and the best practice industrial conditions and see how this is going to affect every government contract going forward over the next few years. It's had a 50 per cent effect on light rail stage three the project's delayed. Uh, it's not going to get any. There'll be nothing extra for the people of my electorate from $330 million extra. And, and so, uh, if the auditor, I'd urge the Auditor General to have a look at this. I really would. This is really important. It's going to have a real detrimental effect on uh, government projects going forward. What it means for the light rail stage four, I really have no idea because it's blown out light rail stage three by 50 per cent. I think we can anticipate it'll do the same thing with light rail stage four. It was already estimated to be over $2 billion, $2 billion. And if it, it blows out by 50 per cent, it'll be another billion dollars. It'll just never happen. Quite frankly, it'll never happen. I've, um, I've even written to the um, Deputy Premier to ask him whether um, whether, he's, whether he has conditioned the Gold Coast City Council to look at all the development that's happening along the route uh, because of light rail, the possibility of light rail coming in the future. The government hasn't even thought about these things, Madam Deputy Speaker. That's how incompetent they are. Look, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, the, the Land Titles Office, well, what a farce that is. What a farce that is. Last sitting it was $4.2 billion, now it's $7.8 billion. Um, if you look at Australian and international accounting standards, you just can't capitalise something uh, like that unless you actually buy it. Unless somebody pays something for it, that's, you can't capitalise it. It's against the corporation laws, I would suggest. Maybe some of the lawyers in the room, um, I know there's some competent lawyers on our side, I'm not sure about the other side, but maybe if there's anybody who knows about corporations law, maybe they could tell us, or maybe, maybe uh, the member over there could possibly tell us whether this, is, whether this actually, whether this would comply with the corporations law, because there's no money changing hands here. Order just members. just capitalising uh, the land titles office. And I had a bit of a look to see whether I could figure out how much money the land titles office uh, makes. And, 
It's nowhere. It's nowhere. Um, but what they have done, there's no money changing hands, but what they are doing is they're saying, OK, well, we'll, we'll put this apparently $7.8 billion into a fund and anything it earns will direct that towards the completely unfunded renewable energy and hydrogen fund, the, ha the billion dollars for housing, a couple of billion dollars for health, the debt reduction fund, the $300 million treaty fund. And, and look, if you go to page 126, I think it is, of uh, budget paper number two, there's a statement in there that tells you that $1.8 billion of that particular $7.8 billion is being set aside for those particular things. Now, this is money, this is money that the government usually spends on hospitals and schools and more police, and all of a sudden this money has been shifted into a, into a fund that is now going to pay for these anonymous um, renewable energy programs and housing programs that really don't exist. The money won't be there. Uh, we don't know how much it is. In fact, it seems like the Treasurer doesn't know how much money uh, the Land Titles Office um, generates. It's a pretty easy thing if you're in business at all and you want to go and sell, sell something or you want to put a, a capital value on something, you have a look and you see how much it earns and then there's a multiple of it. Now, how can the, how can the government have got this so wrong? 24, 25, 30 times, whatever, whatever it's going to be, have a look at how much it makes, multiply it by Let's give it a generous 30 times. That's how much it's worth. Now, I can't imagine that the Treasurer of this state got this so badly wrong that he couldn't multiply whatever this thing earns by 30 and come up with a number. What I suspect has happened here is they needed that extra $3.8 billion, so they just decided, oh, well, well, we'll call it $3.8 billion more. This is like me saying, my car, I use it for Uber, and so it earns me it earns me a hundred dollars a year. It's worth a billion dollars. It's worth a billion dollars, my car. So Order. I'll take that to the bank and I'll buy a mansion somewhere with that billion dollars worth of equity I, I've suddenly that suddenly appeared in my account. Look, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the ratings agencies out there, out there aren't that stupid. They're going to see right through this, and we're going to see our our credit rating. Uh, fall through the floor and our interest rates goes back, go up. This is smoke and mirrors. This is absolute rubbish. This is labonomics. This government is messing up this state. And they've messed up this budget. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Mundingborough. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak in support of, of the Queensland State Budget 2021-22. As this is my first opportunity to speak, during the sitting of the Parliament, I would like to acknowledge the passing of Duncan Peg, Peggy and pass on my sincere condolences to his family and friends. I was fortunate enough to, uh, to get a brief opportunity to sit next to Duncan in this place. Although my time knowing him was short, I can truly understand why his loss is being felt so deeply by so many. His legacy as a true community champion, advocate and friend to so many will live on. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is my second state budget uh, speech and reply, and I'm pleased I was elected on some very important key commitments for the people living in the state seat of Mundingborough. <clears throat> I must also add that the return of the Palaszczuk Labor government was due to the Premier, assisted by her Deputy Premier, and Cabinet showing strong leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. We know this pandemic is still with us, but our COVID-19 uh, economic recovery plan is helping shape our economic future, a strong future focused on jobs, infrastructure and, most importantly, our people. It is also important, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I deliver on my commitments to the people of Mundingborough and to make sure that they get their fair share out of this very important budget. The Queensland record $22.2 billion health budget is an investment for the people of Queensland to provide a high standard of health care which all Queenslanders deserve. Not like the LNP Morrison government slashing Medicare and placing pressure on Queenslanders to pick up the slack of the federal government and furthermore forcing Queensland families into higher health insurance premiums. In Townsville, I call on the LNP federal member for Herbert, Bill Thompson, to stand up to Canberra and reinstate the entire Medicare service and to also provide more bulk billing doctors. 
Philip Thompson has failed our ageing community by not providing more aged care beds to meet the growing demand by our senior Queenslanders. Order Those on members. the other side continually complain and interject about the health professionals at the Queensland hospitals. Not a word from them about the Morrison government slashing Medicare or failing to supply more aged care beds. Nothing. Just continually playing the blame game and silly politics with people's health. The Queensland opposition leader needs to step up, show some leadership and take Morrison on. Enough is enough. Madam Deputy Speaker, us on this side of the House know investing in good quality health care, employing highly trained health professionals, providing job security is extremely important and the, wrong, uh, and the right thing to do. The LNP and the Morrison government just don't get it. The LNP and the Morrison government must now be held to account. In the seat of Munningborough is the Townsville University Hospital, the only tertiary referral centre in North Queensland and the largest hospital in Northern Australia. It is important to note that $17.8 million has been allocated in this budget for the construction projects to improve facilities at the Townsville University Hospital, including the expansion of the outpatients department. A new $1.4 million paediatric cardiology service has also been announced for the hospital to make sure that the 150 young people in their families requiring the service no longer have to travel to Brisbane to receive this very important health care. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk Labor government continually demonstrates time and time again it is serious about delivering high quality health care to the people of Townsville. On Tuesday, the 2nd of June, I accompanied the Health Minister along with young Bodie Campbell, who has used the hospital emergency services on several occasions. It was a privilege to see young Bodie, his mother and the Health Minister open the new $1.6 million paediatric emergency services department at the Townsville University Hospital. This new purpose-built facility provides 12 new emergency services bed beds for young people, separate from the adult emergency services department, another great improvement to health services in Townsville. Madam Deputy Speaker, education is fundamental for the development of our future leaders. Six schools across the seat of Munningborough will be beneficiaries of $11.1 million investment and new and existing education facilities. The Townsville Community Learning Centre will receive a total of $7.9 million to build additional learning spaces and commence the early stage of the new school hall facility. Walgaroo School uh, State School will, will receive $350,000 to refurbish learning spaces. William Ross State High School, $400,000 to refurbish their science lab. And Nuba State School will get their first $256,000 of $500,000 for a cupboard link to the hall. Cranbrook State School will get $700,000 for a new school security fence. Cranbrook State School, 200,000 to upgrade this, uh, the year six playground. And Currajong State School, 280,000 to install a lift to an existing raised covered walkway to allow access to blocks A and C. And a further million dollars for additional maintenance and minor works of schools across the seat of Moneyborough. Madam Deputy Speaker, whilst we here on, the, on this side of the house invest in education and our young people, the opposition leader was responsible for selling and closing schools as a former member for Munningborough and the Minister for Local Government under Campbell Newman. That is right. Member for the Theodore. opposition leader sold schools and closed schools. This morning he stated in this place that he wanted to be transparent. Order members. This morning he stated in this place that he wanted to be transparent and accountable. I call on him to come into this place and admit that he was a member of the Campbell Newman government that sold schools and closed schools. It would be a good starting point and the right thing to do. I still talk to families who remember when the Stewart State School was closed. Mothers crying. Young ones forced to find new schools. Increased travel for families. It was an absolute shame. On a more positive note, Acting Deputy Speaker, more great news from the budget for the seat of Moneyborough when it comes to roads, intersection upgrades and shared pathways. Stewart Drive, University Road to Bowen Road Bridge, $1.3 million for design, survey, geotechnical investigation and public utilities relocation. This is very exciting news for those who travel the stretch of road on a regular basis. It is also one of my key commitments at the last state election. That was to build four lanes along this section of road. My commitment to the people of Moneyborough, we will get this done. There's, University Road got $300,000 for new noise barriers. 
Discovery Drive, your land to drive intersection upgrade planning for 331,000. Rooney Bridge Rehabilitation Works, $473,000. Douglas Cycleway Discovery Drive to Yolanda Drive Construction Shared Pathway, 895000 Angus Smith Drive, Parkinson Road to Joseph Banks Avenue, Design Shared Pathway, 22500 Stewart Drive Guard Trail Drive Intersection Construction Priority Crossing, 31000 and the Townsville University Hospital Intersection Upgrade Planning, 60000 Madam Deputy Speaker, it is great to see $122.7 million allocated to the first homeowners grant in this budget. This is a fantastic news for those wanting to purchase their own home, and it also creates jobs. There is also a new action plan and a $2.9 billion investment to set fast-track social housing delivery. Under this action plan, projects and initiatives will be fast-tracked to increase the supply of social housing across the state and, more importantly, in Townsville. Also, a very important announcement with the $1.9 billion to be spent over four years to boost housing supply and increase housing and homelessness support across Queensland. This investment will increase housing stock and assist more vulnerable Queenslanders into homes quicker. This is another important area that the Morrison government has failed, and more importantly, the member for Herbert, Phil Thompson. Community sa safety, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the recently passed Youth Justice and Other Legislation Bill 2021 is working. Quoting Superintendent Newton, Townsend Bulletin, 2 June 2021. Superintendent Newton said, the changes made a significant impact for police. Probably the most important to us is that presumption against bail and the involvement of parents, he said. I think that's what will have an impact and a continued impact. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, no amount of crime is acceptable. That is why it is important to invest in more police and resources to manage offenders. Police and corrective services are a very important part of this budget. As promised during the 2020 election campaign, the building of a new police station at Kerwin now recognised in the budget. In the coming weeks, I will accompany the police minister to the induction ceremony of more police for North Queensland. The Palaszczuk Labor government is investing in police and police resources. Not like the LNP who sack, cut and sell. This is right, uh, Acting Madam Deputy Speaker. If those from the LNP got into power, we would not have a police training facility in Townsville to train the extra police. Corrective services get a further $20.6 million in the budget to complete construction Order. of an extra 398-bed Capricornia Correctional Centre facility, a further $320 million to commence construction of a further 1,000-bed facility at the Southern Queensland Correctional Precinct. The total cost of construction $654 million. That is right, Madam Deputy Speaker, more capacity in our Queensland Corrective Services facilities to lock up the criminals. I commend this bill to the House. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Clayfield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, this budget is a triumph of spin over substance. And I think uh, the member for Everton uh, made spinner. that point in his contribution to the debate a little while ago. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, not only is it a triumph of spin over substance, it is a budget of hope over experience. Hope that things will be better. Experience under Labor, we know they won't. It's built on a combination of wishful thinking, financial trickery and windfall gains. It promises much but actually delivers so little. It spends more but delivers less. And so far as spin goes, the Treasurer has spent all week claiming debt will be less. But the budget papers reveal just the opposite. In each year that this Treasurer has been in office, total state debt increases. It goes up. In fact, out to 2024-25, the current budget papers show borrowing with the Queensland Treasury Corporation increasing by about $10 billion a year till 2023, then $7 billion, followed by a final tranche of $5 billion in 2024-25. That's almost $43 billion in additional borrowing since just 2020. And under Labor, and under Labor, since 2019, borrowings with QTC have increased by an eye-watering $51.5 billion. Member for Maribor, member In for five Tom years Gull. under Labor, borrowings have exceeded the previous 165 years of borrowing of the state of Queensland. That puts it all in perspective if you ever needed it. And with lease liabilities, and with lease liabilities included, the total 
is an even more staggering $56.9 billion. And Mr Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, I should say, where is most of this debt being incurred? Because we kept being told it doesn't matter, it's in the government-owned corporation sector. They earn an income and that will pay the interest on the debt. Well, we know that the government-owned corporation sector is flatlining. It's getting less. The government-owned generators aren't even actually going to produce any revenue for this government in the last two years of the forwards under this budget. It's so uncertain they can't tell. And, Mr Speaker, where, and, and Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, of the 56 billion, 53 of it is in the general government sector. It's going into the general government sector. So to hear the Treasurer talking about less debt is not only an assault on the truth, which no one's terribly surprised about, not only is it an assault on reality, which no one's terribly surprised about, it's an assault on his own budget papers and an assault on common sense and the future prosperity of Queensland is because today's debt is simply tomorrow's increased labour taxes. To hear the Treasurer claim in exultant tones, as he does over there making his pitch for the, for the, for the votes from the backbench, that Labor's debt is going to be marginally less than last year's horror projections is like hearing a drunk claim to having beaten the bottle because he only drank three and a half bottles of scotch, not the full four. And to continue the analogy, and to continue the analogy, the promise of the so-called debt reduction fund is like the same drinker downing a tumbler of water between bottles in the hope that the hangover won't be so bad next day. And who's going to have the hangover? The hangover is going to be the people of Queensland. They are going to be paying the price. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, if that debt was being used in the main for increasing the capital stock, if we were actually going to get something tangible and productive from it, you might be inclined to accept the increased level of borrowing. But again, the budget figures show this isn't happening. The figures show net debt is still getting worse. It's blowing out. Since 2019, it's blown out by $42.6 billion. And what does the Treasurer's own budget paper say about net debt? At page 131, it says, net debt indicates the soundness of the government's fiscal position, as high levels of net debt will require servicing through interest payments and limit flexibility to adjust expenditure. So by their own measure, by their own measure, by their own papers, not only is it getting worse, but they're being told what the consequences of it getting worse are, and that is less flexibility and higher interest payments. And the figures show that a large part of the borrowing is not being used to increase the capital stock of the state. The things Queensland needs, like roads, ports, railways, things that facilitate economic growth and activity. Because if that were occurring, then for every cent that you borrowed, There'd be and a liability incurred, you'd get an asset of the same value. Mm -hmm. That's a novel idea. And your net debt wouldn't be getting worse, but it is. You'd get an asset built to the value of the borrowing to help generate the income necessary to pay the interest on the debt. You've got to pay it sometime, especially with the $21 billion that QTC had borrowed by the end of May and had already locked in. And the massive increase in net debt tells us that's not happening. Not one cent of existing debt has been identified as being paid down. There's no less debt expected this year than was achieved last year, or the year before that, or the year before that. There are fiscal deficits every year and have been for every year since 2017-2018 under Labor. So, Mr Speaker, the spin that this is all about COVID and its COVID-related borrowing is just that. Order it's members. Just spin. Debt and deficits are well and truly were well and truly locked in before COVID. This Treasurer is just making them worse. Just making them worse. And I take the interjection from the member uh, for uh, Miller. He says you can do better. We can do a lot better than this government has ever been able to do. We can do a lot better. 
and and Madam Deputy and Speaker, order and Madam members. Deputy Speaker, if he just waits a little longer, I'll tell him how we did do it so much better. There you go, Miller. You can't. Uh, you can't. You can only repay debt. You can only repay debt by actually paying it off. It's got to be less. You can't do it by shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic. That doesn't work. Because he knows this is the case, but can't or won't do anything to fix the problem, the Treasurer is now inventing a new mantra. He says Queensland debt is not a problem. He says we should embrace borrowing more. He said we should borrow more, but actually get less. He tries Member to convince Queenslanders that there's no consequence of Labor's debt binge and their failure to have a path out of ever-increasing borrowings. And just this morning we heard the Treasurer with his continued attempts to spin away Labor's failure to control its spending. And he referred, if, memories, uh, if memory serves me, to the LNP government, which he does all the time. It's a fixation with him. Oh, yeah. He must study the figures and wonder, how can I do as well as the LNP government? He reads my speeches. He even quotes them back at me. And they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> of course, what he failed to point out what he failed to point out is that the LNP government started off in our term of government inheriting five years of Labor fiscal deficits totalling more than $22 billion. So we're $22 billion behind when we started in 2012 and two years of operating deficits under Andrew Fraser and Anna Bly. And the member for Woodridge and the member for Inala and the member for McConnell were all sitting around That's the cabinet right. table right. approving those budgets each and every year that it happened. So when we started with Labor's accumulated losses already in the operating statement on, Ju on 1 July 2012, we had a mammoth task. But despite the lead weight in the saddles, we managed to turn those operating uh, losses around in just one year. One year after starting more than $22 billion behind. And we dealt with unexpected shocks too. We dealt with things like ex-tropical cyclone Oswald and a plunge in coal royalties of more than 20 per cent and a 10 per cent drop in predicted stamp duties that had been boosted by Andrew Fraser and Anna Bly and the member for Woodridge as a member of that cabinet so that they were expecting to get 14 per cent year-on-year growth in stamp duty revenues at the height of the global financial crisis. And despite everything the Labor Thurringer. government says, our purchases of non-financial capital assets, that is, the productive stock, like schools, hospitals, roads, ports, was higher in our first year of government than every year under Labor from 2013 all the way up until 2020. And from 2013 onwards, and from 2013 onwards, our fiscal balance was better than every year under Labor from 2008-2009. And, and who can forget, like they want to forget, that Queensland under Labor was paying a higher interest rate on its debt than the state of Tasmania. That's who they measured themselves against. Whoa. And on top of that, they had sold off $15 billion right. worth of assets. Sold, sold, sold. But guess what? The debt still didn't go down. Oops. They spent it all, wasted it. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, no one says borrowing to fill holes in revenue caused by unexpected events should never be undertaken. That's not my position. It's never been my position. But when borrowing continues year in, year out, as it has under Labor since 2017, the excuse wears thin. And it bells the cat on Labor's claim that borrowing to pay the bills is only COVID related. It's Labor habit, it's Labor mismanagement, pure and simple. So, Madam Speaker, there is so much more that I could say in relation to uh, the, uh, the debt and the deficit, but I want to move on now to talk about um, Labor's financial trickery and the way that they have, in fact, benefited from the great initiatives of the federal LNP government, yep. the windfall gains that this government has benefited from, Madam Deputy Speaker. An extra $1.5 billion this year alone from the GST. 
and continuing increases of 5.4 per cent next year and 5 per cent for the following three years. Can we remember them bleeding about the GST? Year in, year out. Not enough. We're not seeing any money of it. And now the rivers of gold are flowing their way because of the extra funds arising from the federal government's outstanding COVID responses, including the billions provided through JobKeeper and JobSeeker, funds that kept being spent in Australia and boosted those, and boosted those funds. And then you've got the second windfall, stamp duty. 21.4 per cent windfall this year, 24.5 per cent next year because people have confidence, because the Morrison government has kept them in jobs, kept their businesses operating. And we remember, not only are they buying their houses to live in, they're buying Order. investment properties as well. And we remember what Labor want to do with investment properties. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We all remember Bill Shorten's That's successful right. policy. Yeah. How, did that negative, how did that negative gearing policy go? Well, well, that went well. well. Take, that home, Mr. <laughs> Take that home, Mundingborough, and see how that went for you. <laughs> No wonder Philip Thompson's doing so well up there. No wonder, no wonder he is slaying the Labor Party up there, and will continue, and will continue to do so. And then there's the trickery. The titles office financial trickery. It has all the hallmarks of the bankers out of Russia and all those places. Four billion dollars three weeks ago. Eight billion dollars three weeks later. If it was so great, table the valuation. Exactly. If it makes so much exactly. sense, table the valuation. Commercial in confidence. Hang on a second. Who else is competing with the titles office in Queensland? No one. No one. Not a single soul. A transfer that amount. And where's the money coming from? All the financial trickery. No one actually says, is it a loan? Is it debt? Is QTC being asked to pay for it? A QIC going to the market to fund it? How's it being funded? Not a word in the budget papers, completely opaque, complete financial triggering. He would, he would know. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the minute remaining for me, the seat of Clayfield. And you see a heat map being put out by uh, the government saying where we're spending money. Well, I can tell you the heat map is icy cold when it comes to Clayfield. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, that's nothing new. We take on all comers and we're very happy to take on the Labor Party. They've been trying for a long time. And, Ms. and Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, the member for Miller, who waltzed out in his cardigan last year to sort of announce an upgrade of the oh, Woolawan Railway he's Station. Oh, he's he's Order, Station. members. Well, why don't you do the Albion one that you promised five years ago first? We're still waiting on it. He was going to supersize the Albion Railway Station. All we got is a super delay from a super dud. The schools are missing out. Kedron State High School still in a hall from 1960, despite 1,800, mem uh, 1800 students. Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, a dud budget from a dud government led by a Deputy Speaker with no skill and no. Member, ability. your time's up. I call the member for Nicklin. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise in support of the appropriation bills for the 2021-2022 budget. But before I go on, I'd just like to, uh, like the rest of this chamber, offer my condolences to the family of Duncan Pegg. He was a great member and an excellent parliamentarian, and it's a great loss that we all share. Same, on to the budget, and it is a terrific Labor budget. How good is it to be a Queenslander? We may have lost Origin 1. But as the Treasurer handed down this budget, it has been explained how we are ahead of all the other states in the important economic indicators. I thank the Palaszczuk Labor Government and the people of Queensland, whom have united to recover, and we are doing that sensationally. The challenges that we face are correctly the focus of this budget. Infrastructure, public health, education and social housing. Underpinning this, investment in the future we are creating jobs, jobs, and wait for it, more jobs. A Labor, a Labor budget with Labor values, backing Queensland workers and their families. On the Sunshine Coast, $730 million is being spent on infrastructure, creating 2,300 jobs. So many of my local tradespeople are benefit, benefiting from this construction bonanza. $1.4 billion is being invested in health services, $140.5 million in education and $38.5 million for social housing. 
We are on the road to recovery. The region of Nicklin is likewise. As a community and state, the positive and immediate actions that have been taken regarding the pandemic have put us in the best position of any state in the country. Speaker, I thank the member for Miller and his department for all the work they're doing and continue to do in my electorate. The Beer Burham to Nambour Rail Upgrade Stage 1, pedestrian res refuge on the Yandina South Connection Road, widening works on Kyamba Road, Image Flat Road to Waddle Road. These are some, but there are other projects that will ease the burden of congestion and unblock our arteries of the Sunshine Coast so good services and people can get to where they're needed. I'd also like to thank the allocation of $20 million for the Sunshine Coast Stadium. And I'd like to acknowledge my, my friend, the member for Caloundra. We are going for the NRL bid for the Dolphins, and we do have an Olympics upcoming, and, and we'd like to be considered on the Sunshine Coast. This is a responsible government that gets things done. Speaker, the Queensland Public Health Service has been critical as we navigate the ravages of the unforeseen COVID-19 pandemic. The Palaszczuk Labor government has allocated a record spend of $22.2 billion over this budget cycle. $1.4 billion of this is allocated to service on the Sunshine Coast. In my region of Nicklin, Nambour General Hospital will have $31 million spent this financial year as it transforms into a subacute facility. This in addition to restoring frontline services on the Sunshine Coast to the tune of 310 extra doctors, 979 extra nurses and 72 extra paramedics. Since the Palaszczuk government was elected in 2015, and these figures will continue to grow as they are needed. I really must thank the agility of our health system, as we had COVID cases just days before the Sunshine Coast show. The speed that extra vaccinations became available and the quick activation of an additional testing site at Caloundra Aerodrome ensured that the show did go on. A fast acting and responsive government getting things done. Speaker, the education system has had 140.5 million allocated to schools on the Sunshine Coast. Speaker, the local schools that will benefit are Burnside State High, which will see work started on their new performing arts facility. Chevalon State School, a refurbishment of Block 15. Nambour State College, refurbishment of Block M, including five learning spaces. And Yandina State School, a senior playground upgrade. I know that the many schools in my region, particularly the older ones, are struggling with increased demand and old rundown facilities. I hope to get some of the maintenance funds allocated, allocated to those schools. The pa Palaszczuk Labor government can be trusted with education. We owe it to our children to get things done. I'm pleased to see the record spent on social housing delivered in this budget. I look forward to the completion of 16 units off Arundel Street in Nambour, which will be delivered in September. These units have eight dwellings that are platinum standard and eight that are gold standard. This means that they will be home to some of our most disadvantaged. In addition, I noted the funds have been allocated to NGOs in the region, Coastal Bay Housing Group and Kyabra Community Association, both located in Nambour. Across the Sunshine Coast, many other organisations have likewise been funded. A Palaszczuk Labor government committed to getting things done. Whilst we're talking on the budget, I'd like to mention something regarding funds, but on a much more micro scale. How good are community gambling benefit grants? You can embark on huge projects such as hospitals, roads, schools, etc. Indeed, we must. But when one of these many community groups are afforded one of these grants, it is just so pleasing. It is personal and it means so much to these groups. I'm sure that all the members of this chamber appreciate the work of the Attorney General's Office in providing these grants, community and government getting, together getting things done. Speaker, the farmer and fisherman's friend, the member for Fernie Grove, has visited my electorate and enjoyed a bit of time at the Sunshine Coast, cracking a whip and impressing the public. The new glass house at the Marucci Research Facility is now complete. The work done there that supports our primary producers is truly amazing. I look forward to the official opening. Speaker, work is nearly complete on the new police station in Nambour. At long last, our officers can move out of the portable buildings that they have endured for so long. It is scheduled for completion and is on track for September this year. I look forward to joining the Minister on Monday to oversee the work that is getting done. The new Kuro police station is in the planning phase and work is due to start soon with an opening date there of 2023 in the same month. The additional staff to the region will be most welcome when the appropriate facilities are finished to accommodate them. Finally, Speaker, with regards to skills, more support for our TAFE College, specialising courses in the gross jobs in our region such as nursing, aged care and hospitality, to name but a few. More funding for our small businesses who in the regional areas like the hinterland are big employers. The Minister visited and spoke with some of the business community early 
and has acted. The Chambers of Commerce will get a chance to talk with the Treasurer next week, thanks to the Member for Calandra and his Chamber. The Palaszczuk Labor Government and the Ministers listen and get things done. Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Condamine. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to make a contribution to the Appropriation Bill 2021. The Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and Treasurer Cameron Dick have stated that this is a typical Labor budget. Mr Speaker, they are right. A typical Labor budget full of dodgy accounting, black holes, announcements that are not funded or only exist somewhere out there in the never-never. There is no greater example of this than the announcement of the $2 billion Queensland Renewable Energy and Hydrogen Fund, which comes under my role as Shadow Minister for Energy. $2 billion, they claim. The government has already committed a good portion of the initial $500 million, and the budget accounts for another $500 million. That still leaves $1 billion unaccounted for. In response to my question without notice, the Minister responded by telling the House about the two lots of $500 million and seemed to think that this added up to $2 billion. That is not so, Minister. What we have is a $1 billion black hole, and there is still no detail on what objections this fund will achieve. This one is well and truly out in the never-never. Madam Deputy Speaker, I have asked the Minister on a number of occasions where is the plan for the renewable energy target. There is no spending set aside for developing a plan to hit the 50 per cent renewable target by 2030. As seen by the service delivery statement, the target for, 2020, target for 2022 is 22 per cent. There is no plan on how to double renewables in eight years' time whilst maintaining a stable, reliable and affordable grid. There is no plan. It does not exist. Oddly, there is a note buried in the service delivery statement which states the 2021-22 target does not take into account all renewable energy generation projects currently committed. Well, why not? Aim high and show Queensland you are serious about it. Why set yourself a target you know you're going to hit? You are marking your own homework and provide no basis for how you derive the 20%. It contains a mere $5 million to spend on renewable energy zones. We know from the New South Wales experience that if you're serious about this, it is a tens of billion dollar investment from both the private and public sector. Yet there appears to be a lot of press releases, but very few dollars to deliver. Have I have asked on many occasions, where is the detailed plan? To, resist, to transition to 50 per cent. Excuse me, Member for Condamine. The House will now break for dinner and resume at 7.30. Call the member for Condamine. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, taking up from where I left off, uh, there is confusion and concern in the market in all sectors. Thankfully, we had baseload coal and gas generators to carry us through the power shortage after the explosion at the Calide power station. Next time, we might not be so lucky. 
Whilst on the subject of the Calloid, Calloid Station, the budget papers contain no capital expenditure to repair Calloid C. So how do we have confidence that this will be rebuilt by April next year as promised? There is also the weird case of the diminishing dividends from our electricity generators, despite the fact that they are still shown to make a profit. Is this finally an admission that they have taken too much cash out in the past and they are now left vulnerable when it comes to paying for more vital maintenance? Madam Deputy Speaker, this morning we heard the Minister claim that he had solved the tariff issue that had been causing great distress and uncertainty in the ag industry and the foundry sector. The Minister spoke of a rebate that would resolve this situation. Like many things that this Minister says, this statement warrants much closer scrutiny. This rebate, as I understand it, begins at 90 per cent of the expected price increase and decreases 10 per cent year on year until the end user is hit with the full increase. So prices will increase by 10 per cent next year, 20 per cent the year after, 30 per cent the year after. This is not a resolution to, the issue, to this issue. This is a con job. This will slowly but surely drive industry, particularly the foundry industry, out of this state. This is incompetence on a grand scale. If you think that is bad, all these industries have to sign an agreement with the provider by the 1st of July this year. That is less than in two weeks' time. The minister needs to spend less time comparing himself to astronauts such as Neil Armstrong and more time focusing on the industry and giving it some certainty and direction. I'll now move on to the other part of my shadow minister role, natural resources and mines. Madam Deputy Speaker, we are all aware of the tragic event that occurred at the Grosvenor Mine in central Queensland on the 6th of May 2020, seriously injuring five underground mine workers. Our hearts go out to those injured, their families and work colleagues. Anyone that has visited an underground mine will be aware of how close-knit the underground team are. The former Minister Anthony Lynham established a board of inquiry into the incident chaired by Terry Martin QC. The findings of this inquiry have been delivered in two reports, the second of these tabled by Minister Scott Stewart this week. Now, while there were 20 first, 25 recommendations in the first report and 40 in the second, and these will take a little time to enact, one has been glaring. I speak of the resourcing, training and remuneration of the mining inspector. This was raised in detail in report volume one. This was also raised as a significant issue in the industrial manslaughter legislation. So it is disappointing that there is no additional expenditure to staff the appropriate levels of the mining inspectorate. We know that this has been recommended time and time again. This sort of investment can help prevent these tragedies in the future. I said during the industrial manslaughter debate that the government were not looking at the real cause of the failures and causes of these incidents. It is beyond time that this Palaszczuk government took some meaningful action to protect mine workers and not just look for easy headlines. Mine workers have every right to doubt the sincerity of this government, given the way they have treated the workers at the New Hope Ackland mine. 350 mine workers just thrown on the, on the scrap heap. That says it all. Despite this, the mining industry continues to deliver for this state and this nation. Whilst royalties took a hit during COVID and trade issues with China, they have regained much of that loss with coal alone contributing $1.75 billion in 2021 and 2021, and increasing 17.4 per cent in 2021-22. Despite this, the Treasurer mentioned the word mining only once during his entire address. This is the value the government gives to this industry. Madam Deputy Speaker, I will now turn to what this budget has delivered for the electorate of Condamine. Frankly, Madam Deputy Speaker, this will not take very long. It will, not take much lo it will take much longer to address the things that were not delivered. But here goes. There is a $3.5 million contribution to the Toowoomba Well Camp Trade Distribution Centre out of a total bill of $10 million. Madam Deputy Speaker, this facility is already built. 
construction is complete. There is another announcement, if you would call it that, and I will quote from the budget papers. The government con this is also out at Wellcamp. The government continues to work with the proponents of the Wellcamp Entertainment Precinct proposal, subject to Australian government funding and other conditions. Oh, I'm serious. This, this, that's what it says. With these two announcements, we are already halfway through the total commitments for the seat of Commonwealth. Going on that, the state government must think 50 per cent of the population must reside in the confines of the Wellcamp Airport. Let's have a look at the remaining two. 2.1 million to complete the refurbishment of the Garen Lee substation and the re-announcement of the funding for the Clifton School training facilities and to upgrade the hall. That's it. That's it. One re-announcement, one station upgrade, one project already finished and one with no funding. As I said, Madam Deputy Speaker, it did not take long. Now let's talk about some of the announcements that the residents of Condamine would have welcomed. There are no major road projects listed in the Condamine in the budget papers. In fact, no road project, projects, full stop. There are many roads that are in desperate need of attention. I have re repeatedly sure sought funding for the Clifton Leeburn Road. When I wrote to the Minister about the dangerous state of this road, all that happened was a reduction to the speed limit and a rough road sign put up. They, they are still there some two years later. Law and order remains a serious issue that has missed out again. The manning and the sad state of the Cambria Police Station remains, despite repeated requests and a petition delivered to this House on behalf of the residents. Rural crime is on the rise, property and stock theft, break and enter and trespass. This is putting increased workload on the Rural Crime Squad, formerly known as the Stock Squad. Madam Deputy Speaker, despite this, there is no mention in the budget papers of any increase in resourcing for this branch of the police force. We know that this minister does not support the Rural Crime Squad and was caught out last year when I asked a question without notice as to whether there were plans to move it into the CIB. Point the of minister order. minister did not reply. Point of order. Yeah, pause the clock, sorry. Take um, personal offence and the statement's misleading and I ask the member to withdraw. I member the um, minister has taken offence. I ask that you withdraw. I withdraw. The minister needs to recognise the important role these officers play and give them the staff and resources that they need. It was also disappointing to not see some funding for the Oakey Hospital. This hospital is well overdue for a significant upgrade, both for patients and staff. Madam Deputy Speaker, I note that the Palaszczuk government is continuing to pursue the quarantine facility at the Wellcamp Airport. We heard this morning from the Deputy Premier that the state government has upgraded its detailed plan for this facility from three pages to 95. You would have to ask why it has taken six months for the Premier to realise that five glossy pages do not pass for a detailed management of a business plan. The Premier has still not provided myself as a local member with this plan, nor have nor the members of the general public of Toowoomba. They have not seen any detail. The Premier should table this document in this parliament so we can all have access to it. The community have every reason to be concerned by this proposal, and the fear and concerns are only enhanced by the ongoing lack of detail. The Premier has deliberately sought to create division in the community on this issue by constantly blaming the federal government for not approving this facility despite the complete lack of detail. This whole process has been nothing short of disgraceful by all involved in this stunt by the Palaszczuk government. Madam Deputy Speaker, last week one of the largest agricultural field days in this country was held at Charlton in the electorate of Condamine. There were good sales across the three days by exhibitors, and record crowds were 20,000 through the gates on the first day. This event was attended by the opposition leader David Christofulli, Deputy Leader David Janeski, and about 10 LNP state members, along with, including the member for Gregory, <laughs> along with federal and, and the member for Callum, <laughs> federal NMP and senators, demonstrating their commitment to this important industry. In comparison, Madam Deputy Speaker, it was a no-show by the Labor Party, state or federal, demonstrating the value that they have 
for the industry. It was also evidenced by the fact that the Treasurer mentioned agriculture only once in his budget speech. If that was not bad enough, we have seen the Agricultural Minister today incorporate his speech after just a few minutes in this budget debate. Five minutes and 30 seconds. That is appalling, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Minister could not even be bothered to Five speak to this very seconds. important ministry that he holds. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is a budget of spin, trickery and deception. Inflated at value of assets such as the titles office, funds promised that do not appear in the budget paper and projects that have no funding committed. This is indeed a typical Labor budget and in the words of a former leader of this par party, it is full of jiggery paper. Just before I finish, I also would like to pass on uh, my condolences to the family of Duncan Pegg. He and I served on a number of committees together and um, I regarded him as a, as a friend and um, very sad with the, the loss. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker. Thank you, Member. I call the member for Miller. Uh, for, thanks, thanks, Speaker. Um, can I firstly also uh, acknowledge that you know, as a member elected in 2015, this is the first budget uh, that I've uh, been here without the member for Stretton. And I want to pay tribute to Duncan as a good friend, good comrade, a great MP and someone who certainly would have been a future minister, and we all miss him. Um, Speaker, this is the seventh budget of the Palaszczuk Labor government, and you cannot see this budget without considering the impact, the profound impact of the global pandemic and the management uh, of that by this government in a world-leading fashion, uh, something not acknowledged by those opposite. But when you look at the tragedies throughout the world, Queensland led the way, not just in this state, but across the world. People say, how did Queensland do it? Well, it came from strong, authentic leadership for, for a start, from the Premier, from the Deputy Premier, the now Deputy Premier, who was Health Minister. Uh, we declared a health emergency on January 29th last, last year. We were one of the first. We understood the threat. Uh, we closed the borders when we needed to against a, hell, a huge amount of criticism from those opposite, from the federal government, uh, and we stuck to our guns and we protected jobs, we protected the health of Queenslanders first and foremost. And to end up where we are is an extraordinary achievement. And it's not just an extraordinary achievement because of the, the lives we saved in Queensland and elsewhere from other jurisdictions that, let, that understood and learned from us. But we saved jobs, we saved the economy, and the sum of that dividends in this budget. You know, when you look at an unemployment rate of 5.4 per cent, you know, a drop of a half per cent in one month, you can see the boom. And what's happening? The confidence is with Queensland. 88% yeah. of net migration in the whole of this country. When you think of all the places people can move to, they're move, 88% is moving to Queensland. It's a vote of confidence in this state and this state's leadership. And it wasn't our Premier who equated the world leading uh, pandemic response to putting a doona over your head uh, and sucking your thumb like the member for Broadwater. You know, we saw his true stripes at that point that he's not a real leader, he's not authentic, he doesn't understand the economy, he doesn't understand the pandemic. You know, it's been pretty pathetic in the last few days to see the opposition you know, looking more like hey, hey, it's Saturday skits with their, with their wheel of fortunes. You know, which, one, which one's Aussie, the ostrich, and which one's Daryl Summers, I'll leave to you to surmise. But you know, they're empty cupboards and they're little skits. There is no substitute for content and substance, Speaker. And that's what we don't see. We don't, that was a low point of the opposition, I think, in the seven years that I, I've been here, to see those pathetic stunts rather than something substantial. They said they'd be different, and they are. They're worse. They're actually worse. Yeah, at, least you knew, yeah, at least you knew what Nenang, the member for Nanango, member for Clayville, stand for. With this uh, current leader of the opposition, he flip-flops from month to month. We're, we're borrowing too much. No, no, we should borrow more. We'll see what we say. Well, we'll see what we say next uh, next month, Speaker. You can't trust somebody who's so inconsistent and so weak. Uh, that's the truth of it. This budget absolutely critical. Another record uh, investment in road and rail across this state. Twenty-seven and a half billion dollars. Two billion dollars for renewables and hydrogen. The the you know huge opportunities in green hydrogen for this state 
uh, for decades to come. Uh, we've got social housing commitment of a billion dollars looking after people who need that help. $300 million path to treaty. It is really important. It is important for the soul of this state uh, that we have a genuine dialogue and respect for our First Nations peoples. And a treaty, a path to treaty, I invite all members of parliament to look into the wisdom and the need for this. It is something that we all will grow from. We will all grow from, and it's, it's not a party political thing. It is something that this, this state needs, and I think this country needs as well. And I, I, I hope everybody looks at it in that light. A record health budget, and you know, not just a record health budget in, in uh, you know, some of the obvious areas. New hospital in Roma. <laughs> LNP could have done that. New hospital in Kingaroy. LNP could have done that. It's actually a Labor government building new hospitals in LNP electorates uh, because we get it done. So you look at our record, 3.25 per cent growth in this budget against the growth. Growth got down to 0.7 per cent under the Newman government. They didn't even have a pandemic. No pandemic. Growth fell off a cliff because they sacked 14,000 people and botched the economy. Jobless rates surged to 7.1 per cent. And here we are, this Labor government, in the middle of a pandemic, and the jobless rates more than 1.5 per cent lower than when they were in office without a pandemic, and growth is nearly four times higher, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker. That is what we are here. We are seeing electricity prices fall by 7 per cent, wherein they went up 43 per cent under those opposite. We saw infrastructure cut at every LNP budget. We're seeing another record rail and road budget from this government. So that's the choice you, that, that we, we Queenslanders have to make. This competent, contemporary Labor government that understands the changing economy, that understands clean energy, that understands uh, technological change, or the old gang over there, you know, member for Broadwater, Newman government minister, member for Clayfield, Newman government minister, member for Everton, Newman government minister, uh, member for Nanango Chatsworth, almost a Newman government minister, uh, member for Service Paradise Classic, Classic, they're all still there. And whatever they say, you know if they ever got elected, it would be cart, sack and sell. We know that. Queenslanders know that. And that's the truth of it. From this government, you get Gold Coast Light Rail, stage three. Built the first two, we'll get the third section done as well. Bruce Highway upgrades, the inland freight route. Not, not through anywhere near a Labor electorate, but it's good economic policy, Speaker. Cross River Rail, what an awesome project Cross River Rail is, Speaker. Getting it done. It was cut. It was cut. Thank you, Member for Gregory. And then they promised to cut it a second time in 2017. How did that go for them? Got killed at the election, Mr. Speaker, because they don't understand infrastructure. Sunshine Coast Rail duplication, another investment in the Sunshine Coast where we've got two fantastic new members. We're supporting the live music industry who are finding it hard during the pandemic. And the Carbon Reduction Investment Fund, $500 million because we believe in acting on climate change. And the biggest fall in net debt in one year in Queensland history. So, Speaker, uh, a very clear contrast. A competent, strong budget from this government who managed the pandemic and saved Queensland lives and jobs or those opposite who have learned nothing from all their mistakes. Deputy, uh, Speaker, uh, the Speaker has reviewed, Deputy Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Miller. I understand that you have been approved to incorporate, so that um, is excellent. So. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I call the Member for Chatsworth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am pleased to rise tonight to respond to the Palaszczuk government's 21-22 budget. The opposition leader rightly stated in his budget reply speech earlier in this debate that every budget handed down sees each minister getting up and spruiking words to the effect, I am proud to announce a record budget for XYZ portfolio. As I stated last year, throwing ever increasingly large amounts of money into key government areas such as transport and main roads, health and education is not in itself a real measure of success. It is about the effectiveness of outputs, not just input efficiencies. Simply put, it is what you actually do with resources rather than just throw borrowed money continually at an issue. Now, given our state debt level will now blow out to $127 billion over the Ford estimates, this budget continues to fail future generations by avoiding the tough decisions required to be made by this generation. Unfair intergenerational debt will continue under Labor. 
I stated in my last budget reply speech that there is nothing wrong borrowing for income-producing assets. This is indeed basic finance 101. Now, given that market has defined a generation as around about 25 years, any piece of infrastructure which lasts for, say, 100 years will obviously have four generations of taxpayers derive economic utility from its use. It is extraordinary, however, that billions are being borrowed for recurrent expenditure rather than capital expenditure, state building assets. I will now comment on the budget in my capacity as the Shadow Minister for Custom Service and Shadow Minister for Transport and Main Roads. Madam Speaker, when you break it down, I mentioned late last year that the raison d'etre of the Transport and Main Roads portfolio is all about delivering an efficient and effective response statewide transport system that will connect people from one end of our vast state to the other, both now and into the future. Yet again, Labor's incompetent approach to the 21-22 budget, particularly for this key portfolio, means this worthy goal is still a long way off. The Minister for Transport and Main Roads wants to talk up the Transport and Roads budget, Main Roads budget and tell us it's a record. In effect, it is definitely more smokes and mirrors and exercise than a credible financial document for the future. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, let me begin a deep dive into the TMR portfolio and I will comment specifically. So, looking at Labor's record, the Minister will talk about a record $27.5 billion Q-trip. But what really is Labor's record? It is one of project cost blowouts and delays. Of course, the obvious starting point is the Palaszczuk Labor Government's signature infrastructure project, Cross River Rail. Let's start with the cost. Minister Bailey has said numerous times in this House that Cross River Rail is a $5.4 billion project. Extracts from Hansard uh, going back to page 310, 9th of March, $5.4 billion Cross River Rail project. Again repeated. Hansard, page 15, 23rd of February 2021, um, 5th of February 2020. 11th of December 2020, 26th of November 2020, 22nd of October 2019, Cross River Rail, a $5.4 billion transformational project, October 15, 2019, 21st of August 2019, back to June 2019, $5.4 billion. But what is the true cost? Page 126 of the capital statement shows $6.725 billion with $162 million in returnable works. If you believe that number, well, you believe anything. Madam Deputy Speaker, make no mistake, this project budget is under massive pressure. Project changes are being made to compensate and environmental standards are being lowered. Spoil haulage from CBD construction sites on a Sunday, which has never previously been allowed. The Clapham Stabling Yard will now take spoil 24-7. Is the project on time? The actual completion date for the project was raised at estimates last year. In a subsequent media um, interview, a Cross River Rail Delivery Authority representative said, and I quote, direct quote, it has been noted publicly on multiple occasions that major Cross River Rail construction works are due to be completed in 2024. This remains the case. Following construction and extensive safety testing and commissioning phase will commence. As has been stated previously, Cross River Rail passenger services are expected to be operational in 2025. The use of remains the case implies that services have always been scheduled to start in 2025. However, a government media release from 4th of April 2019 says, and I quote, Minister for Transport and Main Roads Mark Bailey said because of the Palaszczuk government's decisive action, Cross River Rail will be ready to service the South East by 20." 24. Another release from the former Deputy Premier dated 19th of August 2018 says, and I quote, Ms Trad said fans will begin accessing the Gabba via the new Cross River Rail Underground Station in 2024. Labor have been caught out trying to rewrite history to cover up a project delay. I mean, I know the Minister likes to wax lyrical about things being awesome, but maybe he should concentrate on getting things done. What about the perceived benefits? How predictable, Madam Deputy Speaker, the spin has well and truly begun from this government. It is now backtracking on the benefits of the project. In 2018, the project was promised to deliver Sunshine Coast commuters a train every six minutes in the morning peak. Now the Cross River Isle website says they could get a train every 15 minutes. In 2018, the project was promised to deliver Ipswich commuters a train every five minutes in the morning peak. Now the CRR website says they could 
get a train every 15 minutes on the Ipswich Rosewood line from Rosewood Station. And finally, in 2018, the project was promised to deliver Redlands commuters a train every five and a half minutes in the peak morning uh, time. Now, Cross River Rail website says again they could get a train every 15 minutes on the Cleveland line. We knew this was coming. The 2017 Infrastructure Australia assessment said that, and I quote, the project benefits as set out in the business case are significantly overstated. Let me repeat that quote. The project benefits as set out in the business case are significantly overstated. What about rolling stock? This budget also raises serious questions about whether the additional 20 trains that this government says must be delivered for Cross River Rail will be ready on time. Almost 60 per cent of the project budget will be spent after 24-25 financial year. Madam Deputy Speaker, how is that possible if Cross River Rail services will start in 2025? Now, either the trains won't be ready for Cross River Rail or Cross River Rail will not be ready for the trains. Pure genius. Are we being prepared for further delays to Cross River Rail? Make no mistake. This so-called signature project that is being overseen by a transport minister who is completely out of his depth, and he continues a long line of failed former Labor transport ministers when it comes to this project's delivery. Despite what the Minister for Transport and Main Road says, the LNP has always acknowledged the need for a second rail river crossing in Brisbane. It is true that we differed with the design and project scoping, as the initial plans under the failed Bly Labor government were totally inadequate. But it was always acknowledged that a cross river rail solution would eventually be required. However, as I have repeatedly flagged, we hold concerns about the lack of transparency by Labor regarding cross river rail's cost and benefit. Is it any wonder the cost benefit analysis was not supported by Infrastructure Australia? The minister puffs out his chest every time he boldly declares that Queensland will fully fund the cross river rail project on their own. And is it any wonder the Commonwealth? who, along with the Brisbane City Council, are fast becoming the de facto transport of main roads because the Commonwealth refused to fund a project that didn't stack up. Gold Coast Light Rail, stage three, what about it? Gold Coast Light Rail is another example of project delays and cost blowouts. Prior to the 2020 election, Labor said that John Holland had been selected to build the project and construction could begin before Christmas. What did we find out after the election? a $334 million cost blowout. The contract hadn't even been signed. Now the minister hopes to have construction started by this Christmas. Let me be perfectly clear here, Madam Deputy Speaker. This project is only going ahead because of a $126 million bailout by the LNP federal government. Yes, another bailout for Minister Bailey. What about the Coomera connector? Construction due to start in mid-2021. However, we understand that a contractor hasn't been appointed yet. After questioning, we were advised at estimates last year that the whole project from Coomera to Narang would be completed by 2025. But hold the phone. The TMR website says construction timing for the central and southern sections is yet to be confirmed. This year's Q-trip shows that 41 per cent of the budget will not be spent until 25 26 financial year. So don't bet on a 2025 completion. What about the reduction in the 21-22 Q-trip spend? So far, I've focused on major projects in South East Queensland, but I can tell you that disappointment in this year's budget is spread right across this vast state. Let's look at the forecast 21-22 spend from last year's Q-trip compared to this year's Q-trip. Across the state, $763 million less will be spent on transport infrastructure this year, compared to what the Labor government said and promised only eight months ago. That is a drop of 11 per cent. This government is pushing projects further out into the Fords to cover over a budget black hole. The Bruce Highway, Cunningham Highway and the Warrego, all key corridors and all projects that have been hit. Let's talk about bridge strengthening at Palm Tree and Black Rock Creek on the Bruce Highway up between Mackay and Proserpine. Last year, Q-Trip said there would be $8 million spent in the 21-22 financial year. This year, Q-Trip says just $410,000 will be spent. This is the Clayton's approach to funding, where you allocate a minuscule amount for show 
when you really don't want to be funding it in the first place. Let's talk about safety improvements on the ISIS highway between Bundaberg and Childers. Last year, Qtrip said there would be $12 million spent in 21-22. This year's Qtrip document says just $4 million will be spent. 119 people have died this year, to date, sadly and tragically, on Queensland Road. 16 more than at the same time last year. And very tellingly, $8 million of safety improvements have been delayed. What about inland freight route? Creation of an inland freight route was a key commitment of the Labor government prior to the last election. The Premier said in a media release, direct quote, we'll also build on our existing $125 million partnership with the federal government to improve the inland Townsville to Roma corridor by committing $200 million for the second Bruce to take trucks off the Bruce Highway. On the 10th of May this year, the Prime Minister announced that the federal government would commit $400 million to the inland freight route. Beauty, I thought. That's $600 million for this project. Imagine my surprise when I read Qtrip and Minister Bailey's Ford entity said, quote, We'll be working with the Australian government to identify and deliver projects under the joint funded $500 million upgrade on this corridor to encourage more trucks to move freight inland via the Carnarvon, Dawson and Gregory Highways. Now, I know maths may not be a strength of those opposite, particularly the Transport Minister, who I believe was a former high school drama teacher, who would appear to be much more interested in English, not maths, given his penchant for private emailing. But 200 plus 400, it does not equal 500. Where has the other 100 million commitment by this government gone? For the last two terms under Labor, the Queensland Transport and Roads Infrastructure Program, QTRIP, which outlines the current transport and roads projects, resembles a lay-by agreement. Outlying a dollar today, a few more next year, and the rest off into the never-never. What about backlog maintenance? Labor has neglected Queensland's roads for six years cutting infrastructure spending and allowing approximately $6 billion in backlog maintenance to build up. The figure, according to the Queensland Audit Office, will reach $9 billion over the next six years. Thanks to Labor, our roads are more congested than ever and less safe. In this budget, the maintenance spend has been increased from $4.4 billion to $4.466 billion. Any increase is, of course, welcome. But we know that this level of funding is not enough. The Transport Minister has advised that the asset sustainability ratio as of 30th of June last year was 51 per cent. That means we are only providing about half the funding needed just to keep the network in the current condition. In other words, we need to double the amount we are spending on maintenance. This budget does not do that. For Queensland motorists, this means more potholes, more dodgy bridges and less safe roads. I have always said the role of opposition is to hold the government to account, but not to criticise just for the sake of it. In that spirit, I would again like to congratulate the Department of Main Roads in relation to the Department's service delivery statement on page 7, which outlines their customer experience standards and effectiveness measures. I am very honoured to be appointed the first Shadow Minister for Customer Service by the Opposition Leader, and I congratulate the Transport and Main Roads staff. Madam Deputy Speaker, at the end of the day, this budget is simply bereft of visionary reform, as the Treasurer is, of showing humility. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. Abraham Madam Lincoln. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Member. I call the member for Gladstone. Thank you. I rise in support of the Appropriation Bill 2021. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm proud to stand in this place and to support, once again, another strong Labor budget. I commend the Treasurer for delivering such a strong budget, even as we continue to face the global uncertain time, globally uncertain times due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As the Treasurer rightly pointed out, the reason our government can deliver such a strong economic statement is down to our health response in this state. By putting the health and the safety of Queenslanders first, we are now in a position to deliver Queensland's plan for an economic recovery. And at the heart of this budget is a focus on delivering jobs right across Queensland. As Minister for Regional Development, I'm delighted to see the commitments made to job-creating infrastructure projects right across all of regional Queensland. Whether it's roads or health or schools or infrastructure, every dollar that we spend in regional Queensland delivers good, secure, local jobs for regional Queenslanders. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, that's an important difference between the Palaszczuk government and those opposite. When we make a promise, we certainly deliver. I can tell you regional communities certainly appreciate that. All too often, Madam Deputy Speaker, I hear of the stories of Campbell Newman gutting services and sacking public servants in the regions, and it had a huge negative impact on all of those regional communities. Of course, Campbell Newman didn't do it on his own. He had plenty and plenty of support and help as he recklessly slashed those jobs in regional Queensland. The former short-lived Premier was ably aided by many of those that sit opposite on the front bench currently uh, on that side of the House, including the member for Broadwater and the member for Nanango. The N member for Nanango in particular claims to be all about regional Queensland, yet she stood by and said and did nothing as thousands and thousands of jobs were lost under those opposite. Of course, Madam Deputy Speaker, it wasn't just the direct jobs that were impacted, but the jobs that supported those services in these communities that were also lost. Thankfully, those days are well and truly behind us, and it's a Palaszczuk Labor government that is delivering jobs, getting them back to regional Queensland. A big part of this strategy is our government's $3.34 billion Queensland Jobs Fund. The Queensland Jobs Fund brings together a range of existing funding programs and also delivers a new $350 million industry partnership program to focus our efforts on job creation right around the state. In particular, the industry partnership program that we heard of from the Treasurer will grow and create jobs in priority industries such as advanced manufacturing, hydrogen, biofuels, biomedical, defence, aerospace, space, resource recovery and our MET sector. Madam Deputy Speaker, if there's anything the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly showed us, it is that we need to be self-reliant when it comes to manufacturing critical products. As a Minister for Manufacturing, I welcome the focus and certainly the investment on this area as part of the Queensland Jobs Fund. I also recognise the huge potential the emerging hydrogen industry is for powering our state's advanced manufacturing sector. Hydrogen is already key for a range of industries that provide vital inputs into the manufacturing process, and as we grow this industry, more and more opportunities will become available to all of our manufacturers right across Queensland. Madam Deputy Speaker, water security is critical for our state's long-term economic growth. For regional communities, water security is a key component. Oh, don't you get me started on Paradise Dam, member for Calhide. For regional communities, that water security is a key component for long-term planning and future population and economic growth. While the Palaszczuk government has committed close to $1.9 billion to bulk water infrastructure across the state since 2015, we also understand the importance of water security in the water treatment plants, the reservoirs and water and sewage systems for our regional towns and cities. That's why I was proud to stand in this place yesterday to talk about the $70 million that we're investing in the round six of Building Our Regions program. By providing financial support to regional councils, Building Our Region program has a long history of delivering infrastructure improvements, economic opportunities and jobs for our regional communities. The first five rounds of the program have seen more than $348 million allocated to 271 projects across 67 councils. Building Our Regions has also leveraged more than $539 million in additional funding from other sources to deliver a, a capital expenditure of more than $887 million, supporting more than 2,700 construction jobs in regional Queensland. Madam Deputy Speaker, every mayor that I talk about in regional Queensland raves about the positive impacts Building Our Regions funding has had in their local communities. Round six of Building Our Regions to be delivered over three years will focus on delivering maintenance and improvement works to water treatment plants, reservoirs and water and sewage systems in all of our regional communities. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm not just a proud member of the Palaszczuk government. I'm also incredibly privileged to represent the great people in Gladstone in this place. For our region's education sector, there is more than $14.6 million in upgrades to the schools right across the Gladstone district and even into the uh, electorate of Calide, which uh, we're delivering a $60 million high school, which will be complete next year. 
We're planning for growth in new classrooms at Tulua High School, 1.8 million, and for the amazing team at Rosella Park School, who will receive more than $8.1 million. I'm pleased also to report that our smaller schools will also benefit in this, this uh, budget with $1.1 million uh, going into infrastructure and amenity upgrades at Yarwin, Ambrose and Mount Larkin State Schools. Our local tourism hero, Heron Island, will also increase renewable energy infrastructure and operate at 100 per cent from solar energy with nearly $87,000 of funding that will go to install new eco-tents. Uh, speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, everyone knows the Glasson region is the greatest place to live, work and fish. So our region's anglers will be pleased to know that we're delivering a $10.8 million fish hatchery at Awonga Dam. And you don't need a rod to enjoy the upgrades we're bringing because we're also putting 1.1 into continuing community walking trails at Boyndale and Four Mile Scrub. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to advise that we're also constructing a shared path on Tannum Roads uh, with $2.2 million going to that and an upgrade to Raglan Creek Bridge on the Bruce Highway and fixing up the Tulua Street pavement between Der Derby and Agnes Street. Madam Deputy Speaker, this budget is delivering and providing direct support to Queenslanders and I'm particularly proud of the significant investments it's making in our regional communities. I thank the Treasurer and I look forward to seeing these investments deliver real outcome from all of our communities in regional Queensland. Thank you. Thank you, Member. I thank call the Member for Vatican. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I rise to contribute to the debate on the Appropriation Bill 2021. Madam Deputy Speaker, what we saw in this place on Tuesday was the Treasurer taking the approach of famed American hoaxer P.T. Barnum and hoping that, indeed, there's a sucker born every minute. Unfortunately for the Treasurer, those of us on this side of the House are all over this hoax. But even more unfortunately is the fact that this hoax will have a disastrous effect on each and every Queenslander, including those in the Burdekin electorate. An electorate, I might add, that has played a large part in keeping this state afloat during the COVID-19 outbreak through the resource and agricultural sectors. The news that QTRIP spending for the coming financial year is down by 11 per cent will be no surprise to people in the Burdekin electorate, which is home to one of the most dangerous stretches of the Bruce Highway in the entire state. The section of highway between Zinc Road and the Ames Turnoff has claimed far too many lives. And I see the member for Munding Borough sitting over here tonight, and it used to be in his patch as a councillor, so he knows the section of highway very well. And I'd like to think that when they're having their party room meetings that he's up there raising the flag and calling on the minister calling on the minister to fund this section of highway because there's nothing in the budget to address that stretch of road which is still subject to speed restrictions. In the western part of the electorate we have the Peak Downs Highway, or as the locals like to call it, the Peak Downs Goat Track a road that continues to claim lives and is long overdue for major upgrades. The government's commitment to the current upgrade between Cavill Road and Wuthung Road is welcomed, but frankly, it is far too little and for some, far too late. Again, I need to mention the Kilcum and Diamond Downs Road and others, including the Bowen Developmental Road, the May Downs Road and Clermont Alpha Road, that are nothing more than dirt tracks. They are not just dangerous, they are impeding children getting to school, damaging emergency service vehicles, but again, nothing in this budget for those roads. And what we have to understand, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that for those people who live in the western parts of my electorate, these roads are the arteries. These roads are all they have to get their produce out, to take their kids to school, to travel to the coast. And I take the interjection from the member for Chatsworth. They are an economic artery. And the royalties and the wealth that this state takes from those areas comes out on those roads. And to think not one cent in this budget is going towards upgrading those roads is nothing short of disgraceful. The Treasurer can talk all he likes about investment in roads. But for my electorate, that talk is sleight of hand at best. Madam Deputy Speaker, agriculture plays a key role in the verdict in electorate. And again, all we can see in the budget for local primary producers 
is promises with no commitment to delivery. In Air, Home Hill, Clare, Gumloo and Bowen, farmers are desperate for workers due to the closure of international borders. This government talks a big game about helping, but in those towns the results speak for themselves. I guess the 10 per cent cuts in funding to DAF explain some of the hold-ups, but in the meantime, thousands of tonnes of fruit and vegetables are left to rot and Queensland families face eye-watering increases in the cost of fresh fruit and vegetables. And I don't think those opposite truly appreciate just how dire that situation is. And it was only today that I was talking to a grower from the Sunshine Coast who arranged a convoy of vehicles to transport 40 workers to the Burdekin to help plant this season's produce in that area. And put that in perspective, Bowen, a major horticultural area in the state, needs 3,500 seasonal workers every year. 3,500. In the Burdekin, a couple of thousand. And still, we are only bringing them in in small numbers. Madam Deputy Speaker, we have already heard from the Opposition Leader and the Shadow Health Minister about the absolute con job that is the hospital building fund and the impacts of the failure to properly fund health services in this budget will be felt in the Burdekin electorate as well. Among the so-called election commitments made in the lead-up to the October state election was dialysis services in Clermont and expansions of both the Bowen and Moranbar hospitals. Yes, the same hospital with a termite infestation. None of those projects are funded in this budget, and is there any surprise when this government is formed when it comes to failing to deliver health services in my electorate? In Home Hill, we have a fully equipped dialysis unit, but locals are travelling hundreds of kilometres a week for treatment because there isn't funding for staff. And I know that some of those patients are very elderly, and to think that they are being forced to drive the townsville and back for dialysis defies belief. And down the highway in Bowen, we have already seen a sod turning for the construction of the medical imaging unit, but no mention of the project in the capital statement. All we have is conflicting completion dates and a mention in the government's marketing document, but nothing in the capital statement. Madam Deputy Speaker, I also want to highlight the unfolding disaster at the Clermont regarding the lack of a doctor at the Clermont Hospital. As in many rural communities, the medical superintendent at the hospital has the right of private practice through a surgery located adjacent to the hospital. In recent weeks, Queensland Health has seen fit to close this surgery, which has meant local staff working in this surgery have lost their jobs. We're hearing that Queensland Health are moving to an alternative model. However, scant information has been provided to the community on how this model will work, and consultation with the broader Clermont district on these changes has been abysmal. It's not good enough, and it's no wonder the residents of Clermont are feeling like they are being treated like second-class citizens. Education is yet another area where this government has failed to deliver in the verdict in electorate. In air, less than 10 per cent of the funding needed to build a new multi-purpose hall at Air State High School has been delivered. I sincerely hope that the Treasurer's commitment to an extra 117 teachers in the Mackay Whit Sunday area is fully delivered, because we certainly need them in some of the communities in my electorate, communities like Dysart and Moranbar, which have significant shortages in teaching numbers. Again, no funding in the budget, Madam Deputy Speaker, for school halls, Clermont, Collinsville, Dysart, and no funding for the much needed upgrade to the administration block at Queen's Beach State School. Whilst I'm talking about education, I certainly hope the Minister has moved on the water situation at Valkyrie State School, which has made headlines in recent weeks. That's right, Valkyrie State School has no water and relies on a mining company to truck water to the school each week in a tanker. To think that we have a school in this state in the year 2021 without a water supply is unbelievable. The school community have identified a solution, but the minister is dragging the chain on this issue, and with each passing day, the situation at that school becomes more dire. In air, the Treasurer has failed to deliver any funding for the promised upgrade at Rugby Park. Talk the big game during the election, Madam Deputy Speaker, but no funding, despite the promises to junior players, yes, children 
and their families, there's not one cent in the budget for that project. And I ask, Madam Deputy Speaker, how much lower can you go than to deceive children? But the perception from this government doesn't stop there. And at Clermont, we were promised a new police station. And not only has the contribution in this budget been just over 1 per cent of the needed amount, the entire project has been scaled back. The allocation of $50,000 wouldn't even pay for a shade sale, let alone any sort of detailed planning. And this minister would have us believe that the $50,000 is going to pay for the planning for a brand new police station. Well, Will, I'm going to hold the minister to that, Madam Deputy Speaker, because we'll see what $50,000 covers for the Clermont community. For my electorate and many others, this is a budget that's big on talk and low on delivery. It's all well and good to talk about unite and recover, but yet again, there will be no unity while this government makes promises, fails to provide the funding. I could. I find it inconceivable, Madam Deputy Speaker, that this government could reduce infrastructure spending by $4 billion at a time when rural and regional Queensland are screaming for that funding. I'll bet there'd be a lot of councils around this state who would salivate at the thought of what they could do with $4 billion in infrastructure funding, not to mention industry groups across Queensland. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll now address my shadow portfolio responsibilities. And once again, this budget is big on rhetoric and feel-good statements, but small on delivery. For many Queenslanders, today is like too many days before it. Each day they wake up to check if their car is still in their driveway or if their house has been broken into. And each day they get more tough talk from this government on what is supposedly being done to rein in these hardcore offenders. But on Wednesday this week, they woke up to the realisation that all this government has to offer when it comes to crime is more talk. In Townsville and Cairns, there's just two example, examples. Every victim of crime, and there's thousands of them, saw absolutely no commitment to tackling this issue in the budget. In fact, they woke to the news that things will get worse. The Queensland Police Service, SDS, is a damning indictment of this government's failure to address crime. And let me explain, Madam Deputy Speaker, because it's right there in black and white that the target for total property offences for the coming financial year is actually higher than what we have seen in the current financial year. In Kerwin, possibly the heart of the youth crime epidemic in Townsville, again, less than 1 per cent of the promised funding for the replacement police facility was actually delivered, and statewide we have seen the acts taken to the capital funding for the Department of Children, Youth Justice and Multicultural Affairs just days after it was confirmed that, unbeknownst to the minister, young offenders were relocated to Townsville because of facility shortages in Mount Isa, 63 per cent of funding for that portfolio was cut. We need more facilities to address this issue. Yes, we need more boots on the ground, but thanks to this government's inability to make the tough calls, provide the legislation required and the facilities to house these young offenders, we instead get less than half the actual spend for 2020-21. Moving on to corrective services, we see a commitment of $8 million for double-up bunk beds in high security. It would be interesting to hear from the Treasurer or the Minister as to how many bunk beds that will provide, because despite the same promise being made last year and failing, we see a reduction in facility utilisation for over 35 per cent budgeted for in the coming year. So based on my calculations, Madam Deputy Speaker, achieving a facility utilisation would mean a combination of either an extra 2,000 beds or 2,000 less people being held in Queensland's prisons. So the minister needs to explain which one it is. Now to spot, oh, and there it is, Madam Deputy Speaker. They're different. Now, despite $8 million worth of bunk beds to address overcrowding, the service delivery statement paints a horrific picture with the rate of officers assaulted by prisoners more than four times the target during 2020-21. Four times. And serious assaults of staff by prisoners only improving marginally compared to the previous year. No doubt overcrowding in prisons is a surefire recipe. Order members on both sides. To increases. Order members. To increase numbers of assaults on officers. And they have a tough job. Our corrective services officers have a tough job, and I want to acknowledge them here tonight. 
because it's not easy working in prisons. It's certainly not easy working in prisons that are suffering from an overcrowding problem. Madam Deputy Speaker, moving on to fire and emergency services, we see yet more deception, and this time it's aimed at the volunteers. So let's quickly look back at the targets of this budget-wide deception with children, with the sick, victims of crime, and now volunteers. We've had reviews and promises focused on those brave men and women that, when disaster strikes, answer the call for help. And regardless of whether it's out at sea or on land after a cyclone or battling a bushfire, it is those volunteers that embody the Queensland spirit. Promises to marine rescue operations by the Blue Water Review are unfunded, despite the Minister's assurance in writing that he would deliver on that promise, Madam Deputy Speaker. Today, today the Minister's quoted as saying, Treasury holds the funds and it's in the Ford estimates. So what we have is another promise that, at best, has been pushed into the never-never. Queenslanders know that when they face Members the for, Sorry, pause the clock. Yeah. Member for Gregory and Minister, I'll caution you both to stop quarrelling across the chamber. I will start issuing warnings. Thank you. In the meantime, we have seen SES volunteer numbers plummet to the lowest level in history, a paltry 5,900 down from 17,200 in 2002. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Burdick electorate has only ever asked for its fair share of the pie when it comes to the annual budget. I don't think it's too much to ask for school children to drive to school on a bitumen road or have a reliable water supply. It's time this government governed for all of Queensland, and that means funding services equitably across the board. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call the member for Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. This is a budget that ensures our economic security and employment opportunities, delivers a bright future for Queensland. Each successive Palaszczuk government budget has added to our collective future growth. The Palaszczuk Labor government has been a shining beacon for other states as an example of what leadership looks like, how to um, make those tough decisions that keep people safe and how to keep our economy moving in the right direction under pressure. Our economy is now bigger than it was before the COVID hit. We have become a state of choice for interstate migration. My region is set to be the powerhouse of new industry and jobs in agribusiness. A future um, foods biohub has the potential to value add to crops already grown across the Mackay Isaac Wood Sunday region and value add to sugarcane, cattle, broadacre crops from the west and our salad bowl crops to the north. New industries making high value vitamin and protein powders to sustain world food um, needs can be manufactured in my region. The many byproducts from sugarcane crop um, we are waiting there are many um, products from the bio um, products from the sugarcane crop, and we are waiting for investors to take advantage. Products like biodegradable plastics, building products, paper, nutraceuticals, and um, activated carbon are only some of the proven products that are waiting to be manufactured. manufactured. Um, this budget supports the funding of a business case needed to get the ball rolling on the new manufacturing opportunities in agriculture in regional Queensland. The biofuture scientists are sitting in the classrooms of Mackay and the new in for the new industries builds, um, the, to build the employment opportunities and, cho and choices for our regional students. Paget Industrial Precinct has the skills in the ingenuity to design and manufacture new machinery and factories to, to establish these new industries. The Mackay Resource Centre of Excellence was um, a 2017 election commitment. Now it's a world-class um, piece of centre for um, training and research for the resource sector. The centre will also be the home of the Mackay Manufacturing Hub. Mackay Manufacturing and Industrial State of Paget has the reputation to have one of the highest concentrations of patents per capita. The manufacturing hub will assist those who are already in the export market and hone their skills and extend their market reach, and also assist those who are putting their toe into the export market with the guidance and confidence to grow and develop their offshore clients. Deputy Speaker, 
The Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the records of proceedings. Thank you, Member for Magai. I understand that you've had your uh, speech approved by the Speaker and it will be incorporated. I call the Member for Noosa. Uh, thank you, Acting Speaker. Um, in rising to respond to the 21-22 appropriation bills, I have a question. Is the word appropriation, which means a sum of money uh, or assets devoted to a special purpose, appropriate given it is in large part borrowing? In the journey out of the economic disaster of COVID, we knew we were going to have this debt, as many other governments do. Economic analysis suggests that the Queensland Government's economic recovery plan has set the foundations for a budget with a transition from short-term support and stimulus to longer-term productivity and competitiveness to drive private sector growth and jobs. This is a positive and due to record uh, pause the clock. Member Finusa, it is just, cheaper to just pause for a second, debt. Member Finusa, please. Um, members, there's far too much background noise in the chamber. Could I ask you to um, take your conversations outside if you need to talk? Uh, otherwise, the member for Noosa has a call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As I said, it is cheaper to service debt and borrow to rebuild. As always, though, the devil is in the detail and in the application for effectiveness. The predominant call from our businesses as part of getting our economy back on track is for industries such as tourism, who suffered the greatest impacts, to regain travel confidence. This comes from knowing that borders will not close whilst you are holidaying, lockdowns are at a minimal, appropriate quarantine facilities available and vaccines accessible, including a choice of. Deputy Speaker, in the first readings, this budget appears to have something for everyone, including opportunity through funding packages and initiatives. Within my own electorate, we had welcomed announcements, including for our schools, Noosa, Capital, Noosa Council Capital Works and organisations to provide supports. The omissions, I trust, will be accommodated within these other funding pools, as they are essential going forward, and I will speak on these. Without international workers, we need a concerted effort to utilise our own backpackers and unemployed via training, with job security versus casualisation. It is not the first time I have brought up the need to rebrand our key industries of hospitality as careers, and requires a new focus from schools, governments and industries. May some of the funding provided via the $320 million for skilling Queenslanders and $100 million investment in the Job Trainer Fund incorporate customised training of hospitality-related jobs. Noosa is, uh, is one of only two regions in Queensland where tourism is the major employer, yet has not benefited from any recent initiatives, including the holiday dollar vouchers which Brisbane and the Gold Coast were issued. Deputy Speaker, given the Noosa electorate per head of population traditionally has more international visitors than the Gold Coast or Brisbane, a current loss to our economy equivalent to the Gold Coast, a percentage of loss in visitors and spend equivalent to other regions, and a critical staffing shortage due to one of the tightest vacancy rates and Queensland's most expensive housing market, it is vital that we are able to access initiatives. With Indigenous tourism very much in demand, within the budget and appreciated was a further allocation for the Kalula Great Walk, which is a partnership with our Cubby Cubby in providing unique cultural experiences through these beautiful areas via our young custodians. Building our economy includes diversification and ensuring we are not reliant on international sources for essential products and to increase what we can export. With our upcoming efforts in Noosa to brand our iconic name as much more than a destination, funds will be required by organisations such as FAN for cold storage facilities and ongoing grants for our businesses to increase outputs. It was good to see over $3 billion for the Queensland Jobs Fund and $350 million industry partnership program in the mix to assist in this, as well plenty of small business grants. Within my own committee's inquiries and hearings into bills, it became, became clear that there is a need to have consistent, mandated components in the curriculum focused on healthy relationships and mental wellbeing from the very start of our children's education. Whilst this budget does provide essential funding uh, for school infrastructure and maintenance upgrades, I have yet to unearth whether extra funding has been allocated to address inconsistencies. 
appreciated is the local school, local jobs as part of transitioning our youngsters into the workforce. Did I mention that hospitality is a fabulous career? Deputy Speaker, an increase to policing is always welcome. Noosa's transition to mobile police units versus our two police beats has not had the best of starts, with two assaults in two weeks within the Hastings Street precinct and a delay in response times. We must have the resources to keep people safe and hold offenders accountable. And I trust that within the increases, the Sunshine Coast region is accommodated and that fast track is the integrations between QPS and QPWS systems so we can finally prevent offenders on our North Shore from accessing permits. To Wanton Bypass needs to be completed by 2024 to see an end to the bottlenecks and delays to Stage 2 will see double the amount of traffic enter into the Straits, requiring release at the other end. With Stage 2 having happily commenced, the Umundi Nooseville end now needs those detailed designs and the funds to do so. Deputy Speaker, all in this chamber are familiar with the greatest systems failure I have encountered. Haulage routes in our hinterland, assessed independently as not suitable for 40 to 80 trucks per day, have at times 200 loads plus. The danger and trauma to road users, residents, businesses and our infrastructure has been well documented and is unacceptable. Whilst road upgrades are necessary to repair the damage, the environmental authority and associated haulage routes must be reviewed before a tragedy occurs. An expansion to our emergency department in Noosa Hospital, which in effect acts as a satellite hospital, must be scoped. The flow-on effect from not having capacity to take our emergency cases has led to bypassing ambulances and ultimately adding to the ramping woes at SCU. Whilst on health, I stand here again looking for the clinical master plan for the Sunshine Coast to be finished, with needs including Parkinson's nurses, extra counsellors, psychiatrists and psychologists to see an end to en lengthy delays for those who are suffering mental trauma and depression, I feel that we are running blind. I can only hope that the $648 billion allocated to address the pressures from COVID, emergency patient flow and elective surgery, surgery wait lists will somehow cover these, as well those volunteer first responders to avoid the delays that I have spoken on previously. Deputy Speaker, it has never been more important to speak on palliative care. It is well documented that our volunteer organisations, including our palliative care hospices, such as our much-loved Katie Rose Cottage, deliver services at a much more economical cost than available within a hospital. And yet these accredited hospices still do not have an appropriate level of funding nor, have, nor had a dedicated voice during the inquiry into palliative care. With voluntary assisted dying being debated this year, ensuring choice of palliative care is vital and hospices require the surety of a partnership that commits to funding their nurses for 50 per cent in developing a sustainable funding model into the future. A portion of the $171 million allocated to end-of-life care must be utilised to address this. This year, we, we commenced our Noosa B Connect pilot, utilising volunteers to ensure our frail, who do not have the means to access their treatments at SCU, are transported. Already data being compiled is concerning, with the majority seeking assistance having to attend daily treatments for many weeks, leading to the cost to transport each individual at around $2,500. We have appreciated the funds provided this budget to Anglicare for those under 65 and not eligible for transport assistance through NDIS or My Age Care. However, much more funding is required, especially for the over 65s. As well, urgently, the criteria around the PTSS must be overhauled. With my community facing an unprecedented crisis in housing accommodation, leading to a loss of workers and impact to our economy, as, as well our much-loved and, and long-term residents and volunteers, that this was preventable is, is why I am angry about this. The current rationale of COVID is only part of this story. Deputy Speaker, I stood in this chamber years before the pandemic 
outlining what was needed, which included development funds for our community housing organisations and surplus site identification. Some four years later, state government land zoned for housing sits unutilised with the rationale on one site that the carbon offsets make it, make it unviable and the other under native title claim. As the Noosa Housing Action Group continues to implement initiatives, including emergency provisions, and I thank the Department for assisting in this, all I ask is that in the establishment of the $1 billion housing investment fund, an allocation be provided to us. This without the previous barriers, and that the state criteria around housing assistance for worker families currently not eligible for assistance be changed. The four-year commitment of nearly $100 million for the housing and homelessness service system is appreciated, and I look forward to seeing what head lease packages are made available to Noosa. Whilst the rail duplication to Nambour is vital and it is good to see the commencement of the Beerburram to Beerwa section, so too is a rail shuttle pilot to Gimpy. The opportunities uh, within the um, Sorry, the opportunities within the Noosa and Gympie regions uh, can only be realised when we connect transport to commuters, freight and tourists. So overall, does this budget provide what my community seeks? In many parts, yes, including through opportunity of funding pools to ex access assistance that may not be large in dollars, however, makes a real difference. The extra allocations across the state in domestic violence supports, youth justice reforms and concessions are just a small sample and all very welcomed. In addition, the $42 million over four years to continue the fisheries reform process will raise great interest as it is always a hot topic in my community. Unfound as yet is whether there has been funding to extend, extend the shark smart and other non-lethal trials to other areas, as well the much needed increases for maintaining our national parks. However, I will keep digging. In closing, Thank you uh, to the Treasurer, to the Ministers, Departments and all involved in compiling this budget. Again, your task has not been easy, as across Queensland the diverse needs of our communities can be difficult to accommodate while still finding our way out of COVID, and all efforts are appreciated. Even though the appropriation bills of 21-22 may not have given my electorate some specific sort, it has left the door open. And let me assure you, my foot is planted squarely in the doorstep to prevent its slamming shut. Thank you. Speaker. I'll remember for Bulimba. Speaker, 5.4 per cent. What a great way to start a budget reply speech. And today is another huge milestone in our journey towards economic recovery in Queensland. When we know that unemployment levels have dropped to 5.4 per cent, that we've created more jobs than pre-COVID, almost 90,000 more jobs, in fact, and the hard work that everyone has put in is paying off. What a pleasure it is to be here in Parliament backing a budget that shows our plan for economic recovery is working. As the Treasurer said, we put the health of Queenslanders first, and because of that, we are in the best possible position to create more jobs. Our economy is roaring back to life, and it's now even bigger than it was before the pandemic. It hasn't been easy to keep each other safe. We were asked to do things we'd never had to do before, to stay away from the ones we loved, to not travel around our great country, to close the doors to small businesses, not knowing when they could reopen. But when our speaker, Queenslanders rose to the challenge, and I want to thank every single person for their contribution. The sacrifices made across the state have helped get us to the economic position we're in now, and when everyone has done so much, speaker, for the good of all of us, it is offensive uh, for the Leader of the Opposition to ask this morning in his budget reply speech, where is the opportunity, the reassurance, the hope? To ask this when if we had bowed to their demands to reopen borders, their cynicism of the reality of COVID, Queensland and Queenslanders could now be in the most abject and challenging of circumstances. To ask this when they were the very perpetrators of lost hope when they were in government, when they were the very cause of Queenslanders craving reassurance and crying out for hope and opportunity, it was during the Newman LNP years when the member for Broadwater was a member of that terrible cabinet, when people were sacked, when respect for our doctors, our nurses, our teachers and other frontline workers went out the window, when public servants were called the B team, when community groups were emasculated and made to be silenced, when havoc was wreaked in communities across Queensland. It is the Palaszczuk Labor government 
who has returned opportunity, reassurance and hope to Queenslanders. Speaker. Speaker, I have lots to talk about in my speech about the over a billion dollars investment in skills and training so important to our economic recovery, about our support for small business during COVID and coming out of the COVID economy. I'm so excited about the opportunities we're able to offer, and I want to talk about what the budget means for my own beloved local community. However, before I go into any of that, I want to acknowledge my good friend, our good friend, Duncan Pegg, and the inspiration he was for all of us in how to be a good human being and a good member of parliament. He is already so terribly missed, but I like to think he's looking down on us now, watching what we're all saying in our budget reply speeches, and I hope he approves. Most of all, I know he would be so proud of this budget, but I'm sure he would want us to mention some of the things he fought for, Speaker, and I want to list just a couple of these now that are in this budget. The Stretton bus turnaround facility, worth $1.2 million for starters, which I know Duncan fought for for years. Over $8 million for Runcorn State High School for facilities to cater for growth. Over $1 million for Runcorn State School and $400,000 for Currabee State School. We know how much he loved his local schools in particular, Speaker, and these will be a credit to him when completed. I'm very proud to know James Martin, who is Labor's candidate for the Stretton by-election. I know how much faith Duncan had in him as someone who would follow in his legacy, who would care as much as he did about this beautiful community, who would fight for the things that are important. And I wish James all the best as he works to hopefully take over Duncan's magnificent legacy. Speaker, uh, my speech has been reviewed and approved uh, for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Thank you, Member for Bulimba. I confirm that your speech has been approved by the Speaker of the Deputy Speaker and will be incorporated. I call the Member for Bonnie. Thank, Thank you, you, Speaker. Uh, I'll start uh, by talking about what this budget means for my electorate of Bonnie. And this morning I found out that the Premier did not know the name of my electorate, so just to uh, update her on that. It's on the Gold Coast. Uh, it's named after one of the most extraordinary women that Queensland has produced, Laurie Bonney. And at the last election, it had a 9% swing to the LNP. So that's how she can find it next time. Our electorate is growing and changing. We've got a community that is not only growing in size, but also in connectedness. Residents are proud of our part of the Gold Coast where they live and love what our area has to offer. I could be not more, I could be not be more proud to represent Bonnie and will keep fighting to get the best outcomes for them. I just wish I could say this government was doing the same. I continue to, with my colleagues, ask for much needed funding to keep up with the growth on the Gold Coast and yet again we see empty promises with either no funding or waiting years for it to be realised. The second M1 or Coomera connector has taken a ridiculously long time to plan and now we see only 7% of its funding will be spent in the next year. This road is long overdue. There's not many people who would say they get a clear run on the M1 regularly, and it is often most congested in the areas this alternative route will run between, and that's Helensvale, Pimpama, and Yatla. The Gold Coast is the fastest growing region in Queensland, and at the moment, you have to get on a national highway to drive between many of our suburbs. It does not take over six years to plan a 16-kilometre road, especially when the government owns nearly 90% of the corridor it's going in, and it shouldn't take a further four to build one. On light rail, I find it hard to fathom that the majority of money for Stage 3 will not be spent until after 2024. Stage 2 from the hospital to Helensville was finished almost four years ago, and this budget shows we'll be lucky to finish Stage 3 within eight years of that. We need light rail. It has got to be the rapid public transport spine that runs down our city, and it is crucial to managing our growth. There should be rolling construction between stages rather than continual funding fights and the posturing of those opposite. It doesn't help us to get the infrastructure we need and only looks to create division and fear in our communities. When it comes to roads, the main intersection I'm still waiting on funding for is the Pine Ridge, Captain Cook and Brisbane Road intersection. This is after we successfully fought to get funding for the Harbour Town intersection upgrade. I've written to the Minister and his department multiple times about this. Uh, and with the new Arundel Logistics Hub, Coombe State High and businesses in the area, it is a nightmare at most times of the day and at peak hour, cars can back up for many hundreds of metres. We saw the tender for the business case go up and disappear a week later just recently. And Council has put over $5 million on the table for the upgrade, but without state funding, we can't get the full upgrade that is so desperately needed. 
We've had a big win with the government finally seeing the need to fix some of our old buildings at Coombabar State High School. I was looking back at my previous budget wish lists and they've been eerily similar every year for the past three years, always asking for more permanent buildings in the place of our demountables at my local schools. The upgraded multi-storey facility at Coomba High will make a big difference to this fantastic school, increasing their capacity and also giving them a space they can really be proud of. I would sincerely like to thank Principal Chris Kern for his continued hard work in leading this school. I wish I could say the same for Arundel State School. We got nothing for permanent buildings. Last year, the LNP made a huge commitment to build a multi-storey learning centre, and last February, when the minister said she, uh, the minister claimed she would go one better than a funding commitment and master plan the entire school. Since then, we have not seen a dollar of funding for this master plan. In fact, my recent letter back from the minister referenced a principal who hasn't been at the school for over two years. Uh, and I'll table that correspondence for the benefit of the House. It shows again Labor have no plan for Arundel State School and no idea what is going on there. Labrador State School needs a hall upgrade, much more than the government's committed to fans, but I do welcome the half a million dollars we have secured to at least make it a bit better for the students there. Southport Special School has been promised an almost $1 million upgrade to their drop-off and pick-up facilities. I have witnessed how bad this area is myself. It was uh, not long after I got elected that I, I went on one of the mooring bus rides, uh, and after an hour and a half long trip from Pimpama, we then had to go around the block multiple times on Kambari Avenue just to get into the school. What I am confused about, however, is that while in the region papers $980,000 of the $1 million project will be spent in 21-2, Capital Statement 3 only lists the project as $550,000, with $539,000 to be spent in the upcoming year, with no further funding allocated. So I will be seeking clarification on this. Years after the Commonwealth Games has finished, the Gold Coast Health and Knowledge Precinct has still not seen any construction on the state-owned sites there. I'm pleased to see EDQ commit to getting Proxima and the residential aged care and integrated training facility built, and I'll be watching carefully to see construction start this year as is promised in the budget. I do have to confess to the House that I got it slightly wrong last time I raised this here when I said the closest thing to work being undertaken in is some trees being planted and the installation of signage to rebrand the area. Well, in the last month, we have actually seen some work done. We've had a fence installed, uh, we've got some lights, and there's a car park being put in one of the empty blocks. I actually do think this is a good use of space, considering nothing else has happened in the area. But what I don't understand is when I propose to allow Night Quarter, a fantastic live music venue, which we have sadly since lost to the Sunshine Coast, to temporarily move there, until permanent leases were established, the government criticised the idea because it didn't fit into the health and knowledge category. Well, I'm not sure what's changed in the last two years, but the government has really lost their vision if they think a car park is considered to be health or knowledge. At the Gold Coast University Hospital, the upgrades announced in 2019 with, to the mental health unit has been a long time coming, and just over 40 per cent of the funds allocated uh, in the upcoming year. This unit cannot come fast enough with the demand we're seeing for these services, and I hope to see it open in the 22-3 financial year. The staff there who do a fantastic job will very much appreciate it. There's $1 million as well to the Queensland Police Service for the knife-detecting wanding trial. This was in response to the campaign by the Jack Beasley Foundation to detect knives save lives. This money will cover operational costs. This is things like overtime, for the police who are undertaking the wanding trial in Surface Paradise and Broadbeach in the Safe Night precincts, so they can do enough wanding over the next 12 months to get good data for the review, which is also covered in this funding. This was a big win for the Beasley family and our community, and I am so proud to support them, and there's so much more work to do in terms of education programs. I was also disappointed to see the female facilities program coming to an end after this financial year, as I've got two clubs who desperately need this funding. Southport Sharks and Labrador Tigers are both looking to expand their female facilities and they need this government to back them up. Mr Speaker, I strongly support the Opposition Leader's proposal for a parliamentary budget office. It will provide the transparency and clarity over budget policies for both sides of the House to get the most fiscally responsible policies put forward. We've seen it work very well federally uh, and there are other jurisdictions at a state level with similar setups. And I think this is a case of why not? Why be scared of more oversight? 
Why be worried if you have nothing to hide? The only reason Labor is unlikely to adopt this before we have a chance to is because they are scared of having the lens put over many of their funding arrangements. I'll now turn to the areas I cover in my shadow ministerial role. And from the outset, I'll say once again, Labor is a lot of talk with very little action. To start with, the Carbon Reduction Investment Fund. In my search for the money attached to this flagship program, the biggest environmental spend in the budget, I went back to the Minister's simple terms explanation when I questioned her on this yesterday. There is no funding allocated to this fund over the next four years. How can you make a return from zero dollars of investment? There is no detail about what will be in this fund. All we know is that there's no money from the budget in it over the forward estimates. The budget is apparently being set up to ensure th this fund is apparently being set up to ensure the viability of the land restoration fund. The only thing that threatens the land restoration fund is this government's inability to deliver it. Barely one quarter has been allocated since it was announced back in 2017. Queenslanders deserve better from this government where, who, who pretend to care about climate action but deliver with empty funds. When it comes to waste, the removal of the annual payment to local governments for the waste levy is a clear broken promise. The statement from the LGAQ yesterday was strongly against this, and when there has been little to no communication, it is no wonder why. The government has said it is because they are reviewing the levy, but as the LGAQ has said today, rather than using the regular legislative review process to break a promise to Queenslanders, the LGAQ calls on the government to use that review to identify concrete ways to increase recycling, reduce landfill and achieve a zero waste future. The current waste levy included a 70 per cent commitment to go towards reducing the impact felt by these programs to ease the transition. However, when you look at the expense measures for this waste management and resource recovery program, only 55 per cent of that revenue has been allocated. Once you take out those annual payments to local governments, this drops again to just 6 per cent. If this money is being spelt elsewhere on waste management I'd, management, I'd welcome clarity from the minister because at this stage, it doesn't appear the government is keeping their commitment. This shows the waste levy has nothing to do with the environment. It is simply a cash grab. The further issue with the scheme, Mr Speaker, is currently local governments have no directions or guidelines about how they use the annual payments to reinvest in waste resource recovery or for communication programs. At the moment, they are essentially just paying people to generate waste. I think the LGAQ is right to say the review should be focused on concrete ways to reduce waste and supporting local governments to develop the infrastructure they need within their communities. Speaker, I have spoken before about my passion for FOGO, organic waste processing. It is a revolution in rubbish that we need to get on board with. The Minister has announced a handful of small trials with uh, little clarity over how those particular local governments were chosen, but in other states we are seeing tens of millions of dollars being spent on this. In New South Wales, just over the weekend, their new Waste and Sustainable Materials strategy confirmed that they have spent $105 million to help councils introduce FOGO so far. They are committing another $65 million for five years from 2023, and it will be mandatory for all households and businesses to have FOGO by 2030. Once again, Queensland under Labor is being left behind. The Recycling Modernisation Fund is not identifiable anywhere in these budget papers. I sincerely hope our contribution is hidden in there somewhere because we are the last state to sign up. I understand we are just waiting on an announcement of the state signing of this deal, and the sooner the better. Uh, I want to talk briefly about hydrogen. Only one quarter of the funding we were told would be committed to a renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund has been allocated over the forward estimates until 2025 there is $1 billion missing. The government has said they want to see 50 per cent renewable generation by 2030 in Queensland. Within eight, with eight and a half years to go, less than half of their target has been reached. I support our Shadow Minister, the member for Condamine's calls to see their plan to achieve this. And again, the sooner the better on that. Our carbon emissions are still higher than when Labor came to office based on the latest data in the state and territory greenhouse gas inventories. In last year's budget, I spoke about the lack of ambition in protected areas, with a target of just a 0.01 per cent increase in the next year. And I'm sad to say this has happened again. They've once again put forward uh, this um, very disappointing target of 0.01 per cent growth. And if we continue to go at this rate of growth, that puts us within reach 
uh, of the government's own target of 17% uh, of Queensland air land area being protected uh, in what I calculate to be around 800 years. That is how slow we're going with our increase in protected areas. The Great Barrier Reef funding in this budget is best described as underwhelming. Despite the Minister for Environment's grand announcement of $270 million in continuing the water quality program, there's only $1.2 million allocated for this year. I wish there was more to say on this funding, but unfortunately, yet again, it is another example of empty promises and a continuation of the existing amounts of funding. Business as usual, basically. To finish, this is just a typical Labor budget of promising much but delivering little, particularly when it comes to the environment. Call the member for Cook. Speaker. Speaker, I rise to speak in support of the Appropriation Parliament Bill 2021. Speaker, before I do, I would like to pay tribute to my dear friend Duncan Peg, Peg, Peggy, or DP as I called him. It is different, this budget, not having him around to cheer me on. Duncan loved budget speeches, and I loved how he would walk in with his scribbled notes on a piece of paper, multiple pages of past speeches and newspaper articles with sections highlighted and sometimes looking somewhat disorganised, and then he would get up and deliver the most structured speech mixed with passion and humour. Yeah. As much as I miss not seeing him in, in action this budget, I know he is up there somewhere making commentaries about the proceedings in the House. <laughs> I send my condolences to DP's family, his parents, Graham, Lindsay and brothers. Yeah. Speaker, I would like to acknowledge the Treasurer, Cameron Dick, for delivering an outstanding budget, a good, strong budget that delivers directly to the heart of Queensland. This budget demonstrates the Palaszczuk government's strong commitment to Queenslanders through our strong health response and plan for economic recovery. This is a sensible budget that comes off the back of, of this government's strong health response to the global pandemic. But unlike those opposite, we on this side of the House have a plan for economic recovery. And this budget proves it, uh, proves it is working. I echo the Treasurer's words that when you protect the health of your people, jobs will grow. This budget recognises the need for growth in the wake of the pandemic, and we are investing into vital infrastructure and services to support jobs now and into the future as we continue to recover economically. When I first got elected in 2017 to represent the Cook electorate, I made a promise to my community that I would fight hard to represent them in Parliament. It is wonderful to see investment allocated in this budget to support services and deliver better roads and vital infrastructure projects. The vastness of my electorate highlights just how critical it is to deliver quality health care and how important it is to, to have the right infrastructure and resources in place to meet the ongoing needs and demands of every community in the most remote parts of Queensland. The presence of COVID-19 in any one of my vulnerable remote communities would have been devastating. Speaker, this record health budget delivers for Queensland and more specifically, it delivers for Cairns and Torres St. K Hospital and Health Service. I welcome the 1.81 billion investment for the Cairns and Hinterland Hospital and Health Service, which covers Mariba and Mossman in my electorate, representing an increase of 62%. The Torres and Cape Hospital and Health Service will receive $250 million, representing an, an increase of 45.5%. Speaker, this is a far cry from the devastating track record that Campbell Newman and the LNP uh, left behind. 14,000 public sector jobs, including nurses and doctors, cut with no second thought of the impact to service delivery. Those opposite likes to come in here and make a lot of noise about health, but one thing for certain, Queensland will never forget the LNP legacy of savage cuts to our health sector jobs. Speaker, when it comes to health, we not only talk the talk, we walk the walk. In the Torres Strait, we're building a brand new primary health care facility on Mare Island with upgrades to primary health care centres at Masig, Puruma, Ugarduan, St Paul's and Thursday Island. And not too long ago, were commenced for the redevelopment of the Thursday Island Hospital, which I had the pleasure to visit recently with the Minister for Health, Yvette Duff. In the Northern Peninsula area, our health investment will allow for the replacement of the existing roof and associated infrastructure at Bamaga Hospital. This budget allows for the implementation of a remote building management system that monitors generators, vaccine fridges, fridges morgue fridges, and the incoming power supply at Northern Primary Healthcare Centre. 
the WIPA Integrated Health Service will receive much needed funds for the refurbishment of a birthing suite, bringing maternity services closer to home, as well as, a, as compliance and redundancy works for the chiller and heating, ventilation and air conditioning system that will enhance service delivery. I visited the WIPA Integrated Health Service back in March where I got to meet with health staff and patients alike and I got to, got to hear um, how this wonderful world-class facility is contributing to staff and patient health and well-being across the board. Speak our children deserve quality education no matter where they live in Queensland. This government investment of $51.2 million for Far North Queensland region will give schools greater capacity to maintain, improve and upgrade their facilities. I'm delighted with the $16.78 million education budget into schools in my electorate, demonstrating this government commitment to deliver quality education to children in regional and remote areas. We on this side of the house know that by investing in our children, we are investing in our future. From the Torres Strait to Cape York, Mossman to Mariba, we are prioritising upgrades and refurbishments, maintenance costs, additional amenities and learning spaces in, to improve water supply, the installation of disabled amenities and accessible walkways. And who can resist talking about roads? Speaker, I'm trying to make this really fast. Roads is one topic that has grown on me over the years, knowing how critical it is to deliver safe and reliable roads for road users travelling the vast region of FNQ. While at it, I would like to acknowledge the Minister for Transport and Main Roads, Mark Bailey, for his support in delivering vital road <laughs> projects in my electorate. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, his ministerial staff in the department for the wonderful work that they do in supporting um, the work that I do in, in my electorate. Speaker. The Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation and as such I ask the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Thank you, Member for Cook. I Deputy confirm speaker. that the Speaker or Deputy Speaker has approved your speech for incorporation and will be done. Uh, call a Member for Lockyer. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. On the day of the budget's release, the Premier and Treasurer both claimed with pride that this was a true Labor budget. Many members since then have repeated these claims and espouse how good this budget is for Queenslander, but when you examine the details, it becomes very clear, line after line of the announcements with no funds allocated, the claims of this being a good budget for Queensland is simply not true. These claims are simply a smokescreen to the fact that this budget is a budget full of Labor debt heading to a record $127 billion and false promises of announcements with no actual dollar value. It is an insult to Queenslanders right across the state. This budget should have charted a clear path for out of the pandemic, but where is the vision and investment in vital services across Queensland? Ambulance ramping is out of control. Queenslanders are sitting in traffic longer. Housing affordability is dropping thanks to diminishing land supply and youth crime is out of control. This budget does not fix these problems. As we've come to expect, this budget, like all Labor budgets, is short on infrastructure spending, long with excuses for earlier failures and chock full of empty promises. I recognise the Leader of Opposition's business observation of the excuses that this government has used with his aptly named blame game wheel. Queenslanders expect governments to take responsibility for their decision, but this government is intent on blaming others, especially Canberra, and history will show that the LNP federal government saved Queensland's finances through their JobKeeper and JobSeeker programs. With projections of increases in revenues in this budget and cuts to infrastructure of $4 billion and debt increasing to a staggering $127 billion, the question obviously is, where is the money? The impact of what these numbers mean to everyday Queenslanders needs further exploration and we need to have an examination in the budget of more detail to show the true cause. In Queensland, infrastructure spending accounts for 12 per cent of total budget expenditure. This proportional expenditure is the sixth lowest in the nation and pales in comparison to that of New South Wales and Victoria, who each spend over 20 per cent of their state budget on infrastructure. No wonder our roads are falling apart as the Auditor-General con <coughs> confirmed as we're on the way to a $6 billion behind. 
While we currently sit in sixth spot, just ahead of Western Australia, Queensland's average budget expenditure on infrastructure has been on an annual decline since the Palaszczuk Labor government ascended to those benches in 15, making us the only state to record a decline in annual spending. Indeed, in this budget, total infrastructure expenditure has been reduced in real terms by $4 billion. $1 billion of new infrastructure supports 10,000 jobs. By cutting $4 billion of infrastructure spend, that will send 40,000 jobs out of Queensland and on to other projects in other states and countries. This budget is full of creative accounting. Creative accounting at its best is the titles office being owned and run by Queensland. The state government has valued the titles office at $7.8 billion. Two weeks ago in Parliament, the Treasurer said in the House that the titles office had a preliminary value of $4.2 billion. Now, I am a parochial Queenslander, but when New South Wales's title office is bigger than Queensland and actually sold their titles office for $2.5 billion in 2017, one has to question the $7.8 billion. And Victoria, likewise, had a value in 2019 of $2.85 billion. Again, one has to question the $7.8 billion valuation. What makes this so creative is that the government has used the inflated figure to place a great asset on the books against the debt. I wonder how many Queenslanders out there would love to increase the value of their house or property threefold and get comfort from their banks. This is questionable accounting at best, while the state's debt heads towards record $127 billion. One of the other areas of creative accounting is the government's claim of their new $2 billion hospital building fund. All the government has done is throw a net over business as usual building cost and called it a building fund. This is not going to fix the 1,500 bed shortage that the AMA has called for to fix the ramping and health problems in Queensland. Indeed, Labor's self-proclaimed record health budget has only increased by the $400 million that was gifted by Canberra in this year's federal budget. I'm sure even this generous assistance won't stop the Palaszczuk government from blaming Canberra for their continued failures and inability to effectively manage Queensland's health system in the midst of this health crisis. Fear motivates people, and the government should be ashamed of its approach to scaring Queenslanders. I've only skimmed the surface when it comes to pointing out this Labor budget has failed Queensland. To continue to do so would deprive me of the time to speak about how this budget has affected my community of Lockyer. I'll be honest, as I sat yesterday to pore over these budget papers, I was initially surprised to see some projects receive funding in Lockyer. Sadly, this surprise quickly wore off as I realised that, like much of this budget, all I was seeing was re-announcements. There was virtually no or new or increased funding for desperately need projects in Lockyer. However, we did get some small wins, and as, as I was always taught, be thankful and grateful for those. Beginning with the good news, I welcome the state's investment to provide the upgraded amenities blocks at the Grantham State School, also the Lake Clarendon State School, Blenheim State School, Laidley and Lowood State High Schools. And those are much needed funds for these great little schools. Indeed, education spending was one of the few areas that Lockyer received a fair share, and I thank the Minister for that. Given the government's $293 million decline in education capital expenditure in this budget, I am certainly grateful we got some. Unfortunately, this budget has once again failed to fund perhaps the most important education project in Lockyer. At Hattonvale State School, one of the fastest growing schools, parents and teachers continue to battle over an insufficient number of car parking spaces and our calls to see additional land provided and additional car parking has fallen on deaf ears. 
But before the battle for parking begins at the school, many parents and teachers must first survive the threat that many Lockyer residents face daily. And I've said it numerous times in this House, every day Lockyer residents risk their lives on crossing our state's most dangerous roads. Every day our motorists risk their lives by tackling dangerous intersections on the Warrego and Brisbane Valley highways, and this government simply couldn't care less. Despite my ongoing campaigning for road safety right across Lockyer and the state road toll which continues to grow, this government's road infrastructure priorities remained skewed towards those electorates in the Brisbane area. <clears throat> it all goes well to invest in solutions that will see residents in Brisbane and Ipswich get home 15 minutes earlier. However, I'm certain there will be of little consolation to the families of the more than 30 Queenslanders who have lost their lives on the Warrego Highway through the Lockyer in the last decade. Fortunately, the Morrison Federal Government has its priorities in order was, and is aware Lock of the dangerous... Sorry, Member for Lockyer. Members, there's far too many conversations happening in the chamber. Can you please take it outside if you'd like to talk? Member for Lockyer has a call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Fortunately, the Morrison Federal Government has its priorities in order and is aware of the dangerous nature of the Lockyer Roads. And I once again thank our Federal Member for Wright, Scott Buckholz, who has secured $60 million for road safety improvements on the Warrego Highway from the Morrison Government's Roads of Strategic Importance Fund. And over the past two years, this money has sat unused, awaiting partial contribution from the Palaszczuk Government for $15 million. The government, state government has the opportunity to work collaboratively with the Morrison government to save Queenslanders' lives. This $75 million package of road safety upgrades for the Warrego Highway will save lives and will, is something that the government should fund. They need to stop playing political games with the lives of Lockyer residents, and it's time to get this state government's priorities in law order. Another sign this Labor government's ignorance towards regional Queensland and our Lockyer is this budget's almost total lack of agricultural investment. I've said it before, and the fact ring true, that Queenslanders would not be the state it is today without the Lockyer Valley. We are the seventh most fertile valley in the world, and the hard-working families, families who work the prime agricultural land it offers produce products renowned the world over. I'm sure every single person in this House and their family has, with or without their knowledge, sampled some wonderful produce from the Lockyer Valley. The reputation upheld by our farmers and the esteem their products hold hasn't come without hard work and sacrifice, and I look forward to further discussions and work with our Shadow Minister for Water, Deb Frecklington, and our leadership team and the Minister for Water, Glenn Butcher, to discuss and see the Lockyer Valley and Somerset Water Project funded in upcoming years. Constrained by drought and the ongoing a pandemic and an anti-region, anti-farmer government, Lockyer farmers have never had to work harder than they are currently. Recent rainfall has done little more than turn the grass green. While public attention remains on the government's favourite source of blame, the ongoing health crisis and meanwhile the longest drought in living memory continues to impact our farmers and our irrigation assets remain some of the poorest performing in Queensland. And I once again call on the Minister to freeze or waive the Part A charges for our water schemes. At a time when our farmers need the support more than ever, this budget shows that the Labor government will truly abandon the agricultural sector once again. Well, it's just one more of this budget's long list of re-announcements. It would remiss, be remiss of me to not acknowledge the government's investment into stage two of the South Queensland, Southern Queensland Correctional Precinct just outside Gatton. It is one of the largest infrastructure projects in the state in its comparison, and it does provide some employment opportunities. But once again, I stress to the minister and the government the importance of maximising local business opportunities and benefits. The contractors have been engaging with our locals, and we need to see this continue to maximise those lo local opportunities. Unfortunately, the outlook for other potential public safety projects in Lockyer is far less clear. The communities of Fernvale and Lowood are two of the fastest growing in my electorate. 
these communities are protected and served by the officers of the Lowood Station, and unfortunately their task is made particularly hard due to the station's desperate need for renovations. Within its walls, officer force, officers are forced to work with cramp, within cramped conditions where they can hardly turn around without colliding with one another. Prior to my election in 2017 and again at last year's election, the LNP promised to provide $2 million for this renovation to ensure the hard-working officers at Lowood Station are able to complete their work and keep their community safe in a suitable working environment. Sadly, this commitment has not been met by the Palaszczuk government in each subsequent budget, and I once again call on the minister to fund that needed upgrade. The Premier and Treasurer were correct. This is a true Labor budget, reflecting the Palaszczuk Labor government's continued lack of direction, lack of meaningful investment, lack of transparency and contempt for regional Queenslanders. Like the government who developed it, this budget is an insult to many Queenslanders and fails them in almost all levels. It contains nothing but re-announcements, cover-ups and creative accounting, and would certainly gain some negative attention from the Australian Tax Office were you to try it with businesses' books. Once again, this budget has failed Lockyer in most counts, and whilst grateful for some minor investment we will see, there are far more missed opportunities which will leave our community wanting. This budget fails to address the road safety needs and fails to provide water security for Lockyer farmers. It also fails Lockyer educators and fails to address the public safety concerns in Lowood and Fernvale. This isn't the budget Lockyer needed or wished to see. Nonetheless, I will continue to fight for those projects that we so desperately need and hold the Palaszczuk government accountable at every opportunity that goes by. This budget should have charted a clear path out of the pandemic where Queensland vision and investment would have given certainty to business and for Queenslanders. The problems in Queensland, including ambulance ramping, the housing affordability as well as youth crime, Queensland deserves better than this Labor government. Call a member for Sandgate. Deputy Speaker, uh, I support the appropriation bills and congratulate my friend the Treasurer on delivering a traditional Labor budget with a record investment in health, education and housing. It is a budget which recognises that our health response to the pandemic and our economic recovery plan are working. The budget shows that because the Palaszczuk government protected the health of Queenslanders, we can recover and grow with confidence. A central part of that economic recovery is the more than $860 million that the Palaszczuk government has committed in delivered and planned support for the tourism and events sector since the onset of the pandemic. This includes $10 million in funding announced in Tuesday's budget, being invested over two years to start rebuilding aviation connectivity, and the government's commitment to the $7.5 million Work for Paradise program to offer cash incentives for much-needed workers to take up jobs in the tourism industry in northern and western Queensland. Deputy Speaker, these initiatives, along with a long list of other successful programs that we have implemented in the last few months, including the hugely popular Holiday Dollars Voucher Program and the Great Barrier Reef Education Experience Program, providing subsidised reef trips to, for, school students to, uh, for school students, have been effective measures to help take the Queensland tourism industry from their darkest hour last year to a position where the economic recovery of the sector leads the nation. Deputy Speaker, our economic package for tourism recovery is working. The March 2021 monthly visitor data compiled by Tourism Research Australia shows Queensland outperformed all other states and territories in growth of overnight visitor, visitor expenditure. Expenditure was up $673 million, or 88 per cent, to $1.35 billion compared to March 2020. That's, uh, that's $43.5 million being spent by tourists each and every day in Queensland, or $304.5 million a week. The Palaszczuk government's investment in tourism in the industry recovery is in stark contrast contrast to those opposite, who, went, when fleetingly in government, cut 35 staff from Tourism and Events Queensland. Those opposite also cut 
$188 million from the tourism budget. The lack of investment in the sector by those opposite severely limited tourism and events Queensland's ability to plan, market or deliver events supporting the tourism industry. The LNP government's short-sighted vision for tourism put thousands of Queenslanders' jobs at risk, and we saw tourism growth flatline. And this was uh, under a government that claimed it was one of the pillars. In fact, being one of the pillars under the Newman government was uh, uh, to, to, to uh, damn you to go backwards. Damn you to go backwards. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, I fear for the people of Queensland if those off opposite were ever to find themselves in the government again, as they clearly cannot read budget papers. The number of inaccuracies and incorrect figures in the Leader of the Opposition's budget reply were outstanding. The Leader of the Opposition claimed only $430,000 had been spent on the Wangetti Trail in 2020-21. Clearly wrong. That figure is for property, plants and equipment. The uh, Leader of the Opposition needs to scan further down the page where it clearly states that $3.63 million was spent on capital for the Wangetti Trail in the 2020-21 financial year. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition also claimed that only $1,000 had been spent in 2020-21 on the $1 million Outback Tourism Infrastructure Fund. Absolutely and utterly and clearly wrong. This is actually a hugely popular $7.79 million program with a $5.9 million being distributed in 2021, uh, 2020-21 and the remainder proposed to go out in 2021-22. Deputy Speaker, these errors show the Opposition simply cannot read the budget papers. What makes it worse is that the Leader of the Opposition is also the Shadow Tourism spokesperson and has been since 2017. This is a portfolio that he should have knowledge of, not make such blatant and clear errors in. In stark contrast, the tourism industry has come out in support of the Palaszczuk government's investment in tourism. A tourism industry, a tur a Queensland Tourism Industry Council CEO Daniel Gushwind welcoming the extensive government investment into support uh, with positive tourism-specific initiatives noted in the budget, including the creation of a new $10 million aviation fund, budget maintained for Tourism and Events Queensland and other region-specific capital works and infrastructure. He also commented on ABC Radio, the state government has reacted strongly to the needs of the tourism industry. Transport and Tourism Forum CEO Margie Osmond welcomed ongoing funding for Tourism and Events Queensland to continue the important job of marketing the state to get interstate leisure, business, cultural and event-related travel right back into gear. She went on to say, we are also pleased to see funding provided for the long-awaited uh, called for aviation route support package, with $10 million over two years committed to rebuild Queensland's international aviation connectivity. In addition to immediate support initiatives, a roadmap for tourism's longer-term recovery is underway. Deputy Speaker, we have established the Tourism Industry Reference Panel to consult with industry and identify opportunities to improve resilience and accelerate the industry's economic recovery. The panel will release an interim action plan in the second half of this year and a final report early next year with a blueprint for the industry, tourism industry's uh, future. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk government's economic recovery plan will further deliver a $25.8 million over four years to rebuild Queensland's international student market. Before the pandemic, overseas students contributed $5.8 billion to our economy and supported the jobs of 27,000 Queenslanders. So it's crucial that we're in a position to recover quickly. We know this sector is important to our broader economic recovery. The Palaszczuk government's $25.8 billion will place global uh, education specialists in key markets ahead of the borders reopening, expand remote learning and protect Queensland's reputation as a world-class study uh, destination. Uh, also, the, delivered in the budget was $29.3 million over the next two years to support preparations for a future Olympics should the Queensland secure the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And, Mr uh, Speaker, on that, Mark, I, I want to note that this was a project that uh, our friend Peggy was massively excited about. Duncan Pegg thought that this prospect was a hugely important prospect for the, 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 the state and, and for the region of South East Queensland. So with the final finish line in sight, uh, we, we, we want to make sure that we go forward to that final vote uh, with great confidence. And we know the Games have the potential to be transformational 
uh, injecting more than $8 billion into the Queensland economy and generating up to 122,000 full-time equivalent jobs and a once-in-a-generation opportunity for tourism. Deputy Speaker, uh, the, the, the Deputy Speaker has reviewed and approved my uh, budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech, which highlights other elements of my portfolio responsibilities and for the Sandgate electorate, uh, that it be incorporated into the record of proceedings. I confirm that the Speaker, or Deputy Speaker, has uh, ruled that your speech can be incorporated. Member for Sandgate, I call the member for Hinchinbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, before I start my speech this evening, uh, my first chance on my feet since the, uh, the passing of the member for Stretton, I would like to pass on uh, our deepest condolences on uh, behalf of the people of Hinchinbrook to not only uh, Duncan Pegg's family, friends, but also uh, the good people of Stretton on, uh, on, his, on his passing. Mr. Speaker, um, I, yeah. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I'd like to uh, give my contribution to the appropriation bill and speak to the budget 2021-2020. And like most people have said in this House, from both sides of the House, uh, this is a textbook Labor budget, Mr Speaker. And firstly, I'd like to um, draw your attention, Mr Speaker, to these lovely glossy documents, um, lovely glossy documents that um, have been provided during the budget while it was handed down. And, you know, we've got a lovely one here for far north Queensland. We've got one here for Townsville. I, um, I'd like to actually put on the record that next time we do this, I'd really like a Hinchinbrook one because it seems to be forgotten for some reason. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'll take that interjection. Don't give up. That's right. But, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, this is a standard Labor budget that I believe does one thing. It keeps the lights on for Queensland. It does something uh, that most people will be happy with, just keeping the lights on. And once again, Mr Speaker, if I could, uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, if I could actually get you to uh, intervene and pull a little bit of the chit-chat up. Otherwise, I'll just speak louder and louder, if you like. <laughs> uh, just pause the clock. Um, uh, Member for Hinchinbrook, I'll, I'll chair the, uh, the chamber and you just keep <laughs> I'd talking. I'd like you to. Yeah, yeah. You, you've, got the, you've got the call? Yeah. And go hard, mate. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, education has been a winner in the state this year uh, with the budget, health and transport and main roads, as per usual. Oh, I could get very standard Labor stuff. People that have missed out, though, is anyone out there, Mr Speaker, trying to do something a little innovative for the state? and uh, any of that nation-building infrastructure that the KAP is usually called for and part of our mantra, Mr Speaker, has missed out. Unfortunately, things like um, Big Rock's Weir hasn't got a mention in the budget, Hell's Gate Dam, Mr Speaker, um, North Queensland Bioenergy Sugar Mill. Now, Mr Speaker, you need to remember, uh, in previous budgets, North Queensland Bioenergy Sugar Mill, which would be built in the Hinchinbrook electorate, has copped a mention. But unfortunately, we've seen a state Labor government that seems to have moved away from this, the conversation of biofuels. Uh, there have been numerous calls in the past and you know, plenty of money spent on trying to get a biofuels industry up, but unfortunately, we've moved to hydrogen now. We've stepped away from something that could have been a great industry uh, for this state. It made, great, made a great deal of profit for the state, but unfortunately we've put that to the side and we've gone for another pie in the sky, which is hydrogen. It has a future, of course, and we love the investment, but don't forget biofuels like this budget has. Mr Speaker, another thing that hasn't been mentioned in this budget, as well as the Copper String 2.0 project, uh, Mr Speaker, this is an imperative uh, project, not only for the North West Mineral Province, but for your seat of Mundingborough, Townsville, as also Thurringow, Mr Speaker. And we would like to see continued, not only in principal support, and, but financial support and hard backing from the State Labor Government to see that project go forward. Because the fact is, what's good for the North West Mineral Province, and not just Mount Isa, opening up new mines and those high value um, uh, minerals that we would, uh, the member for Townsville spoke of in his speech a couple of days ago, um, but also opening up new mines in copper, gold and zinc 
in the northwest mineral province to make sure that Townsville has a future. Because, like I said, what's good for the northwest mineral province is great for Townsville. Mr. Speaker, Hipco never got a mention as well. Those, those guys in Hewenden that are trying to get up their irrigation project. Once again, no money for those guys. Big rocks we are. You know, the money's sitting there for that project from the federal government. We just need the state government to really get their hands dirty on that and, and progress that. And I hope that the, uh, the water minister um, takes heed of that and continues to work with those stakeholders. Mr Speaker, but if I want to draw down on water projects that are, were missed out by the, uh, the state government in this budget, that would help the Hinchinbrook electorate. Uh, the Hinchinbrook Shire Council has worked tirelessly and is now working with the federal government to try and secure some funding, because we need funding to, to do studies, Mr Speaker. You can't expect these small little councils out there across Queensland to put the money forward for these sort of style of infrastructure projects that build wealth for the nation and build wealth for the state. They're looking to do weirs on the Stone River system, but also the Herbert River, not just for agriculture, but also, if you believe in rising sea levels, to protect our water sources from rising sea levels, Mr Speaker. Now, I think that's uh, something that the state government should be looking at, helping these small councils to future-proof their water supplies in this instance. Uh, Mr Speaker, one thing that we have seen some good investment from the state government in this budget for the electorate of Hinchinbrook is $2 million going to sorry, $600,000 out of a $2 million spend to upgrade Wallaman Falls visitor facilities. That's making sure that, yes, there are, there are better facilities up there in the Girigan National Park for when people are travelling up there. Now, we get 100,000 people a year driving up to Wallaman Falls. It's the greatest uh, single uh, waterfall attraction in Australia, largest single drop waterfall in the Southern Hemisphere. And if anyone here in this house hasn't seen it, I'd um, ask you to get up there and check it out. It's absolutely beautiful. But what we do need, Mr Speaker, is more funding to be invested in the Paluma to Wallaman Trails project. So that's a project that the state government's known about for some time and I've advocated strongly for. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, we need to make sure that we're spending more money on those sorts of things to open up ecotourism. But while I am speaking on tourism, of course, Mr Speaker, I can't talk about tourism right now in this state if I'm not talking about insurance because we have small mum and dad operators across the state right now. Whether you're an tourism operator, um, Magnetic Island is one, there's a Magnetic uh, Jet Ski operators over there that are unable to get insurance. I'm hearing it across the sector. And without tourism insurance, public liability insurance, Mr Speaker, we don't have product. So we can open our gates at any stage and have international tourists, but if we don't have product there for these people to come and enjoy our, our ecotourism attractions, we just don't have a, um, an industry, you know, and that's what saddens me. So I know that a lot of this falls under the federal sphere, and I know um, the Honourable Bob Catt has put a lot of pressure on the government at that level to make sure that there can be some work done. But the state government can play its part here. Otherwise, uh, we're going to see that fold up. Mr Speaker, another thing that doesn't get a lot of attention uh, when it comes to new infrastructure in this budget is anything to deal with uh, our youth crime pandemic that we're seeing out there. Right now, we would, you know, there's some beds being built down here in the southeast corner, a little bit of money being spent here and there to, um, for programs. But we're looking for a real investment in better facilities to look after these kids. And may I note, this is a great opportunity for me to talk about the KAP's relocation sentencing policy. Mr Speaker, this is a policy that would see children taken out of the environment they are in right now, committing these crimes, away from the Cleveland Bay detention centres that continue to be a revolving door scenario. But the fact is, eight days they're spending out there, Mr Speaker. That's the information provided to us. That's the average day at Cle uh, Cleveland Bay Detention Centre. We're wanting these kids to go out on country in a purpose-built facility, donga style accommodation, Mr Speaker, not going to cost you $1,500 a day, which it is at the moment, and a much cheaper way of doing it and doing some real investment in these children. Six to 12 months stints out there, alternative sentencing options for these kids to try and break the crime cycle. Mr Speaker, while I'm on my feet also, I'll um, acknowledge uh, that it is Men's Health Week this week. And although that we've seen quite a significant um, investment and acknowledgement from this side of the House into women's problems and women's issues across Queensland, whether it be domestic violence or whether it be um, homelessness, we see very little being invested by this state government when it comes to men's health. And I will acknowledge in this House today the, uh, the passing of Rodney Rooney. 
stabbed allegedly by an ex-partner in front of his son. Now it's Men's Health Week and we aren't even speaking about men in this, bus in this budget. While we've got men out there that are also victims of domestic violence, they're also victims of homelessness but not acknowledged in this budget uh, like women are. And that needs to be um, brought up in this House. Mr Speaker, while I'm also on my feet, I'll also talk to you about, um, talk about the good things other than uh, the tourism investments in, um, in Hinchinbrook. And one of those um, good news stories, and I do thank the, member, uh, sorry, the Minister for Education um, on this particular subject. Now, the Minister of Education always does a, a good thing for us up there in the Hinchbrook electorate. And this, this, um, this budget, we see $1.5 million for new amenities at the Blue Water State School. Mr Speaker, we all also will see at the Bully Vale School, just around the corner from my place in fact, uh, $375,000 to refurbish Block B. We'll also see $700,000 invested in a large, beautiful um, fence to go around the school to not only protect the kids from someone that could come out, come into the school at any time, but also protect those kids from going out on the road um, and you know, falling victim to maybe a car incident. Mr Speaker, we also see one of my favourite small schools in the Hinchinbrook electorate, Chabron State School, get $45,000 for their adventure play, outdoor play equipment. And uh, they were actually fortunate enough to get about $35,000 last year um, from the Community Benefit Gambling Grant funds to ensure they could start that project. The community's tipped in as well, and now we're going to see an extra um, investment from the state government, because small schools, I think, in the Hinchinbrook electorate are cool schools. Mr Speaker. I'm sorry if I'm speaking quickly, I've just got a lot to say here. Mr Speaker, <laughs> feel like an auctioneer. Mr Speaker, we'll also see 887000 for minor works across the, uh, the Hinchinbrook schools over the 2021-2022 budget. And uh, like I said, once again, we thank the, uh, the Education Minister for that investment. We, yeah. Also, people will be very happy in the Hinchinbrook electorate to see progress on the North Shore on the North Shore Ambulance Centre that's going to be built there, right next to the Bunnings, Mr Speaker. $500,000 will be spent in this budget uh, to make sure that land is secured and, and preliminary works can be conducted and planning. And that will be a $6 million spend in the Hinchbrook electorate to make sure that ambulance services for that northern corridor are top-notch, Mr Speaker. And I'll continue to advocate for that. But off the back of that, if we see this ambulance centre get up and running, we want to make sure that the Black River Ambulance Centre stays there because it plays an integral part in that emergency services spine that services the northern part of Townsville. Mr Speaker, um, we've also seen a further commitment, and I'm sorry, it's more of a reinforced commitment. We've had some long-standing issues with Port Hinchinbrook in the Hinchinbrook electorate. And unless we can fix the problems of Port Hinchinbrook, Mr Speaker, uh, we will not see Cardwell as a whole re recoup and uh, rebuild post-Cyclone Yasi. Yes, it's been 10 years since Cyclone Yasi hit Cardwell and damaged Port Hinchinbrook beyond repair. Uh, but we can work together to make sure that we band together and fix some of the long-standing problems there. And it's good to see that the state government has still left the $6.4 million in there in the budget for um, rebuilding the sewage treatment plant, but more needs to be done up there. And I'll continue to work with state development to ensure that we can unpack some of the long-standing problems with that development to make sure that we see normalisation and we see an, an end at the road for those people out there in Hinch Hinchbrook that have had to deal with that. Mr Speaker, while I'm also on my feet, uh, projects that didn't see um, any funding this round, but I'll continue to lobby the state government on, uh, is marine infrastructure for the, tourism, for the tourism industry in the Hinchinbrook electorate. You know, we've got some of the most beautiful islands with Hinchinbrook Island, largest island national park, home to the Thorsbourne Trail, right there in the Hinchinbrook electorate. We want everyone to visit these things. The Palm Island group over there, which is, sits in the Townsville electorate, um, we want people to get out there and see these things. But unless we've got all tidal access, Mr Speaker, we just simply can't. We need investment at Forest Beach. Cassidy's boat ramp's a good start, but we'll have a lovely big breakwater out the front 
I know that could be pie in the sky for some people, but never say never, especially when you see what happened up there at Mission Beach in Clump Point. With the right lobbying at the right time, things can happen. Mr Speaker, we'd also like to see uh, all title access for inter Enterprise Channel at Dungeness, which is via Lucinda. With access at Dungeness, we would have all title access to have more tourism operators operating in the Hinchinbrook Channel, accessing Hinchinbrook Island, but also taking people out to the reef uh, to catch a barramundi up the channel or catch a coral trout. Every North Queenslander and Queenslander visiting should get that opportunity, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, while I'm also on my feet, I'll um, make a special note that uh, I'll make a special note that, like I said earlier, there's um, a couple of really good glossy documents that sort of talk about the, um, you know, the big spend that we've seen here in Queensland from the state government, especially in our, you know, education and health, and that's great. Uh, but the fact is, we're seeing certain things not being funded. We're seeing people out there still being left behind. The cost of living is still through the roof. You still need two parents working for two full-time jobs just to scrape by, Mr Speaker. Insurance costs are still through the roof. Uh, we need to bring those down, and the state government has an opportunity to do that through state, um, stamp duty reductions or um, reassessing some other ways uh, some of this funding is done. But, Mr Speaker, also, we would also push the state government to help those out there that are, are trying to get ahead, Mr Speaker. We want people that are working to be able to um, access the, uh, the things that they need. Member for Keppel has the call. Thank you, thank you Deputy Speaker. And it's great to hear the member for Hinchinbrook and the Canada Australia Party talking up the Palaszczuk government's record education budget in this place. It is. Deputy Speaker, it's the first time I'll take that interjection from the Minister for Education. Deputy Speaker, it's the first time that I've risen in this place since our good friend, the member for Stretton, passed away. Duncan was a good bloke and he was a friend to many of us in this place. He was taken too soon and, Deputy Speaker, I'm really still grappling with his passing. It feels like he's just on holidays or something, um, and I'm sure that many of us will have more to say about Duncan and his work in the future. But we miss him terribly, and I offer my condolences in this place to Duncan's parents, his brothers, friends and family. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, the way that those opposite are talking in this budget debate, you'd think that Queensland is falling apart. Those opposite say, oh, Queensland's roads are falling apart, the hospital's falling apart, the schools are falling apart, the drama, the negativity. They're so negative. They actually, Deputy Speaker, sound like a used car salesman. Just like, just like the same used car salesman when I traded in my first car, my beloved Betty, the Holden Barina. That salesman said it was white, it was white. The salesman said, oh, the wheels are falling off, there's dings in the body, the paint's chipped, the brakes don't work, it's not worth much at all. Sounds just like those opposite. Talking the car down, talking down the care and maintenance that I had given it, looking for every opportunity to give me the lowest price possible. It sounds like, sounds like those opposite talking down our great state, Deputy Speaker. And there's always lots of hidden fees, Deputy Speaker, when you're working with used car salesmen when you're uh, trading in a vehicle, or hidden cuts, as the LNP like to use. Uh, lots of hidden fees, lots of hidden cuts. There's always lots of fine print in the contract, Deputy Speaker, like where they said that there will, that there will not be any cuts, but then the Leader of the Opposition, Asterix, says, oh, but it just won't be savage. There's always fine print when it comes to the LNP and their promises, Deputy Speaker. I looked after that car, Betty. I, it didn't miss a service. It had uh, clean oil and it was regularly topped up. The tyres were newly replaced, brake pads replaced. I looked after my Betty Barina just like the Palaszczuk government is governing with care and attention. And all of us on this side have a great love for our state of Queensland. Those opposite are talking down this state our state, like a used car salesman, talking down the economy, talking down our future and the prospects of our great state for their own benefit. Well, Deputy Speaker, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world right now. And it's only because of our Premier, our Chief Health Officer, our Deputy Premier and the nurses, doctors, healthcare workers and all Queenslanders who have worked so hard to keep our state safe from this global pandemic. And now our economic recovery is underway. Our economy has rebounded, rebounded back, and the latest labour force data shows that unemployment in Queensland has dropped to 5.4 per cent. It's lower now than before COVID. Deputy Speaker, in Keppel, the hotels are booked out. 
In fact, the owners of Ocean tell you that they could book out their hotel twice every night. The restaurants are full, tourism is booming, and this budget demonstrates that Queensland's COVID-19 economic recovery plan is working. This budget invests in growth, in jobs, in infrastructure, in services, in, including in health and schools, and growth right across Queensland. In Keppel, Deputy Speaker, this budget delivers on our election commitments. It delivers a record health budget with a $691 million investment in our Central Queensland Health and Hospital Service. This budget delivers the funding for the finishing, the finishing touches on the $14.3 million 42-bed detox and rehab centre in Rocky. It delivers funding to start work on the cardiac hybrid theatre at the Rocky Hospital so local people can get the stents in their arteries that they need without having to travel to Brisbane. It delivers the funding to refurbish and expand the mental health unit at the Rocky Hospital so more local people can get the mental health treatment they need close to home. Deputy Speaker, I'm incredibly proud to be Assistant Minister for Education in a government that is, yet again, delivering a record education budget. The Palaszczuk government's seventh record education budget. A record $15.3 billion state education budget investment in school and early childhood education, with which will deliver for Queensland children, students, teachers, teacher aides and tradies from far north Queensland to the Gold Coast. Almost $1.9 billion in infrastructure spending will maintain, renew and build new facilities, including 10 new schools and other facilities supporting more than 4,100 jobs across the state. This continues our proud record of giving every child a great start and engaging young people in learning no matter where they live. Deputy Speaker, I have, uh, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation and as such I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Uh, member for Keppel, that's been approved for incorporation. Um, uh, the member for Nindari has the call. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on the Appropriations Bill 2021-2022. As the Treasurer trumpeted in his speech, the budget has all the hallmarks of a Labor budget, following lockstep in a generation of Labor budgets that have come before it. It's one void of ideas but full of empty prop promises and empty buckets of money. In fact, the budget reminds me of one of my kids' favourite reads, Choose Your Own Adventure. It relies on a series of chance outcomes and the correct alignment of the stars to hopefully result in a happy ending. Unfortunately, there is no happy endings when you combine a Labor government and economic management. They are diametrically opposed, and that is clearly apparent again in this budget. No ambitious, bold plans to back up their lofty targets, just more creative accounting and subterfuge. Mr Speaker, this budget can be likened to a tried and tested recipe. Step one, cook the books, hoodwinks the taxpayers, then bunker down. It's Labor's favourite tactic. Fudge the figures, apply some clever accounting and bury the details deep enough so by the time the truth is exposed, you can lay the blame elsewhere, like Canberra or COVID, or play the commercial in confidence card. Just spin the wheel and see where it lands. Step two, distract. Ideally, by replaying their favourite hit list straight from their best-selling album, Out of the New Manera, an, in, an administration, mind you, which governed more than six years ago, long before I got here, Six long years in which this third term Labor government has had ample opportunity to lay their own foundations of a new era. But as we know, the hallmarks of a Labor government are not ones that stand the test of time. Mr Deputy Speaker, it does not take a master chef to guess what happens when you take the same dated recipes, stale ingredients and dodgy chefs. It was always going to be a flop, styled to, styled to appeal and look tasty, but ridden with holes and hard to digest. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, thanks, thanks, Grace. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Grace. Come on, Grace. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we all know the Treasurer likes to compare himself with, with the greats. Order. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we all know the Treasurer likes to compare himself with the greats. Aspiration is a wonderful thing provided it's grounded in at least some element in ability and reality. However, the name Charles Ponzi comes to mind when I reflect on what has been arguably the Treasurer's biggest light bulb moment of his career in the delivery of this latest budget. I'm talking about the Queensland Titles Registry. No doubt, after learning the ratings agencies 
were going to downgrade our credit rating, a moment of enlightenment struck while he was eating his peanut butter toast. It probably went something like this. Let's beat up the value of this bad boy and move it off our books so debt will look better down the track. No one will suspect a thing. As polished as he likes to think he is, this sleight of hand did not go unnoticed and the Queensland Treasurer has been called out. Unlike a, a real playmaker, thrilling and suspenseful, he is not. Deceptive and hard to follow would be much more appropriate words to describe this latest attempt to create a distraction from what can only be described as a missed opportunity to deliver a budget that actually delivers for all Queenslanders. Our state's economy is not a game of monopoly where a chance card can get you out of jail. You have to pass go and pay your dues, the same way that hard-working Queenslanders pay their taxes and expect a fair go in return. According to the Premier, the Queensland economy is coming back bigger, stronger and faster than ever. However, no amount of creative accounting can make up for the fact that this budget fails to deliver for Queenslanders. Not one constituent in my electorate has contacted my office this week to ask a question about the state budget. And it's not because they don't care about their future, their kids' future or the economic health of our state. On the contrary, they just can't relate to a government that has clearly lost touch with reality and with public sentiment. The Treasurer's deceptive accounting and quiet musings have no relevance to the appeal or appeal to the 39,000 people living in my electorate. But I can tell you what they do care about. They care about their health. They care about getting home safely. They care about security for their families and their future. They care about getting a good education and a good job. They care about the cost of living. At a time when the Treasurer himself has boasted about the pace of our economic recovery, the questions most, most Queenslanders are asking is what does it mean for them? How can they continue to afford paying record high prices for rent and housing? How much longer will they be forced to wait for medical treatment to ease their suffering and pain? When will the long overdue upgrades for our failing road network be completed so they can get home sooner and safer? Will their children be forced to leave our region to look for work? Is their own job secure? Mr Deputy Speaker, we know the Palaszczuk Labor, Gov Labor Government likes to talk about transparency, so let's reflect on some of the figures that were missing from this third term Premier's budget. Hospital ramping has peaked and currently sits at 40 per cent. It's the highest it's been in a generation. At some hospitals, it's a 50-50 chance whether you are seen in clinically recommended timeframes or not. Essentially, it's the toss of a coin. Right now, more than 10 per cent of elective surgeries are not completed on time, and there are nearly 55,000 people on the waiting list. In addition, nearly 230,000 Queenslanders on the waiting list are on the waiting list to get on the waiting list. Similarly, there are more than 150,000 people on the dental waiting list. Labor's operational health budget has increased by 2 per cent, barely above CPI, which budget papers forecast at 1.75 per cent. Queensland's health budget only increased by the extra amount that Canberra gave them in this year's federal budget, $400 million. Labor's record health budget does nothing to improve a public health system which they are losing control of. Infrastructure spending has been slashed of particular concern to residents in my electorate. There is no money to fast-track long overdue road infrastructure projects, including busting congestion in Coolum or to upgrade major arterial roads like Yandina Coolum Road and Yamundi Noosa Road, which are no longer fit for purpose. There is no money in this year's budget to re replace the Bly Bly Bridge, which has been the subject of extensive structural investigations for over a year. Truck drivers have been forced to make, make lengthy detours due to the load limit that has been imposed for the duration of the investigation works. Not only does this add to their time, it adds to their cost, reduces profit margins and ultimately impacts our local economy. Meanwhile, questions about the bridge's safety and structural integrity go unanswered. There is still no money budgeted to start construction on the duplication of the Sunshine Motorway, which Labor committed to at the last election. This infrastructure project would be a game changer, not only for my electorate, but for the entire Sunshine Coast region, particularly high growth areas north of the Maroochee River. Imagine the number of jobs a construction project of this scale would create. And it would also save lives, too many of which have already been lost on this dangerous stretch of road, which is well past its use-by date. 
In 2021, there are still students at Coolum Primary School sitting in hot, asbestos-ridden classrooms and buildings they can't access in the rain due to flooding. There was no money in this budget for them. Similarly, while I see the minister still in the, <clears throat> in the house, they're still waiting <clears throat> for their air conditioning, which after years of fun which, 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 which is after, after years of fundraising Years of fundraising. I do, Order. I do take that Order. interjection. I do take that interjection. The Coolum Primary School does not deserve to wait till 2028 for their air conditioning. When the PNC worked tirelessly for years to raise over 400. Pause the clock. Pause the clock. Uh, member for. Member for. I'll get it right in a minute. Member for McConnell. Minister, uh, if you want to interject, can you do it from your, your seat? Thank you. Um, the member for Nindari, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it is an air con con by this minister. And I do take her interjection of Coolum State School having to wait till 2028, when the hardworking members of the PNC raised over $400,000 and have already spent that money getting the school's electricity network ready for aircon. Because of this hard work, they were promised that they would be one of the first to receive aircon. They were promised it before last year's hot summer, and there is still no indication as to where this, when this aircon will be rolled out, Mr Speaker. And I urge the Minister, while she's here, to take that on board, because it has been promised. They worked hard to fund the electricity upgrade, and I call on the Minister and this government to do what they said and provide Coolum State School with the air conditioning. Within the Sunshine Coast, for, with the Sunshine Coast forecast to grow to over 500,000 by 2041, now is the time to be investing in major projects, not shortchanging our region with funding shortfalls and empty buckets of money. Mr. Speaker, the Labor Party themselves have admitted this is a typical Labor budget, full of promises, short on detail, and void of an economic plan and vision to realise our state's potential. Mr Speaker, taxpayers don't care about the Treasurer's musings over his peanut butter toast. They care about the things that affect them directly, like receiving medical treatment when they need it, having access to housing in a safe community, not falling victim to the state's growing crime crisis, giving their children a quality education and the prospect of them securing a job in the future, getting home safely and not spending hours stuck in traffic the things that affect them directly, which is what this budget has failed to deliver. Member for Ipswich West has a call. Thank you. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak in support of the Appropriation Bill 2021 and the Appropriation Parliament Bill 2021. My focus will be on the Appropriation Bill 2021. As at January 2020, the first five years of the Palaszczuk government had delivered five successive surplus budgets with a fit sixth forecast for 2020. Such was the strength of the Queensland economy, but the COVID-19 worldwide pandemic turned our economy upside down, particularly our tourist and transport industries. By early September, Australia had plunged into its first recession in 30 years. With the 2021-22 state budget, the Treasurer Cameron Dick supports the ongoing implementation of our COVID-19 economic recovery plan introduced in 2020 by further strengthening the core pillars of our government, health care, education, infrastructure, renewables and jobs. The focus of the Queensland Economy Economic Recovery, uh, recovery Strategy Unite and Recover Queensland's Jobs is to help the state recover from the COVID-19 with a focus on backing Queensland jobs. Our successful response to the global pandemic has reminded us once more of the value of our world-class health system, and that will be boosted by another record investment in the healthcare budget in, uh, healthcare in this budget. We're also set to build more schools, better roads, a workforce for tomorrow, equipping Queenslanders with skills they need to succeed and unlocking the opportunity of our state requires to grow and flourish. For the Ipswich region, the 2021-22 budget will see significant expenditure. This includes $950 million for infrastructure that is estimated to deliver 2,900 jobs, $750 million for health for the West Morton Health Services and $157.2 million for education to maintain and improve and upgrade Ipswich schools. 
The budget delivers $166.9 million for the Ipswich Hospital to improve facilities, and construct, that includes constructing an acute mental health unit, $51.9 million for social housing to expand and improve social housing, uh, $7.3 million for the highly successful Schooling Queenslanders for Work program to fund more training opportunities and, and improve workforce participation. Mr Speaker, this is a great budget, not just for Ipswich but for the whole of Queensland. In my electorate of Ipswich West, the budget provides a wide range of education infrastructure projects at Ipswich West schools, such as Ashwell State School, $750,000 for an overall spend of $750,000 for amenity upgrades. Ipswich North State School, $300,000 of a $300,000 spend to refurbish Block B learning spaces. Again, Ipswich North State School, $250,000 of a $250,000 spend to resurface courts and the outdoor learning centre. Ipswich State High School, $5.5 million, $5 million of a $25.5 million investment for additional classrooms. Ipswich State High School, again, $622,000 of a $700,000 spend, being a contribution to the sports field upgrade. Carol East State School, $200,000 of a $200,000 spend for a more efficient, larger septic system. Mount Marrow State School, $750,000 of a $750,000 spend for amenities upgrades. Rosewood State High School, $30,000 of a $7 million spend for additional classrooms. Tivoli State School, $350,000 of a $350,000 spend to refurbish Block B learning spaces. Balloon State School, a $1,553,000 spend of a $5 million, $200,000 spend for additional classrooms. There is a general allocation for maintenance at schools at the Ipswich West electorate of $689,000 allocated across 14 schools in the Ipswich West electorate for maintenance in schools throughout the 221 22 financial years. And, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, there is a general allocation for minor works Member for Namanga. in Ipswich West of $266,000 allocated across 14 schools uh, for minor works in schools throughout the 2021-22 financial year. But there's more, Acting Deputy Speaker. Infrastructure projects for police and fire and emergency services, including a $1.1 million investment to build a new auxiliary fire and service rescue station, Albert Street, Rosewood, and $50,000 to commence planning for the new Rosewood police station. Transport and main roads projects include, in the budget include funding for the Warragul Highway and Hagsley Amberley Road interchange for planning of $399,000 of a $799,000 spend and the Warrego Highway Mount Crosby Road interchange uh, for planning of $2.7 million of, of $5 million jointly funded by the Australian Government and the Queensland Government, with an additional 20 per cent contribution by the State Government of a $22 million project provided in the 2020-21 State Budget. With these projects, we will deliver not just new or improved infrastructure for our communities, but jobs for workers and contract for suppliers. This is a true Labor budget. Acting Deputy Speaker, as my mother would say, these jobs and contracts allowed breadwinners to keep a roof over their head and food on the table for themselves and their families. And we must never forget that. Acting Deputy Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed my budget speech for incorporation. As Can we such, pause the I clock? Pause the, the clock. Um, order. Order. In the record uh, just of take a chair, the member for uh, Ipswich West. I can't, I, I can't hear a word. Um, I know they're excited to hear your speech. Um, uh, the member for Ipswich West, uh, uh, continue. Acting Deputy Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation. And as such, I seek that the remainder of my speech be incorporated in the record of proceedings. Uh, uh, member for Ipswich West, uh, you have prior approval. Uh, thank you. Uh, the member for Southport. Mr Deputy Speaker. Has a call. 
Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I also rise to speak in respect to the appropriation bills that are before the House. Uh, and before I get into some of the detail, uh, with the House's indulgence, I'd like to send a bit of a shout out to uh, all of those Gold Coast uh, business people and community members that are sleeping out in the cold at uh, the Seabus Super Stadium. Uh, this would have been my sixth year as an ambassador and, and a participant, um, but unfortunately I needed to be here for Budget Week. Um, but I particularly want to acknowledge uh, Colin Wheeler, Lorraine Lovett, uh, Karen Phillips, my co-ambassadors. Uh, also, Chris Martin and Tanya Mahoney from uh, St Vinnie's down the Gold Coast for the incredible work they do. Um, but more importantly, I just want to thank my team who are actually parading around the event with a, a, car, a core flute cut out of my head uh, with a beanie on it uh, this evening and sending me regular updates. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly proud of the team because we set a target of raising tw 28 I'm not taking those interjections. <laughs> I'm not taking those. I'm not taking those interjections. Um, in fact, I've, yeah, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I take offence at those comments from others on the other side of the house. Um, but, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, Team Southport, who set a goal of raising 28,500, actually exceeded that uh, goal. And I want to just uh, put on the record my thanks to John Cutler. Uh, who is uh, parading around as a, um, a stunt double for myself this evening. Also to Sheila Ponting, uh, Chris Smith, the officer in charge at Southport Police Station, uh, Jackson Hills, Logan Walker, Liam Jin and uh, Leanna Marquette, um, who are all part of the team down there um, uh, representing my electorate. And, uh, and the other thing I, I just need to say, and I know I, know I do need to get on the appropriation bill, um, but this year's a record uh, result for the Gold Coast uh, sleep out. Um, at, at, at the last glance at the website, $575,000 raised um, from some 4,000 contributions. Uh, that's the most we've ever raised before, and every cent of that will go towards building more crisis accommodation um, at Arundel, um, at the um, uh, Families Back on Track facility that uh, St Vincent on the Gold Coast have developed over many years. So. Um, that, that money will go towards uh, the, the cost of building another apartment or two for um, elderly uh, women on the Gold Coast in need of uh, crisis accommodation and support. Uh, Mr the Acting Speaker, I also would like to pass on my condolences uh, to friends and family of uh, Duncan Pegg. Um, I had the pleasure of attending a number of functions with him at uh, Sunnybank, uh, at Landmark and uh, Golden Lane and a few of those other venues uh, over the years. Uh, he certainly was a very well adored and, and, well, and, and greatly loved uh, local member. Um, I did hear one of the members on the other side of the house make a comment about the progress he was making learning Mandarin. Um, and I think they may have misrepresented that slightly. I'm not sure that he was making much better progress than I was at learning Mandarin. Uh, he's probably a little better than me, um, but uh, certainly very challenging and, and, it's, and it is incredibly sad. Uh, to, to have lost him from this house, and, uh, and, and I know that um, uh, all of us, um, uh, political differences aside, uh, certainly value the hard work that each of us do and the contributions we make in our communities. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, while, uh, while the Minister for Education is still in the House, um, I, do, I do want to thank her for the spreadsheet that I received today outlying uh, funding commitments uh, that perhaps weren't identified in the Capital Works Program for schools within my electorate. Um, uh, but I, I need to say, Minister, it's not enough. Um, so, in the, so, in the, <coughs> so, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm not taking those interjections. Um, but, uh, but uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, the three million dollars that has been committed, uh, particularly for Bell Bellevue, Bellevue Park State School, uh, also for some uh, in, uh, infrastructure improvements at Ashmore State School, uh, the, the sports court shade sales at Benoa State High School, uh, and the extra money for, towards the construction of the gym at Kebra Park is certainly appreciated. Um, there's about three million dollars uh, that's coming into my local schools. I actually have 18 schools in the electorate of Southport and some 20,000. Uh, young people attending schools across the electorate. Um, 
Uh, but my wish list, um, which I actually have spoken about at great length in the last uh, appropriation bills um, debate, uh, actually totals 31 million. So uh, I've got about 10 per cent of what we need uh, to meet the, the needs of growing schools um, in the fastest growing city in the Gog in Australia, uh, but also um, as a result of COVID, we've seen ex extraordinarily high growth uh, on the Gold Coast over the last 12 months. Um, and a lot of that growth has come into um, the, the electorates of Bonnie and Southport um, via the Games Village and a lot of the high density uh, development that's happened through Southport as a result of the PDA. Uh, and so all of the schools um, are either at capacity or um, very close to reaching capacity. And so there's a real need for some significant capital works expenditure uh, on additional classrooms and facilities right across my electorate. Um, Mr Acting Speaker, um, I also just want to make the note, um, and I've spoken about this previously, but um, in terms of the overall capital works budget, um, the Gold Coast has yet again been bypassed. Um, with, with something like 14 per cent of the total population of the state of Queensland, uh, the Gold Coast will actually receive only 8.5 per cent of the total capital budget, so about $1.1 billion. Um, out of a total state budget of uh, 12.6 billion, um, and sadly that that trend is reflected in just so many areas of uh, vital in infrastructure. Uh, there's still no dollars in the budget for uh, the realignment of the uh, Southport Narang Road from Queen Street through to Kumbari Avenue. Um, although I am pleased to see that the department um, acquired one of the properties in that route, um, and uh, and and actually. Um, had it demolished because uh, it was at risk of becoming um, a problem with vagrants and homeless people um, and not a particularly uh, safe location for that. So, so I do pass on my thanks to the, the regional uh, manager of Gold Coast um, TMR for um, expediting that demolition fairly quickly. Um, Mr. Acting, uh, sorry, Mr Deputy Speaker, I also want to just touch briefly on law and order. Um, Southport uh, has been for some time known as something of a hotspot. Um, it's often misrepresented because um, it's the largest policing district on the Gold Coast. Uh, and so geographically, as a result of that, uh, when the statistic comes out, there's always more of everything. But in pro rata terms, it's, it's comparable to the rest of the city. Uh, but there's certainly a great, a great need for more police. And I note that in uh, the uh, service delivery statements, uh, there's reference to about an extra 1,000 police uh, in the 21-22 uh, budget for Queensland. Um, I just hope that uh, Southport gets a, a good share of those and, and certainly uh, we could use at least an extra 20 or 30 police uh, based in the uh, Southport command uh, to deal with the, the ever-growing challenges around domestic violence, um, support for families uh, and also managing some of the homelessness issues that we've seen um, in Southport and other, and other uh, um, uh, population centres um, up and down the length and breadth of the Gold Coast. Um, Mr De Deputy Speaker, this morning um, I had wanted to ask a question of the Health Minister, and uh, perhaps I can pose it now. Um, not that the Health Minister is here to reply, but hopefully she'll hear of the question and we'll get a response. Um, Point of order, Chair. Um, um, whether a member is in the House or not, is really standing order that is usually observed. I know the member may have made an error, but it should not be used in that manner. Okay. I'll take advice. Mm. Okay, I didn't realise that. No, I wasn't reflecting on the member, but. not here to answer right now. Yeah. Member for Southport, um, it, it's um, against convention to be asking uh, or mentioning uh, members that aren't in the House. Uh, if you need to ask a question, you, you need to refer that later. So uh, we need to with, um, be mindful Thank of that. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I accept your guidance on that. Um, um, so 
so the concern that I want to express, or the, 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 the issue I particularly want to draw the House's attention to, is that in reviewing the um, service delivery statements of Queensland Health um, and looking at, in particular at um, the budgets for all health, uh, hospital health services across the state, uh, there is a discrepancy, um, and at some point I, I, I would like to hear some, uh, a response on that. And it's simply this, that uh, we've heard talk of this being a record health budget. Uh, we've, talked to, we've heard um, discussion around the fact that, um, uh, in fact, uh, the Minister has made statements in this House saying that um, every hospital and health service in Queensland uh, will receive extra funding. Um, but the reality is that across all health services in the current uh, budget, as proposed, uh, there's actually uh, a drop of $74 million um, in budget terms over actual expenditure for the current year. And of particular concern, uh, $51 million of that uh, is just on the Gold Coast. Uh, and so um, it does raise significant concerns, and I understand that, yes, uh, last year there was um, over budget expenditure in some uh, hospital health services like Cairns and the Gold Coast uh, and some of the metropolitan services as a result of extra expenditure due to COVID. Uh, but it does concern me that um, on the Gold Coast where, where the, the department's forecasting a, a $51 million drop in expenditure over the current year, uh, the Sunshine Coast will uh, apparently be $16 million down. Um, Cairns some $25 million down on actual expenditure for the year just gone, um, and even the Children's Hospital here in Brisbane, uh, a decline of about $7 million, and a, a number of the other metropolitan health services also see uh, actual decline. So that's in the direct spending of the health services themselves. Um, uh, it also concerns me um, in looking at the capital works budget for uh, Queensland Health. Um, that there doesn't seem to be any significant amount of money uh, allocated for uh, uh, additional hospital beds. Um, while there is some money there, there's not a lot. And um, <clears throat> if I reflect on my time in the, uh, the Health and Environment Committee as Deputy Chair, uh, we recently had uh, the Queensland Audit Office make a presentation to us on planning uh, for sustainable health services. They raised uh, significant concerns about the lack of forward planning. Mr Speaker, I'm not taking those interjections. If you could perhaps... Um, the member for Southport has the call. And thank you, Mr um, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, but, but, Mr Deputy Speaker, what, what concerns me... Order. What, what concerns me about this health budget and what, what concerns me about um, um, the, the capital works budget particularly uh, and, and some of the loose terms that we've heard about these new sort of um, hub hospitals or whatever they're called um, or uh, satellite hospitals, um, there's, there's not enough detail. And, and it's incredibly frustrating as a member of the health committee um, to not be able to actually share some of the information that's been presented um, because uh, so many of our um, briefings have been uh, in private, uh, which goes very much against uh, the, the fundamental principles of establishing the parliamentary committee system. Um, and it was actually Judy Spence in August a number of years ago that stood in this very house and said that in every occasion possible, the, the, the work of committees, the proceedings of committees uh, should be in public unless there is a clear reason for a, a meeting to go into private session. Um, and so there are many concerns, I believe, that need to be highlighted and explored further in respect of uh, planning of health services across the state. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, in drawing, uh, coming to a conclusion, um, I also just want to raise concerns, as the member for Everton and member for Hill and many other members in the House have done today, uh, around the underspend of uh, public housing. And uh, while I've heard the Minister's announcement about a $1.9 billion uh, commitment, I note that that's over four years. Um, and my real concern, again, is if you look at the budget for this year, um, the Gold Coast, in terms of capital work, works for acquisitions, upgrades and uh, new housing 
uh, will only receive $32.9 million, uh, which is about 6 per cent of the total budget. Uh, and again, uh, that's a significant shortfall given that the Gold Coast has 14 per cent of the state's population. Um, and if you look at that um, uh, in terms of the last decade, um, it's, it represents a, a, an annual shortfall of around 25 to $30 million. So um, almost $300 million of underspending over the last 10 years. There's a lot of uh, catch-up that's required on the Gold Coast, and I would implore the Minister and the Government uh, to roll out that proposed um, housing program a lot quicker than what's been foreshadowed in this budget, because there are many families in crisis, and uh, no less so on the Gold Coast than anywhere else in the state. Mr Member Deputy Speaker. Member for Cairns has the call. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And just before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the uh, overwhelming detail in some of the contributions that are being made. It's almost intimidating. Um, I raised to make my meagre contribution um, to the budget in reply. And before I do, I'd like to acknowledge um, the hard work and congratulate the Treasurer and his team. Never before have any of us in this chamber ever seen the challenges that have evolved uh, or presented themselves over the last 18 months. And hopefully we've seen the back of them, but may well continue uh, into uh, the Fords because we're not out of the woods yet. And I think uh, presenting two budgets to a uh, half understanding and uh, people who can read a P&L and to the others who can't is obviously a challenge, um, even for those that have the most basic of education. However, the Premier and Treasurer of this government have been at one as we as a government have been at one. We have been consistent with a simple message. I, I, it's not over yet, so hang in there. Uh, the Premier and the Treasurer and this government have been at one and consistent with a simple message. A healthy community leads to a healthy economy. And today the figures speak for themselves. That sensible, calculated and measured response based on the science has worked and worked well, not just for the government, but far more importantly for the people of Queensland. Investing in job creating industries and activities is how you grow the economy. Investing in much needed social and community housing is how you grow the economy. Investing in our hospitals and associated staff is also how you grow the economy. And investing in our schools and teachers is how you contribute to building a better Queenslander for their future. And this is what this budget does. We're not cutting services, we're not sacking people, we're not selling assets. This is a solid investment in our future. We're growing our economy and, most importantly, we are investing in the people of Queensland. Now, Speaker, I'll only make slight mention of those on the opposite side of the changer, but we did hear the member for Sandgate highlight the member for Broadwater's inaccurate details. Impressively disappointing. The creative accountancy that we're hearing. You don't look at a P&L sheet and go, maybe. They're black and white. They're figures. You look down the columns. It is as basic as the day is as long. So what I can say here Order. is that what passes off what passes off as the opposition in this state can best be described as a quagmire of dysfunction, displaying an impressive and inconsistent inability to comprehend or articulate any significant solutions to the challenges that COVID-19 has presented. And there was no greater example, there was no greater example on, that on your side you called on 64 occasions for the borders to be open. I mean, what an absolute, impressively disappointing response. Not only did that reflect their inability to comprehend the magnitude of the challenge, but it's as concerning as you didn't even understand the science. It highlighted your total lack. It highlighted your total lack of understanding. To have a healthy economy, you need a healthy community. And the good news is, the people of Queensland knew that and reflected that towards the end of last year. Only the other day I was speaking with a senior executive of a worldwide hotel chain who was telling me that prior to COVID-19, the Pacific region was producing less than 20 per cent of that company's of total profit. Now, due to the impact of COVID around the world, the Pacific region now accounts for 54 per cent of this company's global profit. A healthy society means a healthy economy. The facts speak for themselves. 
And speaking of health, may I, uh, may I just touch on some of the spectacular things that are happening in our part of the world in far north Queensland. When I look at the far north, I'm pleased to report that the Palisade government has continued its investment in our city and region, with $1.3 billion being allocated. The Queensland government is investing $1.33.9 million into projects at the Cairns Hospital as part of its transition to a university hospital, supporting 389 full-time jobs. This government investment includes $70 million for a new mental health facility, $30 million for expanding our emergency department and fit out for a pre-admission clinic, amongst other investments. In addition, the government is investing $24.9 million for critical infrastructure upgrades to ensure the ongoing efficient operation of the hospital to meet projected future demand of its facilities. Completed projects include the $4.1 million to deliver a new hybrid theatre and the $4.5 million to fit out the 11-bed ward. Order. The Queensland Too much side chit-chat. Member for Cairns has a call. In addition, the Queensland Government is investing an initial 16.5 for a Cairns Health Innovation Centre adjacent to the hospital site, which is set to become a new public health precinct for clinical research, education, training, Indigenous health and community engagement. The Government is developing a CHIC in partnership with James Cook University Pause the Cairns clock. Tropical Enterprise Centre. Uh, the member for Cairns, just take your seat um, while... Um the rest of the room gets comfortable. Um, there is someone ha um, from the member for Cairns has the call, and a little bit of respect as you come and go from the chamber would be great. Uh, the member for Cairns has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And these figures are actually real. As the Treasurer highlighted, since our government was first elected in 2015, we have overseen a 30% increase in the strength of our nursing workforce. That means an additional 8,400 nurses and midwives Queensland has 2,841 more doctors, 4,291 more health practitioners and 858 more ambulance personnel, reinforcing our frontline health response. You do not need to be a parent like me to understand the importance of education. And the understanding of that importance is reflected in the government's commitment to the far north, with $51.2 million being spent into our schools to maintain, improve and upgrade our schools in the region. This includes half a million dollars to refurbish the Resources Centre at the Balaclava State School, and I was very happy to ring the principal there the other day and have a chat with her about that. And thank you again, Minister. In addition to that, an investment, $600,000 for the upgrade to the Cairns West State School, over $5 million for the administration upgrades to Edge Hill State School, and over a quarter of a million each for both Balaclava State School and Parramatta State Schools for out-of-school hours care. This is absolutely fundamental. In addition, the new hall facility at Trinity Bay State High School will receive 450000 for initial works out of the planned $11.5 million. I am also very pleased to report that the Cairns Diversionary Centre will receive $3.2 million to expand its facilities, and those funds have been allocated. But just as importantly, in addition to the $1.2 million to establish a Cairns Managing Public Intoxication Program, this is an essential piece of local infrastructure which contributes to dealing with our city's itinerant challenges. Deputy Speaker, the Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record for proceedings. I call the member for Moran. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on the 2021-22 state budget for Queensland. On behalf of the people of Moran, I'd like firstly to thank the ministers for working with me across on certain projects. I'd also like to extend my condolences to the member for Stretton, Mr Duncan Pegg, who actually invited to me to some of his functions, and we had some great times together. The House will sad, it'll be sad to see him uh, from this House. I would seem, it would seem this budget hangs on a shoestring, both being dependent on fickle weather events and future COVID lockdowns for it to be delivered successfully. With the current debt, it invests Queensland money on hydrogen projects that at this point have no real demand and at this stage no imminent return on investment that is desperately needed at this time. After COVID hit us in 2020, 
wiping out small businesses and crippling so many others, Queensland soon became aware of what is truly essential. And why wouldn't we continue Order. on this path to ensure a free stabilisation across the state until the threat of COVID and the impact on our mining and agriculture sector stabilised, giving Queensland the foundation that supported us through the COVID crisis? The electorate of Morani is home to some of the state's most wealth gathering generating industries in the country, including sugar tourism, horticulture, fishing and many other of support industries. Queensland crucial mining sectors are based there. With all the due respect to the members present, but the needs and concerns of the people of Morani are very different to the needs and concerns of the South East. One of the biggest concerns we have is the terrible state of our road network. Across the electric, there are roads in desperate state of disrepair and the real program of work is urgently needed to ensure they are safe and fit for purpose for the future. That's why I've been asking for a solid commitment from the state government to repair areas of the Bruce Highway, road, farm, road that farmers use to haul cane, and also Anzac Avenue that transfers visitors to our beautiful Pioneer Valley and Yungla Range. The problem is fast becoming urgent, however, with the rash of horrifying accidents and near misses, rollover of trucks near schools, rollover on main highways and 100 kilometre hour zones. The road network has fallen into complete disrepair in many areas. The Wilkeston bypass funding in the budget was also very welcome, but as I have said previously, the project has numerous design problems and are causing untold problems for farmers in the areas that need to be addressed. The current plan forces cumbersome farm vehicles to cross the planned new bypass via a staggering TC uh, intersection, and that's a big safety concern for local cane growers. The intersection uh, with moving cane harvester gear causes, could cause fatalities, and this could all be avoided just by listening to growers and making changes. If it isn't fixed, interaction will claim lives during the crushing season when you have to have over 220 trips per day crossing the intersection into existing traffic during peak periods. Madam Speaker, this is only the beginning of the terms of what's needed. We are in urgent need of funding to address issues on the Bruce Highway for new need of new bridges and additional culverts, more lane duplication, increased overtaking lanes and flood proofing of long stretches along the Bruce Highway from St Lawrence North. Health is another area, Speaker, as on part of that committee. Queensland faces an unstable future concerning its infrastructure, with more than 11,000 people reported moving to our great state every month. That, coupled with the already overburdened health system and crime issues, are deep concerns being continually spoken from my people's lips. Regional hospitals are crying out for more beds, more medical staff, more supplies. More than that, I'm hearing people all over the region calling for much more transparency around the health sector. I've had some older people just recently, and my father was one of them, who went in for a normal procedure and spent nine days in intensive care. Another lady had a, a gentleman, her husband, went in for a procedure and didn't come back out. And she still doesn't know the reason why. It's not Excuse the health me, call. Member for Marini. Pause the clock. Um, there's, members, there's too much chattering going on in the chamber. Can you please keep it to a minimum? Thank you. Thank member, you, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's not the health or hospital's fault. They do it the best job they can with what they have. And they, I can't praise them enough for the work that they have been doing. It's just because it's, the whole system is overloaded and we just don't have the resources of the workers that they need to keep up at some times. We're also seeing noticeable lack of adequate community and social infrastructure it's becoming critical. And even the member for Mackay would be able to say this, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. People working in the community up there say they're being hit with huge surge of unmet demand for services and are, are dealing with huge volume of people suffering economic hardship, homelessness and health issues with job losses. Only last week, 500 people, it was actually 478 people, some of the most of mothers with children living in houses and could not find places to rent because of the economic hardship. Um, you know, they can't afford the rent rises and what's going on in the actual state. You know, they're living in cars and couch surfing at the moment. That's mums with kids. So from what we're seeing, that many people are still struggling. We need the government to throw a lot more effort and finance towards that area um, so that we can, you know, work through that. Marini Electric also uh, pro provides com critical support services for the mining sector, Hay Point, Dalrymple Bay. Uh, and is proud to be the home of the most residual, resilient sugar and cattle industry in the world, I believe. The whole state has and, and does re, the whole state has and still does reap untold riches from the blood, sweat and tears of our miners, farmers, manufacturers and small businesses. The onus is now on the government to give back some of that wealth 
to the people who produced it. Mount Morgan is a prime example. Drought-stricken and urgently needs piping and water up to its number seven dam to both facilitate its people and also the opening of the new mine that sh uh, coming on this year. And we also need the government's support to ensure that that mine does open and the legacy and the damage of all the poisoning that's occurred over the years is addressed by that mine opening. And you know, the mining going in there helping give jobs to the local economy and also fixing that legacy. Same goes for the fire-clad cabins in Mount Morgan. Um, the dinosaur, dinosaur footprints, they're just crying out for more investment and, the, and opening up of that area and the support of the government. We have a risk-adverse government in that certain sector that did not want to be able to access that, to shut those fire-clad cabins, and we need to work to make sure that we open that again. They're crying out for that tourism investment. It's been an absolute shame to watch that whole thing close. Some of the projects I've been fighting for and will continue to fight for is the mountain bike trail also in Morani. that goes from Yungla back down to Finch Hatton. That'll be a major tourist attraction and help the whole region. Well, there can be no beating around the bush. Queensland books are covered awash with red ink. The state's total debt is expected to jump from the estimated $95.8 billion this year to $106.3 billion in 2022 before hitting $127.3 billion in 2024-25. According to the Treasury, the debt interest bill is forecast to reach $3.4 billion per year by 24. That's an unprecedented, staggering amount of money which the state will now have to pay each year. And even in these alarming figures, they're heavily reliant on shaky set of assumptions. Omitted from the calculations are all the massive costs we will incur if it wins the bid for the 2032 Olympic Games. And I'm, in fact, I believe that the government should pledge to the people of Queensland, should pledge to the people of Queensland, a dollar for dollar investment of infrastructure and water security spent in this state that equals the overall cost of the games and the bid for it if they consider it's going to turn a profit for Queensland. That's what I believe. There are also many other rising assumptions. The interest rates stay at their current low of 0.1% that there are no more outbreaks of COVID and the government somehow works out a way to reap dividends from all the billions being poured into renewables. The Treasurer said on Tuesday that all the borrowing we are doing is needed to generate growth for the future, but nowhere did I see in this budget any productivity plan or blueprint for reform of, tax system, of our tax system or plans to reduce the regulatory burden that is killing small business and agriculture. Neither are there plans for new ports and only any other major water or power infrastructure projects that would help expand the supply side of Queensland's economy. We could have at least built Wookwood Weir to the, to the level it was actually designed for. There would have, you, would, you know, there would, uh, <laughs> that's where you'll find real potential for growth and the opportunity to create jobs and investment and wealth for the future. As it is, Queenslanders have been handed a budget that focuses exclusively on maintaining people's cash flow in order to service their monthly debt payments and keep the state's property and household debt bubble from bursting. Mortgage stress figures are already showing that there are huge numbers of people, especially in the south-east corner, are most at risk. That's a real reason behind the budget's huge spending, to create enough low-paying dead-end jobs so people have just enough to service their debt obligations. Most of these low-paying dead-end jobs will mostly be in the service sectors and will end in destroying more of our middle wage earners over, over time. Any government can borrow to create low quality jobs and to drive unemployment numbers down, but only by investing in private and export sectors can you Board help members. Queenslanders with real jobs. Jobs that are rewarding, secure and well paid. As it is, any increase in unemployment figures over the next few years, and we will quickly see a rise... Member for Maribra sees all interjections. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. ...and defaults that will finish stability in terms of the banks and bring on a whole, a whole economy to its knees. All this borrowing debt with the government in its usual prop-up debt bubble and the green economy will do nothing to prevent the steep falls we will see in the government revenue, particularly from our coal exports. All revenues are falling, and we have seen a big drop in LNG royalties as well. Overall exports from Queensland fell 28.4 per cent between 2020 and 2021, with the biggest falls being in the mineral fuels and coals, which both fell 38.1 per cent. Lower exports and lower coal prices mean billions of dollars less in royalties for the government. With the massive debt and the government is carrying, and the implications for Queensland is a sobering fact that could be huge. No more than ever, 
we needed government to step up to support and safeguard the state's most productive and most proven wealth-creating industries, the backbone of our economy, and they have failed to do it once again. There was nothing for the resource, mining, agricultural or tourism anywhere apart from a few one-off temporary projects. Even worse, the budget made damaging cuts to, to the budgets of those departments responsible for those sectors. Agricultural budget was slashed by 32.5, tourism lost 24 per cent, and small business and trading more than 8 per cent. The Department of Resources suffered a whopping 47.7 cut to its budget, something not even the loss of the titles can hope to justify. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Government of Queensland has missed a unique opportunity in this budget, an opportunity to take all the debt used, use it to the invest in Queensland's real economy, the economy that generates real wealth, it drives real growth and it creates real jobs for the future, and they have missed it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise I... the point of order. What is your point of order? Section 244, subsection 5. Members must be in allocated seats, particularly with COVID restrictions. And I draw your attention to the member for Miller. Can I please... Speaker. Madam order. Speaker. Order. Order. Speaker. Members. Can I please remind members to be in their uh, own seats? Madam Acting Speaker. Speaker. Member for Bundaberg. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, last year Queenslanders had a choice to decide who they trusted to keep us safe in a time of global pandemic. Last year Queenslanders had a choice to decide who they trusted to deliver for our state's health our hospitals, for our schools, for delivery of infrastructure and for the growth and security of jobs. Deputy Speaker, last year Queenslanders elected a Palaszczuk Labor government and since then that third term Palaszczuk government has delivered two budgets and that continues the great track record of backing in health, backing in regional infrastructure and backing Queensland jobs. Deputy Speaker, this is a budget that meets the challenges that my community of Bundaberg has had to face because of COVID-19. This is a budget that delivers for health, that delivers for housing and delivers for more jobs in Bundy. Deputy Speaker, let's talk about housing. $1.9 billion in the budget for housing and this will change lives for the people in Bundaberg. We have the Housing and Construction and Jobs Program 2.8 million in this financial year to complete the construction of 20 housing units. The Works for Tradies program, 2.7 million in 21-22 to complete further construction. And this is a game changer because what it does, it looks after the most vulnerable people and it gives them that roof over the head and the confidence to get back into the job market. And we help people get back into the job markets on this side of the house and we've got fantastic programs. We've got Skill and Queenslanders for Work and we've got the Back to Work program and I can tell you, Deputy Speaker, that businesses in Bundy love the Back to Work program. They love the Back to Work program because it gives young people a chance to get back into the workforce and it also gives that $20,000 to those businesses to invest back into their business and grow their business as well. And businesses in Bundy love the Palaszczuk Labor government, let me tell you that, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, when we talk about education, what a huge win for schools, a huge win for schools. Over $3 million in new builds and $1.4 million of ongoing uh, maintenance and small works. And Deputy Speaker, when I met with the principal of Bundaberg South State School earlier this year and said that we'll deliver that new security fence, well, there's $440,000 in that and the security fence is already underway. 350000 for Bundy North State uh, School, 350000 for Walker Vale, and even though it's just slightly out of the electorate, just under $1 million for the students, the staff and the parents of the great Wungara State School as well. And let's talk about education. Let's talk about TAFE, Deputy Speaker. I went to TAFE uh, the other week and I've got to say, you can still feel the scars and the hurt of the savage cuts of the LNP. That Newman, Nichols, Chris Fully government that absolutely ripped our TAFE apart. But the Palaszczuk government is investing in the TAFE, investing in the TAFE. What we know, what we Order. know is that we will deliver the new Order, members. And water culture hub for the Bundaberg TAFE. Because we know that the Bundy... Members, there's just too much excitement happening in the chamber tonight. 
Member for Bundaberg, you have the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. We invest in our agriculture and our horticulture in our TAFE because we know that Bundy kids of today are the growers of tomorrow, and we have the best growers in the world in Bundaberg. And, Deputy Speaker, this budget is about investing Order. in the jobs. It's about investing in the jobs, and we're doing that through the construction and the housing, the construction and the education. $41 million for works on Isis Highway and Childers Road. And of course, the next big step to delivering Bundaberg's brand new world-class hospital. And Deputy Speaker, that's right, the hospital that the Premier promised is the hospital that the Premier will deliver. And what a great hospital it will be. This is a budget that delivers for Queensland. Member for Nanango, member for, for Everton, sees all interjections. And Deputy Speaker, while we're talking about health, let's talk about my good friend, the little angry ant, the member for uh, Burnett. Little angry ant, he went on radio on Wednesday and said, oh, the budget's just too hard to read, too hard to read. And look, it's obviously too hard for him to understand the technical services as well around the terminology of a hospital. But that's OK, because the member for Burnett's not happy lately, because there's a Labor member back in Bundaberg and he's standing up for Bundaberg. And let me tell you, I'm not going to let the mistruths and the spin of the member for Burnett poison our community, that's for sure. But the member for Order. Burnett is not happy. He's not happy because his own party shafted him all the way to the backbench. Shafted him all the way to the backbench. He's not happy because the local LMP, the local LMP are getting their pre-selection candidate Order, members. Ready and they are circling. He's not happy. He's not happy because, as I found out, this week is actually the fifth anniversary of him being found in contempt of parliament. So he's not happy about that now. I didn't have a chance to go out and get him a card, so I thought I'd table this article here and I'll wish him a happy anniversary on that. But let me tell you, Deputy Speaker, Paul Keating once said of one of his political opponents that his political opponent needed a Valium. Well, Deputy Speaker, the member for Burnett, he doesn't need a Valium. He needs a big hug and a good lie down. Big hug and a good lie down. And before, before I support, before I give my final member support, Everton. let's talk about the member for Broadwater's oh no moment on Sky News last night. Let's talk about that. In fact, Deputy Speaker, you can go back and you can watch it. It's on YouTube and you can see the moment that he actually gasps. There's a gasp at the fact of what he said. And it's the same moment when all of his advisers had to pick their jaws up off the floor at what he said about savage cuts. And it was also the same moment that the member for Clayfield, the member for Nanango, the member for Surface Paradise, they had a little bit of a smirk and a smile and they said, brother, welcome to the club. Welcome to the club of former LNP leaders. Welcome. They, they're going to welcome Order. him with open arms back there, that's for sure. The member for Broadwater, you could see how much he's rattled by that mis misstep that he did last night. And his own side wouldn't even listen to his own speech today. They wouldn't even back him. They were too busy on their phones. I think one of them might have been playing Tetris. I'm not too sure. Have to check the record. But, Deputy Speaker, last week, last sitting week, I mentioned how um, I'd heard, heard some comments about uh, maybe Member there was a little bit of a coup murmuring around the backbenches. I'd heard some comments. But, Deputy Speaker, let's just say... It would not be it would not be a long reach would not be a long reach at all to suggest that some LNP members Hold are a little, members. Bit, little bit nervous about the member for Broadwater. And let's just say he shouldn't have to fret because I'm sure that he's got nothing to worry go about. Nothing to worry go. That's a bit of a bad pun, but you know you've got to try and work it in, don't you? Not a long reach and he's got nothing to worry go about. This is a budget that delivers for health. This is a budget that delivers for housing, delivers for jobs, and delivers for Bundaberg. What a fantastic Labor budget this is by a fantastic Labor treasurer, a part of a fantastic Labor Palaszczuk government. I support this budget. Speaker, Deputy Speaker. Member for Nanango. Thank you, you Deputy call. Speaker. And seriously, it is always so great to follow a member of the Labor Party like the member for Bundaberg. Now this is this is this is the new member who actually thinks who actually thinks he's supporting his electorate by ripping down Paradise Dam, by supporting a budget that doesn't have one red cent to restore the Paradise Dam, not one red cent to support the agricultural Order. industry, not one red cent Order. to support all of those
those incredible Bundaberg people that were there today. And where was the member for Bundaberg when those fruit and veg growers were standing at the end of the Speaker's Hall? They're standing there. They've spent all day with that incredible display. And where was the member for Bundaberg? Well, he was so scared to talk to them. He walked straight past member for Bundaberg. because he knows. He knows that the people of Bundaberg and the people of the Wide Bay Burnett region are disgusted with the member for Bundaberg and his lack of support for Paradise Dam and ripping down Paradise Dam. He's on one side. He's on one side. On one side. One turn. Sorry. Uh -huh. oh. Member for Everton, Member for Bundaberg, Member for Miller, please seize all interjections and cross-chamber chatting. I call the Member for Nanango. Thank you for your protection, Deputy Speaker. If I can move on from the... F the I'll, I'll get back to him. I will get back to him. But I do, I do wish to start tonight being the first time Port I've order. spoken since the passing of the Member of Street. For what is your point of order, Member for Bundaberg? Uh, that correct title is to be used in the House, please. What? I'm not him, Member for Bundaberg. Sorry, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was talking about the Member for Stretton and his passing. Member for Nanga, you have the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And as I was saying, since it was the first time that I've had an opportunity to speak in this House since the very sad passing of Duncan Pegg, the member for Stretton, I do, I do wish to, and I know we will have an opportune time to speak uh, of our memories of Duncan Pegg, but given that it is the budget and reply speech, it would be remiss of me not to just recount how much we loved Duncan Pegg in the way that we called him the financial genius. Uh, and I know we loved it. Uh, even though, and he stood up in every budget and reply speech and, and you know, gave it back to us as best he possibly could, uh, which was great. And he did it in, our, in his motions as well, every Wednesday night motions. Any time there was a financial uh, bill or motion in this House, uh, the member for Stretton was on the speaking list. And, and it was always great, and I really loved the debate uh, with, with Peggy, and he is sorely missed. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, in relation to this appropriation bill, well, it's a bit like following the member for Bundaberg. It's just all smoke and mirrors, really. Uh, and Dribble, I will take that interjection. But look, this state budget sets the government's economic and policy agenda for the next year and beyond. And look, Quite, quite frankly, what is going to happen because of this budget is just so far-reaching. It goes to the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. I mean, we've, I cannot go past the fact that two weeks ago we stood in this chamber and we debated a bill that the Treasurer put before us, a debt reduction bill supposedly, where he, he said that the Lands Titles Office in Queensland Order. was at an unbelievable value at over $4.4 billion when Victoria and New South Wales was below three. But don't worry about that. Within two weeks, Madam Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, all of a sudden, miraculously, because I dare say the ratings agencies went, hang on a minute, Mr Treasurer, or, oops, let's, let's double it up to $8 billion of value. That is trickery, it's a con job, and we all know it. Now, we know Labor is losing control. It's completely losing control of the key services that people of Queensland deserve from their state government. And there is not one more critical example than the failures of the health system across Queensland. And here are just a couple of examples from my electorate. 17-year-old Jordan, who suffered a severe cut to her leg and needed surgery in Toowoomba. And she's from Kingaroy. After her mum urgently drove her to Toowoomba for surgery, Jordan went nil by mouth each day um, for four days awaiting that emergency so, um, surgery. So every day. She was told, don't eat, 
because you'll get surgery that day for four days. 17-year-old girl. And then there's Merv from Tagulua who needs cataract surgery. His eyesight is deteriorating due to glaucoma and he is ref he's, was referred to Ipswich Hospital in September 2020. By February, when Merv contacted me, he had not heard from the hospital. His referral then went to the PA and he was told he was in category two, meaning he'd have to wait another 90 days. Right. Well, it's now June and he's been told by the PA that category two is now a wait time of 18 months. That means it'll be two years from his original referral before he even has an appointment with a specialist. Merv may be blind by then. And that is the concern. The health system in Queensland is at crisis point. And I know I have said in this House many times before, I recall the day that Anna Bly, the then Premier of Queensland, stood up when the now Premier of Queensland was a Cabinet Minister, sat around her Cabinet table and the Premier, she nodded her head, and the Premier of Queensland, Anna Bly, stood there and said, the health system is a basket case. We've got to split it into two. Well, where is the Premier Palaszczuk now? It's a worse basket case than it was under that name that no one in this House ever likes to talk about, and that is Premier Bly. It is now worse. And yet the current Premier was a minister sat around the Cabinet table that made sure the health system... And that is one of the reasons, Order. Deputy Speaker that I'm in this House here today, because we know that it is only the LNP that can get in and fix up the health system here in Queensland. Now, we also know, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, in my portfolio of Shadow Minister for Water and Construction of Dams and Regional Development and Manufacturing, this is yet another department... Member for Everton, cease your interjections. Member, you have the call. Thank you. In relation to the Department of Water, this is another area that the government is losing control. It's a sector that has kept our economy going and booming through and ticking through this pandemic. And it's its sector that's ensured that food is on our table. It's a sector that has made sure Queenslanders have remained in jobs. And what does this sector need? It needs water. It doesn't need the Paradise Dam wall ripping down. It doesn't need Calide Dam wall ripping down without an alternate to put it back up again. It needs investment in water infrastructure. And now at an all time, at a time where interest rates are at an all time low, you would think the government would be spending some of that extra borrowing that they're doing on infrastructure. But instead they've actually ripped the heart out of the infrastructure budget in this state. No extra money, none, zero, zilch, for extra uh, water projects that we need. Whether it's projects in the Calide electorate, whether it's the weir projects in my electorate, the Balil weir. The member for Calide there, he's always talking about Nathan Dam. There's other dams. There's Urana Dam. All these projects member that are for, waiting for investment and support by the Palaszczuk government. And what do we see in this budget? Absolutely nothing. But what we do see, we do see is an absolute con job with this paper here. So here on this um, highlight, we go to this glossy brochure where it says Townsville, oh, $195 million on this brochure. But yet you actually will see that goes to show how clueless the member for Thurman Gower is. I'll take Point that objection because it is obvious. Once the clock, the member, member for Nanango. Point of order. What is your point of order? I take offence, personal offence, ask it to withdraw. <laughs> member for Nanango, the member for Tharangar takes personal offence, do you withdraw? I withdraw and, and Madam Speaker, I'd take offence too if the Treasurer of Queensland, who was on my side, actually fed me an absolute pub and said I'm going to say $195 million but in the capital statement, in the capital statement, member for Tharangawa, it's at $85 million. Well, no wonder you're offended. I understand his problem because it's the member for Tharangawa who is under the pump because crime is out of control under his watch and it is Quite obvious 
that the member for Thorangawa is so precious. Point of order. Oh, I take, again, take personal offence and ask the member to withdraw. Member for Nanango, the member for Thurung, member for Budrem, sees your interjections. Member for Thurung, uh, member for Nanango, the member for Thurungau takes personal offence. Do you withdraw? I withdraw, but I would like to. No, no. <laughs> I withdraw. Thank you, member for Nanango. You have the call. I do would like to take the interjection from the member for Budgerum because uh, it was it was uh, very good. But in the manufacturing space, in the manufacturing space, Labor are quick to boast building two new manufacturing hubs. Now, where are those hubs? Apparently, both in the Gold Coast and Mackay. Yet again, once again, devil is always in the detail. Yeah. When it comes to a Labor budget. I mean, we know that all those opposite have not picked up the papers. Oh, sorry, they've probably picked up the papers that the ministers have fed them, and that was pretty obvious from my, my neighbouring colleague, uh, the member for Ipswich West there. It was pretty obvious that the education minister had just said, hey, Jimmy, just, oh, sorry, member for Ipswich West, just read this, because seriously, Deputy Speaker, this is a budget that is a con job. Yes. It is full of yes. um, trickery. It is full of glossy paper and smoke deception, and deception smoke, smoke and, mirrors. and mirrors. I take that interjection because there is the order. Look, Member for Lockyer. Member it is no Nega. wonder, Madam Deputy Speaker, that this budget completely fails to address so many issues that are hurting regional Queensland, whether it's electricity prices, whether it's water infrastructure projects, whether it is the incredible project in the Lockyer and the Somerset providing water for another incredible agricultural, horticultural region that, that is amazing. Imagine how good it would be if we could just add water. And that's what we want to do in the Lockyer and the Somerset regions. And that's what the member for Bundaberg should be looking at in relation uh, to Paradise Dam. But in, in, to my... Look, Madam Deputy Speaker... Member for Everton, cease your interjections. Madam Deputy Speaker, in relation to the Nanango electorate, there is nothing more disappointing in this budget than the lack of road funding. Now, I, I just want to... This, this is what we've missed out on. Kilkeven tansey Road, single-lane bridge on New England Highway at Kuya, the 11-kilometre single-lane section at Mundubba Jurong Road, seven kilometres of the unsealed section of Memorambi Gordonbrook Road, Running Creek Bridge on Maluga Road, the Brisbane Valley Highway, single-lane Tangerinji Bridge. It was the Tangerinji Bridge, Madam Deputy Speaker, that these opposite said they would look at after a school bus full of kids nearly went over it. I've been advocating for it. It's not even listed anywhere in the budget. No planning, nothing. Backlog, uh, backlog maintenance. And when it comes to a busload full of school kids, I've sat, I've spoken in this house about this issue twice, and you would think the Minister for Roads would think, oh, well, maybe we should fix up that bridge, but no. It's like the Bunya Mountains um, ceiling of that road. You think, oh, great, it's actually the it's in there, but not until after 2024 25. It's absolute rot. <coughs> they have kicked it down the road. I will give it to the great PNC and the principal of the Kilcoy State the Kilcoy State School for the, uh, around seven years of advocating with me for the new school hall. Great, great, and we are great, great, so great. pleased Order. to be able to see that eventually, after six years, the Palaszczuk government have decided to fund that and for Tukulawa School. And I do thank the Minister for Education in relation uh, to those schools. But what I will say is this. For the, for the South Burnett, what we need more than anything is a paediatrician is a paediatrician for the South Burnett families. And I get the arrogance and the hubris of the member over there who thinks they don't care. They think a new member will help them. But what we need for the South Burnett is actually an understanding from those inner city people like the member for Mansfield yep. that the people of the bush deserve yeah, to have the services. Yeah. They don't deserve... Oh, was it the member for... It was the member for Mansfield who thought she was funny. 
She should know better because she's a principal. And it's the principals of my local schools who are asking for this. They want the paediatrician based there. They don't want the health minister to say, oh, we've got it fixed, because they can go to Toowoomba. Well, I'll tell you this. If you are a family that lives the other side of Proston and your kids are at Tingora State School, you can't just take your kids. You can't afford to get your kids over to Toowoomba. That's the reality of living in oh, regional God. Queensland. It's not like just heading off to the Royal uh, Children's Hospital. You, you, the Lady Salento, you just can't do it if you're in the bush. And that's why we need a paediatrician for the South, um, yeah, South yeah, yeah. Burnett. I've touched on the water infrastructure uh, that we also need in the, in the um, wonderful area of the South Burnett. But in closing, Madam Deputy Speaker, <coughs> what I would say is that this budget is a complete fail. It's a fail for the people of Queensland. It's a fail for the people that support us by putting food on our table. It fails the people that want water security in Queensland. It fails the manufacturing industry. It fails the mums and dads who are just trying to get ahead to get a home and get ahead and raise their, their families here in Queensland. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is unacceptable that this con job is actually a state budget. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise Deputy in point of order. <laughs> Section 244, subsection 5, the member for Miller. Not in his seat again. Thank you. <laughs> Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Green Slopes. Temporary Speaker. What an absolute success of a budget. That's what I'd like to say. And can I just say, member for Bundaberg, member for Thurangower, member for Ipswich West, member for Mansfield, how did you survive that withering attack? That withering attack from the former leader of the opposition who thought the way to the top job was via the new Bradfield scheme. It is absolutely a great honour to reply to the budget delivered by our very talented and hard-working Treasurer. That's right, the talented and hard-working Treasurer. According to the member for Kiwana, uh, he is also an extremely photogenic Treasurer and a very, very good dog walker. Order! Look, before I... Be member for Everton, seize your interjections. Yeah, member please. for Grinslopes, you have the call. Please cease your interjections, Member for Everton. I, I've heard all about the statue that you've raised to yourself and, and now the photograph you've put up of yourself. You, you've said enough tonight. Look, I wanted to get on to... Before I respond... Member for Grinslopes, you have the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Before I get on to uh, responding to the budget, I did want to respond to some of the things said by those opposite, starting with the Leader of the Opposition's efforts. Now, there were many of us on this side of the House who prior to day feared that Derek Zoolander had perished in a freak gasoline accident. But <laughs> fear not, the spirit of Derek is alive and well, and he's rocking blue steel in the Queensland Parliament. We have the member for Broadwater, who delivered a budget speech that will be compulsory reading at the Leader of the Opposition's Centre for Kids Who Can't Budget Good and Want to Learn <laughs> to Do Other Stuff Too. The member for Broadwater's Order. speech shows that he is more than up to the job of filling the shoes of previous opposition leaders, and long will he stay there. He has a foot to fill the shoes and the mouth with wonderful quotes like, I am ruling out being savage. I'm ruling out being savage. Well, like any good butcher, he'll be offering prime cuts. Uh, but will they be cuts that make people want to come back and back again? Well, I think not. But perhaps they'll be non-savage cuts delivered with velvet scissors. Crafty cuts. That's a good one. Crafty cuts. But enough of the member for Broadwater. I did want to pay tribute to the former opposition leader, and I've already uh, alluded to that. But I will start uh, with some comments uh, updating the House on the word on the street from Greenslopes about the new Bradfield screen scheme. Because I can tell you what, the people, the people of Order, member for have Everton. stopped talking about the new Brad scheme. Member Bradfield for Everton. Scheme. They love the new Bradfield scheme, member. They love pa the new Bradfield scheme. Pause the clock. Pause the, what, the clock. The member for Greenslope. New... Pause the clock. Member for Everton, please seize your interjections. Member for Greenslopes, you have the call. 
Thank you, uh, temporary speaker. I'll tell you what, the, the thing that I can update the House on in relation to the new Bradfield scheme, and it's the only thing we can say, is that since the last time I spoke on this topic, in the last budget reply speech, if, if the LNP would have been elected, we would have now had only 14 and a half years to wait until anything was actually delivered. In fact, the much vaunted office, uh, the vaunt, much vaunted office, I think it's called the Parliamentary Budget Assessment Office or something, so vaunted, in fact, I don't think I've heard a single member on that side of the House talk about it in their speech. Now, the member for Order. Talked about it. The member for Bancroft Order, said, members. But the Office of Budgetary Assessment would have a mere 14 and a half years to assess the new Bradfield scheme if the LNP had actually been elected. But we know the new Bradfield scheme is not going to happen, and we also knew the Office of ba uh, Budgetary Assessment is not going to happen either. The, the leader, oh, I want to get on to see <laughs> the rego rebate. Yeah, well, that won't take long either. Look, I do want to get on to serious matters. The Leader of the Opposition used his speech to continue to perpetrate the mis myths of a health crisis. I don't want to diminish or disregard the serious issues raised by those opposites, but to take individual cases and conflate them to a crisis is the height of intellectual and political laziness. Member for Everton, Member for Budrum, please cease your interjections. Member for Greenslopes, you have the call. It is the height of intellectual and political laziness. As intellectually and as intellectually and politically lazy. Member for Budrum. Please seize your interjections. As Member intellectually Winslow. and politically lazy, might I say, temporary speaker, as not listening to the speaker on their feet. I recently saw a post on a local community social media page with extremely positive feedback about a person's recent visit to the Princess Hosp uh, Alexandra Hospital Emergency Department. De there was over 60 positive comments accompanying that post. Now. Does this mean does this mean everything is perfect in the health system? Do I suddenly go away and conflate that absolutely everything is perfect? I hope you're listening, Member, because this is about dealing with confirmational Member bias, for which is something you clearly don't clock. understand. Member for Grinslopes, please direct all comments through the chair. Does the member understand confirmational bias? I think not, because he understands very little. Does this mean that everything in the health system is perfect and we can ignore everything those opposite state? Absolutely not, temporary speaker. If there are people in my electorate who have problems with the, the care they are receiving, and there will be, I support them through those issues, and where there are systemic, systemic issues, I go to the minister with policy suggestions. I, what I don't do as I don't come in here and use those individuals and their cases for cheap political gain. And that is what continues to happen in this place here and here and here again. If there is a systems issue, I will take an evidence-based policy suggestion to the minister. I have done that on many times and with good result. The reality is not one member of the LNP can explain how ramping is fixed by sacking AMBOs and nurses which is what they did the last time they were in office. Certainly, Order. certainly the member for Madhubar, as the only nurse in this chamber to vote against safe nurse-to-patient ratios, would be hard-pressed to explain to any nurse how having more patients for each nurse would help fix ramping. The member for Toowoomba North wants to stomp and scream about building a hospital as his own personal policy suggestion. Well, I'd support that every day of the week, uh, as would every single person on this side of the House, and that's why we're building more hospitals, and that's what this budget is all about. It contains uh, budgetary measures for building more hospitals. Those opposite, what didn't they do? They didn't build more hospitals. If it was just a matter of building more hospitals, which is what we are doing, then ramping would be fixed quickly. It is a complex nationwide problem with some significant causes by it. You know, there is a crisis in healthcare. It's called a global pandemic. Those of us that work in healthcare understand it. Order. Those of us who show up every week and vaccinate Members to my left, that. please seize and your we interjections. Also understand how difficult it is for people to see a GP, which is why they're flooding our system. It is a complex issue that we are working hard to resolve. But we'll let those opposite continue to be politically and intellectually weak and lazy on this and every other issue. The Treasurer and the Premier are to be congratulated on a fantastic budget. We have economic growth, falling unemployment and huge numbers of people moving to the greatest state in the nation. 
It is a growth budget for COVID recovery. It's an infrastructure budget. Schools, hospital, social housing, roads, public transport. You name it, we're building it. It's a small business budget. $140 million for our small business strategy, the business investment fund and the back to work program. It's a skills and training budget, making the skilling Queenslanders for work permanent. Remember that particular program, member for evident? You should because you've cut it. Order. It's an industry development budget, the hydrogen and clean energy fund, $2 billion. That's what they're talking about in the streets of Greenslaves. So they're certainly not talking about the new Bradfield scheme, and they're talking about the investment in film and television. Infrastructure, small business, training, new industries. This is COVID recovery. This is a COVID recovery budget. Speaker. I call the member for Kuangba. Thanks, Speaker. Um, I'd just like to start, uh, if you'll indulge me, in um, acknowledging, as others have, Duncan Pegg's contribution to this place, as well as his friendship, um, and offer my condolences to his family and loved ones. Um, as has been said many times, this was his week in the parliamentary calendar, and I think we're all going to miss that. So, um, I'm proud today to speak to this year's appropriation bill introduced by our Treasurer, the Honourable Cameron Dick. This is my seventh year supporting a strong Labor budget, and I couldn't be more proud. Thanks again to everyone involved in preparing this budget. It's a lot of work, and it's been a much shorter break between the budget since we brought one down the end of last year um, to this one. Thanks to the way Queenslanders pulled together in a crisis. And we see it with flood speaker, we see it with bushfires, we see it with cyclones, and we've seen it with COVID-19. Thanks to our willingness to do the right thing and protect each other, we're able to invest money sooner in building back better across Queensland. We still have to balance, though, our forward planning with the risk that this pandemic continues to present in our country. We need to keep future-proofing our small businesses. We need to make sure our systems of government, particularly in health and education, have the technology and capacity we need to continue to outwit this horrible disease. And we need to keep investing in a brighter future with climate change in mind. This means more money for renewable energy sources, a particular passion of mine, and I'll come back to this a little later. Above all, we need to keep Queenslanders healthy. To do that, we're delivering another record health budget of $22.2 billion, including a new satellite hospital in our area, replacement of the Petrie Ambulance Station at Lawton, multiple projects in the two major local hospitals at Redcliffe and Caboolture, including an MRI at Redcliffe. This budget continues our investment in an extra 5,800 nurses, 1,500 new doctors, another 40, 475 paramedics and 1,700 additional health professionals over the four-year term. Stands in stark contrast to the cuts we saw in the last LNP government, Speaker. We're still undoing that damage they did in those few years. We're also picking up the slack of the LNP nationally, rolling out new mass vaccination hubs in coming months hubs that will vaccinate aged care and disability workers the federal LNP couldn't appear to be bothered with. Get in the queue with everyone else, they said, even though the majority of deaths from COVID-19 in our country have occurred in the older co cohort. Speaker, there's no better indication the LNP doesn't value investing in health like Labor does than the cuts to Medicare we're now seeing at the federal government level. Cuts at, was it Scotty, Scotty from Marketing told us, or was it Malcolm Turnbull? I keep, can't keep up with all the leadership changes. Cuts the federal LNP said wouldn't happen. When federal Labor and we tried to warn Australians, tried to warn Queenslanders the LNP wouldn't make cuts to Medicare that would leave them out of pocket, they said it was a scare campaign. Well, what a shame. We were right all along. Uh, speaker, like health, education and training are key Labor priorities, this budget uh, continues our commitment to employ more than 6,100 teachers and 1,100 teacher aides over this term of government. The rollout of air conditioning and solar for all state schools continues in this budget. In my opinion, it's so exciting to know a number of schools are already completed and nearing completion um, in two years, not eight years. Our schools are getting building upgrades as well, and it's really great to see Lawton State School getting more love in their, with their new teaching spaces and admin block, receiving seven million this year of the total spend. Speaker, this new admin block and the hall I secured from last term has made for a lot of smiles around Lawton State School. Speaker, Lawton's not alone in receiving funding, as Burpengary State School, Jinnaburra State School, Kawongba State School and Narangba State School also receive the funding that we've been promising them for a while. 
And, Speaker, I know I sound like a broken record when I talk about how many awesome infrastructure projects we have on the go in the Kowongbar electorate, thanks for the most part to our state Labor budgets. This budget we see, the continuation of the long-awaited Deception Bay New Settlement Road interchange, which is well underway, was dropped from Q-Trip under the LNP, we put it back and it's nearly done. Petrie roundabout. Order, Member for Evidence. No longer be a roundabout or bol talking about broken records. I'm hearing one down the front from Evident. Gee, um, <laughs> Petrie roundabout. No, no, soon no longer be a roundabout or bottleneck. Thanks, thanks to Minister Bailey for listening, and I'd also like to thank commuters for their patience during construction of these two major bits of infrastructure in my patch. Dacaman Station's nearing completion, much to the joy of Gemma Gale and the Dacaman Station Action Group. We've worked hard over the years to get a result. I'm proud to say we've listened and we're delivering this long overdue upgrade. Looking forward to opening this with my neighbour and friend, Deputy Premier Stephen Miles and Gemma Gale. Burpengary Station upgrade, which I promised before the last election, has a line in the budget and planning is underway as well. Not only the station, but a park and ride upgrade for Burpengary commuters. This will be well needed as a new club Burpengary opens soon across the road. This exciting new shopping and club precinct has the community buzzing, and if it's anything like any of the other Comiskey ventures in Moreton Bay, it'll be a raging success. Narangbar Station Park and Ride has not been forgotten, and work's continuing there, with money for design in this budget. Energy investment. I did say earlier I'd get back to renewable energy. I welcome the announcements last week from the Premier about the $2 billion Renewable Energy and Hydrogen Jobs Fund, which will create many decent and secure jobs and continue our government's investment in renewable energy. This fund will provide significant investment in big-scale storage like batteries and pumped hydro, which, like a large battery, is ready to provide clean energy at the flick of a switch. This versatility was evident a few weeks back when Wyvernhoe's pump storage came online quickly to help restore the state's grid when, gener when the generator at Calide failed and took out neighbouring coal-fired power stations. Those steam turbines take some time to reset as they build up steam, whereas pumped hydro, hydro comes online in minutes. The news that Barumba Dam is being looked at for a similar and larger system is great news, as is the 2,000 regional construction jobs it promises. As an electrician from this industry, I know my former colleagues will love this news. Speaker, just before I finish up today, I want to return to an issue I raised in my speech on the Debt Reduction and Savings Bill last sitting, and we keep hearing it from across the chamber. At that time, I tabled an article from the Financial Review, which I've tabled before for the benefit of informed debate. That listed comprehensively Queensland Government assets the LNP sold during the Campbell Newman years. Speaker, this article wasn't the only news source that reported these, but it's the best summary I've seen yet, and I encourage members to have a look at this tabled document. Speaker, the reason I'm saying that is because we don't sell assets. This government doesn't sell assets to fund things. The previous Order, members. Speaker, I'm dead against selling Queensland's assets. My commitment to my constituents on that matter is clear, and I'll stand up in this place to reiterate it at every opportunity. Order, members. Our commitment as a government is also clear regarding this issue. Speaker, we'll continue to build back better in Queensland. We'll do it while prioritising Queensland as health, and we'll create thousands of jobs as we do it. We'll find savings wherever possible, and we'll borrow money as well. But like every Queensland household, we'll review and recalibrate our, our, recalibrate our budget sheet as circumstances demand. We've taken the hits from COVID-19 and we're making positive changes. I'm proud to be part of the Palaszczuk Labor government and I'm proud to stand here supporting another strong Labor budget. Speaker, I commend this bill to the House. Mr Deputy Speaker. I call the order members. I call the member for Calloid. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to make a contribution to the Appropriation Bill 2021, but before doing so, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to uh, join with my parliamentary colleagues from all sides of the House in recognising Mr Duncan Pegg, here, here. and I do send my sincere uh, uh, condolences to his family. Mr Deputy Speaker, once again we see a minimal budget spend in a big rural electorate such as Calloid. Calloid Electorate is, of course, a significant revenue con uh, contributor to the state of the and the nation through major industries such as agriculture, mining, resources and energy generation. And relatively speaking, it has been overlooked in the budget yet again. Mr Deputy Speaker, it was pleasing to see money, $8.6 allocated to the replacement of the John Peterson Bridge at Mundubra. 
a project the community has lobbied hard for for many years. I know former councillor and local identity Mrs Faye Whelan will be most pleased. This $25 million project has attracted a $20 million funding contribution from the Federal Government, courtesy of Federal Member for Flynn, Mr Ken O'Dowd. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, while we're on bridges, it is most concerning and disappointing that there is an allocation of only $19.5 million to the bridge replacement program. Of all the old bridges throughout the road network in Queensland that need replacing, the Labor Government can fund little more than one of them. And again, I draw your attention to the Auditor-General's report which identifies the bridge replacement program as grossly underfunded. My constituents will be furious to know that there has been allocated in the budget $2.5 million of an estimated $10 million spend to the South Brisbane uh, bikeway network. Incidentally, Mr Deputy Speaker, one could classify the Transport Minister, Mr Bailey's electorate, as South Brisbane. Furthermore, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is a $12.148 million allocation to cycling programs throughout Queensland. This, of course, takes precedence over vital road infrastructure projects in rural and regional Queensland, which provide connectivity for important money-generating mining resources and agricultural products and service. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is also pleasing to note in the budget a $3.5 million allocation to the redevelopment of the Mara multi-purpose health service, including renewal and upgrading of aged care facilities. This is part of a $7.2 million cost estimate, but once again it pales into ins insignificance when you compare it to the $40.3 million financial year spend on hospital car parks in the southeast corner. This is part of a total cost estimate of $162 million. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm guessing the government has to provide for more space for ambulance ramping. Mr Deputy Speaker, there has also been some monies allocated to some of the 60-odd schools in the Calide electorate, namely Tarum, Jin Jin, Calliope, Chinchilla, Bulliard, Colston Lakes, Jambin, Monte Prospect Creek and Thangool schools, respectively. There has also been some road upgrades in the Jin Jin area and replacement of a 66 kV power line from Childers to Gainder, a 30.5 uh, $25 million spend of a $75.86 million cost. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to use the rest of my time to make some comment in relation to the energy sector, specifically what has happened at Calloid Power Station and proposed hydrogen production, all mentioned, albeit briefly, in the budget papers. Mr Deputy Speaker, very recently we have seen the major failure of Calloid C4 coal-fired power generator. An explosion of compressed hydrogen in the C4 generator has led to the destruction of the turbine shaft, which has led to the shutdown of the entire plant. Further ramifications of the event caused the tripping out of Stanwell and Gladstone power stations, causing widespread power outages, resulting in energy failure chaos throughout the state. Hydrogen is used as a coolant for the electrical generators at Calide Power Station and the explosion at Calloid C4 generator is an example of just how dangerous it can be given certain circumstances. There will be many ongoing investigations into just exactly what has happened in the lead up to the generator failure and the results of the aftermath. I know there are questions being asked about the integrity of the footings and only an extensive geo survey will determine the outcome. Madam Speaker, there are two things that are clear in regard with this episode. One, Calloid C4 generator and turbine shaft have been destroyed. And two, the state's electricity grid is reliant on coal-fired power generation. And the renewable energy sector, whilst it tried, it failed in making up the energy shortfall. Madam Speaker, the Minister, Mr De Brenny, has made a com commitment to replace the generator and turbine. However, there has been no allowance made in the budget presumably because CS Energy and co-owner Energen are pursuing insurance claims. And my experience in that sector says it will take a considerable amount of negotiation and time. All that aside, I would argue, given the generator and turbine are write-offs, then so is the boiler and associated coal plant, as one complements the other, even though it is emerged unscathed. Madam Speaker, I can only imagine the cost of the repairs to Calide C4 will run into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Rather than investing in 25-year-old technology of the Calide C4 plant, 
we should be investing in the latest ultra-critical super high efficiency low emission coal-fired technology. This would boost efficiency of coal-fired power stations upwards of 45 per cent and produce lower carbon emissions. It would also provide greater energy security for Queensland businesses and industry, which the renewable energy sector is not capable of. Mr Deputy Speaker, at the recent G7 meeting in England, Japan has insisted that there should only be transition away from building and financing unabated coal power. This was agreed to by the world leaders at the meeting, recognising Japan's request to continue to develop their nation with coal and gas-fired power stations and the use of carbon reduction technology. Mr Deputy Speaker, Jam, uh, Japan is proposing to build 22 new coal-fired power plants. China, 127, India, 27, and Vietnam, 17. Australia exports $70 billion worth of the best coal in the world to these countries so that they can provide cheap, reliable electricity to their businesses, industries, and peoples. Yet we deny that opportunity to uh, our Australians. This argument is driven by the mind-numbing eco-Marxist millennials and upper-middle-class wokes who have been indoctrinated with some quasi-religious belief that coal is bad and carbon dioxide is poisoning. Order, members. Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, China's coal-fired power generation grew by 38 gigawatts last year, the equivalent of 19 Liddell power stations. Japan has just signalled to the world that it will support, produce and use coal-fired generation technology now and well into the future. And it wants Australian coal, the cleanest and best coal in the world. Here, here. Mr Deputy Speaker, Brisbane is the biggest coal mining town in Queensland. There are 50,000 jobs that rely on the coal industry. Everybody relies on coal-fired power generation in Queensland. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have a question to the Labor Party, to those opposite. Do you support the coal industry? Will you support the building of a new ultra-supercritical coal-fired power station at Cullo? Through, the, through the chair, please, member. Or are you going to continue the through the chair, please, member. of relying on coal mining and coal exports and other, to other industrial nations that is an indispensable revenue stream for the state of Queensland? and limit and stop the use of the most abundant, cheap and efficient energy source we have in Queensland. Mr Deputy Speaker, if the Labor government does not support new technology, coal-fired power generation, how can it guarantee the viability of heavy industry like the Boyne Island luminous smelter at Gladstone? Remember this smelter was offline for approximately three hours during the Calide power station event. It can only stand five hours offline, then the pot lines freeze over and it's all over. As the government pursues its 50 per cent renewable energy target, we will end up in the same position as Victoria, where Portland Smelter has recently been underwritten by the federal government to the tune of 76 million because of electricity demand management strategy implemented by the Victorian government. In short, there is not enough peak load power in the system to keep everything going in Victoria. Portland uses 10 per cent of Victoria's generating capacity. Mr Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, I beg your pardon, hydrogen will be the answer that those opposite will champion. But as we all know, and the Labor Party has admitted this, the commercial production of industrial hydrogen uh, quantities of hydrogen is economically unviable at this point in time with the available technology. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have heard many times from the Labor, the Labor Party spruik the merits of hydrogen, particularly green hydrogen produced by using wind and solar to power electrolysers that split the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen. Recently, I attended a conference developing hydrogen, Queensland hydrogen hosted by the Committee for Economic, Economic Development of Australia, where Mr. Minister Mr De Brenny was among the guest speakers. Mr Deputy Speaker, hydrogen needs to reduce production costs to $2 a kilo to make it economically viable. Current projection costs are in the order of $9 a kilo. The biggest single production cost is electricity, approximately 80 per cent of the total cost. At the conference, we were told that there are conversations around ideas of making hydrogen electri electrolysers exempt from electricity costs to bring down the cost of hydrogen production. Mr Deputy Speaker, to me, this idea is economic insanity. 
The renewable energy sector, which is supposed to supply green hydrogen production, is already heavily subsidised through energy generating credits. If we are then to subsidise hydrogen electrolysers, which use renewable energy, we are subsidising alternative energy production twice, which is absolute madness. Ultimately, the people who will bear the cost of this idea will the people who will, can least afford their electricity bill. If hydrogen is to become the world's new energy source, it will have to find another way or develop better technology. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for now, we should be investing in the latest ultra-supercritical coal-fired power technology and use the plentiful coal resource we have. And in closing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I re reiterate my support for the coal industry and for coal-fired power. Coal is king and will be for many years to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deputy Speaker. Call the uh, member for Springwood. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, this is our plan, our plan to create more Queensland jobs. It's a plan to create prosperity for generations to come as well. And I'd like to start by congratulating the Treasurer on delivering his second budget and the Premier on her seventh. What a tremendous Labor budget it is, Deputy Speaker. And I'm incredibly proud as well of the 52 Labor members that were elected to this House uh, on the commitments in the 21-22 budget. Commitments I know will deliver in spades for the community that I represent of Springwood. Uh, for example, in the Redlands, the Palaszczuk government will deliver through this budget a full-time fire station for Mount Cotton, a new oval at the Mount Cotton State School, a brand new primary school for the Southern Redlands, it's terrific news, a brand new satellite hospital and an expansion of the Redlands Hospital as well. Uh, and in Logan, a massive $1.75 billion investment in the M1 upgrade from Eight Mile Plains right through, Deputy Speaker, to the Logan Motorway and, of course, the busway in there as well, getting you home sooner and safer. An extra 206 beds at the Logan Hospital, so help is there for families when they need it most, Deputy Speaker. Important upgrades to our schools as well, including a new oval for my primary school, Springwood Road State School, uh, refurbished classrooms at the Kimberley Park State School, a brand new hall for Rochdale State High and new classrooms at Rochdale Skate School too. I'm proud of the future this budget paints for our community, and I acknowledge those locals in my electorate for supporting me to stand up for them. Deputy Speaker, this budget continues our COVID economic recovery off the back of our strong health response, a budget that delivers job-creating infrastructure, a budget that delivers better schools, a budget that delivers better hospitals, more frontline services and a clear path to delivering on our renewable energy target, a budget that delivers one of the strongest financial positions of any state or territory in the nation. But we didn't get here by chance, Deputy Speaker. The strong forecast for economic growth in Queensland and job creation is not the result of some coincidence or luck. It is a result of the tough decisions taken by this government, by our Premier, to keep Queenslanders safe and our economy open throughout the pandemic and keep it open. And it's because of those decisions we now know that a thousand, a thousand Queensland jobs were created each and every day throughout the month of May. A thousand jobs every single day, Deputy Speaker. Queensland now has 84,900 more jobs than our pre-COVID level in March last year. The highest rise in jobs in the nation, Deputy Speaker. That's what this side of the House is all about. 337,400 jobs created by this Palaszczuk Labor government since we came to office, Deputy Speaker. And the budget delivered this week continues that strong record. And when it comes to my portfolios, this is a budget that delivers big. The Palaszczuk government has delivered the single largest energy investment in Queensland's history. At the same time as maintaining our public assets, renewable energy projects, network upgrades to bring that cheaper, cleaner energy into homes and businesses across the state. Speaker, this is a budget that does it all. $52.3 million in electricity rebates to support regional farmers, to support regional manufacturers, to support, to support foundries and irrigators, to support employers in the north. $39 million for grid-connected batteries. Grid-connected batteries, new technology in Townsville, Rockhampton, Bundaberg, Harvey Bay and Toowoomba, Deputy Speaker. 
$22 million to progress the Barumba pumped hydro, the second largest pumped hydroelectric scheme in the nation. $144.9 million for Cleanco's Carrara wind farm, $40 million to unlock the Northern Renewable Energy Zone and its cornerstone project, the Gabon Wind Farm, Deputy Speaker. $239 million to upgrade PowerLink's high voltage transmission infrastructure. $2.38 billion in job creating, capital upgrades and maintenance of Queensland's publicly owned electricity assets. But what must be considered the centrepiece, Deputy Speaker, is our $2 billion renewable, and renewable Energy and Hydrogen Jobs Fund. That's right, Deputy Speaker, a $2 billion fund. And before those opposites start jumping up and down, here he is jumping up and down about how budgets work. Unlike the LNP, unlike the LNP we are a government that delivers generational nation-building infrastructure. That's what this is about. We are a government that has long-term goals. We're prepared to make the long-term decisions. And that's what our forward estimates, that's what our forward estimates and the budget strategy and the budget strategy and outlook clearly outline, Deputy Speaker. Those opposite can play all the political games they want. We know they're already planning for cuts. The opposition leader let that one slip just yesterday. Savage or not, cuts are guaranteed under the LNP any time they get their hands on power. What Queenslanders what what they expect. And what they deserve is long-term generational infrastructure, investment and vision. And that is what the Palaszczuk government is delivering. It's what Queenslanders get with our $2 billion renewable energy and hydrogen jobs fund, a fund that delivers for a future energy, uh, a future energy sector, and a fund that delivers this advanced manufacturing jobs boom for Queensland, Deputy Speaker, a fund that expands public ownership a fund that expands public ownership of renewable energy generation and storage assets. A fund, a fund, Deputy Speaker, that will see solar panels, electrolyzers, wind farm components and batteries made right here in Queensland by Queenslanders, Deputy Speaker. Order, members. Deputy Speaker, we are witnessing a worldwide renewable energy boom and Queensland is right in the thick of it. It is this government, Order, this, Order Labor government this Labor budget that will ensure the renewables boom becomes a regional jobs boom for Queenslanders. And Deputy Speaker, the Palaszczuk government's buy Queensland procurement approach means greater local returns for the taxpayer dollar. To put it simply, buy Queensland will deliver more bang for budget bucks. But this means more than just choosing the cheapest price, Deputy Speaker. It means ensuring every dollar invested in goods, services and infrastructure prioritises local business opportunities, local jobs, fair wages and safe working conditions. That's why this budget strengthens compliance with our Buy Queensland procurement approach. A greater focus on compliance will do this. It will ensure that everyone is playing by the rules, Deputy Speaker, rules that mandate opportunities for traineeships and apprenticeships so we continue to future-proof our skilled workforce. Rules that deliver greater social outcomes. Rules that deliver greater social outcomes and increase procurement. Pause the clock. Pause the clock. Sorry. Uh, resume your seat, please, uh, Member. Member for Burley, your interjections are repeated and they're not being taken. I place you on a warning. I call the uh, Member for Springwood. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Now, I was talking about our commitment to greater compliance with our Buy Queensland policy, supported by funding in this budget to ensure that the rules are followed, rules that deliver greater social outcomes and increase procurement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander businesses, rules that ensure we deliver on our promise to source at least 30 per cent of procurement spend with small and medium-sized enterprises by the end of 2022. But, Deputy Speaker, one of the best things a government can do, I think, is to provide its people with the skills and training to get a good, decent, secure job. And for that reason alone, the Palaszczuk government made a commitment to rebuilding QBuild. Since then, hundreds of apprentices and tradies have started new careers with QBuild. We are quite literally giving these young Queenslanders the tools to take advantage of the future opportunities our budget creates. Opportunities in electrical, carpentry, painting and plumbing. They will even help deliver our $52.2 billion four-year capital works program. The QBuild story, though, Deputy Speaker, tells Queenslanders everything they need to know about the LNP. Queenslanders have not forgotten, Deputy Speaker, how those opposite gutted QBuild, sacked 1,654 QBuild workers, scrapped the apprenticeship program. The opposition leader that sat around Campbell Newman's cabinet table making those decisions. And the scariest part, Speaker, is we all know if they had the chance they'd do it again. 
The member for Broadwater says his cuts wouldn't be savage. Well, Campbell Newman also told public servants that they had nothing to fear. They had nothing to fear. And we know how that worked out, Deputy Speaker. There's a reason why they're sitting on that side of this House, Deputy Speaker, because Queensland, Queenslanders are smart because Queenslanders know better than to trust the LNP. They know, they know to trust this Palaszczuk Labor government to deliver their plan, our plan, for jobs and prosperity. I commend the appropriation bills to the House. Uh, cool. I call the member for Surface Paradise. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to speak to the Appropriation Bill 2021. And for a bloke who maintains that debt is not a dirty word, the Treasurer certainly spent a lot of time justifying why the Labor Party has given Queenslanders so much of it. The member for Woodridge used six pages of the budget speech in December of 2020 to pontificate about debt, and there were seven pages of justification in this budget speech about the $127 billion of debt uh, billion dollars debt that Labor continues to inflict on Queensland. Let's not forget the 22 paragraphs the Treasurer, Treasurer blathered on about trying to explain the title registry's revaluation in just a few weeks from $4 billion to $7.8 billion. One thing the Treasurer failed to explain in those 22 paragraphs, however, was the parameters that the Bank of America, VIS, o uh, Oxford Economics, Deloitte, Allen's Linklaters, QIC, PwC and EY base their assessment on. It was a lesson in Labornomics, Mr Deputy Speaker. Additional debt accumulation, but at the same time a reduction in debt using creative accounting, not credible financial management. The Treasurer has certainly pulled the budget rabbit out of the hat with our state's multi-billion dollar deficit projected to metamorphosise into a paper-thin $153 million surplus based upon some rather precarious assumptions, including Queensland's borders remaining mostly open to other states, no major community outbreaks, and that the RBA keeps the uh, cash rate at 0.1 per cent until mid-2023. Mr Deputy Speaker, this budget foreshadows a fantasy future. Borrow, 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 spend, 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 but in a few years, Queensland will come out with a positive balance. What an absolute farce. Mr Deputy Speaker, the financial uh, acumen was exemplified by the types of lectures, lectures that we get from ministers, and I'm glad the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships in the, is in the House. I love it when they freelance, Mr Deputy Speaker, because the Minister loves to give me supercilious answers to my uh, earnest questions. And yesterday was a classic example when I asked about the path to treaty funding. So I want to have a look at the speaking notes that the Minister's staff obviously gave him. And uh, he told me, gave me a lecture, said he was going to teach me a bit about basic maths and that he'd dumb it down even further. So let's have a look at the things that the minister had to say to me. He referred to the fact that this fund was similar to, and his words was, a Commonwealth Government Dolomites account. Ba -ba! There was no Commonwealth Government Dolomites account. There was a Commonwealth Bank Dolomites account. And Mr Deputy Speaker, this state has just gotten rid of Dolomites because they weren't happy. They called them predatory, which is what this Labor government is for Queenslanders' hard-earned yeah. taxpayers' money. Uh, and so it was all about that supposedly it was a future fund, but it was a future fund supposedly uh, based on money from the sale of an asset already owned uh, by the government and sold to itself. But the minister wanted to tell me it was a future fund and tried to tell me it was that. Uh, Labor have never saved anything in their lives, Mr Deputy Speaker. The, ma the way they're magically getting this $300 million uh, was, was just ridiculous, but of course the Minister had no idea about that. And finally, I'll just say to the Minister, through you, Mr Deputy Speaker, we don't take lectures in financial literacy from someone who came here with a Part 9 bankruptcy, who had to go to a deed of assessment with his creditors. So for the Minister to come in here and abuse constantly uh, me, when I ask serious questions, means he needs to take a good look at himself instead of what the stuff that we cop when we ask these serious questions. When I look at this budget through the lens of the surface paradise electorate, it's patent that my constituents have once again been forgotten in Labor's latest rendition of a budget that's pure window dressing. This budget is proof that Brisbane Labor does not understand the concerns of the people of the Gold Coast and of my electorate. Tourism is the lifeblood of our state of the Gold Coast region and of my electorate. Battling volatile border closures, travel bans and lockdowns, Queensland's tourism and small business operators are incredibly resilient, but they are hurting. 
If Queensland has ever needed proof that this government and the Treasurer are more interested in symbols, rhetoric and imagery than actual service delivery, they need look no further than this quote from December 1, 2020 from the member for Woodridge's first budget speech, and I quote, The opening of our borders today is a signal of a hope and a sign of confidence in the plan that has brought us this far. It means more flights, more accommodation bookings, more activity to support jobs throughout our tourist regions. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, the government used the metaphor of the borders reopening on the day the budget was brought down to proclaim a new dawn for the area most affected by the events of 2020. The tourism sector, not just on the Gold Coast, but wherever tourism plays a significant role, and that's a lot of places in Queensland. Fast forward to Tuesday's speech from the same member for Woodridge, and there was not one word about tourism for a sector that continues to face significant challenges and not just due, due to the issue of the lack of international travel. Not one word. Not a word about the skills sector challenges, about the travel agents cast adrift, about the uncertainty when there are new rules brought in about what's going to be allowed and now I see that there are going to be more rules applied uh, for visitors coming from Sydney and Melbourne announced today. There are operators who are eking out a living on trying to be two-day-a-week operators instead of seven. By all means, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are operators travelling well. However, many are not anywhere near where they were before March 2020, and it's beyond cruel of this Treasurer to ignore the plight of thousands of businesses in this sector. There are lots of businesses throughout our state that pay taxes and provide a great service for Queenslanders who have been snubbed in this state budget. When the, when the chips are down, Queenslanders should expect that the government will help to protect their livelihoods. For tourism operators, the federal government's been doing the heavy lifting via the programs they rolled out through the pandemic. Many of the Gold Coast operators at Chambers of Commerce that I've been to throughout the state have thanked the federal government but have bewailed to me the lack of support from the state Labor government. Is it any wonder I say Labor just doesn't get the Gold Coast? In this case, when it comes to tourism and the jobs it supports, Labor doesn't get a raft of Queensland cities, towns and communities, all of whom stoically keep trudging forward, but it's no thanks to this expedient Labor government, big on style and symbols, but very poor on delivery when it comes to my communities and communities like it. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's not just tourism that the Treasurer ignored yesterday and for the last 16 months. Since COVID, my electorate and city have been besieged by a crime and hooning e epidemic that has local residents threatening vigilanteism, hiring private security and bewailing the lack of police numbers to follow up on complaints. Of course, when our hard-working police have been occupied at the borders and quarantine hotels, it's unsurprising that these problems continue unabated. Social media outlets each day are clogged with warnings about intruders stealing cars or loitering outside properties, and there's great frustration at the slap on the wrist penalties, or worse still, lack of penalties for the often young offenders. These brazen youth keep returning, sometimes to the same house, to steal the same vehicles for the second and third time, as happened this week in Benoa Waters. These issues have also been happening from Main Beach to Broad Beach, Paradise Waters on the Isle of Capri, Chevron Island, Clear Island Waters in Sorrento and Bundal. Local residents are also subjected to ongoing hooning, excessive speeding and more recently and notably horrendous exhaust noise, which is very frustrating for residents. I've got an email that I'm going to table, Mr Deputy Speaker, from someone who wrote to me. Uh, I'm a resident of Clear Island Waters, have noticed over the last few months the increased noise from traffic, motorbikes with, ba with backfiring ridiculously loud exhausts, cars with backfiring exhaust flying up and down Bermuda Street, one part of my electorate, around Markiri Street, which is the southern border of my electorate with the member for Mermaid, and on Rabina Parkway, my border with the Mudjurbar electorate. It's now literally constant, middle of the night, they're flying up and down, so it wakes us up. So, uh, and I table that, Mr Deputy Speaker. This week I asked a question on notice about the number of infringement notices that have been issued for modified silencing device offences. Because, of course, some years ago we passed legislation in this House that enabled police or, tra or uh, traffic um, inspectors to be able to uh, take away vehicles, uh, and that's confiscation that doesn't seem to be happening as much as it was back then when there was uh, an issue similarly. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, local residents are fearful, frustrated and angry. That's why they've signed petitions that, was ta that were tabled in this House this week for more police resources and speed cameras. Let's hope we get more of an acknowledgement than we did from the Treasurer on Tuesday. The budget papers are not any more promising with no commitment for more police officers in surface paradise. The only police support uh, surface paradise received from the budget, and I know the member for Bonnie acknowledged this, was a $1 million trial. Uh, a $1 million for a trial of metal detecting wands. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for Education. Today, out of the blue, uh, we received uh, an email in my office about the allocation for um, maintenance and minor works at the only state school in my electorate, Mr Deputy Speaker, Surface Paradise State School, $84,000. But most importantly, I want to thank the Minister for the courtesy of letting my office know that specifically. So it was one crime-related initiative. Where are the rest, Mr Deputy Speaker? It's unacceptable that my constituents feel unsafe in their communities, while at the same time Brisbane Labor preaches that they care about the Gold Coast. Well, actions speak louder than words. Mr Deputy Speaker, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples deserve to thrive socially, economically and culturally. Seniors and people with disability deserve to live free from physical, emotional and financial abuse. However, it is questionable whether this budget genuinely enables an inclusive Queensland or whether Queenslanders are dealing with a government that is all show. As I have already mentioned, the Treasurer announced a $300 million path to treaty fund with great fanfare. However, an inspection of the budget papers reveals a lack of allocation to this fund, with not one cent to be spent by 2025. Additionally, there is very little specific detail for seniors. The only seniors performance measures in the budget papers is the numbers of seniors, the number of seniors eligible for a seniors card. I'll continue to visit groups and communities in disability services, communities and seniors, as well as multiculturalism and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander partnerships to find more detail than is in the budget papers. And I note the Auditor General some years ago wrote about the confusing nature of the budget papers. This is in a previous report some years ago. And I note that today it's been highlighted by media as well about the constantly changing parameters in the budget papers that are designed, it would seem, to almost confuse people about what the actual detail is. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Premier describes this as a traditional Labor budget, with more than half of the budget being dedicated to uh, health and education. It would serve this government well to walk the talk on the issues that Queenslanders face in these two areas. When my constituents contact me about a health-related matter, normal procedure involves referring that query on to the Minister for Health the member for Redcliffe. Lately, we've had a number of requests for the constituents' contact details, which our office provides, but as a courtesy, we ask to be copied into the response. I've written to the Minister for Health asking for clarification about these issues. At her invitation, I think in the last sitting week or the sitting week before, about why it is that the office doesn't always get that response, we're not asking for patient details. Uh, or the details of the case, but we are, when we're asking on behalf of a constituent, believe that we, the courtesy is for the office to be advised, instead of us having to ask the constituent subsequently if they'd mind copying us into the response uh, when we see that we haven't received one. So far, I've received no response from the Minister for Health. It's very frustrating for my constituents and also for my office when we're trying to do the right thing, and the Minister for Health invited members uh, to write to her with their specific issue, concerns about these issues. It would serve the government well to put its money where its mouth is when it comes to the billions of dollars of promises within this budget. As many other members have pointed out, $2 billion was promised for the hospital's building fund, but there's no funding allocated in the budget papers. A $1 billion promised for the housing investment fund, but again there's no funding allocated in the budget papers. Mr Deputy Speaker, Queensland is awash in a sea of red. It has been for some time, even before the onslaught of the, onslaught of the pandemic, um, now being used by the Treasurer as a justification for his debt splurge, which of course is, uh, in his own words, not a problem for the member for Woodridge. The Treasurer's borrow now, pay later approach will leave future generations to deal with the unavoidable debt reckoning. The Treasurer's sunrise state, in his own words, is characterised by a financially imprudent government, a government that is out of touch with the needs of everyday Queenslanders and a government that is all icing, no cake. We deserve a budget that benefits all. The glossy brochure under the Treasurer's arm is certainly one which does not. But people on the Gold Coast, the people I represent, Mr Deputy Speaker, they don't want the government to give them a handout. They'd like a bit of a help now and then, but
But when it comes to small business grants that were completely oversubscribed within a couple of days, it's very frustrating. And as I've already mentioned in this speech, the fact that the rules keep changing when businesses that are now operating on 20 to 40 per cent of their previous capacity are trying to get back and they just can't do it and they want the government to get out of the way. That's what our party believes in, less regulation and making sure that businesses can do what they do the best and making sure, though, that we also have a safe social safety net. Well, there's a whole bunch of people who feel that the safety net is not helping them at the moment, and this Labor government is responsible for the fact that they, these people are feeling like that, and there's no empathy or concern coming from those opposite. Speaker. I call uh, the member for Jordan. Uh, speaker, I'm very proud to speak on the appropriation bills and acknowledge my strong support for the 2021-22 state budget delivered by the Queensland Treasurer this week. When I reflect on 2020, I reflect on the hardest times for our communities. Some of our actions to keep Queenslanders safe were difficult. The lockdowns, the border closures, social distancing and mandatory mask directives. They were disruptive to the economy and challenging for so many in our communities. But our communities did not waver. As the Treasurer said in his budget speech, in facing down COVID-19, everything that was asked of Queenslanders, they did. And, Speaker, by protecting the health of Queenslanders, economic confidence has been maintained and we are seeing the economic benefits of our decisive actions. I want to particularly acknowledge our Premier. She faced incredible pressure and, frankly, relentless bullying by those opposite and by the Prime Minister of this country. We will not forget the relentless calls to open borders, the undermining of the Chief Health Officer, blaming the states for quarantine and vaccine rollouts, despite this being the clear responsibility of the Federal Government. As has been stated in this House, it has been shown that both globally and domestically, economic outcomes have been more favourable in jurisdictions and countries where control of the virus and health outcomes have been better. As a result, we are now seeing Queensland returning to economic growth sooner and more strongly than other economies. Backed by our clear COVID-19 economic recovery plan, through our focus on creating jobs and working together, we are ensuring Queensland's future prosperity. And these results can clearly be seen in my own electorate of Jordan, a high growth electorate benefiting from the opportunities and also from, but also from the challenges of our strong interstate migration. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that understands the importance of resourcing our health system properly. Like all states across our country, there are challenges to the Australian health system, but in Queensland we are rising to those challenges. This year's budget has a record investment of $22.23 billion in health services and infrastructure. Speaker, I was so very proud to stand with the Premier, the Health Minister and the Queensland Treasurer to announce that we would be investing in a new public hospital in Springfield. Since being elected in the state member for Jordan in late 2017, I have been relentless in my commitment to see increased health services for our region. Greater Ipswich is projected to grow by 37 per cent in the next 10 years, and an extra 100,000 people will live in the Greater Springfield-Ripley Valley area in the next five years. For our elderly residents, for those with chronic illnesses and for our young families, I have been advocating strongly for health care closer to home because I know just how important this is. Our government has listened, and in partnership with MITRE Health Services, we have confirmed in the state budget an initial funding contribution of $177 million for the new 174-bed public hospital in Springfield. The hospital will have a much-needed emergency department, intensive care unit, maternity services, increased interventional spaces such as operating theatres and endoscopy suite, as well as incre increased clinical capability of the service, meaning more complex care can be treated locally. Over the next decade, this partnership with MARTA will mean more than $1 billion in investment by our government, and it will also be an economic and jobs boom for the region, with the project expected to create more than 1,000 frontline health positions, as well as more than 700 jobs during the construction. Our community has warmly welcomed our commitment. I have been overwhelmed by the many positive messages that I have received, and we will work as quickly as we can to ensure we have the new public hospital operational by 2024. Speaker, the growth that we are experiencing is not limited to our health services. Order With members. Many young families moving into our region, we are seeing an explosion in student numbers as well. From our record $18.3 billion for education and training in 2021-22, I was pleased to see the $913.7 million for 10 new state schools. For the Jordan electorate, this includes a new primary school for 2023 to be built in Augustine Heights that will cater for increased growth in Greater Springfield and Red Bank Plains, and a new primary school in Bellbird Park for 2024. 
The commitment will also see a new secondary school for Greater Springfield in 2024, which is so important as our wonderful Springfield Central State High School has seen incredible growth over the last few years. During the election, we also announced planning for a new secondary school in Greater Flagstone, and I know this is something that is very important, particularly for families in Green Bank and New Beef. But, Speaker, our existing schools have not been forgotten, and I'm pleased to see $9.3 million for new classrooms at Springfield Central State School, $7.5 million for new classrooms for Flagstone State School, and funding of $2.25 million for the expansion of our West Tech Trade Training Centre at Woodcrest State College. Speaker, through this budget, we have announced that over the next four years, the value of the Palaszczuk government's capital works and infrastructure program will be $52.2 billion. For the Jordan electorate, we are seeing this investment through the delivery of our $44.5 million Springfield Central Park and Ride, which is currently under construction. And our government's com contribution of $18 million towards the new Brisbane Lions AFLW Stadium, which is also under construction. We will see it through the much-anticipated upgrade of the Centenary Highway, Logan Motorway Interchange. This $15 million project is currently at the detailed design stage, and I look forward to sharing the plans with our community soon before we progress to the construction phase. But there is also some longer-term planning underway for the Centenary Highway to future-proof the highway, more lanes, new interchanges and off-ramps to address the increasing population growth. Speaker, the Deputy Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Speaker. I call the member for Mansfield. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I'm proud to rise today to speak in support of the appropriation bill delivered by the Honourable Treasurer, Minister for Investment Minister, and Member for Woodridge. I congratulate the Treasurer and his team. What a great budget it is for, for, the, for Queensland and the Queensland we serve, and for the good people of the electorate of Mansfield. This great Labor budget creates jobs, setting out a clear economic plan, attracting investment and building infrastructure, building the economy of the future, a budget that delivers the health and education infrastructure investment for the future success of young Queenslanders and for the prosperity of our great state. A quality education transforms the lives of individuals, families and whole communities. When I was elected to this parliament, I vowed that I would strive to ensure that the Mansfield electorate became a hub of educational excellence. I am proud of the 19 schools in my electorate and the quality education that they provide. The reason young families flock to my electorate, more than 100 young families move to my electorate every month. Our $16.8 billion for education in 2021-22 delivers on our election commitment to employ 6,190 new teachers and 1,139 teacher aides over the next four years. I congratulate our Education Minister on her courageous and decisive leadership around the money that has been expended on one of the most important pillars of our community. The 2021-2022 budget includes $1.4 billion for new schools to open in 2023 and 2024 as well as for additional and renewed inf infrastructure in Queensland's existing state schools. We're delivering a $24.156 million investment in new modern school facilities in Mansfield. $10.5 million of $17 million for a new building for Mansfield State High School. Additional classrooms at Mansfield State School and Mackenzie Special School. A new $250,000 outdoor learning area at Wishart State School. And, and as well as another new $6.4 million building on top of the $7.5 million new building, classrooms and canteen that's currently being built. A new hall at Rochdale State High School. A new $15 million building for Rochdale State School. More than $1 million for minor works and maintenance for schools in my community. The completion of the new building to replace the classrooms lost in the fire at Upper Mount Cravat State School as well as $500,000 for a multi-purpose sports facility, air conditioning and solar, $2 million to light state school ovals in my electorate as a project, a trial project for our state. The Palaszczuk government has a clear vision for education in Queensland because education is the best investment that we can make for the future of Queenslanders yeah. and for the future prosperity of our great state. Yeah. The delivery of seven satellite hospitals, one locally in Brisbane South, to enable our acute hospitals to continue safely managing patients 
via alternative models of care worth $265 million is welcomed by my community. Last year, I joined the former Minister for Health and Chief Health Officer to announce a $12 million investment to establish a 24-bed ward at the QE2 hospital. A further $22.4 million has been allocated for improved facilities to our local QE2 hospital. Queensland's health response to this global pandemic has drawn accolades globally. On behalf of my community, I thank the Premier, the Minister for Health, the Deputy Premier and Dr Young, our Chief Health Officer, for their courageous and decisive leadership. Social isolation and loneliness is a well-documented and researched new world issue identified prior to the pandemic, but which has been exacerbated since COVID-19. Since my election in 2017, I have worked closely with the University of Queensland, School of Psychology and Sociology, the Mount Pavac Community Centre and the Community Queensland Community Alliance to proactively address this important issue in my community. The employment of social workers locally, known as link workers, as part of our nation-leading Ways to Wellness program has attracted $505,016 by the Palaszczuk Government. I'm proud of this program, the interna international interest it has attracted, and the significant outcomes achieved to date for our local people. I'm equally honoured to be chairing the Parliamentary Committee that will conduct a statewide inquiry into this important social issue that significantly impacts the lives of Queenslanders and on the future economic prosperity of our state. I am delighted to announce $287,000 for Southside Community Care, $581,000 to InSync Mount Cravat to, to deliver specialist homeless, homelessness services. $722,000 will further enable the Mount Cravat Community Centre to continue their tremendous work supporting our most vulnerable. 32 new social housing units will be built, a much needed addition for people in my community. $28,836 over the next four years will support my much-loved Meals on Wheels service. Speaker, the Deputy Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation, and as such, I ask that the remainder of my speech be incorporated into the record of proceedings. Yeah. Speaker. I call the uh, member for McAllister. Uh, speaker, I rise to speak in support of the Appro Appropriations Bill 2021. This is a budget that delivers on many of my uh, 2020 election commitments and then some. McAllister schools are in for some major makeovers commencing next financial year. Commitments I made last year included uh, and to be delivered uh, include the work that will commence on the new $12 million Beanley State High School Hall, a commitment personally made by the Premier attending one of the recent award-winning Paddock to Plate events at the school. Yeah. Work will commence on expanding the Carbrook State School Administration Building. Considering the staff numbers have trebled since the building was first built, the staff are really looking forward to that one. And Mount Warren Park State School will finally get the funds needed to refurbish the troublesome roof guttering that has been the bane of their maintenance budget for quite some time, with $1 million allocated to finally fix this ongoing problem and Windaroo State School will get two new outdoor creative learning spaces to the value of $400,000. But on top of the election commitments, this government knows that school communities need ongoing improvements to meet growing populations. So on top of those election commitments, we will be delivering for more McAllister schools. Not content with opening a brand new building at the Beanley Special School last year, work will commence commence on another $16.8 million building next financial year. This school's population has trebled in the last six years. Eden's Landing State School will also benefit from a $1 million refurbishment for their prep blocks, because we all know that those prep classrooms need the space to learn, grow and play. Eagleby South State School is also in line for facility upgrades worth $400,000. Along with education infrastructure in a connected community like McAllister, roads and transport are vital to sustaining our community. Pleased to see that the uh, continued allocation for funding for planning the M1 upgrades between Daisy Hill to Logan Home 
in particular the work on making the busway extension to Logan Home a reality. This will truly be a game changer for commuters, not only in my electorate, but in the Springwood and Waterford electorates. And I'm pleased to see that the V1, the Velloway upgrades will occur alongside these road and public transport upgrades. Work will continue on the signalisation of Kruger Road and Beanley Redland Bay Road intersection at Carbrook, along with the $14.5 million worth of road safety upgrades and additional turning lanes further along Beanley Redland Bay Road. And planning will commence on widening Beanley Redland Bay Road to four lanes at Cornubia. Bodesert Beanley Road between Beanley and Bannockburn is also due for upgrades. An upgrade between Mount Warren Boulevard and Talagandra Road from two lanes to four lanes and pavement widening along the road at Bannockburn. The State Government will also contribute $27.5 million to the upgrade of local roads in Bar Scrub, the fastest growing part of my electorate, to meet the growing needs of those commuters and that fast growing community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is not just about roads. The Beanley train station park and ride has funds allocated to get that much anticipated project underway. Work will commence next financial year on a new $7.2 million permanent fire station to service the Carbrook and Cornubia area alongside Mount Cotton and the Redlands. This can provide peace of mind for residents of Logan who know only too well that Logan is the state's hotspot for house fires. The next financial year, we will see work completed on the Hydrogen Training Centre of Excellence yeah. in Beanley. This was my signature $20 million project that secured real job training opportunities in secure, well-paying jobs, but also with an eye to the jobs of the future the future where Queensland is at the forefront of the hydrogen industry. I also welcome the announcement of the permanency of the Skilling Queenslanders for Work program. Yeah. This program has assisted hundreds of my constituents uh, into work and further training. Uh, I also note that in the next financial year, we will finish uh, many of the social housing projects that commenced uh, this year uh, with more to start, particularly in the community of Eagleby in the next financial year. I commend the bill to the House. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Traeger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just to make, rise to make my contribution on the, uh, on the budget. And uh, to start off with, I'd, uh, I think it's, I always like to uh, start off with being appreciative of the money comes into the electorate. Uh, whether I think that's enough or not is something to we'll discuss um, further on, but um, I'll just go through some of the, the, the things that have been delivered. Uh, the money for the Kennedy Development Road, uh, that's, um, you know, that's been a big thing ever since I got into Parliament, um, which was formerly known as the Hand Highway, an inland highway for Queensland, and um, you, can take, you take a triple road train down the inland of Queensland, you take two B-doubles off the Bruce Highway. And, and that saves a lot of maintenance, a lot of safety, and it gives you a dry run in the wet season, away from the, the west of the east, uh, sorry, the wet of the east of the Great Divide. You get west of that, and, and you, uh, it's more traversable in the wet season, and it's shorter. You, you burn, uh, they estimate 13 hours less diesel going the inland from the tropical north down to Melbourne if you go that inland route. So it's been a very strategic uh, piece of infrastructure that's required. I think the next most um, significant of that nature for industry is Utan Road that goes up through the Cape to open that up. Remember the hill, I'm sure mentioned that earlier. Uh, they're, they're good projects. There's not a lot of people live up there or on those roads. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, not very enticing for the government because it's, uh, it, it's not going to be a great vote winner, but it sure would be great for the economy and the people of Queensland would appreciate it in the future, that's for certain. So that's good to see that that money that um, has really was worked very hard for for the community um, in Hewenden, uh, people like Les Carter and um, Greg Jones, former mayor, fought very hard for that uh, that money, and and we're very pleased to see that that's almost sealed all the way through, and 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 
I know that Premier's started talking about the inland highway uh, now, and, and that's, that's good to hear. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done on, on crossings and what not to, to make sure we can start getting triples through the inland. Um, and some of that stuff is not, not a lot of money, considering the benefits it can have. There's uh, money on the Flinders Highway, but the next one I'd go on to is the Ar Ar uh, Aramac to Torrance Creek Road, which is part of also that inland link. And, uh, and that's been um, something Bill Bowe, the uh, council there in Hewenden, uh, it's been his passion for many years, but it forms part of that vital link for the trucks. And now I heard Blenners on the ABC radio on the country just the other day saying how wonderful it would be if we can take those trucks on the inland, and, and he specifically mentioned Torrance Creek Aramac Road. So that money's there now. And I noticed that these all say in partnership with the federal government, so we acknowledge their contribution to those things as well. Uh, Cloncurry to Jarra Road, I'll make special mention of that, probably no one, not many people here know where that is. Um, but uh, that was another one. There was a, a thorn in my side for years um, because uh, Incitec Pivot, the biggest fertiliser plant in the Southern Hemisphere, is down that road. We are the biggest fertiliser plant in the Southern Hemisphere, and they've been waiting for about 15 kilometres of seal to be done ever since I've been in Parliament 10 years. Uh, maybe that reflects poorly on me as a, a state, uh, the member for that area, but certainly it reflects poorly on the government as well, because if we can't seal and make a, a, a road in there for consumables into that mine site for the biggest fertiliser plant in the Southern Hemisphere, um, and then yeah, we're, we're not doing our job, uh, I believe. And, and that's after that the mine itself would already contribute a, a great deal to the material to be used for that road. So there'd already been a big contribution from the mine. And, uh, and, and I often, you know, use that. I like using this road as an example in here because, um, you know, a lot of the roads that down here, it's great. Hundreds of, well, sorry, thousands of people a day get to use the roads. And not many people get to use these roads. They don't buy a lot of votes, but they contribute a lot to the state. Because you build that, you get consumables in and out of the roads. It's a good piece of infrastructure that, that helps create wealth. And, and that's something that means a lot to me as a politician, that uh, when we're spending money, there's good value there that makes sure it, it contributes to the long-term wealth of the state, not just these short-term sugar hits that uh, the government seems to be addicted to. Health is an interesting one for me and, and one that's really um, galvanised its, its, its um, curiosity with me over the last six months because I've just become uh, so attuned now to the massive de deficit there is in health in, in remote facilities in remote Western Queensland. Um, it, is, it is bewildering uh, some of the things that um, people go through due to the lack of resources, lack of facilities. And, and quite recently we had our board um, effectively stood down in the Northwest HHS for saying simply saying for the last few years there's just not enough money here to do the job that we're expected to do and the services we do. So almost everything else that's said in this budget, spending, I find it difficult to see how that is a priority over di critical dialysis chairs, uh, renal chairs and new x-ray machine for Charters Towers uh, so that you can have an x-ray machine that works. Um, you know, the, the hospital in Charters Towers had maggots falling through the ceiling and has rats eating the wires in the, in the building, so they have um, data problems. And um, they're pretty real problems to have. And we don't have a mental health in patients in Mount Isa. Um, we have a flood of people coming in through the Northern Territory, clogging up a health system. Uh, but the problem is all the board. Um, not the problem was that we're not getting enough money to uh, con conduct the service we have. We have not had money to employ the doctors and nurses out in those remote areas. Uh, health is a massive problem and, and there is a really big drama for the government to fix that. And, um, and you know, when I hear talk, the nonsense of Olympic Games bids and, and you know, to hear about the seven billion now on the Cross River Rail and to see that those things uh, still aren't done in your own electorate and other parts of Western Queensland, it really makes you quite angry. Um, there, there is some, uh, so there was some good, you know, again, some social infrastructure in my electorate um, that I, I should be grateful for. It is, you know, pleasing to have that. Um, the, the footy park in, in Normanton, the upgrades there, Gallipoli Park in Mount Isa, um, is enjoyed by a lot of people in the Family Fun Park there. But they are things that, that they do increase, enhance livability, and we are appreciative, and I'm, I'm sure people in the electorate will be very appreciative of that. Um, 
there were some um, other aspects of the budget I did want to talk about. Um, the, the claim that 60 per cent of the budget, um, and I know this was addressed by my colleagues as well, member for Hinchinbrook, member for Hill, but um, you know, there's, there's always a lot of deception um, with budgets and, and it's, it's, um, it's really unfair for people out there trying to interpret what's, what's the real deal. And going back to health again is a good example because when you heard health it was saying an increase in spending. So I guess everyone in my electorate would be fair to believe, for them to believe, well I guess that means an increase of services or infrastructure. Uh, but there's nothing new. There's, there's, there's nothing new in there um, uh, in terms of those critical elements of uh, you know, CT scanners, um, renal chairs. And, uh, and, and another, um, another thing that I found deceptive was saying, well, 60 per cent of the budget is spent in regional Queensland. So regional Queensland, as I define it, doesn't include Sunshine Coast, uh, Toowoomba and Gold Coast. And, and they're important places. They're important places, but to the layperson sitting out there, you don't look at that as regional. And so, so when you, you flip that back around, it goes back to 60 per cent, 40 per cent. And, and that's all right if you want to spend 60 and 40 per cent. Maybe there's a good reason for it, but, but it's just don't say that to people out there because it's misleading. Um, uh, I, I mean, looking at mining royalties, uh, I, I mean, the only comment I can make, and I have to comment on mining royalties because it's such a big part of my electorate, uh, the income, but it um, obviously was depleted this year and we expect it to go up. And, and um, it seems to have dulled down a little bit, but there's always the coal bashing comes out. Uh, I, I noticed the member for Callide uh, still vouched his support, and I know certainly the KAP um, would like to register their strong support. And um, a lot of people seem to be warming to coal a little bit, but it was very frosty in here a few years ago when we were talking about coal. It was very frosty indeed uh, before the last... When, um, but we all seem to be friends again with coal. Let's just keep that in mind because it's really helping us in the budget and it will help us in the future. So let's be careful how much we pick on it when it becomes trendy again in the political um, sphere out there, atmosphere. Um, so uh, you yeah, were concerned about um, royalties. And, and, and I mean, the big thing for me is the absence of money making projects. Um, you know, a, a, and for many years, there's been a defocus. I mean, the water infrastructure just gets dragged down in the quagmire of, of um, uh, you know, green tape and, and uh, business cases after business cases. And for the amount of times in the Northwest Minerals Province, I had one mayor to say, uh, to state development, please don't come to me again for more contribution to a business cut for another study of the Northwest. You've done it three times. I've told you the same thing, and none of it's been delivered. So stop coming and asking me what you want, you know, to contribute to these forums on on Northwest, you know, business cases. It's pretty easy. We've got the world's most expensive power in Northwest Queensland. Fix it by connecting us to the NEM. It's pretty easy. <laughs> Build a transmission line. Yet, uh, and that the, the government has the power to do that now. We could we could regulate that line now. Uh, we could own, the government could own copper string and and uh, turn us in, into a powerhouse out there. And we can contribute so much, and we can help you pay for your your Cross River Rail. We can help you pay for your Olympic bid. But we can't if you sit there and just give nice tokenistic words like saying we support it. Don't support it. Go and build it. Make sure it's done. Don't do another study of another dam. Build it. Build these things so that you lay the platform to industry, money-making projects, not money-absorbing projects. There seems to be uh, a really um, dangerous, um, misleading sort of definition or inclusion of infrastructure, of, of social infrastructure being um, put in where it should be separately defined from, um, you know, industry building infrastructure or industry enabling infrastructure and and so all too often in this house and in, in the budget we hear about infrastructure spending I don't define that as cross river rail I mean technically it is infrastructure I get that but in my mind I'm thinking we need to build some things that have a legacy and make money for this state and that's not it I mean that's something you build after you've made the money from building your transmission line after you build the, tra the transmission line, we'll build your money. 
you'll learn about this in the future you, because you'll run out of money. It's $7 billion now and it'll keep costing more and it doesn't make money, just like your Olympics Games. The Olympic Games doesn't make Comments money. Comments come through the chair. You have the call. Oh. Just like the Olympics Games, you know, you keep selling these things to the public, but I'll tell you what makes money is that you, all the business cases are dams don't make money. That's what they said about the Fairburn Dam. That's what they said about just about every dam that remained in Queensland. But you lay the platform of that infrastructure and that bill, it, you know, it's not a great thing to announce an election. It doesn't win your votes, but that's the mature decisions that are needed in this House to take this state forward. And that's what the, the, there is a, a complete absence of that in this, in this, uh, uh, in this budget. And that's a real problem um, that I see going forward. And it's been a, a problem for a long time. And, uh, and I believe you have a front, I have a front row seat in that because I live in a part of Queensland that's highly undeveloped. It, it has a, um, it has a um, large portion of untapped resources that we have in this state. You've got four million megalitres running down the Flinders at the moment, hardly a drop of it's been taken out past um, tens of thousands of acres, sorry, I should say hundreds of thousands of acres of black soil plains, all lending itself to uh, irrigable farming land. But, um, I mean, if you talk to half the people in the city, you say, well, we're running out of food to feed ourselves across the world, like, is, which is just crazy. We've got so much resource up there that could um, enhance the productivity of Queensland, more taxes, more revenue. Um, but we're not talking about this budget. We're talking about more pieces of uh, you know, social infrastructure. And, and that stuff uh, will cost us money into the future, no question. So uh, they're, the, they're the biggest issues. Um, I have. I'd, I'd, I'd like to finish on a positive note. There were some very, um, there were some very good uh, uh, contributions made in the budget to the, the schools and my electorate, and um, and we had and some good details on that. Uh, some very pleased uh, principals that I rang uh, today, and some of them weren't aware of that money coming in. So, um, you know, things like the uh, the lift the elevator at um, Barclay State School in, in Mount Isa, uh, Sunset State School upgrades, Spinifex State College with Phil Sweeney and, and Chris Pocock there who do a wonderful job. Uh, they've, they've attracted a lot of money in, in these upgrades. Uh, and Happy Valley State School with Alyssa Chambers uh, where I frequent and they've got um, 500 uh, almost 600,000 for playground equipment and, and extra classrooms. So there's been a bit of money spent um, throughout the electorate in, uh, in the schools, and we appreciate uh, that, and um, and that will be um, a go to very good use. Mr. Speaker, I call the member for Calandra. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak in support of the Appropriations Bill 2021-2022, and what a marvellous budget our Treasurer has set out before the people of Queensland. Mr Speaker, the Queensland economy is in excellent condition because that is precisely where the Palaszczuk Labor government has positioned it. 3.25 per cent is double the national growth figure, and considering where we were 12 months ago, that is incredibly impressive. More jobs created than ever before, and lo and behold, the unemployment rate has dropped 0.7 per cent to be back to where it was pre-COVID at 5.4 per cent. So again, I remark, Mr Deputy Speaker, what a beautifully crafted plan for the future it is. This is not luck. This is not coincidence. This is not chance. This is the result of the Premier standing firm and making all the correct calls in the face of ill-informed and often asinine criticisms from many quarters, the Queensland LNP and our Prime Minister chiefly among them. We could not forget the LNP petition to open the borders in mid-pandemic. And we'll never be able to forget the advertisement that read, we flattened the curve, stop flattening the economy, as they sought to disregard the science over and over and over again. But by far the most ridiculous cut before the horse logic that I hear repeated time and time again by the LNP is the torturous line that goes, COVID numbers are small, therefore it can't possibly be having an impact on Q Health or the budget. The COVID-19 numbers in Queensland are small because we have directed so much time, energy and money into combating the pandemic and will continue to do so as long as the health and well-being of Queenslanders, especially our older Queenslanders, is at stake. This seems to be lost on the LNP. 
Queensland's health response has been so comprehensive and so magnificent that we are now outperforming the national economy and the economy of the other larger eastern seaboard states. Indeed, the residents of many other states are voting with their feet in line with the voting intentions of Queenslanders in 2020. They are backing this government's handling of both the pandemic and the economy and flocking here in droves. Mr Deputy Speaker, the value of education, access to a good quality and comprehensive education, is quite simply a golden stairway to opportunity and can lift those from even the most modest backgrounds into a better place and leads to a cascade of opportunity for successive generations. An investment, as investment in education goes, this Labor government has absolutely outdone itself in the electorate of Caloundra. Over $50 million in education spending in the seat of Caloundra. I'll say that again, $50 million of investment in education in the electorate of Caloundra. Yeah, yeah. The brand new schools in Narimba is to be accompanied by upgrades to almost every state school in the electorate. Golden Beach State School tuck shop and prep rooms. A special congratulations to Kelly Morris from the Golden Beach PNC for her advocacy in this space. Caloundra State School, the first allocation of funding for a brand new school hall. Baringa State Secondary College, a new visual arts facility, a new three-storey general learning block and an expansion to the science block. And further upgrades for Glenview State School, Glenview State High, BOR State High, BOR State School and Landsborough State School. Not to mention funding for the planning of the proposed ambulance station in Caloundra South. I've heard from the LNP that there is in fact no money in this budget and that the cupboard is bare. Smoke and mirrors, we are being told. That being the case, I look forward to welcoming the Minister for Education to Caloundra in the coming weeks to show her the imaginary schools that she has caused to be built and the imaginary upgrades that have started in the other schools. I further look forward to meeting the Minister for Transport and Main Roads as we tour the works of the imaginary Bells Creek Arterial Road, and if we have time, I'll show him the imaginary traffic lights at Ridgewood Road, a set of traffic lights that, imaginary or otherwise, the LNP could not deliver despite 116 years representing the electorate. Over a century, and traffic lights was apparently too much to ask. Most of all, I welcome the massive cash injection matching the Malula River interchange, $160 million to match the federal spending. Not only is that the fantastic investment in the Sunshine Coast, but it members. has the dual function of demonstrating how very little the LNP did in this space of road infrastructure on the Sunshine Coast when last in government. Order member. When they cut $1.6 billion from the road and transport budget, that's hardly surprising. I hear that the LNP members on the Sunshine Coast chatting about the lack of attention to their respective electorates, so I feel compelled to mention the gigantic effort they put into Caloundra in 2012. On the verge of winning the greatest majority in the history of Queensland, so great was their commitment to Caloundra that they almost delivered a closed-circuit television camera for the Caloundra CBD. Almost, but not quite. That was Caloundra's reward for voting for the LNP for 110 years, a near miss on a CCTV camera. In closing, Mr Speaker, I cannot help but comment on the Gordian knot of the LNP's own making, a position so contrary it almost defies description. According to the opposition, we need to borrow more money for Queensland while simultaneously borrowing less money for Queensland. And I couldn't help but mention their incredible logic when they were dealing to the when they were looking at the uh, overcrowding in Queensland's jails as it started to spike in 2012. Their incredibly intelligent solution was to close a jail because nothing solves the problem of lack of bed space like creating a lack of bed space. It's like a bad script from a bad sitcom. Mr Speaker, this budget has delivered for Caloundra and has certainly delivered for Queensland. The economic indicators tell the tale. I commend the Appropriations Bill for the House. I call, I call the member from Richardall. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. At a time of severe housing shortages in the private rental market, now is the time for the Queensland Government to get cracking <laughs> and remove the barriers to affordable, more timely delivery of housing. Incredibly, 
The Queensland Government is doing the opposite by proposing more costly red tape in the home building industry, which threatens, threatens to increase the cost of a new home up to about $8,000 per home, according to industry. Moves are also afoot to increase some infrastructure charges by up to $10,000 per lot. This will hurt families, builders and other small businesses, as well as burdening one of the most stressed housing supply markets in the nation, putting home ownership further out of reach of first home buyers. The housing shortage in the private rental market here in Queensland is a humanitarian and an economic crisis, with families, including those with jobs, competing with as many as 40 other families. I know that's the case on the Sunshine Coast and many parts of Queensland as are trying to get a rental house. Now, social housing is important, but it's not the total picture. In fact, the majority of people who are looking for rental housing will be looking to the private rental market. And the fact that there has been such a failure in housing supply, particularly in Queensland, comes back to a lot of the barriers that we see with poor planning here in Queensland under this Labor government, as well as a lack of timely infrastructure delivery. The vacancy rates, the vacancy rates are so chronically low because of this housing supply stress that we're seeing people who would never have expected to think they could be homeless facing homelessness. The REIQ says that housing rental vacancy rate in Meriburra is 0.2 per cent, Southern Downs 0.3 per cent, Bundaberg 0.5 per cent, Gympie 0.4 per cent, Rockhampton 0.4 per cent, Sunshine Coast 0.4 per cent, Gold Coast 0.6 per cent, and I could name other regions as well. This vacancy rate is so chronically low is because of a housing supply uh, shortage and a stress in the market that's being exacerbated by what we see here in Queensland with bad planning and a lack of timely infrastructure delivery. Now's the time to uh, coordinate action, uh, not to add additional unnecessary costs, but to bring across the multiple government agencies that all have a say in regard to how housing is delivered here in Queensland. They must get on the same page, stop adding more costs through bad planning and a laggard and inefficient infrastructure delivery. Uh, we know that under this uh, Labor government there's been moves in the infrastructure space to also add up to 30 per cent extra in cost to infrastructure build, supposedly by this poorly named uh, best practice principles, uh, which is in fact another word for union extortion. Now, I believe in unions and the right application, particularly with regard to safety standards. But this is extortion. It is actually cutting down the delivery of the infrastructure we need in Queensland at a time when we need uh, more bang for our buck, more delivery, and yet this practice that this government is bringing about is going to see less delivered in Queensland when we need more. We also see with infrastructure here in Queensland uh, that this government has cut $4 billion from the forwards uh, for infrastructure spend, $4 billion uh, over the next four years, a time when, once again, there needs to be timely investment in infrastructure. But I want to say a little bit more about the private rental market and these failures of this government uh, to address this, because of all places, Victoria, I wouldn't think I'd be singing the praises of Chairman Dan, because I think they're lunatics in many ways, but they've got something right. They're actually delivering a more timely planning and uh, infrastructure plans around release of housing lots, as I understand, in Victoria than we've, we've seen in Queensland. As we uh, heard from the Leader of the Opposition this morning, uh, well, actually, yesterday, now we've ticked over into Friday. As we heard, there's been quite a stark fall-off in the release of new housing lots in Queensland. Quite a stark fall-off in new housing lots in Queensland at a time when we need to see more. Uh, I mentioned before about the poor planning and uh, lack of timely infrastructure delivery impacting upon that uh, release of affordable new housing. Well, 
I we'll will say one thing. The Deputy Premier announced that there would be these growth areas teams and there was a project with uh, Caboolture West to uh, put some enabling dollars into the infrastructure there, and it was welcomed by industry. So they're doing that on one hand, and yet on the other hand, uh, they are talking with industry through the Economic Development Queensland about increasing uh, the infrastructure charges by up to $10,000 per lot in some of our new PDAs here in Queensland. Now, if they do that and then replicate that through other areas of Queensland, I think we have to ask the question. The left hand of this government doesn't know what the right hand's doing. At a time when we've never seen such, a, uh, such a, an affordability crisis, a supply crisis in the rental health, housing market, and it's causing great distress. I want to also address the building industry concern about a mandatory imposition of the silver level living housing design standards across all new builds. Now, I support there being encouragement and incentives to make uh, housing more appropriate and livable and accessible for those with mobility uh, issues. But industry is warning that the way that this Labor government has been proposing to mandate and bring this in could actually cost the average new home $8,000 a new build. You see, it's, it's more than just about the size of doors and having a downstairs toilet. It's also about lot configuration, yield within housing estates, what you can't do with smaller lot housing because the standard doesn't fit, and it, it knocks on. And it's quite a significant impact that hasn't really been taken into consideration. And once again, it's an imposition of additional costs when there should be a more targeted way that you are able to help people uh, who have a need with mobility issues to be able to get into housing that is fit for purpose. But to apply that which is not fit for purpose for the majority of lots and also housing is going to add up to $8,000 per house according to industry. It's the wrong way to go when we should be seeing a move against a poorly planned red tape and costs that are going to make it even harder for those first homeowners to get into, get into their first home, let alone the rental market more broadly, which has a lack of supply, which needs more housing to address affordability. Um, the state government did announce a $1 billion housing investment fund, except they had no money against that over the forward estimate. So that's disappointing because there is a place for good social housing and ensuring that the most vulnerable have housing. But I would say at the moment, it's so broad, it's beyond those who are actually entitled uh, to social housing, but there isn't any. The broader rental market's in failure. And when we look at the release of uh, housing product interstate, we see that Queensland's got a problem and it's getting worse. And you just can't blame interstate migration. The housing supply and the fall off in lots being released clearly is a Queensland issue and the amount of cost that's being added per house is getting worse. It's time that this, there was leadership from this government to address this, rather than press releases and ig ignoring the real and very distressing situation impacting right throughout our state. Uh, this government is get, got rid of the Productivity Commission. They don't like accountability. We believe accountability uh, is in the interests of the public. It's, in the, it's good democracy, but it also ensures that people can see for themselves where the money is going and also ensure that they're getting good bang for their taxpayers' dollars because it's not our money, it's theirs. The announcement of a parliamentary budget office by the Leader of the Opposition, I believe, is part of that process where we say you should have nothing to fear. Uh, you should have nothing to fear by releasing the truth of the figures. And that's why we've announced this as an important integrity measure. There's not much time in these speeches to cover all the areas I'd like to, but I want to uh, go to my electorate, uh, the Merchador electorate and the Sunshine Coast. Now, there was supposed to be a 786 built capacity uh, at the Sunshine Coast University Hospital by 2021. Uh, actually, I'll correct the record. There was supposed to be operational 786 beds at the Sunshine Coast University Hospital by this year. Then the Labor government did a fudgeroo on the uh, websites and their printed documentation said there would be a built capacity. Well, that sounds like the uh, a faulty towers version of uh, uh, you've got a hospital with no patients. In this case, you've got uh, hospital uh, rooms without beds and without staff. And this is one of the reasons we're seeing some of the worst ambulance rambling, 
rates on the Sunshine Coast, and that's been replicated in other areas because we're not actually seeing beds in these rooms that have got staff, uh, and it's, it, it is rubbery. And the, 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 look, the proof. They can, they can put their press releases out, they can laugh and joke about it, but uh, we have been talking to the patients who have been ramped uh, in ambulances waiting to gain access to hospitals, and uh, a GP clinic ain't the answer. In these cases, it is, in fact, having capacity in these hospitals and sy uh, a systems overhaul to ensure people get a bed when they need it. Um, I want to also address uh, that some of the transport issues on the Sunshine Coast. And I was so thrilled when the federal government announced $160 million for the Mooloola River interchange. We've been waiting for years for this business case to be finished. We still haven't seen it from the, from the government. It went on over three years. It dribbled out $7.5 or however much it was in a business case. Talk about a never-ending story. We still haven't seen it, but fortunately the federal government has tipped in half of the funding for what is a state road, the Mooloola River interchange. Uh, when we were in government, we did acquire most of the property uh, for that corridor. We lost government and then we saw this government went into this never-ending business case. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it, it's meant that the last six years uh, that project hasn't been started. But finally it's going to start, even if this government is only tipping in $4 million this year out of $360 million a $320 million bill, which is pretty pathetic, but thank goodness it's starting because it's dangerous and it needs to happen. Uh, I want to also address the issue of mass transit. Uh, we all support better public transport. Uh, there has to be better public transport, but this also has to be something where you listen to the people and get it right. And clearly, and I know my colleague, the member for Kwana, and I have been uh, vocal on this issue because we've been listening to our community and they don't want the higher level of density that Council were proposing to go along initially with a light rail, and now they say, oh, it's not necessary light rail uh, between Caloundra and Maroochydore, up the Nicklin Way and, and through Alexander Parade and other areas. They, were, they still are talking about taking out two lanes of traffic on a very busy road. Now, that talk, talk about uh, uh, having hope to have mode, mode shift by taking up two lanes of traffic and yet increasing the density to a high level at the same time. You'll never, never get out of the congestion. Uh, that's not the way to address uh, the transport issues. We want to see an integrated transport network that services the whole of the Sunshine Coast and, as part of that, get heavy rail into Maroochydore on the Camcross Corridor. Interesting that the federal government, through Infrastructure Australia, did put money into a business case, but in the executive summary of that business case for the North Coast Connect, which included a segment of Camcos Corridor for heavy rail, uh, one of the factors they said was a delivery risk was, one, there was no proponent because the state government uh, wasn't manning up and being the proponent, and secondly, uh, it wasn't in the current Queensland government transport strategies. That's unfortunate, and I believe it's time this government did put that project into their transport strategies, redo the business case, get this thing going, now's the time, and uh, to stop fluffing around on a light, light rail option and increase density down the Nicklin Way, which will destroy the amenity of these communities. We want to see our, our communities with enhanced amenity, with the right planning, but don't waste money on projects that the community are clearly saying is not the right way to go. Uh, policing has been a huge issue and one that we know they've been under the pump with many demands. But honing the complaints I heard my colleague, the member for Surface Paradise, expressing some of his concerns and other colleagues, and the lack of access to police and transport officers to work with them. We used to have these joint operations where you'd have the transport officers go out as well and they would address those issues of non-compliant vehicles. I don't even know when they last ran a joint operation. It's time that these frontline staff were put in place not only for peace and uh, good behaviour in our community, but for safety. They're desperately needed. So, uh, Mr Acting Speaker, um, we want to see this issue also addressed. Time's expired.
I call the uh, Leader of the House. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to make a contribution to the budget introduced by the Treasurer and commend him and his department on a strong Labor budget. The budget before us continues the Palaszczuk Government's long-standing commitment to serve the people of Queensland. There are many great funding announcements in this year's budget, including a $3.34 billion Queensland Jobs Fund to further stimulate job creation and industry development in Queensland as part of our economic recovery efforts from the global pandemic. We are investing over $14.6 billion in this financial year in infrastructure projects right across our state. $16.6 billion has been allocated to improve education outcomes for students and teachers and $1.9 billion has been committed over the forward estimates to support social housing. In my mighty electorate of Redcliffe, we will see the benefits of this funding. The Palaszczuk Government is investing in the road infrastructure we need, including upgrades to the pedestrian facility at Anzac Avenue, Marine Parade and Redcliffe Parade intersections, putting signals at the Oxley Avenue and Sydney Streets, and improved safety measures on a number of intersections across the peninsula. I'm pleased that in this year's budget we are seeing funding for our local schools, including a brand new fence at Humpybong State School worth $700,000, infrastructure enhancements at Clontarf Beach State High School and Clontarf Beach State School totalling nearly $600,000, $550,000 to upgrade learning spaces at Redcliffe State High School and $640,000 for enhancements at New Playground and fence at Woody Point Special School. I know the importance of a strong education and I'm proud to be part of the Palaszczuk Labor Government, which invests not only in our education system, but also invests in our broader social infrastructure. In particular, we are continuing to provide vital funding to our frontline community organisations, such as Chameleon Housing, which is receiving nearly $650,000 in this year's budget to deliver specialist homelessness services. I want to give a shout out to all of the community groups in Redcliffe, including Carmel at Chameleon Housing, who do an incredible job and work every day for the benefit of our fellow citizens. On behalf of the Palaszczuk Government, I say thank you. I am thrilled that we have extended our Skilling Queenslanders for Work program. As the former Minister for Training and Skills who brought back Skilling Queenslanders for Work, which was savagely cut by the LNP Government, I have seen firsthand how this program helps Queenslanders and changes lives for the better. The Moreton Bay region alone will see nearly $8 million allocated for cyber security training in addition to other training opportunities. There is dignity in work and I am proud that this government is investing in job creating programs which will not only help residents in my community but all Queenslanders no matter where they live. $400,000 has been allocated for the Scarborough Harbour Master Plan and I was pleased to join the Redcliffe Chamber of Commerce business owners and local leaders last week on our mighty Moreton Bay to announce that consultation will commence in August. Consultation will be extensive, ensuring our community can have their say. I look forward to working with my community on this exciting new opportunity. Deputy Speaker, since 2015 we have restored the LNP savage cuts to the budget and the front line. But what, what did we learn recently by the Leader of the Opposition? Recently he was asked, are you ruling out cuts? The Leader of the Opposition said, I'm ruling out being savage. In his budget speech, he said a budget should give people hope. So what does this mean? Does that mean instead of the LNP sacking 4,400 health workers, they'd only sack 3,000? Does that mean instead of sacking 1,800 frontline nurses and midwives, they'd only sack 1,000? This, oh, cut waste, I'll take that interjection. I would love for them to define what they think is waste. This is, this is someone who said that previous health cuts, quote, whilst you have to feel for those involved, you have to live within your means." End quote. Our approach throughout the pandemic has been focused on two things, keeping Queenslanders safe and employed. And the success of that approach has been plain today. Queensland's unemployment rate has dropped to 5.4 per cent. This is a vindication not only of the government's decision to follow the Chief Health Officer's health advice, but also the strong economic recovery plan we took to the last election. It is clear that those opposite cannot read a budget. They claim the health capital budget has been cut. This is incorrect. When the one-off leasing commitment for leasing stars is taken into consideration, the increase to the health capital budget is 260 million or 23.7 per cent. The LNP said $2 billion has not been allocated to build a single new hospital. This is incorrect. That $2 billion is already being used to deliver Marta Springfield and the Toowoomba Day Surgery, and business cases are underway for new hospitals in Bundaberg, Toowoomba and Cooma. What single hospital did the LNP build? None. 
Zero, zip, nothing. That wasn't, that wasn't. I'll take that into Order, members. That wasn't Order, your members. Order. Order, member for Kiwana. Started before they came into government. Uh, Order, member speaker, for Kiwana. Those opposite complain about regional health investment, but the record reflects that the Palaszczuk government is a friend of the regions. We have just opened a new hospital in Roma, and it should be noted Order, that member the for last Grimm, hospital Noggle. that was built in Roma was by Labor as well. Major upgrades are occurring in Cairns, Mariba, Atherton, Serena, and the list goes on. The LNP's only infrastructure project was 1 William Street in Brisbane. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Order, members. Mr. Speaker, um, sorry, Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker has reviewed and approved my budget speech for incorporation. As such, I ask that the remainder of my speech is incorporated into the record of proceedings. Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The House will now adjourn. Uh, De Deputy Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. Getting ahead of myself. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I'll take it with the standing that uh, everyone's in agreement. Uh, the motion is carried. Uh, the House will now adjourn until 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning.